Somewhere in the depths of the desert, there was a strong explosion. The mysterious sword was shrouded in radiance. The youth who was next to the sword was in shock. The stranger turned to him. The youth's face was filled with emotion. The stranger asked if the young man considered himself worthy. The young man thought about it. He closed his eyes. The youth's body was covered in magical dust. He thought of the voice that had guided him to his destiny. The youth extended his hand towards the sword. He realized that this voice turned out to be a holy sword that appeared in front of him and said, placing his hand on the holy weapon, his body was covered in a magical aura. The stranger asked Leon if he was right. The entire area was covered in bright light. The plot takes us into our own world. The kingdom's flag fluttered smoothly in the wind. The guys were fighting with wooden swords. The people standing nearby were watching them. The guy knocked the sword out of Leon's hands, who was taken aback. His sword fell to the ground. Distressed, Leon took hold of his injured hand. He asked the guy to take it seriously. Leon asked if the guy thought it was okay not to fight him at all. He smiled and put the sword on his shoulder. He stated that this was not the case. He pointed out that there wasn't a single person in this Imperial Academy who would challenge him other than Leon. Enraged, Leon ordered them not to mock him. Laughing, he began to examine his sword. He revealed that it was partly true that he was fighting Leon at half strength. The guy noted that Leon was much better than before. The main character's face was shrouded in anger. His hand moved towards the wooden sword. Leaping up, Leon attacked the guy from above. He said he hated being pitted. The locals were discussing that this Leon can't even stand up to Leon. They were watching Leon's next attempt to strike at Leon. The resident believed that the battle was delayed. The stranger reported on a rumor in which Leon destroyed his opponents with a single blow. The resident suggested that the guys compete because of the same names. The main character's face was full of seriousness. A resident of the city thought that Leon liked it. A smile spread across his face. The citizen noted that though their names sound the same, but they are written differently. The sun was shining brightly outside. Leon was upset that he had lost again. The defeated protagonist was sitting in front of a stone fence. Leon leaned back inside. He thought about how it had been three years since Leon had been transferred here. The main character was angry. He believed that he would never surpass him even if he trained hard. A silhouette of Leon appeared in his mind. Leon thought that even though their names were pronounced the same, he was completely different from him. The girl's attention was focused on Leon. The main character thought that Leon's mannerisms, looks, and personality were similar to the hero from fairy tales. Leon's face was confused. Leon said that he would be lying if he said that Leon is a normal guy. The main character thought that Leon definitely did not belong here because he should go to the elite class. Leon didn't know what Leon was doing here at all. He suggested that Leon likes to show everyone how strong he is. Leon held out his hand to Leon, who was sitting in the shade. He asked if he was alright. His face was full of smiles. The main character was thinking that if only he wasn't here. Leon lowered his head and sighed. The main character already wanted to give the good-natured Leon a hand. Suddenly, a girl called out to him. Leon looked confused. The girl was wearing black heels. With a wave of his hand, Leon asked her to leave him alone. The indignant girl watched the main character go off into the distance. She asked him to wait. The enraged girl put her hands on her side. She noted what she'd heard about their fight with Leon. She didn't understand why he kept fighting Leon if he couldn't beat him. The main character was confused. Startled, Leon tried to calm Chloe's indignation. The girl rushed to the main character, seeing a wound on his finger. Chloe said it had to be neutralized immediately. Proud Leon said that this should not be done. Surprised, Chloe wanted to disinfect the wound. Leon started shouting angrily. He told Chloe to mind her own business and stop worrying about small things. Chloe's face was in shock. The main character headed forward. It was evening in the kingdom. Noises were being made in its surroundings. A confident Leon was doing his best to train on the wooden dummy. Being enraged, the main character swung his sword. He thought about what it would be like if he had blonde hair and a family that could support him. The main character believed that Leon had a clear talent. Leon's face was full of worry. He was wondering what would happen if he was of noble blood. Leon's sword was shattered into splinters after hitting the wooden dummy. The main character froze in anticipation of further actions. He knew that after all, he didn't have any of these things. His gaze was fixed on the broken sword. Lino stared thoughtfully at the light that came from the palace windows. The main character believed that in this world there are too many peaks and obstacles, where one desire and effort cannot overcome the mountain. Leon remembered that today was Leon's birthday. Happy guests enjoyed the birthday celebration of the birthday boy. The main character was sure that a grand party should be held for the pride of the Imperial Academy. Leon tossed the rest of the broken sword onto the floor. After calming down, he lay down under a tree. Leon supposed he would try again tomorrow. He watched the night sky thoughtfully. Leon noted that he had lost three whole years of his life here. The main character thought that he had again wasted one day in vain. In rage, Leon began to spin from side to side. There were tears in his eyes. 
he didn't understand why he still hadn't given up. Leon thought it was all settled in the first place. The main character wondered how he could become stronger. Leaning on his hands, he stared at the moon. Leon turned to God. He didn't know why he was doing this. The main character asked if his efforts were not enough. He couldn't understand why he had to live like this. Leon pointed his hands at the moon. A blush appeared on his cheeks. Leon didn't think anyone would answer him. Suddenly, a bright glow appeared, the glare of which was reflected on the ground. His gaze was focused on a certain magic ball that was heading in his direction. In his hands, Leon held a glass of alcohol. Chloe asked him if he'd seen Leon. He reported that he had not seen him. Surprised, Chloe put her hands on her side. She noted that no one had seen him in the dorm either. Chloe was sure that he would come to the party. She put a finger to her chin, thinking. She didn't know where he could have gone. Startled, Lion noticed that Chloe was with him now. Chloe said she had to find him. Surprised, Lion raised a hand in Chloe's direction as she ran away. A man was standing behind him, holding a glass of alcohol. He called Lion your majesty. The man assumed that Lion had just been rejected. Lion turned his head in his direction. He asked Gilbert not to call him that, even if they did. Lion noted that hiding your identity will become meaningless if someone hears. He felt that he had no right to bear this title. A smile spread across Gilbert's face. He noted that a person of noble blood must be better than others. Gilbert congratulated Lion on his 17th birthday. There is only a year left before the prophecy related to the imperial family comes true. We were shown the royal flag flying in the wind. On the day that a member of the imperial family, the Great Clyde Empire, comes of age, the current emperor's life will end and a new era will come. While in the shadows, the man stabbed the dragon's body. When everyone mourns the holy emperor Roderick, a new one will take the throne. Lion wondered if Gilbert was talking about Roderick, who had died 300 years ago. He noted that two high expectations are placed on him. A look of longing crossed Lion's face. Lion thought it would take them another year to find out. A silhouette of Chloe appeared in his mind. He believed that she had a special talent and was already proficient in fourth-level magic. Lion thought of Leon, who had superhuman strength. Lion wanted them to always be by his side. Gilbert raised his glass to his mouth, lost in thought. He was thinking about the prophecy. An image of the youth sitting across from the holy sword appeared in his mind. Gilbert thought of the day when the man called Lion would grow up, and the god of destruction would descend from the sky. A powerful holy sword was stabbed into the stone. Astonished, Leon watched the sword, which was surrounded by a powerful glow. The glare of that sword could be seen on his face. He didn't understand what it was. Leon assumed it was a sword. His gaze was fixed on the sacred weapon. The stranger asked Leon to come over. The main character was confused. Startled, Leon began to turn his head around. He asked who was there. The stranger wondered if he could see who was in front of him. Leon's face was covered in sweat. The main character was thinking about the shape and shining light. He was startled by the fact that there was a sword in front of him that spoke like a human. Leon thought it was some kind of joke. Leon's gaze was fixed on the sword, the hilt of which was emitting a glow. He assumed that the holy sword was speaking to him. The weapon stated that it did. The sword announced that Leon had called him. Surprised, the main character pointed at himself. The sword noted that Leon felt the world was unfair to him. A memory of Leon being surrounded by a crowd of happy people popped up in Leon's mind. He thought back to when he broke his sword while holding a piece of it in his hands. The sword said that someone gets everything, and someone should grow through their perseverance. The main character was thinking about Leon, who was standing next to Chloe. Holy Sword pointed out that even that didn't affect the balance in any way. Leon's face was in shock. Mech stated that those who don't put in the effort don't have the right to blame their lives. The sacred weapon was wrapped in a magical aura. Mech added that only those who really worked hard deserve it. He noted that Leon, who complained about his life to the Lord, is too presumptuous. The main character was confused. Holy Sword asked if Leon deserved it. Leon closed his eyes in thought. With all his strength, he clenched his fist. A look of confidence crossed his face. Leon, who was shouting, put his hand to his heart. The main character said that he deserves it. The sacred weapon began to shine even brighter. The sword ordered Leon to take it. He noted that he would give Leon a chance to prove to everyone that he is not a weakling. The main character went down to the place where the sacred weapon was located. Leon thought that the stranger wanted him to take the holy sword for himself. Leon didn't know if he could even take it. A memory popped up in his mind with Leon reaching out his hand. The main character believed that his life was very unfair. He thought of walking away into the distance while Chloe watched him in shock. The main character reflected on the fact that every day he trained for wear and tear. A memory of grueling training sessions popped up in his mind. Leon headed towards the sacred weapon. A powerful glow radiated from its hilt. Leon's gaze was full of seriousness. The main character declared that he was not a coward. Standing in front of the sacred weapon, Leon watched the mysterious dust that appeared around him. He said that he tried to prove it to all of them on his own. 
Leon noted that this reality was too cruel, and then he tried to destroy it. The main character clenched his hands into a fist. Leon noted that he is not going to turn all his works into garbage and throw them in nowhere. Sacred Weapon asked, then why is Leon standing right in front of him now? Taken aback, Leon raised his fist, saying that the sword itself asked if he deserved it. He said that he wants to prove the significance of his determination and efforts. A smile appeared on Leon's face. He believed that everyone should have equal opportunities. The hilt of the sword was covered in a glow. Turning around, Leon started walking in the other direction, noting that if the holy weapon didn't care. The sword noted that this was the case. Surprised, the main character turned in his direction. Due to the bright glow, Leon brought his hand up to his face. The sword stated that Leon had proven his integrity. He asked to be picked up, calling Leon a warrior. On Leon's face, glints of light that came from the sacred weapon could be seen. The startled protagonist asked him again. He was amazed that the sword would trust him so easily. The sacred weapon stated that it was his will, not trust. Almost completely, the sword was covered in white light. The sacred weapon reported that a heart that wasn't broken by fate wasn't born from a prominent bloodline. A look of shock appeared on the protagonist's face. The sword spoke of a desire to prove one's beliefs that did not crave fame or riches. The sacred weapon declared that Leon is someone who is worthy of being a warrior. He asked Leon to pick it up. The entire area around them was illuminated by a strong light. Sword pointed out that this was a reward that Leon deserved. He said that he has one opportunity to prove his strength and will to everyone. The main character froze in anticipation. With complete confidence, Leon placed his hand on the sacred weapon. The sword announced its name, its name was Elsid. Leon's body was enveloped by the power of the sword he had just taken out of the stone. It is said to be the sword of the Holy Emperor Rodrigo Caldias El Vivar. He noted that he is a sword that directs light into a new era. A glow appeared in the protagonist's eye. Elsid asked Leon to defeat evil with him. With a smirk on his face, the guy asked if it was his. He was talking about the combination of war and the holy sword, and the boy thought it was a funny combination. Closing his eyes, the boy spread his hands. You're asking me why I broke the prophecy. He continued. The guy noted that the name of the main character also means lion. The guy stated that just because it was a prophecy passed down to the Clyde Imperial family, it didn't say that it was a family member that was being discussed in the first place. He wondered if that was true. Thinking about it, the guy brought his palms together. He noted that Lion does not meet their requirements at all. The guy said that despite the strength and talent, as well as the fate of Lion, he failed to awaken his will. Also, seeing how you find fault with him, you must have liked Leon. What is it? He asked. Choking back a laugh, the boy put his hand to his mouth. The guy noted that such people are now a rarity in their world. With a smile on his face, he closed his eyes. He asked me not to worry. He wondered if if he had used the legacy, something would have changed. He thought it was time to pay off his debt slowly. The boy's gaze was directed at the stranger. He asked him to watch him from the heavens. The guy asked if it was his job. Leon woke up and opened his eyes. The main character was in his bed. He was surprised that it was a dream. Disappointed, Leon got out of bed. His gaze was fixed on the sacred weapon. Surprised, Leon began to rub his face assiduously. He realized that it wasn't a dream. Elsid informed him that this was his last chance to become stronger. The main character froze in shock. Elsid pointed out that Leon didn't want to think that if he used it, he would get better in an instant. The sword was wrapped in a magical glow. He said that Leon will have to endure the test that he will receive personally from him. A soul was emanating from the sacred weapon. Elsid pointed out that those who have great power must live a terrible life. His gaze was directed at the startled Leon. A memory of Chloe and Lion popped up in the protagonist's mind. Elsid said that he might have to sacrifice the woman he loves or the friends he trusts very much. He stated that Leon chose this thorny path himself in order to become special among these people. Thinking about it, Leon noted that this is not a thorny path. A smile appeared on the protagonist's face. He thought this was his chance. Elsid was surprised by his words. Closing his eyes, he said that Leon was right. Leon leaned on his hands and listened intently to Elsid. The sacred weapon declared that now, his journey would begin. Elsid asked me to show him how to use a sword. His face was full of confidence. Elsid said that before starting training, he first needs to know its level. He pointed out that this was Leon's first test. The main character was shocked. It was slowly getting brighter outside. Elsid watched the city as the sun rose over it. He was surprised that the sun had risen so quickly. Angry, Elsid asked why Leon was shaking all over. The main character could barely stand on his feet. Leon said it was morning and he wasn't at the academy yet. He was surprised that the sword was still in his possession. Leon stared at the sword in his hand, looking flustered. The main character noted that if people see it, they will recognize it. Elsid folded his hands in thought. He thought Leon was right. Elsid noted that this is not what you need to worry about right now. 
Holding up his finger, Elsid informed him that there was one way. Surprised, Leon asked him again. Suddenly, the sacred weapon began to shine brightly. Leon watched in shock as something happened to his hand. The main character discovered a tattoo that appeared on his arm. Elsid informed him that Leon would now be able to take the sword out of his hand at any time. Surprised, Lino continued to stare at his hand. Elsid noted that the sword was hidden inside it, so no one would see it. He thought the problem was solved. The shocked protagonist turned his head towards Elsid. Leon asked him what would happen if he went to bed. Elsid claimed that the sword would not interfere with his sleep in any way. He added that Leon wouldn't feel anything. A malicious grin appeared on Elsid's face. The main character believed that now he is like a superman. Elsid said this was no time for jokes. He pointed a finger at Leon. Elsid stated that from this day forward, he would not have any rest. He reminded Leon that they would be training hard. Excited, Leon slid his wooden sword back into its scabbard. He assumed that Elsid would be disappointed with him. Elsid stated that he was not disappointed in him yet. The main character froze in shock. Elsid's face broke into a smile. He said that Leon should try his best, because his dream was at stake. We were shown Leon's grueling training sessions, where he trained his punching technique, did push-ups and ran with a strapped barrel. Elsid noted that the result will also depend not only on him but also on his teacher. A smile appeared on Leon's face. He gripped the sword tightly in his hand. Leon's gaze was full of determination. The main character started his training. Concentrating, Leon swung his sword. With sharp thrusts, he continued to practice his punches. With a face full of determination, Leon pointed his sword down. The main character assumed that he became stronger from Elsid's words. Leon's face was frozen in shock. He was amazed that just a few words could give him so much strength. With a smile on his face, Leon continued his training. The main character believed that only after winning someone's trust, the power boils in his hands. Shouting, Elsid ordered him to stop. Leon was baffled. He turned his head in Elsid's direction. Leon wondered why he should stop, since he hadn't started yet. Elsid said that the sword might not be able to withstand such pressure. Leon didn't know what he was talking about. At the same time, Leon's wooden sword shattered into small splinters. In surprise, he dropped his sword to the ground. Elsid asked if Leon had noticed while holding it in his hands. He said that basic training is good. Elsid was shocked that Leon's swordsmanship level was equal to that of an area bearer. His gaze was fixed on the broken sword. The main character didn't understand what this meant. Closing his eyes, Elsid noted that it didn't matter now. He said that if Leon continued to fight like this, he wouldn't learn anything. Leaning down, Leon extended his hand toward the sword. Elsid said that Leon is still quite mature, he noted that they still have to learn and learn. Elsid folded his hands in thought. He said that Leon's basic swordsmanship was quite good. Elsid believed that all that remained was to train his body to perfection. The main character was surprised by this. He asked if it was a sword swing he needed to train. Elsid's gaze was directed at the surprised Leon. He asked if Leon could wield a sword without hands. We were shown a pumped up body. Elsid stated that the body is the foundation of martial arts. He noted that if you constantly train it, you can achieve a perfect result. Elsid added, so first, Leon has to run. The startled protagonist started running. He asked how long he should do this. Elsid informed him that he must run until he told him to stop. Swiftly, Leon continued to run forward. Elsid added that Leon must achieve the desired result. Elsid said that later they will train their muscles with exercises and one arm and leg stance. Leon's face was in shock. The main character thought that when it comes to running, he is not inferior to anyone. While running, Leon did a lot of exercises. He was thinking that he had never stood on one arm or one leg. Leon reflected that he didn't even know what it was. His face was covered in sweat. He wondered if it would make him stronger. The main character was busy training until sunset. He put his hand to his face, thinking. He noted that so far everything is going exactly according to plan. The guy said that this is a rather specific taste. His finger was pointing at the bowl with Leon's image on it. The guy was talking about an old saying in the East. He said that Leon himself is an empty cup. The guy believed that it was enough just to fill an empty bowl and give him all the basics of swordsmanship and sword fighting techniques. A silhouette of a strong warrior appeared in his mind. The guy thought that then Leon would become something like a master of the sword. He noted that he could not yet allow his successor, who was born 300 years later, to become only a master. A mysterious silhouette of a stranger stood on the face of the defeated dragon. The guy thought Leon should bring the demon king to his knees. The stranger raised his sword above his head. He didn't know how strong the demon king was. The guy guessed that it was roughly equal to half of his strength. Smiling, he pointed his finger forward. Hey hey, why are you so quick? What is it? The happy guy asked. He noted that they have already made a decision, so we can only wait. The guy said that the gates of hell will definitely open for Leon. Very tired after training, the main character began to take a nap in class. Elsid's gaze was serious. 
he turned to Leon. When he woke up, he said he was listening. The teacher was standing directly in front of the blackboard. Leon's face was very haggard. He was thinking that he still had homework to do. The main character thought that too much effort was spent on training with Elsa. Leon was thinking about adding classes to that. Tired, Leon accidentally drew a line in his notebook. He considered it important not to miss a single word of Elsid's training. A smile appeared on Leon's face. Elsid said he knew where they would start their training. He asked Leon what he thought he was missing. An image of a man wielding a sword appeared in his mind. Leon guessed it was swordsmanship or endurance. Elsid reported that this was not the case. He felt that Leon was lacking in mindfulness. The main character was surprised by what he heard. Elsid pointed his index wand at an imaginary board. He told him about a saying that originated from the East. One eye, two legs, three hearts, and four powers, Elsid said. He said that mindfulness is the most important thing, and after it comes the endurance of the body and courage. A pyramid appeared in Leon's mind, indicating the priority of his skills. Else noted that only the latter is power. Astonished, Leon continued to listen to Elsid. Elsid reported on the importance of the force. He added that this means that there are three other main indicators that are more important than strength. The image of a man who longed for knowledge appeared in his mind. Elsid noted that there are also some points where it is not entirely possible to agree with this, but mindfulness is above all. Leon was thinking about mindfulness. He was surprised that he had never heard of mindfulness training. The main character suggested that Elsid means that the movement in his eyeballs will increase the radius of mindfulness. Concentrating, Leon began to turn his head around. Elsid said that now it will become even better. Elsid put a finger to his eye. He asked me to show Leon how useless his eyes were. The main character was shocked. The sun was shining brightly outside. Leon continued to stay in the classroom where the lesson was being held. Leon's gaze was fixed on Elsid. He didn't know how exactly he would show it to him. Elsid headed off into the distance. He asked Leon to look ahead. The main character focused his gaze. Elsid ordered him to focus on the teacher who was standing in front of the blackboard. The teacher came up to the blackboard and started writing something. Elsid asked Leon to record his movements in his memory for 10 seconds. Leon's eyes were strained. After saying something, the teacher pointed the pointer at the blackboard. The main character thought about what he saw in front of him was a dark blue board, a middle-aged man with white hair and green eyes. He was thinking that he had a pointer in his hand. Leon noted that the man's hair is a natural color with a slight gray streak, and his mustache also has gray hair. Elsid's face broke into a grin. He asked Leon to close his eyes in 10 seconds. Elsid asked how many lines were written on the blackboard. Leon looked shocked. The teacher smiled and held up his finger. Leon noted that Elsid had told him to look at the teacher. Elsid reported that he said to focus, but did not say to look only at him. The main character was disappointed with his result. He thought about how he hadn't seen anything but the teacher. Elsid asked if he remembered. He noted that Leon had this board in front of him. His gaze was directed at the teacher, who was facing the blackboard. Elsid suggested that apart from the teacher, Leon can't think of anything else. He didn't think Leon had looked at him for 10 seconds. The disappointed protagonist lowered his head downwards. Elsid asked why he hadn't noticed the board. Taken aback, the main character said that he did not know this. A confident Elst held up a finger saying that he knew. Elsid stated that Leon only looked at what he thought was important. The main character was confused. We were shown the capabilities of the human eye. Elsid pointed out that the eye is a much more wasteful organ than Leon thinks. He said that few people use the full review at all, referring to unnecessary information. Elsid said that Leon should concentrate on the whole field of vision. The main character focused his gaze. Elsid asked to capture everything he sees, the full picture. Leon turned his attention to everything around him. Elsid noted that he needed to relax his eyes, then he would realize how wide he could look. Leon noticed areas that he hadn't noticed before. Elsid noted that he only had 10 seconds to memorize all of this. The main character strained his eyes as hard as he could. Leon thought that sounded absurd. He didn't think that the training of the Holy Sword would be so difficult. Leon knew there was no turning back now. Elst asked me to turn my attention to the top of the board. He said he was giving Leon 10 seconds. The protagonist's eyes were focused on the top of the board. Surprised, Chloe turned her gaze to Leon. She was shocked by what she saw. Outside, the sun was slowly sinking into the sunset. The main character was very exhausted after the grueling training of Elsida. He thought about his eyes and his head, which was cracking like it was about to explode. Tired, Leon put his hands to his aching head. Elsid thought the result was quite good. He pointed to Leon's tired eyes. Elsid reported that the eye fatigue was caused by dryness. He noted that this was because he was straining them more than usual. Elsid added that the headache is different. Tormented, Leon turned his attention to Elsid. Elsid reported that Leon had awakened a function that he hadn't used for a long time. 
His body was wrapped in chains. Else had said that this led to the pain of the brain, unaccustomed to changes. He added that this does not apply to muscles. The tired protagonist started to rub his eyes. Leon asked if it was a muscle ache. Else had noted that this was a metaphorical way of speaking. He stated that in truth, the brain does not feel pain. Else had added that this is not what it sounds like in reality, he asked Leon just to understand one thing. The boys were walking down the corridor of Leon's school. Else had said that now we need to train more. Motivated, Leon raised his hand in the air. He thought Else's words were correct. Else had mentioned that there was a candle holder hanging in the corridor, and he asked how many candles were on it. Leon's eyes were fixed on the candle holder. He assumed there were two candles in it. Else had claimed that there were three candles in it, calling Leon stupid. Else had reported a boy next to a girl who passed three seconds ago. He asked if he was wearing glasses or not. Leon's gaze was fixed on this boy. The main character suggested that this is so. Else had asked if he was wearing a tie. Leon was taken aback by his words. Lights were on in the windows of the house. Else had asked if the light in the twelfth window was on. The main character suggested that it seemed so. Else had wondered if he remembered. An excited Leon stated that it was turned on. Smoke was slowly coming out of the chimney of the house. We were shown the door that led to Leon's room. Else stated that it was turned off. The exhausted protagonist put his hands to his head. He said he wanted to sleep. Leon's eyes were watering from the exertion. Else had noted that it was not bad for the first time. He said that if Leon trains constantly, he will develop a habit. The main character was lying in his bed. He asked if Else had would give him a break if he asked. Else had said he wouldn't give it to me. Tired, Leon asked how much longer he would have to suffer like this. The main character noted that it's been a long time since he felt so weak as today. With confidence on his face, Else had folded his hands. He said that getting used to it means adapting to something new. Else had reported that there was a limit to all their training. The exhausted protagonist put his hand on his head. Else had pointed out that repeated training also has its advantages, but the biggest problem is that Leon's body can show false results. The protagonist wondered if his body could lie to him. Continuing his story, Else had spread out his hands. He said that then it will mean that he is used to such training. Else had believed that this was why Leon needed to train in several ways alternately. A memory of his physical training session popped up in Leon's mind. He talked about jumping or standing on one leg. The main character asked if this was the same reason why Else had said to train the body. Else had reported that this was so. His gaze was directed at Leon. He said that he needed to learn about its weaknesses. The main character continued to listen to Elsid. Elsid noted that people, regardless of how much they train and how they live, their bones and muscles, the nervous system, develop differently for everyone. We were shown a man who catches fish and a guy who was looking for a wolf and a flock of sheep. Elsid said that this was the reason why he came up with three main criteria, the sailor's sense of balance, the hunter's sense of government, and the shepherd's superior eyesight. The main character thought that he understood his words. Leon's face was full of thoughts. He believed that the basics of learning were to use strengths and compensate for weaknesses. Leon thought that this was what Elsid was driving at. Elsid noted that Leon's strong stats were endurance and intense training, which was the foundation of swordsmanship. Elsid said that other skills were also needed. A memory of Leon's sword training popped up in his mind. Elsid noted that the weaknesses were the form, frozen during the repetition of the same thing. He added that to put it simply, it is the lack of physical and mental flexibility of aura fencing. Surprised, the protagonist got up from the bed. He was amazed that his weaknesses were flexibility and aura swordsmanship. With a smirk on his face, Elsid folded his hands. He said that after all, swordsmanship is a way of handling a sword. A silhouette of a guy practicing with a weapon appeared in his mind. Elsid stated that if Leon can safely apply basic skills depending on the situation, then it is fencing. He noted that the sword itself is also incredibly strong, but that's a theory. A smile appeared on the protagonist's face. Elsid leaned against Leon's forehead. He asked if she could teach him all the basics of battle. At his words, Leon was taken aback. He said he didn't think so. Elsid's eyes grew serious. He assumed that the guy named Leon had used the aura skill to defeat him. A memory of the battle with Leon popped up in Leon's mind. Elsid reported that it is impossible to use it correctly without special training. He didn't think Lion was a simple guy to use him. A silhouette of Leon standing with a wooden sword appeared in his mind. Elsid mentioned that he would teach him aura skills after he graduated from the academy. Elsid asked Leon to focus on his training. The main character remembered Lion holding out his hand. Elsid asked if Leon would like to defeat him as soon as possible. Motivated, Leon clenched his fist, saying, That's right. He added that he was eager to do so. Closing his eyes, Elsid sighed. He said that this is still not enough. Leon didn't know what that meant. A memory of his teacher appeared in his mind. Elsid noted that if Leon constantly trains, he will get used to it. 
He said that today the main character has completed an internship, and as soon as he learns to see more extensively, Elsid said that at this rate, they will pass the entire training course. His face was full of confidence. After Elsid's words, Leon was filled with doubts. He was thinking about how bad he was feeling. Closing his eyes, Elsid continued his speech. The main character asked about the next training sessions. Elsid noted that it was better for him not to know about them now. He added that if Leon dares to cheat, a malicious grin appeared on Elsid's face. He stated that starting tomorrow, if he made mistakes, he would be punished. The main character's face was shocked. He was startled by the words about punishment. With a smirk on his face, Elsid continued to stare at the startled Leon. He noted that he didn't want to worry about nothing. Elsid said that this will be a great incentive for him to become strong as soon as possible. Thinking about it, Elsid held up a finger and said that Leon's psyche was good, but he needed strength in spite of himself, so he decided to push him a little. Sweat gradually began to drip down Leon's face as he became agitated. He knew that Elsid was right. Leon didn't think it would be wise for him to make another mistake tomorrow. The chief thought that if this honey is really effective, then he will not mind such punishments. His expression was full of uncertainty. He believed that by doing so, he would be able to raise his power level. After being motivated, Leon turned his head in Elsid's direction and held up a finger. Elsid asked him what he thought about trying it out. Leon said he was in business. A powerful aura filled his body. Due to this, he started to cry out in pain. After trying to control his aura, Leon collapsed into his bed. Elsid was amazed that he lasted five seconds. He said it was the first time he had done this, so he couldn't control the force. Leon's entire body was covered in soot. Elsid noted that the next time will be weaker. A smile appeared on his face. He said that every time Leon tried, his strength would increase, so he should try hard. Elsid stated that they will start new training sessions starting tomorrow. Startled, Leon clutched at the sheet on his bed. He was amazed that it was just an attempt. The sun began to rise smoothly over the city. The main character started his training. Leon started to train his vision concentration again. After that, he started strength training. On the roof of the house, he watched a small flock of pigeons. Elsid asked him how many pigeons were sitting on the roof of the dorm. The main character reported that there were ten of them. Elsid asked him which pigeon came first. Leon noted that the first was the sixth. Elsid asked how many pigeons were sitting on the window. Leon put a hand to his head, lost in thought. The main character noted that only one crow was sitting, and there were no pigeons there. A smile appeared on his face. Elsid noted that Leon's result was not bad, because he began to focus his attention. He praised Leon for his efforts. Elsid was glad that this moment had finally arrived. The main character's face was overflowing with happiness. He couldn't believe it was true. Leon raised his hand in joy. Elsid said that he could take a short break today. Leon was glad that he was taking his first break in a month. Leon turned to the happy protagonist. When Leon heard him, he lowered his head. Turning in his direction, he noticed that they hadn't seen each other for a long time. Behind him was an indignant Chloe, who put her hands on her hips. Leon thought about how they hadn't seen each other since she started training with Elsid. He remembered that Chloe had tried to talk to him. Putting his hand on his side, Leon noted that they should meet in the hall immediately after lunch. He said that he was asked to call Leon. Leon put his hands in his pockets and said, thought you'd probably be here. The main character was surprised by this. Leon crouched under the shade of a tree, thinking. He noted that a month had passed and Leon had never wanted to fight him. At that moment, Leon wondered if he had given up. The sun's glare fell on the main character's face. Leon noticed that looking at his face, he saw some changes in it. His gaze was full of seriousness. The tattoo on Leon's arm shone white. He asked Leon if he was serious. Leon smiled and said it was true. Images of people who refused to fight him sprang up in his mind. Leon said that the faces of people who think they can't beat him are very different from Leon's. A faint smile appeared on the main character's face. Leaning over to Leon, he declared that he was good. Leon asked if that was the only reason he came here. He noted that if this is all, then let him leave. The shadow of the tree fell across Leon's face. Smiling, he noticed that Leon was as cold as ever. Leon said he hadn't asked for such a thing in a long time. He asked Leon to talk to him again. Leon leaned in and asked him who he thought he was. Leon noted that he was only asking for 10 minutes. Leon scratched his head in thought. After making his decision, he sat down next to Leon. The children watched the clouds moving slowly across the sky. Leon asked if he had heard about the rumor that he wasn't a commoner. Leon turned his head in his direction, lost in thought. A grin spread across his face. As he continued, he raised his hand. Leon asked if he needed to lie. He didn't think it was like Leon was hiding it. After that, Leon wondered if he was expecting special treatment. Leon said that wasn't what he meant. His face was full of seriousness. He said that he was no longer a newcomer to the academy, and quite seriously in his words. Leon noted that he was hiding his identity. The main character was confused. 
Leon smiled and told him not to worry about it. Wyon asked him if he understood that he only accepted the challenge because he was a student at the academy. Memories of training fights with Leon popped up in his mind. The main character noted that he understands this. He understood the logic of what if Lion wasn't paying attention. In his mind's eye, an image of Lion surrounded by a crowd of academy students appeared. The main character believed that Lion could just contact him and not attract too much attention. He suggested that this would be the right and favorable decision for him. At that moment, Leon became alert. He thought that as the winner of Lion, he was loyal to it. Leon thought that unlike him, he wanted to. Due to the wind, Lion's hair started to flutter. He said that this time is now over. The main character was taken aback by his words. Outraged, Leon asked why. Excited, Lion said he wasn't going to stop there. Getting to his feet, Lion offered him one last fight. He noted that they will fight with swords and not on wooden sticks. Leon looked surprised. Turning his gaze on him, Lion declared that if he won, he would become his vassal. From the experience, drops of sweat began to appear on the main character's face. He was amazed that Lion would challenge him. Leon pointed out that it looked like a gamble. The sun was shining brightly in the sky. The main character asked where there was a guarantee that he would keep his promise. He pointed out that it wasn't a magic contract, but just a verbal contract. Lion stated that if there was another person in front of him, this would be the case. He reported that the person in front of him had pride and honor. Lion doubted that he would be able to leave just like that. Surprised, the protagonist raised his hand. He asked if Lion had insulted him or given him a compliment. Lion stated that he believes in Leon's words. The main character was moved by his words. Lion said that despite everything, he will be on his side. A smile appeared on Leon's face. He asked him again about how if he lost, he would become his vassal. Lion reported that this was the case. Leon smiled with all his might and pointed a finger at himself. After that, the main character asked what would happen if he won. Then, he froze, waiting for an answer. A small smile appeared on Lion's face. He stated that in that case, he would do whatever Leon asked without jeopardizing his family and honor. His expressions were brimming with confidence. Lion noted that he will do everything except pass on secret skills, techniques and methods of teaching fencing. Motivated, Leon asked if he could set a date for the battle. Turning around, Lion waved his hand and said that as soon as he was ready, he could let him know. He said that he would find a place and then asked to warn him three days before the battle. The wind was raging, and the leaves were being gently blown away by the wind. Thinking about it, the guy spread his hands. He was glad that this moment had finally arrived. The guy was talking about Leon, who was chosen at the whim of the Holy Sword, and Prince Lion, who claimed the throne. There was a flicker of excitement on his face. He said that they would fight again. The main character's face betrayed his fear. After hearing Leon's words, Elsid was shocked by what he heard. His face was filled with emotion. He was amazed that Leon was afraid. Elsid noted that recently he was determined to win, but now he decided to give up. Leon put a hand to his nose, thinking. He stated that this was not the case. The main character noted that he is very strong. He was concerned about the future of Leon. After saying this, Elsid fell into a stupor. Leon's eyes were fixed on his hand. He said that a month ago, his training seemed very hard, but he began to feel like he was getting stronger. Clenching his hand into a fist, the protagonist stared down. Elsid's gaze was filled with doubt. Closing his eyes, he said that even though no one knew about it, Leon didn't have to worry too much. Surprised, Leon asked if this was true. Elsid reported that spiritual power, fullness, is different from physical strength. It's fine that you didn't notice it because you've never used it, right? Elsid asked. The main character was taken aback by his words. Elsid asked him not to worry because he would help him with this. He pointed out that Leon wanted to pass the endurance test. Hearing this, Leon's face broke into an uncertain smile. He said it was true. Thinking about it, Elsid said that he would look forward to it. After that, Elsid spread his hands in anticipation. He was sure that something very intriguing was going to happen. A grin appeared on his face. Elsid asked if Leon was going to panic again. When the main character heard this, he was taken aback. The afternoon sun was shining brightly in the sky. The man asked everyone to rearrange themselves in order. In his hands, he held a list of private owners. The man said that those who are unable to participate due to health reasons should step aside and say their names in order to make room for other students. The main character was standing in the ranks of the participants. He was thinking about the endurance test, where he finished ninth last year because of his physical fitness. Leon noted that despite this, the children of high-ranking nobles won prizes. A memory of the winner of the endurance test popped up in his mind. Leon was thinking that in addition to Origin, they also had special stamina potions that would boost their strength stats in a matter of seconds. Nearby, Elsid asked what place Lyons had taken. The main character reported that he won first place. The sacred weapon's gaze was directed at Lion. He noted that Lion shows that he trained very hard. Elsid said that he should not be compared with those who only boast of their origin. 
we were shown the distance of the running platform. The main character said that even if the distance is small, you need to run two laps. He noted that one circle is 400 meters and two 800. Leon stated that Lyon's last record was 1 minute and 20 seconds. Thinking about it, Elsid asked what Leon's time record was. Taken aback, Leon reported that his record was 1 minute and 40 seconds. Elsid was surprised at the 20 second difference. He was curious. Elsid pointed out that Leon wouldn't try until he knew. His face was full of excitement. Elsid asked him not to worry. He emphasized that this was in the past. Elsid noted that now he had him, and Leon wasn't what he used to be. The protagonist's gaze was full of hope. He asked Elsid to believe in him. Having concentrated, the guys prepared for the race. Shouting, the man announced the start of the race. Bracing himself, Leon began to run. His speed shocked the students sitting next to him. Leon was shocked by what he saw. The main character was rushing forward with all his might. Due to the fact that he was moving at an unrealistic speed, Leon almost hit a person standing next to him. Surprised, the student said his name. The man announced Leon's result, which was 1 minute 29 seconds. Leon's face was in shock. Taken aback, the man approached the tired Leon. He asked if he had taught him how to use the aura. The main character noted that this is not the case. Surprised, the man wondered if he could check it out. Reaching out a hand in his direction, Leon agreed with him. The man started checking the main character for the presence of aura. The main character was shocked by the way they test the use of aura. He knew that if they recognized and sensed the aura, the contestant would be immediately disqualified. When he finished checking, the man said that Leon really didn't use aura. He was extremely surprised by its changes in a month. The man asked how Leon had trained. Embarrassed, the main character put his hand to his head. He said that he only trained the basics. Leon assumed that the man had noticed an increase in his stats. The man stared thoughtfully at the documents. He noted that Leon's training was intense. The man was shocked that the main character managed to become so strong in such a short period of time. He didn't think it mattered so much now. The student's eyes were focused on the confused Leon. At that moment, Leon was wary. Tired after the race, Leon decided to sit down. He asked Elsid what was going on. A smile appeared on his face. Elsid wondered gleefully if he had mentioned it. The startled protagonist asked him to stop laughing and explained to him what was going on. Elsid pointed a finger at Leon before answering. He started talking about what Leon should know first. Elsid asked where the main character thinks physical strength comes from. His gaze was directed at the male commander. Leon asked if it was muscle. Else pointed out that this was not the case. The main character continued to stare at the man's toned body. Else had stated that most of the physical training methods in this world were to increase one's own muscles and their density. He noted that this is only half the way to achieve maximum results. We were shown the human nervous system. Else had asked if Leon was familiar with the concept of the nervous system. He said that muscles also have nerves, which, with the development of the nerve, determine the limit of muscle strength. Elsid has demonstrated this in his own example. He stated that the reason why physical strength does not depend on the visible effect is due to the difference in muscle nerves. The main character thought that he had never heard of such a thing and even the academy did not talk about it. Here was an example of a physically strong body. Elsid noted that muscle density is determined from birth, and there is also a clear limit to their development and size. He said that Leon had trained them almost to the limit. The main character's face betrayed that he didn't understand anything. Elsid noted that he was now training his muscular nerves. With uncertainty in his voice, Leon said that he understood a little. His gaze was focused on his bicep. The main character was wondering how much his neuromuscular system had developed. Leon noted that he had never trained his nerves. He asked if it was even real. Elsid stated that there are his punishments for this. Leon's face was filled with indignation. He was shocked by this. The student's eyes were focused on the screaming Leon. Elsid said that everything he had gained in 10 years, he got in a couple of months because the pain tearing the nerve endings eventually bore fruit. We were shown how Leon's body was shot through with intense pain. The main character thought about the pain he went through for his mistakes, he was shocked that it was not in vain. In his mind, Leon assumed that she was the reason for the training of his neuromuscular system. Outraged, Leon asked why Elsid hadn't told him about this earlier. He noted that the reason is even greater concern for Leon. Hearing this, the main character was thrown into shock. A memory of focusing training popped up in his mind. Else noted that training with attention was the key to such training. Leon thought back to how hard he'd tried to focus. Else had stated that if Leon had known about this earlier, his attentiveness would have noticeably decreased. He asked if there was anything else Leon could focus on. After Elsid's words, Leon fell into a stupor. Sacred Weapon said he doubted that. Elsid smiled and folded his hands. He stated that Leon should just say thank you to him. The main character's face was filled with hatred and malice. With a smirk on his face, Elsid reported that he was only doing what the Holy Sword was supposed to do. 
He noted that he hadn't coached anyone for a long time, so he was happy with his results. In Leon's mind, an image of Elsid watching the sacred weapon appeared. The main character was shocked by the fact that Elsid is a sacred sword. A memory of the monument that was dedicated to the hero popped up in his mind. In his mind, Leon assumed that Elsid was a part of the soul of the hero Rodrigo. He wondered if the great Rodrigo was actually a villain and not a hero. The joyful students were shouting someone's name. Their eyes were focused on Lion running ahead of them. The young man noted that Lion, as always, is amazing. He was amazed that he managed to break his previous year's record. A grin appeared on Lion's face. The main character was confused. The moment Leon walked up to the results board, he saw that he was ranked second. He noted that he could not beat Lion. Elsid felt that he was in a great hurry as it had only been a month. The main character clenched his hand into a fist. Elsid said that the time has not yet come, so we need to train hard. Leon said that he knows and understands this very well. His gaze was directed at Lion, who was surrounded by a crowd of academy students. Leon thought about how they were in first and ninth place. In his mind, he knew that Lion was still in first place, and he was still in second. After getting motivated, Leon clenched his fist. He believed that all was not lost yet and he would definitely win. The stars in the night sky were not obscured by clouds. While resting, Leon put his hands under his head. He asked Elsid what kind of training session he was going to have tomorrow. Thinking about it, Elsid asked him to wait. He noted that they had almost perfected their attentiveness. Putting a finger to his chin, Elsid said that now we need to take care of our physical abilities. He believed that they needed to put this into practice. The main character thought it was even more difficult. Elsid said that was why he was asking Leon to take his time. At that moment, he was surprised by his words. Interested, Leon turned his gaze in Elsid's direction. The main character asked if he could teach him swordsmanship. Elsid said it was too early to think about that. The sacred weapon stated that Leon needed to learn how to use aura first. An image of Leon appeared in his mind, his body shrouded in an aura. Elsid noted that it is enough to apply basic skills to reach a certain level. Focusing, the protagonist continued to listen to him. Els stated that martial arts without the use of aura are just movements. He noted that at first glance it seems complicated, but in reality it is too simple. Elsid thought Leon was too predictable and his movements and intentions were easy to read. In the main character's mind, the memory of the defeat in the duel with Lion surfaced. Elsid reported that the strongest swordsman is Lion. He asked if Leon was ready to take him down now. Leon's face was filled with confusion. Elsid said that he needed to learn how to use his strengths. Leon recalled the results of the race, where he finished second and Lion first. Elsid noted that the sword forged by long efforts is very strong. Pondering, the main character continued to listen to him. Elsid reported that as long as Leon's skills level up, even the strongest lion won't be able to defeat him. Elsid let out a sigh as he finished his story. Sacred Weapon noted that Leon would need some hands-on experience. Elsid asked if Leon thought that Leon wouldn't have stronger enemies in the future. The main character imagined two armed bandits standing in front of him. Leon leaned over to Elsid and said that such bandits usually lived in the slums, he believed that there were no such things in the academy. Elsid said he needed to think about it. While in his thoughts, Leon headed down the corridor of the academy's dorm. He was thinking of a serious conversation with Elst. Suddenly, the main character heard someone talking about him. The youth asked if it was Commoner Leon. Three students appeared in front of him, their gazes filled with hostility. His eyes were fixed on the gold button on one of the men's clothes. Leon realized what he saw when he saw the distinctive markings on the school uniform. The main character thought that these guys were students of the elite class. The youth's face was filled with hatred for Leon. He didn't understand how such a tramp came in second place. The enraged youth pointed his finger at Leon. He believed that the instructor was wrong about something. The young man noted that they could not be deceived. Surprised, Elsid noted that 300 years had passed and these guys were the same. With a smile on his face, Leon spread his hands. He said that if they are not satisfied with the leaderboard, they can go to the curator. Because of this, the main character started laughing hard, pointing his finger at the enraged elite disciples. The youth asked how such a commoner dared to be impertinent to them. The startled students of the academy watched the entire situation. The elite students didn't know how Leon managed to cheat. They thought it was strange that Leon, who was ranked ninth, had suddenly moved up to second. Interested students assumed that he had only just reached his true potential. The guy asked what kind of family Leon was from. The bewildered protagonist felt that there was no point in arguing with them. Leon was pretty sure he didn't need to mess with them right now. In his mind's eye, he imagined them towering over him. Leon thought they were just annoying bruises who wanted to show their power. When they reached the landing, the stranger asked them to calm down. Holding up a finger, he said they were making too much noise. The stranger began to walk slowly down the stairs. He noted that even if Leon is a commoner, absolutely all students in this academy are equal. 
Alcid's gaze was fixed on this stranger. His face was full of confidence. The stranger stated that their job as nobles was to give such commoners a chance to stand out a little. A small smile appeared on his face. He asked if that was true. The elite students agreed with Elmont's words. The youth declared that a commoner would always be a commoner. Hearing this, Leon was a little taken aback. Elsa didn't think they were smart. He was amazed that they were now bragging about their origins. The main character reported that in front of them was Elmont, who was the second son of the Count of Bourbon. Leon pointed out that he was in second place before him. A memory of last year's endurance test popped up in his mind. Leon guessed that Elmont was deeply hurt by the fact that he had lost his seat. The main character imagined how the second son of the Count is beside himself with rage. He noted that Elmont could not overtake Lyon all these years. Alcid stated that despite this, the second son of the Count enjoys his status. With a smirk on his face, Elmont appeared in front of Leon. The second son of the Count said that he was sorry that their first meeting went like this. Elmont suggested that Leon was thinking about being unfair to him and not understanding. The Count's second son will extend his hand to Leon. The Count's second son said that if he agreed, he could follow his advice. The protagonist's gaze was directed at Elmont's hand. Leon lowered his head in thought. He said he wanted to hear it first. The elite disciples were shocked by Leon's audacity. Elmont's face was full of seriousness. He suggested that Leon go through individual competitions one on one under the supervision of an instructor. After saying that, Leon became alert. He didn't understand what the Count's second son was talking about at all. His face was covered in beads of sweat. While thinking about this, the protagonist clenched his fists. He thought that the offer itself was tempting, but it was clearly an unfair accusation against him. His gaze was directed towards the mocking elite disciples. According to Elmont, the fact that I didn't use aura means, Leon continued to think. The main character believed that they themselves wanted to use the aura. Closing his eyes, Leon continued to think about the situation. He knew that if he ignored it now, everyone would think he was a cheater who decided to run away with his tail between his legs. There were elite students standing around him, bursting with laughter. The main character suggested that if he accepts the offer, then Elmont will want to somehow harm him. Leon looked around at the standing crowd of people. In the crowd, he noticed Lyon watching him. The main character turned his head towards Lyon. He thought it was obvious that Lyon could help him and get him out of this mess. After that, he gritted his teeth. His face was full of emotion. He believed that help from an opponent is no different from a strong insult and shame. Having calmed down, Leon accepted the challenge of the Count's second son. A grin spread across Elmont's face. The Count's second son asked if he accepted his offer. The main character stated that this is so. Leon pointed out that instructor Helmut would be present and it would all end in one day. Helmut was waiting for the contest to start. Leon's face was full of determination. The main character stated that if he wins, then Elmont must swear that he will not doubt his abilities. He asked if the Count's second son was prepared to accept his terms. Elmont put a finger to his chin, lost in thought. During their conversation, the instructor was picking at his ear. Leon was sure that if Helmut was watching them, no one would cheat. Elmont's gaze was directed towards the main character. The Count's second son said he accepted his terms. A malicious grin spread across Elmont's face. He didn't think it mattered who the instructor was. In his mind, the second son of the Count wanted to make Leon embarrass himself in front of everyone and let everyone know his true strength. Once in bed, Leon was talking about the strange expression on Elmont's face. The main character was surprised that he would get practical experience so quickly. Elsid's face broke into a smile. He thought it was just luck. Holy Weapon put his hands on his side in thought. Leon asked Elsid if he could win. Leon said that he doesn't know how to fight an opponent who uses aura. After hearing this, Elsid was confused. Suddenly, the sacred weapon was inspired. He asked if he could actually show Leon this. The excited protagonist put his finger to his palm. He asked what exactly Elsid wanted to show him. Confident Elsid said that this is the easiest way. A magic screen appeared in front of Leon's face. This screen displayed his stats. While reading all this, the main character didn't understand what it was. Leon's gaze was directed at Elsid, who was standing next to him. The sacred weapon reported that this was his current level. Elsid noted that there are also Elmont's abilities. After his words, Leon began to study the abilities of the second son of the Count. Elsid said that all this was written by him, although not quite objectively. Leon asked why Elmont was so weak. Sacred Weapon stated that if this is the second son of an Earl, it's not uncommon for them to use potions. An image of Elmont resorting to various potions appeared in Leon's mind. The main character thought that Elmont developed his strength through hard training. Putting his hands on his side, Elsid informed that if Leon took a lot of the potion but couldn't digest it, it would just become a nutrient for him. Sacred Weapon noted that even the intense training was nothing compared to his. Elsid reported a physical ability that can be increased without using aura, Itzy rank, 99, he stated that this is the limit. 
we were shown that E99 for the body is the maximum. Elsid pointed out that with his help, Leon would be able to jump over this wall by his own efforts. Leon's mind was filled with memories of intense training sessions where he ran with various elements of exercise, pulled weights, and took second place in an endurance test. Elsid spread his hands as he continued his story. He noted that even without the aura, Leon would be strong and thus he would be able to respond to them in full. The sacred weapon's gaze was directed at Leon. Thinking about it, the main character put his hand to his chin. He supposed he shouldn't worry about his physical abilities right now. Thought Leon agreed with him. Elsid's gaze was full of seriousness. After that, Leon didn't doubt his actions in the slightest. He was sure that it was time to climb up, not down. The main character was filled with hatred when he thought of the Count's second son. He didn't think he could lose to someone like Elmont. Leon asked why his rank was like this. On the screen, it was written that his appearance and occupation as a hero who does not yet know how to use a sword. Elsid said it was just too early for him yet. The main character arrived at the venue of the competition. Leon walked slowly forward. His eyes were fixed on Helmut. The instructor said that he had come. Helmut had a smile on his face. Leon's face was full of confidence. He was thinking that a lot had changed in a month. Closing his eyes, the instructor informed him that if Leon tried to do something reckless, he would have to stop him. Helmut didn't think he was like that. The instructor asked if he was right. The main character was taken aback by his words. He wasn't sure he understood Helmut. Moving forward, the instructor waved his hand. Helmut asked Leon to think with his head. The instructor pointed out that he was leaving it up to Leon. The main character was surprised by his words. A wicked smile appeared on Helmut's face. He asked Leon to show those pathetic worms who was in charge. Helmut asked if he understood. Leon's face betrayed the seriousness of his actions. The academy instructor headed to the test hall. The main character went to the entrance of the hall. His gaze was directed at the youth who had addressed him. A grin spread across his face. The young man was amazed that such a baboon was his rival. He thought Leon was too young. The main character turned to Helmut. He said he wanted to start right now. The instructor said that he could do whatever he wanted. The main character appeared before his rival. Helmut announced the contestants. The instructor said that in his presence they would fight each other for their honor. Helmut turned to Jeff Heinrich. The instructor asked him what he wanted to get out of this match. A grin spread across Jeff's face. Henry declared that Leon would have to confess his sins. The protagonist's eyes were filled with anger. After that, Helmut turned to Leon. The instructor asked him what he wanted to get out of this match. Closing his eyes, Leon said that he wanted to determine his strength and test his abilities, as well as understand the results of training. After his words, the instructor started clapping his hands. Helmut asked me to start the fight. Having prepared, the guys began their battle. Among the spectators in the stands were Lion and a surprise Chloe. Lion was amazed that even a wooden sword could cut through flesh when using aura. He thought that in this case, it would be a problem for Leon. The protagonist's gaze was directed at Jeff. Elsid asked if he could show him this guy's abilities. Leon said he was fine as it was. Leon's eyes were brimming with confidence. He didn't think it mattered how strong Jeff was, because he was just Elmont's pawn. The main character was sure that there was no reason to use Elsid to defeat Jeff. Concentrating, Leon charged into the battle. Enraged, Henry attacked him. The main character was thinking that now Jeff is using a diagonal cut that cuts from the top right to the bottom left side. His gaze was focused on the attacking Heinrich. Leon put his sword to his face, thinking hard. He thought it was too obvious a trajectory that could be a ruse. The main character continued to watch as Jeff raced towards him. Leon was thinking that as long as Henry was moving, Jeff's sword was pointed at Leon's head. He didn't understand why Henry was so slow. The main character froze in anticipation of further actions. Leon dodged and threw his punch at Heinrich. Everyone present was thrown into shock. Jeff's face was marked by Leon's punch. The main character turned his head towards Heinrich. He couldn't believe that he would end the match like this. After being hit by it, Jeff collapsed to the floor. His face was filled with anger. Wounded, Henry tried to stand up. He told Leon not to think that he had defeated him with just one punch. Jeff said he was lucky. After that, Henry was furious. He asked Leon to fight him again. After Jeff's words, Helmut turned his head in his direction and informed him that he had lost and the rules should not be broken. The main character completely agreed with him. After which, Henry was baffled. With a smirk on his face, Jeff pointed his finger at Leon. Henry said that Leon, a commoner, should not be conceited. Concentrating, Jeff said that he was going to be serious now, and this time Leon wasn't going to get away with it. Leon's startled gaze was directed at Elsid. The sacred weapon informed him that he shouldn't defeat it in one hit. The instructor announced the start of the match. The main character's sword was held to his face. Elsid noted that this was Leon's first battle against a man with an aura. He thought it might be a great practice in combat. 
Elsid asked Leon to let him know if he wanted to know about his power. Leon's face was full of confidence. He agreed with Elst. In rage, Jeff lunged at Leon. The main character blocked Henry's attack. His gaze was full of seriousness. Leon was thinking that Jeff's hands, feet, and pupil movements had become much faster. Confident, Henry continued his attacks. Leon noticed that his movements were different. Elsid's gaze was directed in Leon's direction. He said that since Leon had seen Jeff's changes, he needed to know what would happen next. The main character continued to fend off Henry's increased attacks. During one of the attacks, Jeff grazed Leon's shoulder. After being hit by it, Leon's clothes were damaged. The main character was sure that Heinrich used aura. A malicious grin spread across Jeff's face. Leon knew that even so, he had to predict his movements. Enraged, Henry ordered him to stop avoiding his attacks. Leon's entire body was covered in abrasions. Elsid said that it was not worth trying to attack him now because he did not have enough experience to change the course of the battle. The sacred weapon noted that Leon's stamina was important right now. The main character understood that even if Jeff had enhanced his physical abilities with aura, he had his limitations. Henry attacked Leon again. At that moment, he saw an open area for Jeff's attack. The main character delivered a powerful blow to Heinrich's leg. Jeff's face was furious. After Leon's attack, he jumped out of the way. An exasperated Henry called him a pathetic worm and stated that he should have just gotten rid of him in the beginning. After which, Jeff started screaming. He said that Leon wouldn't be able to beat him with such a punch right now. Henry's face was filled with shock. The main character launched many strong attacks on his body. As a result, Henry was defeated. Elsid turned to Leon. He noted that everything had happened just as Elsid had said. Leon noted that to practice fast attacks, you need to attack a moving target. Henry, beaten, raised his hands in the air. He announced that he was giving up. A delighted Helmut announced the winner of the match. Leon's friends were delighted to hear this. Elmont's face was filled with rage. Night fell on the street. The enthusiastic young man asked if the boys had seen the fight between Leon and Elmont's gang. The children were overwhelmed with positive emotions. He was amazed that Leon could fight so well. A memory of the duel surfaced in the young man's mind. He thought of the first one as being with Jeff. The guy had heard that Elmont's gang had lost to Leon, one by one. He noted that now only Elmont remained. The enraged second son of the Count watched the defeated member of his gang. The young man believed that Elmont would not lose to Leon. The main character was walking along the corridor of the academy. Elsid found them all boring. Sacred Weapon reported that it was swordsmanship mixed with martial arts, but they were useless. Elsid believed that even with the use of aura, they were the same. A look of excitement crossed Leon's face. The main character noted that today will be a little different. Leon was heading towards the entrance where the competition was taking place. Elsid was glad that Leon's opponent would finally be Elmont himself. He asked Leon to be vigilant, as it was very important right now. The main character appeared before the second son of the Count. Elmont's body was filled with an aura. Leon's gaze was full of determination. Elsid assumed that the second son of the Count decided to pretend in front of the public and act very confident. Leon agreed with him. Helmut, standing between the guys, explained the rules of the match to them. The main character understood that when using Aura, Elmont's physical abilities would be higher than his. Leon was thinking that the second son of the Count had been ranked second for a very long time. While studying Elmont's stats, Leon was struck by his secret swordsmanship. The main character counted. That Elmont still has it on the first level, so you don't have to worry. He thought that the unknown ability of the second son of the Count was the most suspicious of all. His gaze was directed at the enraged Elmont. He suggested that Rodrigo's method would not help here. A grin appeared on the Earl's second son's face. Elmont didn't expect it to be his turn. Closing his eyes, Leon asked if this was true. His gaze was full of confidence. The main character noted that he thought about interesting things, but here the boredom is mortal. After Leon's words, Elmont was furious. The main character believed that this was his ideal victory in front of Leon itself. Leon's friends' faces were agitated. Leon thought his physical abilities were better now, but considering Elmont's aura, they were a little lower. In his hands, Leon held a wooden sword. His gaze was focused on the concentrated Elmont. Leon believed that if the second son of the Count had a good aura around the sword, it would be dangerous to block its attacks with a wooden sword. The main character's eyes narrowed. Leon supposed he should avoid Elmont's direct attacks. Helmut announced the start of the match. Leon was shocked after Elmont landed his first punch. A cut appeared on his face. He assumed that the Count's second son had touched him with his aura. Elmont's wooden sword was pointed in Leon's direction. The main character believed that this wasn't a simple attack. Leon concentrated and prepared to attack. He was thinking that the basic speed attack was too fast. Elmont's body was filled with an aura. Even if he says I'm a commoner, is it because he's a direct descendant from the nobility? Leon kept thinking. 
bracing himself, Leon placed the sword against his body. A grin appeared on the Count's second son's face. Elmont said they deserved it. He continued to laugh, pointing a finger at Leon. He stated that losing to a commoner like Leon was equal to disgrace. The Count's second son remarked that even more so to a man like Leon. Elmont stated that if he still wanted to obey him, then he was willing to forgive him. Leon's face was filled with anger. Closing his eyes, the Count's second son informed him that if Leon stood his ground, he would make him regret what he had done. The main character rushed in his direction. Startled, Elmont jumped out of the way. A cut appeared on his face from Leon's punch. The Count's second son was filled with rage. Elmont was amazed that he continued to believe in his infamous skills, yet still dared to turn up his nose in front of everyone. A small smile appeared on Leon's face. He asked the Count's second son if that was the case. Elsid was shocked by Elmont's words. Enraged, Elsid turned to Leon. A vicious grin appeared on Sacred Weapon's face. Elsid noted that the wretched worm had just blurted out that his technique was a disgrace. The main character was confused. Elsid's gaze was directed at the startled Leon. Sacred Weapons reported rumors that the rivers and mountains had changed in 10 years. Elsid noted that 300 years later, a youngster dared to insult him, he considered it unacceptable. The protagonist's face was filled with excitement. He was struck by Elmont's sinister aura. With a menacing grin on his face, the Count's second son continued to stare at Leon. Sacred Weapon asked if the main character was talking about Elmont. Taken aback, Leon said it was true. Enraged, Elsid claimed that insulting the teacher was equal to insulting all of his students. The Earl's second son still had a smirk on his face. Sacred Weapon reported that until the match was over, Elmont's teeth should be knocked out. After hearing this, the main character was confused. He was surprised that one or two teeth wouldn't be enough. Startled, Leon grabbed his sword with both hands. He believed in knocking out as many teeth as possible. Surprised, Elmont watched the mysterious aura that covered Leon's body. The Count's second son couldn't understand what kind of strange sensation he was feeling. Bracing himself, Leon charged. Concentrating, he threw a lot of punches at Elmont. The Count's second son's face was filled with anger. The shocked young man said that Elmont was moved from his place. Thinking about it, Lyon said that this was not the case. Surprised, Chloe continued to watch their duel. Lyon noted that the main character used his skill, but Elmont's balance was not disturbed. The duel between Leon and the Count's second son was in full swing. The main character suggested that he had overdone it, despite not having any aura. Lyon's face was in shock. He believed that if that was the case, the battle would be for Leon's endurance. Elmont's face was filled with anger. He was surprised at Leon's stubbornness. The Count's second son ordered them to stop resisting him and just give up. A confident Leon declared that this was not the end. After concentrating, he realized that he didn't have enough power, so Leon decided to fill them with the Rodrigo method. The main character was counting on a skill that predicted the opponent's movements. His gaze was directed at the evasive Elmont. Leon's thoughts were related to the fact that he wanted to see the actions of the second son of the Count a little earlier. As he pondered, he drew his wooden sword back. Leon believed that if that was the case, then he was easily able to defeat him. The main character continued his assertive attacks. He knew that he needed to move even faster and wider, as well as have a full view. Leon thought that he should do this until he felt like he was in water. An image of their duel taking place underwater appeared in his mind. After numerous attacks, Leon was able to anticipate Elmont's strike. After that, the main character stepped back. He was extremely happy with what he had achieved. The Count's second son was filled with anger. He couldn't believe that Leon couldn't use Aura. Helmut, who was watching the fight, thought that he still couldn't feel Leon's Aura. The Academy instructor was shocked that the main character was fighting on a par with Elmont. A grin appeared on the Earl's second son's face. Elmont said that he did not think to use this technique against Leon. The main character was shocked. Elmont's body was covered in a mysterious aura. Leon guessed that it was a secret skill of the Count's second son. The main character was overwhelmed with emotions. He didn't know whether to focus his attention on the punch or the speed. As Leon continued to think, he realized that O couldn't attack right now. After which, he decided to focus his attention on Elmont's movements. Frantic, Elmont charged into the fray. Leon's face was covered in fine beads of sweat. He knew that he needed to dodge the second son of the Count's attack. After which, Leon was still able to dodge Elmont's swift attack. The Count's second son's face was filled with confidence. Taken aback, Leona realized that the first attack was a trap. The main character was amazed that even when he dodged, Elmont landed the next blow. The second son of the Count still had the cut that Leon had left on his cheek. The main character suggested that Elmont's secret technique is fencing. He believed that it was a sword that always hit the target accurately. Leon knew that if he tried to dodge, the Count's second son would break his ribs. An image of broken ribs appeared in his mind. 
Leon knew that he couldn't fight with such damage. Almont's aura glinted on his face. The main character suggested that you can try to track the sword of the second son of the Count using the method. Leon knew that at this rate, Almont would defeat him. The Count's second son's wooden sword was heading towards him. Leon's body was covered in a powerful aura. The main character was sure that he could not lose to Elmont, so he had to finish. With all his aura concentrated in his legs, Leon prepared to attack. After which, the main character jumped up and attacked Elmont from above. The Count's shocked second son couldn't believe what he saw. Leon landed a crushing blow on Elmont's shoulder, after which, he once again landed on the floor. The Count's second son's face was filled with anger. Enraged, Elmont held onto his left hand. The young man assumed that Leon had broken the left arm of the Count's second son. He felt that Elmont was now at a disadvantage. Lyon's face was filled with emotion. He reported that the injury to Elmont's arm was nothing compared to the shock of not being able to handle using a secret skill. Concentrating, Leon drew the sword behind his head. Elmont knew that the time had not yet come. He believed that with both of Leon's hands intact, he would attack directly from the forehead. A silhouette of a damaged sword appeared in his mind. The second son of the Count was confident that the strength of the protagonist's sword had already reached its limit. Elmont believed that if he broke Leon's sword, then the chance of winning would increase many times, even with one hand. Jumping up, the Count's enraged second son tried to attack Leon. The Count's second son claimed that he had infuriated him from the beginning, so he was finished. After parrying Elmont's attack, Leon retaliated. The second son of the Count looked shocked. The main character threw a punch to Elmont's face. From the force of Leon's blow, the Count's second son was defeated. His teeth flew apart. The shocked students began to applaud Leon. A joyful helmet announced the winner of the match. Against the background of the competition room's entrance, Elsid's voice could be heard calling for Leon. Elsid was delighted and praised him for the work he had done. Sacred Weapon believed that Elmont had lost to a shameful technique. Elsid said that from now on, the Count's second son would learn to choose his words better. Leon's gaze was directed at Elmont, who was being helped along by the Academy staff. The main character noted that he had not felt the taste of battles in the Academy for a long time. Holding up a finger, Elsid noted that he was very impressed with the result. After which, Leon was taken aback. A smile appeared on Sacred Weapon's face. He said that it is time to open new doors of acceleration Elsid asked if it was fast. Excited, Leon asked him again about the acceleration. Helmut, shocked, counted the teeth that Leon had knocked out of Elmont. Leon walked slowly down the academy corridor, lost in thought. Smiling uncertainly, he asked Elst about the acceleration. The main character asked if this skill would be stronger than Elmont's skill. An image of the power that was being pumped into the man's fist appeared in his mind. Sacred Weapon asked if Leon was aware of the fact that the human body moves slower than consciousness. Elsid noted that all the more so, this happens during emergency situations. In his mind's eye, Leon imagined the image of a man dropping a plate. Sacred Weapon noted that Leon uses reflex movements that have nothing to do with actual speed. An image of a guy practicing with a sword appeared in Elsid's mind. Sacred Weapon asked Leon why professional swordsmen could move so fast. Thinking about it, the main character suggested that this is due to the use of aura. Elsid said he was partly right. A silhouette of a fast-moving boy appeared in his mind. The sacred weapon stated that if Leon didn't use aura, then his body wouldn't be able to withstand the strong and powerful auras. Closing his eyes, Elsid noted that this way, after studying the aura, he would be able to use acceleration. A memory of Leon's body being covered in a mysterious aura appeared in his mind, and then he attacked Elmont. Sacred Weapon reported that the main character was able to use acceleration without learning the aura, without any restrictions. Elsid stated that Leon was able to use this skill. A misunderstanding appeared on the main character's face. The Sacred Weapon reported that this was because he had managed to overcome the instinctive limit of will. Leon asked him to stop. Looking down at his hands, Leon noticed that if he didn't use the aura, his body wouldn't be able to withstand it. He wondered why it was intact. The main character assumed that this happened because he didn't use it fully. Elsid smiled and said it was true. He noted that if Leon had used it on his entire body instead of just his thighs, his internal organs would have leaked out. The main character thought it was very dangerous. Glancing at him, Sacred Weapon asked if he had realized it just now. Elsid hoped that from this day on, Leon would start to take his body more seriously. The main character didn't understand what Elsid was talking about. Suddenly, a barely noticeable spark appeared near Leon's eye, after which, he was taken aback. A kind of pain shot through his body. Leon collapsed to the floor, writhing in pain. Turning his gaze to him, Elsid reported a muscle ache. Gritting his teeth, the protagonist clutched his leg. Sacred Weapon stated that even if Leon can use acceleration, it's best not to do so. Elsid pointed out that the first step was to study the aura. He said that if this does not happen, then the next time Leon may die. Trying to calm himself, Leon said he understood. 
The street of the city was covered with the rays of the afternoon sun. With his hands in his pockets, the protagonist walked down the corridor of the academy's dorm. The surprised female students discussed it. Out of the corner of his ear, Leon could hear the academy students whispering behind him. The main character attracted absolutely all eyes. In his mind, he was amazed that Leon was able to defeat a noble disciple and reveal his potion use. He was thinking of the secret weapons of the royal court, where people secretly take them to increase their strength. The young man assumed that they also learned secret swordsmanship in this way. In his mind, Leon imagined images of the academy's elite students being beaten up. He suggested that rumors spread very quickly. Elsid was surprised at how the elite disciples were ridiculously justifying their defeat. Sacred Weapon asked if there were such nobles. Sunlight fell on the walls of the academy. The main character suggested that the pride of elite students played a role there. Elsid folded his hands in thought. He completely agreed with Leon. On his way, the main character crossed paths with Chloe. She smiled and greeted Leon. Seeing Chloe, the main character fell into a stupor. The children were sitting on a bench in the courtyard of the academy. Excited, Leon asked Chloe how she was. He assumed that her class should be in alchemy class right now. Leon asked her if she was skipping school. Closing her eyes, Chloe called him stupid. She noted that she never skipped school. Chloe reported that the alchemy teacher was sick, so their class was cancelled. Chloe wondered if she could just see Leon. A small smile appeared on her face. Leaning on the bench, she noted Leon's changes. Taken aback, the main character did not understand what was being said. Chloe claimed that he'd started avoiding her a lot lately. She asked Leon if something was wrong. Directing her gaze to the main character, Chloe noticed that he had fought with the students from the nobility. She asked him if he knew how much they were worried about him and Leon. A look of shock appeared on the protagonist's face. He lowered his head in thought. Chloe pointed an indignant finger at Leon. He was thinking about how easy and casual he was talking to Chloe. His face was filled with emotion. Leon didn't understand how this was happening. After which, the main character suggested that it was her attitude. The memory of waving his hand and walking off into the distance while Chloe and Leon were watching him flashed through his mind. The main character believed that she was very caring towards him as she considered him weak. An image of him standing in front of a wooden mannequin, holding back tears, came back to him. Leon thought about getting rid of his feelings of inferiority and becoming stronger. His gaze was fixed on the broken wooden sword. The main character thought that in the past he was very angry with his life, so he hurt himself every day. When he was near the sacred weapon, he asked if it was called Leon. Standing in front of him, he asked him to answer it. The main character asked to prove his words. Chloe closed her eyes and said that the whole school was talking about Leon. She reported on the rumor where he found the sacred sword, which is why he became so strong. Chloe's eyes glinted in the sunlight. Leon's face was shrouded in falling tears. After which, Chloe was baffled. Leon's excited friend started waving her arms around. I'm saying it's only a rumor. Besides, it's been a long time since the sword last appeared, right? Chloe asked, taken aback. Through his tears, Leon said that it didn't matter right now. Chloe's face was filled with confusion. In the main character's mind, an image appeared that the sacred weapon had greatly helped him. Leon thought that Elsid was very rude and had a terrible temper, but despite this, he saved him. The main character noted that the sacred weapon pulled him out of the bottomless pit that he had dug for himself. Rodrigo, who was eating cookies, was watching what was happening in Leon's world. He dropped the cookie and stared at it. Rodrigo didn't understand why the atmosphere had changed so dramatically. The scale with the level above the main characters had suddenly increased. Elsid, taken aback, did not understand how this had happened. Leon stopped crying and put his head down. Leon believed that if he was the hero who would save the world, then the hero who saved him was Elsid. The main character's eyes narrowed. He believed that as the owner of the holy sword, he shouldn't have any flaws. A silhouette of a sacred weapon appeared in his mind. Leon thought that he would become a hero who would surpass Elsid's own expectations. Surprised, Chloe continued to watch him. Putting his hand to his chin, Rodrigo said he didn't understand anything at all. He was amazed that Leon had only spoken to the girl, but he was able to raise his resolve so high. A smile spread across Rodrigo's face. He thought Leon was perfect. Elsid, hovering above them, watched the situation. Sacred Weapon said that it was better not to think about it now. Suddenly, a grin appeared on Elsid's face. He noted that now real training will begin. Shocked, Chloe turned to Leon, who was shivering. It was deep into the night outside. While in his thoughts, the main character was lying in bed. Thinking about it, he said that he had indeed changed. A memory of Chloe popped up in his head, noting that his eyes were completely different. There was a faint smile on her face. Chloe was surprised that he didn't have to worry about anything and could look ahead calmly. She noticed that he looked a bit like Leon. Chloe asked Leon if there was a difference between a person who looks up and a person who looks down. The main character's face was filled with confusion. Fixing her hair, Chloe told him that he should talk to Leon. 
an image of a fearsome lion appeared in her mind. She noted that apart from Leon, he doesn't communicate with anyone normally, Chloe assumed that Leon likes him. With a slight smile, the main character said that he would try his best. Leon rolled onto his side and grabbed the pillow. In his mind, he was apologizing to Chloe. Leon's eyes were blank. He thought about the fact that he wouldn't be able to fulfill her request. A month that wasn't shrouded in clouds hung over the academy. He was thinking about the next match. Standing on the balcony of the palace, Leon looked out into the distance. His face caught the glare of the light. He was thinking of Leon. Morning came, and as a result, a bright sun shone in the sky. Leon swung his sword and attacked the wooden dummy. After which, a portion of the wooden sword flew off to the side. Elsid noted that the wooden sword wears out quickly and you can't really fight with it. His gaze was directed at the tired Leon. Sacred weapons reported that regardless of skill level, the sword also plays an important role in battles. He asked the main character to take into account the fact that training swords are weaker than real ones. In his hands, Leon held the remains of a wooden sword. He hoped that the sword would last one fight. Leon pointed out that the secret technique is best used only once. A flashback flashed through his mind, where Leon knocked his weapon out of his hand with a single attack. The main character believed that if he used the same technique against a genius like Leon, he would quickly defeat him. He recalled how after the fight, he grabbed his arm because of the intense pain. The main character was sure that now, in addition to the usual skill, Lion will be able to defeat him only by reading his movements. Elsid's face broke into a grin. He asked if he still wanted to see Lion's chart. Leon stated that this is so. A screen appeared in front of him, alerting him to Lion's capabilities. Surprised, he couldn't believe that Lion could use sword energy. The main character suggested that the last stage is to use the aura from the outside of his body. He believed that Lion was stronger than most instructors. While eating, Helmut turned his head to the side. The instructor assumed that someone was remembering him. Elsid stated that even the most talented warriors learned this technique around the age of 30. He was amazed that Leon, who hadn't passed his coming-of-age ceremony yet, managed to surpass them all. Leon put a hand to his chin, thinking. The main character was talking about Leon's strength and speed. He noted that his stamina was slightly higher. Shouting, he declared that Leon was undoubtedly very strong, but it was an opponent that needed to be defeated. Surprised, Elsid noted that this was a good start. Leon's face was in shock. Sacred Weapon stated that it would give him advice. A grin spread across his face. Based on all that we've been through, our task now is to defeat our enemy, reported Elsid. Leon smiled and exhaled. His eyes fell on the broken sword. He turned to Elsid. What if something goes wrong and I lose to Leon, what will you do then? Leon asked excitedly. After his question, Elsid was baffled. He said he didn't want to answer. Taken aback, Leon wondered why this was so. Closing its eyes, Sacred Weapon noted that this was its own test. With a furious look on his face, Elsid asked if he hadn't talked about this since the beginning of training. He said that Leon still has a lot to go through. The shocked protagonist fell to the ground. Leon noted that with each step it becomes more and more difficult. Elsid told Leon that this fight and its outcome could be the biggest change in his life. The holy weapon's face was shadowed by the setting sun. Elsid said that if he defeated Leon, he would tell him what would happen next. He noted that as soon as Leon hears his words, he will understand everything. The protagonist's face was filled with doubt. After finishing the call, Leon continued his grueling workout. Gradually, the clouds in the sky began to thicken. A heavy downpour began. Raindrops rolled down the palace window. Gilbert noted that the result exceeded all his expectations. From the window, Leon watched the raging downpour. Gilbert was amazed that Leon was so good that he was able to defeat Almont. In his hands, he held a document with the results of the competition. Leon's gaze was directed at the surprised Gilbert. He was surprised that Sir Gilbert himself had admitted it. Leon thought back to the last conversation he'd had with him, which had been very dark on the subject. Gilbert lowered his head and asked about three years, which was not a long time to acquire the right people. Putting his hand on the documents, Gilbert reported that Leon had defeated the Count's second son with a body that didn't have auras in it. He noted that there is no doubt about its potential. Leon's face was shrouded in a bright light. He said that today he received a message from Leon where it was written about his readiness. After which, Gilbert's eyes narrowed. He was startled by the news. Lightning flashed brightly against the backdrop of Leon. He made a request to Gilbert. A bright lightning bolt cast a shadow across his face. Leon thought that he would not let the main character win. He believed that he would definitely show Leon his place. An image of Chloe walking forward appeared in his mind. Large puddles formed in the vast expanses of the academy. Heavy downpour continued to be accompanied by bright lightning. The main character's shadow was reflected on the floor of the corridor he was heading down. Flustered, Leon assumed that the academy was always talking about him. Elsid reported on a rumor about a holy sword hero fighting for his future. He asked if it was too loud. Helmut's gaze was directed at Leon, who had just arrived. 
The instructor stated that he was on time. The main character noted that it is very quiet today. Pointing to Lion, Helmet said that this was his condition. The instructor told him that unlike all the previous battles, Lion wants to fight without prying eyes and focus on the battle. With a smirk on his face, Elsid noted that Elmont wanted to publicly embarrass himself, after which Leon laughed awkwardly. Raising his hand, the instructor said that there were no spectators and only one observer would be present. The main character didn't understand who he was talking about. Thinking about it, Elsid realized this. Leon asked if the sacred weapon knew him. An image of Chloe appeared in Elsid's mind. He assumed it might be her. Furious, Leon wondered why he felt that way. Closing his eyes, Elsid noted that it was all a matter of perception. In his mind, the sacred weapon conjured up an image of Lion standing behind the protagonist and Chloe. Elsid suggested that Lion was thinking of a special bond between the main character and Chloe. Sacred weapon believed that he wanted to use this match to prove his greatness in front of her and Leon. An image of the man who had stabbed the king with his sword appeared in his mind. Elsid spoke of a king and a subordinate, and how such conflicts were often over the same woman. In the protagonist's mind, a memory of Lion surfaced, saying that if he won the match, then Leon should become his vassal. His face was filled with anger. He was thinking of Lion. Leon thought of sitting with his friend, leaning against a tree. He was thinking about the one-on-one -on -one battle with Lion. A silhouette of Lion appeared in his mind. He thought back to how he had said with a smile on his face that if he lost, he would become a vassal of Lion. Leon understood the reason why Chloe had become an observer. In his mind, he imagined Lion holding Chloe's shoulder. The main character believed that this is a well-developed plan, the result of which is known in advance, which Lion will clearly adhere to. An image of Chloe appeared in his mind. Leon was filled with anger. He was sure that Lion didn't feel sorry for either of them. A small smile appeared on his face. The main character thought that he knew about this from the very beginning, but Lion really is a man of blue blood. A memory of Lion's came back to him. An image of a man controlling a puppet appeared in his mind. The main character believed that Lion was used to subjugating people and playing with them as he pleases. He thought of the hierarchy that surrounded him. In his rage, Leon realized what his companion was like inside. He absolutely didn't like it. The main character's hand clenched into a fist. Surprised, Elsid asked if Leon should be angry. The main character reported that this is so. With confidence on his face, he headed towards the venue of the duel. Leon didn't think he had any doubts about his actions right now. The main character was thinking that Leon would get a good lesson today. The boys faced each other on the battlefield. With a smile on his face, Leon reported that the main character was late. Leon's gaze was directed at his opponent. The main character noted that it was he who came too early. Startled, Leon turned his head to the side. He reported what he had heard about the observer. The main character asked where he was. Closing his eyes, Leon declared that he couldn't see it from here. He asked if Leon lost, if he would regret his actions. Thinking about it, Leon noted that this would only be an excuse. After his words, Leon was confused. You never know, he said. Raising his fist, Leon wanted to start their duel. Leon asked him to wait a bit. From a small jar, he took out a pill of some sort. Lion popped it into his mouth. Surprised, the protagonist asked what he was doing. Putting his hand on his chest, Lion said that it was a pill that suppressed the aura. He said that he would not use the aura, but despite this, it can manifest itself at any time. Lion noted that if this happens, the main character will definitely lose. After which, Leon fell into a stupor. Helmet will give Lion the sword. He stated that they can start. Leveling his sword, Lion prepared to fight. Leon was surprised that unlike the others, he didn't feel any hostility. Lion's body was covered in a powerful aura. Leon knew he needed to be vigilant. Concentrating, he slid the sword behind his back. Helmut shouted and announced the start of the fight. The two boys' swords clashed in battle. The main character dodged Leon's lunge. His face was filled with anger. After which, Leon rushed towards him. Leon's close friend had launched countless attacks. Continuing to dodge, the protagonist was shocked by the strength of Leon's punches. He reckoned that if this continued, he wouldn't last even 30 seconds. Steam came out of Lion's mouth. Focusing, he attacked Leon again. The excited protagonist parried his attack. While in shock, he thought about the strength of his sword's sword. Bracing himself for another attack, Lion leaned his sword against his face. The main character was thinking that everything was happening, just like Elmont said. Concentrating his vision, Leon tried to anticipate Lion's next move. He thought that now, even with Rodrigo's method, Lion's actions seemed unreadable. His close friend's actions were too fast. Raising the sword above him, Leon knew that he needed to calm down and think about what was happening, because he had been fighting with it for several days. Leon continued to attack him aggressively. Shocked, Gilbert couldn't believe that this was actually a battle between the Academy's students. He was thinking about how the guys didn't use their aura. Helmut folded his hands and continued to watch their duel. The instructor thought about the depth of fencing and fighting spirit. 
he thought that even compared to their knights, they looked much better. The guys continued to fight a fierce duel. With a smirk on his face, the protagonist thought that Lion was really strong, like a monster. Lion's eyes were on his friend. He had been thinking about that until now. Shocked, Gilbert was shocked that Leon knew that his opponent was a genius, but he was fighting almost on par with him. The main character continued to dodge Lion's attacks. Lion swung his sword and launched another attack. After parrying his blow, the protagonist thought of a double blow that he could read. Leon's eye was focused as much as possible on Lion's movements. Rushing forward, Leon delivered a crushing blow to his opponent. A Percy's appeared on Leon's armor. His opponent was baffled. With his punch, the main character cut off part of Lion's hair. Enraged, his opponent brushed the rest of the cut hair from his face. Thinking about it, Lion thought that for some reason, he had only seen his first strike. Leon's face was covered by his hair. Concentrating, Lion gripped his sword with both hands. The main character assumed that from the very beginning, his opponent planned to exhaust him with physical attacks. As he waited for further action, Leon tried to catch his breath. With a smirk on his face, he considered Lion's actions not bad. Catching his breath, Lion raised his sword in front of him. In front of him stood the excited protagonist. He thought that with the help of persistent defense, he had managed to reduce his stamina, gradually reducing the opponent's advantage. Beads of sweat slowly trickled down Leon's face. He was thinking of tactics that didn't allow for mistakes. After which, the main character wary of his gaze. He believed that this was a strategy that could not be changed or circumvented. A powerful aura enveloped his body. Leon reflected that his sense of victory was getting stronger and stronger each time. The main character believed that he had to somehow break Lion's will, otherwise he would never give in to him. His opponent's face was brimming with confidence. Gilbert's face betrayed his surprise. He was amazed that Lion chose to use the pure law technique. Raising his sword, Leon prepared to advance. Gilbert thought about how Lion had focused all of his attention on the muscles and blood flow that contributed to the increase in strength beyond the body. His gaze was focused on Lion's body. Leon's opponent's gaze was filled with hatred. The main character continued to focus his vision on Lion's movements. His opponent used maximum acceleration. With lightning speed, Lion rushed towards the main character. Turning his head back, he was shocked that Leon was able to dodge. Blood gradually began to drip onto the floor. Holding his injured arm, Leon thought about the pure law. He couldn't believe that Lion wasn't using aura. Leaning close to his ear, Elsa informed him that there was indeed no mana in there. After which, the main character jumped to the side out of fright. Taken aback, Leon asked if this was true. Closing his eyes, Elsid reported that the human body can be much faster and stronger than Leon thinks. Directing his gaze at his disciple, Sacred Weapon noted, there are different types of training that affect the speed and strength of the body. Also, Elsid talked about training sessions that affect the strength of the body. Sacred Weapon stated that Leon's knowledge cycle is very narrow. While the main character was listening to Elsid, he was attacked by his opponent. Lion swung his sword and ordered them not to look away. He asked if Leon had already noticed. After repelling Lion's powerful attack, the protagonist stated that he just wanted to break him with his swordsmanship. As he dodged another attack, he assumed that Lion was at his limit. He was thinking that Elsid wasn't telling him anything. A Percy's appeared on Leon's face as a result of his opponent's attack. The main character believed that he could not determine the exact limit of Lion. Thinking about it, he decided that he didn't want Elsid's interference. After Lion's attack, he jumped back. The opponent's face was wary. Leon gripped his sword with both hands, thinking that he was only five or six paces from the edge of the clearing. He suggested that he might push Lion back a little. A mysterious aura enveloped the main character's body. Surprised, Gilbert noticed the change in Leon's mood. He believed that Lion's level was too high for simple basic attacks. Blood was slowly trickling down Leon's cheek. He was confident that the victory would be his. The main character thought that he should calm down his ardor a little. An image of an hourglass and Lion appeared in his mind. Leon thought that while maintaining his superior physical strength, he could only wait for Lion to relax and wear out. He knew that he didn't know the exact time, so now he had to keep an eye on the opponent's movements. Smiling, the main character said that he himself was amused by his thoughts. Lion's face tightened. Concentrating, Leon raised his sword with bloodied hands. When he thought about it, he knew that he had to believe in his own strength. An image of his friend towering over him appeared in Lion's mind. Lion was thinking that this was the first time his opponent looked so big. He smiled and said that he accepted the challenge. The main character believed that no matter what, he didn't want to be someone's servant. After focusing, Lion applied the pure law technique. Shocked, Gilbert thought about the pure law without aura, he assumed that Lion had long gone beyond his capabilities. Elsid was extremely pleased with what he saw. Enraged, Lion believed that if he really was a hero, 
he wouldn't lose. Thinking about it, the main character said that his opponent did not know anything since he was a genius from birth. A memory of his defeat in the duel popped up in his mind. An image of him training hard with a wooden dummy popped up in Leon's mind. He thought about the fact that he had then stubbornly swung his sword in order to become stronger. Leon's gaze was full of determination. He thought that was the difference between them. At the moment of the duel, a heavy rainstorm began outside the academy walls. The boys lunged at each other. As a result of the attack, the blade of Lion's sword flew off to the side. Leon's opponent froze in shock. Some of his weapons clattered to the floor. Astonished, Lion couldn't believe what he was seeing. Elsid was overjoyed and noted that they had not trained so much for nothing. Catching his breath, Leon agreed with him. In the main character's mind, a memory appeared where he dodged a powerful attack from Lion. Leon thought about what he'd learned from fighting Elmont's gang. The main character recalled the moment when Lion continued to attack him. Leon was thinking about an unusual sword technique that attacks the upper body, adding a bit of power to it. A memory of the attack that broke Lion's sword popped up in his mind. Thinking about it, the main character stated, more than anyone else, so many swords have been broken in all this time. He thought back to the countless broken swords during his training. Turning his gaze to Lion, he said that it was all thanks to him. Leon noted that even if you count them, their number is beyond his imagination. His opponent's face was filled with shock. The main character stated that if the sword was real, the result would be very different. After which, Leon pointed his sword towards the fallen opponent. With a smile on his face, he announced his victory. Behind him, Gilbert said it was an exciting fight. Turning his gaze upward, Elsid told Leon about the conditions of their battle, which was that if Leon won, he would become his vassal. With a malicious grin on his face, Sacred Weapon asked what Leon asked for in case of victory. In the protagonist's mind, there was a memory of Leon, who said that he would give him anything he wanted, except for what might harm his family and honor. Also, his opponent pointed out that the transfer of arcane swordsmanship and aura techniques, along with forbidden potions, is impossible. Leon put a hand to his head, lost in thought. He thought that he wouldn't need it. With a tilt of his head, Leon declared that he had lost. His opponent thought that accepting Leon's challenge was too cocky. Leon noted that now all he has to do is accept the result. With complete seriousness on his face, Leon's opponent reported that a promise was a promise. He asked what the main character wanted. After saying that, Leon was taken aback. Putting his hands on his side, he said that he would put it off for later. Leon was shocked by his response. With a smile on his face, Leon noticed that he wasn't thinking about it right now. The main character asked if Leon would like to fight again sometime. His opponent's face was filled with confusion. With a small smile on his face, Leon agreed with him. The shadow of the bright sun shrouded the academy corridor. Clutching his arm, Leon noticed that he hadn't used acceleration yet. He thought that Leon had overdone his sword swing. Chloe's hands were on Leon's wound and she applied healing light. Concentrating, she continued to heal his sore arm. Delighted with the result, the main character was amazed at how quickly the wound healed. He was talking about level 4 healing magic. The delighted Leon declared that Chloe was incredible. His girlfriend's face was frozen in place. With tears in her eyes, Chloe declared that she didn't understand either him or Leon. She didn't understand how they could fight each other. After hearing this, the main character was thrown into shock. Wiping a tear from her eye, his girlfriend noted that he had become strong. Looking down, Chloe asked if Leon was going to leave the academy. Surprised, he asked how she knew about this. Closing her eyes, Chloe claimed to know Leon. She also noted that she is not so stupid. The main character's face was covered with longing. Holding up his hands, Leon stated that she had been like this since she was a child. Outraged, Chloe said she wasn't going to listen to anything. A memory of Leon slaying a giant boar as a child popped up in her mind. It had always been that way, Chloe thought. Chloe reflected that Leon always challenged those who were much stronger. She recalled what others had said about the impossibility of it. Chloe wondered what had happened in the end. With a smirk on her face, she noted that it took Leon longer now. Taken aback, the protagonist assumed that it was fast because the difficulty level was too high. Closing her eyes, Chloe praised him. She struggled to contain her laughter. A smile spread across Leon's face. The boys laughed hard. Heading off into the distance, the protagonist reported that they were already finished. He asked me to hit Leon for him. Taken aback, Chloe asked if she needed to heal him. Leon was sitting on the floor, leaning against the wall, looking dejected. The main character noted that his opponent does not show up outside, he assumed that Leon was worried. Flustered, Chloe continued to listen to Leon. He thought that a slap from his girlfriend would quickly bring Leon to his senses. A small smile appeared on his face. Leon suggested that losing wouldn't stop Leon from getting stronger. He asked Chloe to take care of their friend. Her eyes reflected Leon's departure. Putting her hand to her chest, she turned to him and asked him what he was going to do after he left the academy. Leon waved his hand as he left and noted that it was a secret. 
Her face was filled with emotion. She folded her hands in thought. Flustered, Chloe put her hands to her chest and froze in one position. Elsid, who drew her attention, said that for the first time he saw a wizard who did not believe in God and prayed for others. The main character noted that Chloe is really an amazing person. The walls of the academy were shaded by the sun. Sacred Weapon asked if he would leave like this. Leon stated that this is so. With a smirk on his face, Leon assumed that Elsid was eager to find a special person. Taken aback, Sacred Weapon didn't understand what he was talking about. A memory of his training sessions popped up in Leon's mind. He thought about how he was desperately trying to get stronger and didn't want to give up even when things were going downhill. Thinking back to Leon's birthday, he thought of the wall of status and talent that he felt was impossible to overcome. The main character was thinking that in front of two special people, he struggled for years with a sense of detachment. A memory of his first encounter with the sacred weapon popped up in his mind. He was sure that for him, meeting Elsid was fate and therefore he could overcome himself and become stronger. The main character recalled his achievements in which Elsid helped him. Having won over Leon, he believed that it brought him out of the shadows. Motivated, Leon said that now he was going to become a hero. He wondered who was more special in this world than the hero. Taken aback, Elsid called him a snob. The main character asked if the sacred weapon was disappointed in him now. Elsid stated that this was not the case. Elsid grinned and asked what was wrong with wanting everything at once. Sacred weapons believed that there was nothing wrong with becoming a hero. Elsid noted that it is normal for people to want something. Leon's face was filled with surprise. The sacred weapon reported that if you move towards your goal, persevere and do not give up halfway, you can achieve everything. After which, Elsid added that desire is a force that proves humanity. The image of Leon touching the sword appeared in Sacred Weapon's mind. Elsid stated that this is why he chose it. Sacred Weapon noted that the original hero should not be him, but Leon. An image of Leon holding a sword appeared in his mind. The main character was confused. The Imperial flag fluttered in the wind. Elsid was talking about the Imperial Clyde family. The Sacred Weapon told the story of the sword that was to build a new empire. An elder stood over the newborn baby, holding a scepter and a power. Elsid said that Leon's friend's full name was Lion Callum Gladius von Clyde. He noted that Lion was the chosen vessel for the hero, who was to be reborn 150 years later. Leon's face was filled with shock. Lowering his head, he declared that Lion would be the perfect hero. Just like Elsid said, the glory that Lion was supposed to enjoy passed down to me. Leon mused. Raising his thumbs up, the protagonist assumed that this match was a test. Folding his hands, Elsid declared that Leon had done a good job. With a smirk on his face, the sacred weapon spoke of someone who would become a hero without any prophecies. Elsid believed that only with his own willpower and determination would Lion open up a path for himself. Gilbert watched in shock as Chloe slapped Lion across the face. Elsid noted that the guy named Lion was wrong. A faint smirk appeared on the protagonist's face. Turning to the protagonist, Sacred Weapon asked if he felt guilty for taking his chance. Taken aback, Leon spread his hands and said he didn't know. With a smile on his face, the main character stated that they were all on equal terms now. He didn't understand why he should feel guilty for a guy who tried too hard. The main character thought it would be wrong. After hearing this, Elsid froze in surprise. Pointing his hand towards the Sacred Weapon, Leon noted that his friend should feel guilty for being defeated. After which, he added that this also applies to Elsid, who chose him. Leon thought that the spirit of the great hero Rodrigo and the sword of Elsid had chosen him. The main character believed that in this regard, he now has no time for any nonsense. Pondering, the sacred weapon closed its eyes and exhaled. The kingdom's flag fluttered in the wind. The plot moves to the next day. Leon announced that he had submitted an application for expulsion from the academy. Helmut handed him the documents and put his hand on his head. The main character decided to leave the academy and become an adventurer. He noted that his mentor really did not want to say goodbye to him and gave him a letter of recommendation instead of a crust. As Leon headed out of the academy, he watched the students train. The main character noted that the match between him and Elmont's gang was an incentive for commoners and aristocrats to become stronger. Leon believed that he gave hope for the future, which he was very happy about. As he watched the vast expanse of the academy, he knew that he would never return there again. After being motivated, Leon raised his hand up and signaled the beginning of their journey. The main character went to Blaine, a free city where all adventurers gather. There were sounds coming from the thick of the forest. Startled, Leon ran out of the crowd. Trying to catch his breath, he said that he needed to get out of this terrible place as soon as possible. Leon's terrified eyes were filled with tears. Putting his hand to his face, the main character looked at the expanses of the city. Leon thought Blaine was far away. He was talking about how it had been half a month since he left the academy. The main character wanted to get into bed as soon as possible. With a look of disdain on his face, Elsid noted that the forest wasn't scary at all. 
He felt that Leon should be grateful to him for training his stamina. The main character's face was filled with indignation. He thanked the sacred weapon and remarked that he would not have survived without its help. Leon thought about how half a month ago, he and Elsa had entered the forest to take a shortcut to Blaine. The tired protagonist brought firewood to support the fire on which the food was being prepared. He noted that at first he was afraid. A memory of being attacked by a horde of goblins popped up in his mind. Leon added that they were occasionally attacked by goblins. The main character noted that if it wasn't for Elsid and his training at the academy, he wouldn't be here now. Leon thought back to the hard training of the sacred weapon. A memory of how he used the holy sword popped up in his mind. The goblin's head was cut in two. The determined Leon continued to fight fiercely against the monsters from the forest. The main character believed that all the days in this forest, he seemed to be retraining and was trained by Elsid. With a smile, Sacred Weapon stated that it had taken longer than he had anticipated. Elsid noted that even so, the goblins were decently flown in like this. He thought back to Leon's head-splitting experience with the enraged goblins. Elsid claimed that he had become so strong that he destroyed them all in 10 seconds. Leon was heading for Blaine at an incredible speed. Sacred Weapons thought it wasn't bad. Elsid pointed out that it was because of the training that made Leon pass through this forest so quickly. Clenching his hand into a fist, the protagonist thought that he was definitely stronger than he was before entering this forest. Closing his eyes, Leon thought that there was only one thought in his mind right now, which was about fighting monsters. The main character's face was filled with emotion. Elsid reported that he sees his motivation. Closing its eyes, Sacred Weapon noted that it needed to be patient for a bit longer now. After which, Leon was taken aback. An image of the bowl that stood on top of the mountain of goblin corpses appeared in Elsid's mind. Sacred Weapon stated that Leon wasn't experienced yet, so he needed to gain experience to fill his glass to the brim. Elsid thought about it and imagined a broken glass being filled with water. The Sacred Weapon noted that whatever Leon poured, its power would grow. Elsid added that if his glass was empty, there would be no effect. The main character smiled and said that he would keep this in mind. The afternoon sun shone brightly over the city. An eagle hovering over Blaine watched the city. Leon arrived at the entrance and headed towards the security guards. The streets of the city were ablaze with life. Raising his hand, the main character said that he was glad to arrive safely in the city. He noted that his academic ID came in handy in time. Looking around, Elsid declared that this city sucked. Leon's face was in shock. The eyes of the townspeople surrounded the newly arrived children. Sacred weapons reported that 300 years ago, there were dozens of such cities. Elsid said that the city is not small, but not big either. He thought that the city was dirty and there was only a rabble in it. Sacred Weapon's gaze fell on the bandits sitting in the shadows. Elsid didn't like what he saw. Taken aback, Leon noted that this is not the main thing. While walking down the city street, Sacred Weapon asked where Leon was going to go. Elsid assumed he was heading for the hotel. The main character said that first he had to go to the guild. The daytime sky was shrouded in snow-white clouds. Leon thought that was why they didn't have to hurry just yet. He thought it was better to register now than later. Remembering the main character's words, Elsid asked if he wanted to become an adventurer. An image of powerful knights and sorcerers appeared in his mind. Leon noted that mercenaries were good, but compared to adventurers, their range of action was too narrow. The main character said that he was not going to take on tasks with high pay. An image of himself fighting a mob of goblins appeared in Leon's mind. He believed that first of all he needed training. I think I'll take on missions where I have to destroy monsters, he continued. Closing his eyes, Elsid noted that it was still a long time before his seal was released. Thinking about it, the main character thought that in the forest, in addition to battles, he learned a lot from Elsid. The memory of his first encounter with the sacred weapon popped up in Leon's mind. The protagonist noted that since Elsid had fallen a year earlier than planned, most of his holy sword power had been sealed. An image of a sacred weapon that was wrapped in chains appeared in his mind. Rodrigo raised his sword above his head as he towered over the mountain of fallen goblins. Leon reported that Elsid's original goal was to prepare the wearer's body for immortality, giving it immense power in return, making the wearer an invincible hero. The main character mentioned that the aura was a bonus to strengthen his skills and body. Raising his fist in the air, Leon thought that what he needed to do now was to learn how to use the sword fluently, which he needed an aura for. The main character was sure that he should improve his skills even more. Gradually, the sun began to set. After putting the seal on the document, the girl thanked Leon for coming to register as an adventurer. With a smile on her face, the girl stated that they were confirming his training at the academy and accepting his recommendation letter from Sir Helmut. She pointed out that if Leon registered as an adventurer, he could start at D rank. Holding the document in his hands, the protagonist asked if he could start. He noted that his document has a D rank. The girl said that this is the rank at which he can start taking tasks. She stated that if Leon followed the rules, he would quickly reach the C rank. With a smile on her face, 
The girl said that the B rank is given out on the condition that the main character must prove his skills in using Aura. She pointed out that it would take some time for him to reach the ORS rank, which is highly prized in their guild. Leon was shocked that the use of Aura was the minimum condition for a boost. The main character thought that in addition to simple use, here the control of the Aura should be like this. The guy's hand was covered in a powerful aura. Leon was thinking that a sword covered in aura could cut rocks and break steel, this was already a great talent. With the help of the aura, the stone was cut into two parts. Leon's face was filled with excitement. He knew that even with such abilities, he would still be at the B rank. The main character was shocked that the A and S rank was so strong. Elsid was surprised and said that it was quite an interesting organization. He asked Leon to pay attention to the number of races that were present there. The guild room was crowded with different races who were watching him. Their faces were full of menace. With a smirk on his face, Elsid talked about how the guild had everyone from werewolves to elves and half-elves. Sacred Weapons was surprised that those who had been at enmity with each other 300 years ago decided to unite. He thought that the person who created this organization was pretty good. Leon's face was in shock. Taken aback, the girl asked if everything was fine. The main character reported that everything is fine. Drawing attention to the task board, she reported that the registration process was completed. The girl said that if Leon wants to officially start his work, then he must accept one request for free. She handed the task sheet to the main character. Leon was shocked that the task had to be completed for free. The shocked protagonist asked about it again. With the task in hand, the girl said that in order to be an adventurer, you need to have a guild certificate. With a thumbs up, she stated that Leon had to prove that he was capable of being an adventurer. Dropping his gaze down, Elsid reported that not everything comes easily. The enraged protagonist ordered him to shut his mouth. Clouds gradually began to gather over Blaine. The stream flowed slowly through the city. It was directed to a place that was under the city. Leon was on his way to a water mission. With just one punch, the main character defeated the monsters attacking him. Blood splattered everywhere. Leon noted that this was the first time he was seriously fighting with a sword. Behind him, Elsid stated that the main character's swordsmanship was always one, on one. Sacred Weapon added that due to this, its field of vision should be facing several enemies. Elsid believed that wild, flying monsters were the best practice, which was the battle between these species. Leon was surrounded by a crowd of monsters. The main character noted that now he almost does it. Folding their hands, Sacred Weapon stated that the mission Leon had chosen was to clean up the sewers, so there was nothing he could do. Enraged monsters rushed towards the main character. With just one swing, Leon overthrew this crowd. His eyes narrowed. He turned to Elsid with a question about the monster at the end. The monster behind him had a horn on its head. The main character didn't understand why he needed it if he was a rat man. After thinking about it, the Sacred Weapon assumed that it had evolved. Leon was surprised by his words. An image of mutated monsters appeared in Elsid's mind. Sacred Weapon stated that monsters are also undergoing evolution. He noted that there are also those who acquire abilities when they absorb a lot of resources. Elsid reported that it was the same with a human. Holding his sword with both hands, Leon asked what he should do in this situation. The Sacred Weapon's gaze was directed at the evolving monster. Elsid reported that the Ratman's horns prove that they have special abilities. Sacred Weapons noted that the bigger the horn, the stronger the monsters. He added that the greater the number, the more dangerous the ability. A technique formed at the end of the Ratman's horn. Turning his head in Elsid's direction, the protagonist asked if he could tell what the monster's ability was. Sacred Weapon thought it would be a good idea to fight the Ratman one, on one, but that doesn't really matter right now. Leon was flustered and didn't understand why. The image of a nail-driven doll popped into Elsid's head. He stated that the monster has a low rank. While listening to Elsid, Leon was holding a holy sword in his hands. After attacking the main character, the Ratman used the Plague Curse. Leon was able to easily deflect his technique. Satisfied, the main character noted that he did not make much effort. He assumed that the monster had met the wrong person. With a swing of his sword, Leon ordered him to hand over the horns. It was getting dark outside. The main character, who came from the task, put the bag on the table. The girl was shocked by what she saw. Putting the bag on the scale, she asked if it was the Ratman's tails. The girl assumed that the bag contained 23 kilograms. The shocked members of the guild thought that if the count was made, it would be 230 rats. Taking out another bag, the main character provided the contents to the girl. This bag contained the horns of Ratman. Holding the horn in his hands, Leon reported that he had seen 200 of them, but only managed to catch four. The main character asked if he could sell them. He turned to Miss Lee. Shocked, Lee said it was true. She gave Leon a reward for monster materials. Lee said that she was giving him a total of 13 silver and 50 copper coins. Looking at the award, the main character noted that it came out more than he expected. 
With a smile on her face, Lai reported the high price and demand for Ratman horns. She stated that Leon was the first person to complete the mission so well. The main character's face was filled with shock. Lee said she was very surprised by the result. Lee stated that she would have been even more surprised if he had brought a live Ratman to the guild. After hearing this, Leon was confused. Folding her hands, she hoped that the main character would be able to subdue all four evolutionary species. Although you're still so young, you must also have a good command of aura, which is impressive, Lai continued. Being confused, the main character put his hand to his head. Taking out a box from the shelf, Lai congratulated Leon on being registered as an official D-rank adventurer from now on. After she opened the box, the main character saw the guild's logo. Lee said that the seal on the plate represents the free city of Blaine. Picking up the plate, Leon asked if he could use it however he wanted. Lee said it was true. She added that if the main character is below B rank, then his mission parameters will be changed to second priority. His face was filled with confusion. Leon's gaze was directed at the adventurers who were standing in front of the quest board. Lee said that this measure is designed to prevent people who are only looking for profitable missions. The main character agreed with her. Looking at the guild's emblem, Leon thought that he was no longer a student of the academy, and this plate proved that he was an adventurer. The guild's logo glinted with light. Lee laid her hand on her chest and said that if Leon had a special request that he wanted to pass, he should let her know. She noted that even if the amount of the mission is small, she will try to help in some way. Leon clutched the plate in his hand and considered. While standing at the door to the guild, the main character looked thoughtfully into the distance. He turned his attention to the satisfied Elst. With a smirk on her face, Sacred Weapon assumed that Lai had mistaken Leon for the strongest hero. The shocked protagonist didn't understand why Elsa had decided to do this. Sacred Weapon claimed that Leon had no money, no fame, and that he had volunteered for a difficult mission. A memory of how the main character had accepted Lai's assignment popped up in his mind. Elsid reported that since ancient times, it has been said that a hero does not reveal his identity until his people themselves consider him a hero. The evening sky was shrouded in clouds. Sacred weapons believed that in a sense, this was how it should be. Elsid asked if it was cool. Closing his eyes, Leon declared that he didn't need any extra attention. Sacred weapon pointed out that if anything, they would find out soon enough. Elsid declared that as Leon's teacher, he would endure anything. An image of an old lady telling people a story popped up in his head. Sacred Weapons suggested that the main character might become a legend in this guild. Elsid said that everyone would know about Leon as a hero about whom a whole book would be written. An image of the book written about him and Lai holding it in her hands appeared in his mind. Taken aback, the main character noted that now it sounds like complete nonsense. In his mind, Leon thought about how this kind of future appealed to him. He thought of the man thanking him for protecting him from the monsters. Leon's idea was to make sure that people liked it and did as much good as possible. Heading down the street, the main character noted that he plans to stay in Blaine for a while. He thought it was a good chance to level up. With confidence on his face, Leon stated that once they promoted him to B rank, he would leave. Elsid was surprised by what he heard. While holding the guild emblem in his hands, the main character was thinking about the B rank. He was wondering how long it would take to get this rank. Pointing his hands in different directions, Elsid declared that a hundred days would be enough. Leon was baffled. Covered in an aura, the sacred weapon announced that it would train the main character for half a year. Elsid said that the sooner this happens, the better. With confidence on his face, the sacred weapon notified Leon of the increased training. Elsid reported that his apprentice was currently catching rats in the sewers, which hurt his pride quite a bit. He considered it a disgrace. In the mind of the main character, a memory arose that he earned a lot of money for killing monsters. Leon didn't know if that was a bad thing. Elsid stated that Leon should become stronger as soon as possible. An image of a powerful dragon appeared in his mind. Sacred Weapon noted that the main character's strength should prevail over the dragon. Outraged, Leon asked if Elsid had missed out on too many ranks. His face was in shock. Sacred Weapon reported that Leon had now fully mastered the skills he had been given. In the main character's mind, a memory of how fast he overcame the expanses of the forest popped up. Elsid pointed out that he needed to become stronger in battles. After thinking about it, Sacred Weapon stated that one of the hero's privileges is the ability to destroy monsters, absorb and accumulate their power. In his hands, Leon held the dead Ratman's tail. The main character recalled being near a pile of goblin corpses. He thought about what else it had told him about the connection between monsters. Up until this point, Leon had thought that the fastest way to develop an aura was to take potions. An image of a king using a technique appeared in Elsid's mind. The sacred weapon stated that anyone can absorb the power of a monster and turn it into their own aura. With a smirk on his face, the king used the technique to bind the book with chains. Elsid noted that the nobles and royals hid it for their own benefit. Leon assumed that only Elsid knew about this technique. 
he thought that the new knowledge motivated him to become even stronger. With their hands folded, the sacred weapon was in thought. An example that described the difference between monsters popped up in Leon's mind. Elsid reported that even if a thousand rats were consumed, it wouldn't be enough. Sacred Weapon noted that once the main character got used to it, he would start hunting stronger monsters. He wanted Leon to give preference to dragons. An image of fighting a huge dragon appeared in his mind. The main character asked if Elsid was joking. The infuriated Sacred Weapon declared that it wasn't joking. Elsid noted that the Holy Sword wasn't just a scavenger. He asked if it made sense for Leon to constantly clean these sewers. After the task, the main character's body was covered in mud. Leon was thinking that when he came out of the sewer, he asked Elsid to use the purification ability. After concentrating, the sacred weapon used this technique. After which, Leon's clothes shone with cleanliness. The main character believed that much had changed during that time. Walking through the evening city, Leon asked why Elsid was so eager for him to start hunting dragons. Directing their gaze at him, Sacred Weapon replied that their next target was the Titan Mountains. In his head, the main character imagined a mountain of titans. Leon said it was a place where even dragons couldn't go. He noted that this is the land where the titan rules. Stretching out his hand, the main character stated that this is a place that Elsid could not conquer. He did not understand why he needed it. The Sacred Weapon reported that it would benefit Leon. Startled, Elsid noticed that his body was still there, and he had forgotten about it. An image of Rodrigo putting his hand to his head appeared in his mind. He suggested that Leon set a goal, which was to complete this within six months. Putting his hand to the selection, the main character noted that this is a rather dangerous place. Elsid reported that this was not the case. Turning his head in Leon's direction, he said that he wasn't joking. The sacred weapon reported that he was confident that the main character could handle it. Pointing a finger at himself, Elsid asked Leon to trust him because he is a holy sword. A faint smile appeared on the protagonist's face. Closing his eyes, Leon realized that after all, he always trusted Elsid. Sacred Weapon stated that the infernal training starts right now. The guild flag slowly fluttered in the wind. Leaning down, the man addressed the cat. The guy asked if he was going to kill rats again. Drawing attention to the main character, the stranger wondered if he was called a cat. He noted that Leon is young. The young man told him about the rumors that said that the main character kills a hundred rats every day. As Leon walked towards Lai, he was thinking that he had become quite popular because he had hunted ratmen too often. Leon noted that now everyone calls him the cat. Walking over to Lai, he placed a bag of materials on the table. Glancing at the bag, she asked if there hadn't been enough loot today. The main character reported that this is so. Leon noticed that the ratmen were barely visible to him now. He also reported a decrease in their number. A memory of the ratmen running away at the sight of him popped up in his mind. Leon assumed they were afraid of him. Putting a finger to her cheek, Lai declared that the ratmen weren't all that smart. The main character noted that he would like to see other tasks. Lee gave him a list of other tasks. An enthusiastic Lai said that she knew this day would come one day. She reported having four special orders. Thoughtfully, Leon turned his gaze to them. The main character focused on one of them. He put his hand on one of the tasks. He thought that he had studied all the tasks. Leon noted that the request for this task is quite old. Turning his attention to the task, Elsid noted that they didn't pay much here. He found Leon's choice quite interesting. Putting his finger to his face, the main character said that he wanted to choose it. The afternoon sun rose over the city. Leon asked if the stone slime needed to be destroyed. An image of the place where the stone slime lived appeared in my mind. The main character said that the habitat is an underground passage near the wall. Because of the habit of gnawing rocks, if they are not removed from there, the strength of the fortress will noticeably sag, Leon continued. Holding a task sheet in his hand, the main character said that the customers are the Knights of Blaine. Taken aback, Leon realized why he was being paid so little. After he arrived at the entrance of the underground passage, the protagonist handed the task sheet to the knight. The shocked knight asked if Leon was talking about their bid. The main character's face was shocked. Surprised, Leon asked where the monsters were, noting that he had received an official request from the guild. The knight understood what he was saying. While standing behind the main character, the knight asked if he was the cat. With a smile on his face, he talked about the adventurer who cleared the sewer of rats. Leon said it was true. Putting his hand on the main character's shoulder, the knight was happy about it. He added that there should be more adventurers like Leon in this city. With a smirk on his face, the knight stated that the adventurers were so weak right now that they were useless. He noted that such people are even funny to call for help. The knight asked Leon if that was the case. The main character found himself in an underground passage. Leon recalled the words of the knight who said that if he successfully completed the mission, he would increase his reward. The startled protagonist suggested that it would not be easy. Elsid asked if it was a good thing that the knight promised to increase the reward. Leon pointed out the floor and said it wasn't as dirty as the sewer yet. 
He noted that the floor of the underpass was slippery. The main character believed that it would be difficult for him to move and keep his body balance. Closing his eyes, Elsa declared that this was the perfect leg workout. Leon held up his hand and asked him to wait. His gaze was directed towards the glowing slimes that were heading down the underground passage. Taken aback, Leon guessed that there were three monsters. Sacred Weapon asked the main character not to slow down. Turning to the main character, Elsid pointed out that if it was just a normal slime, they wouldn't be turning to adventurers. Gripping the sword in his hands, Leon agreed with him. In front of his face, there was a rock that was flying towards him. At the last moment, the main character managed to dodge the flying stone. A piece of rock slammed into the wall of the underground passage. Leon was shocked by what he saw. Elsid claimed that Leon was attacked from the front. A slug was heading in his direction. The main character tried to cut it into two parts. Using a special technique, the slug repelled Leon's attack. With a smirk on his face, the protagonist understood why he was called a stone slug. With confidence on his face, Elsid revealed that the main weakness of the slime is the core. The plot showed us exactly what this core looks like. The sacred weapon noted that if you break the slug core that is inside, then whatever abilities you have will be destroyed. He imagined an arrow piercing the slug's body. Elsid's gaze was focused on the army of enraged slimes. The monster's body contained a huge amount of rocks. The main character thought that stone slimes store countless stones inside themselves, which protect their core with impenetrable armor. With a wary look on his face, Leon thought it was a pretty well thought out method of defense. Putting a hand to his chin, Elsid reported on the difficult task that lay on the shoulders of adventurers. He noted that a blunt weapon wouldn't break through the slime. Sacred Weapon stated that they would only be able to be pierced by the sharpest sword or arrow. In his mind, he imagined the image of a powerful weapon that pierced through the slime's body. Elsid pointed out that the weapon must be sharp enough to cut through rocks. Directing its gaze at Leon, Sacred Weapon reported that these monsters were difficult to defeat with just one weapon. A crowd of rabid slimes began to fire stones at the main character. A lot of projectiles were flying towards Leon. Concentrating, the main character began to reflect the stones flying at him. Leon decided to step back. Pain shot through his body as he was hit multiple times by rocks. Thinking about it, Elsid said that the monsters understand that Leon can't fight off all the attacks, so they purposefully hit vital organs. Sacred Weapon asked what was the result of analyzing the attacks of these monsters. In Leon's mind, the approximate attack range of the slimes appeared. The main character reported that the distance at which the slimes start shooting is 5 meters. The enraged monster continued to attack him. Leona noted that there is a slight delay between shots fired. A shadow fell across the main character's face. He believed that if he could get close enough, he would launch one or two attacks. Leon knew that even though it was possible, he wouldn't be able to break through their defenses. The monster's body was wrapped in a pile of rocks. Leon felt that he needed to somehow cut through the core while avoiding the attacks. His face was filled with doubt. He didn't know if he could cut it open. Elsid watched him fight in surprise. The protagonist was thinking that while observing their movements and flying rocks, he would need to have time to pierce the slime's body with the holy sword. An image of him focusing his attention on the monster's body appeared in his mind. Leon understood that the difficulty lay in dodging their attacks, he thought that he would have to do it as quickly as possible. In his mind, he imagined killing one of the slimes. A smile spread across Leon's face. Turning to Elsid, the main character asked if he could break through them. Sacred Weapon noted that when the slime creates a shooting hole, the flow of rocks inside the slime stops for a moment. The story showed us the process of attacking a monster. Holding up a finger, Elsid informed that with Leon's skill, only at this point would he be able to destroy the core. Turning his head to the side, the protagonist asked if Elsid had been thinking about how to defeat the slime all this time. Sacred Weapon reported that this was the case. Bracing himself for the attack, Leon agreed with him. He felt he had to do it. The main character rushed towards the crowd of slimes. His gaze was focused on their bodies. Leon managed to pierce through the monster's body, thus destroying it. The main character understood that every second counts for him, so he should not be mistaken. The enraged monster attacked Leon. With a swing of the holy sword, the protagonist chopped it into small pieces. Leon's feet were surrounded by slime that was spilled all over the floor. Elsid reported that the slime reads the main character's movements by the vibration of the floor. He suggested that Leon try to minimize his pressure on the floor. The monster's projectile was aimed towards the main character. Elsid thought that after all of Leon's training, he was quite capable of it. After focusing his attention, the main character started dodging the slime attacks. A grin appeared on his face. Got it. Just like Elsa had said, if I use the footsteps technique, I'll get to them almost unnoticed, Leon mused. Suddenly, the main character slipped on the slime that had spread across the floor. Shock filled his face. There were glints of light in his eyes. A pile of rocks was flying towards the main character. In his rage, Leon didn't want to lose. The main character managed to stay on his feet. 
Leon was able to dodge the incoming projectiles. His gaze was focused on the slime core. With just one attack, the protagonist pierced through the monster's core. Absolutely all the slimes were defeated. Closing his eyes, Elsid noted that he hadn't thought Leon wouldn't notice them. Sacred Weapon asked if the main character did it on purpose. While getting rid of the slime on his face, Leon wondered what Elsid was talking about. The Sacred Weapon spoke of a trick that the main character performed with his legs, reaching the second level. With a smirk on his face, Elsid pointed out the number two with his fingers. The main character didn't understand what he was talking about. His eyes were fixed on Leon's feet. The Sacred Weapon reported a level balance and a reduction in the sound of its movements, but he noted that these were just the basics. Elsid stated that even if the ground is not solid, the main character must adapt to its consistency, regardless of the terrain. An image of ice and hot metal appeared in the sacred weapon's mind. As an example, he cited ice and burning platinum. Holding up a finger, Elsid said that the essence of Leon's footwork was that he could safely use the environment as his own territory. The main character's face was filled with surprise. The sacred weapon added that this power is useful because Leon can change the unfavorable environment in his favor. A memory of the main character putting his feet up popped up in his mind. Elsid reported that Leon was lucky for the first time, but he spread his legs wide, deciding to lower the center of gravity. Sacred weapon thought of how the main character had charged from a standing position. Elsid noted that this way Leon moved out of a standing position from which he could easily dodge and attack from different directions. A memory of the protagonist's training sessions popped up in Sacred Weapon's mind. He stated that if the environment changes, then Leon's pose should also change. There were glints of light in the protagonist's eyes. Elsid noted that the poses that the main character initially uses are also quite good, but they are more suitable for flat and open areas. After which, Elsid spread his hands. The Holy Weapon emphasized that the underground passage had a very low ceiling and wet ground, which meant that Leon had to adjust his posture to suit the situation. Leaning on his knee, the main character noted that it was really more convenient to move this way. Feeling everything with your body is the best workout, isn't it? Holy Weapon asked. Outraged, Leon called Elsid a demonic sword. Thinking about it, the main character realized that this was just the beginning. Putting a hand to his chin, Sacred Weapon said that for better training, Leon needed to stop dodging. The main character's face was shocked. Holding the stone in his hands, Elsid asked if Leon would like to die being stoned. He stated that the main character needs to learn how to take a hit, but receive less damage at the same time. The Sacred Weapon asked Leon to take the blow with his body as if he was trying to block it but couldn't. The main character was confused. With a smirk on his face, Elsid asked him not to try to attack. He noted that Leon needs to endure a certain amount of time. After which, the sacred weapon added that the main character can't be hacked if there are less than three enemies. Leon's face was filled with anger. The enraged protagonist asked if Elsid wanted him dead, calling him a demonic sword. Sacred weapon claimed that it was for its own good. Elsid said that this way, Leon will get used to fighting enemies faster and gain experience. An army of slimes was bearing down on them. The main character didn't understand why it was always so difficult. Elsid noted that he would still have time to swing his sword. He noted that so far these are only the basics. A crowd of knights were standing in front of the entrance to the underground passage, discussing something. Putting a hand to his chin, the knight noted that it was already the third week. He wondered how long ago the main character had been there. Turning his attention to the entrance, the youth reported that about 10 hours had passed. He assumed that the second shift was already underway. Oh, here it is, young blood the man said. The main character appeared in front of the knight with a huge bag of slime. From the very beginning, it seemed to Leon that this was just another failure. The main character noted that each time he started coming out with a bag full of materials. He reported that it was not so easy to defeat the stone slimes. The dumbfounded crowd of knights turned their attention to Leon coming out of the underground passage. The main character's feet were shaded by the sun. Holding two bags of slime in his hands, Leon arrived outside. The knights' faces were shocked. Holding out a bag of material, the main character said that today was the last day. The knights were surprised by this. Leon smiled and said that no more slimes would bother them. The main character noted that they grow very slowly, unlike ratmen, so the knights will live clean for a while. Their eyes fell on the two bags of slime. Leon said it was the last batch. The main character asked them to contact the Adventurer's Guild to confirm the completion of the task. The two knights looked at each other in shock as Leon headed off into the distance. Slowly, the main character strolled along the city street. He asked Elsid if he was ready. Sacred Weapon reported that this was the case. Directing his gaze at Leon, he stated that all the power he had gathered while clearing the slimes was being used to activate the aura. Clouds drifted slowly across Blaine's sky. Elsid noted that this was a little earlier than he had planned. Leon listened carefully, 
then put his hands to his feet. Sacred Weapon stated that at first he thought it would take the main character longer to destroy the stone slimes, since they are magical monsters after all, but thanks to Leon's hard training, he managed to finish the task in no time. An image of the protagonist destroying the stone slime core appeared in his mind. Elsid noted that in this regard, their schedule has shifted by almost a month. He was extremely impressed with Leon's result. Folding his hands, the protagonist continued to listen to the sacred weapon. Elsid stated that in any case, they had accumulated enough power to start using the aura. Focusing his gaze, the sacred weapon informed him that the time had come for Leon to learn how to use aura. Elsid asked if he was ready for this. With confidence on his face, the main character declared that he was ready. An image of Leon and Chloe standing next to some potion popped into his mind. Leon thought about how the descendants of noble families like Leon had been given this power since birth. He believed that by feeding the body with potions, they were building the foundation of their aura. An image of elite students taunting him appeared in the protagonist's mind. Leon was sure that this was the difference between nobles and ordinary people. He believed that the development of aura for ordinary people could not possibly outstrip the noble blood. Holding up his finger, Elsid noted that not everyone can survive the purification and opening of all aura channels. Leon's face was filled with shock. An image of Rodrigo appeared in Sacred Weapon's mind. However, all the magic that you have absorbed, as well as I, the Holy Sword, will protect your vital organs and blood vessels, we will simultaneously heal them, so everything should go smoothly, Elsid said. An image of a man deep in meditation appeared in his mind. He noted that the main character will still feel pain. With a serious look, the sacred weapon stated that if Leon fainted, then purification would be required it won't work. He noted that the awakening of the aura depends only on the main character. Leon's face was filled with excitement. The exalted Elsid started activating his technique. The main character's face was shrouded in glints of light. He assumed that the swords in front of him were made of light. Mysterious weapons hung in the air. A mysterious weapon pierced through Leon's body, after which he cried out in pain. Streams of aura spread through his body, overflowing his body. Elsid continued to channel mysterious weapons into the protagonist's body. A bright light filled the entire room. Blood gradually began to drip from Leon's mouth. The main character's entire body was slashed by a mysterious weapon. Elsid stated that Leon must withstand ten swords. The exhausted protagonist continued to suffer hellish pain. The sacred weapon believed that after that, Leon's aura would awaken. Elsid's gaze was directed toward the window, where the night was deep. With a serious expression on his face, he was confident that the main character would be able to do it. Blaine's sky was shrouded in bright stars. There were glints of light in Leon's eyes. He ordered Aura to appear. The main character's entire body was shrouded in streams of powerful Aura. Leon could feel the current that was circulating all over his body. He knew that all the power was moving in him. Overjoyed, the main character felt the feeling that he had become stronger than everyone else. He was ready to move mountains right now. Elsid glanced at Leon and said that it was only an illusion. The main character's face was shocked. Closing his eyes, Rodrigo noticed that Leon was a funny guy. He was surprised that the main character managed to awaken the aura so early. Putting a hand to his chin, Rodrigo didn't understand why he was looking so displeased. Pointing a finger at himself, he wondered if he was right. Rodrigo noted that in the end, everything went well. He believed that from Elsid's point of view, the stronger the hero, the better. With a smirk on his face, Rodrigo stated that everything the sacred weapon had done didn't bring them to the end result. He noted that the latter didn't even use force to show the holy sword, and he asked if the latter remembered it. He claimed to be the holy hero of Rodrigo. Rodrigo held up his finger and noted that Leon was his receiver. He asked him to stop interfering in this. Rodrigo asked him to sleep well and keep an eye on them. Elsid closed his eyes and waited. Turning his gaze to Leon, he informed him that he expected Leon to be able to withstand only five swords. Folding their hands, the sacred weapon claimed that they had managed to make its aura channels open. Elsid pointed out that they now had to go through a hell of a lot of training to use everything properly. He said that now the main character is only a small child who has opened his gate of power a crack. Closing his eyes, Elsid declared that they still had a long way to go. Taken aback, Leon said he knew it. The protagonist's gaze was wary. His body was shrouded in many streams of aura. Leon was counting that his physical abilities hadn't changed. He believed that he could only feel the flow inside his body. The main character suggested that it was like the nervous system leaving the body. Turning its gaze to Leon, Sacred Weapon asked if he could feel his aura right now. Elsid noted that if the main character can concentrate, he will be able to control it. Leon was overwhelmed with positive emotions. He thought it was very cool. Pointing to the blackboard, Elsid began his story. Sacred Weapon noted that they understand the protagonist's joy at his new abilities, but first they need to repeat the basics of using aura. Elsid asked if Leon knew that aura has an individual attribute. 
Sacred Weapons noted that the most common attributes are those of one of the five elements. In his mind, he imagined an image of a table that represented the attributes of an aura. Elsid stated that this does not apply to the main character. With a smirk on his face, he reported that Leon was very lucky with his aura. After hearing this, the main character was taken aback. He asked what Elsid was talking about. Closing its eyes, the Sacred Weapon stated that Leon's aura had the sun attribute. In his head, the main character imagined the image of a bright shining sun. Elsid spoke about light and fire, he noted that this is the highest attribute that represents justice. Leon's face was filled with shock. After hearing this, the main character jumped for joy. He was glad that he had the same attribute, the Kai of a legendary great hero. Lowering his hands, Elsid said that before starting the main part of the training session, you need to take stock. With just a flick of your finger, the sacred weapon provided a screen with stats. After which, the main character began to study his abilities. There were glints of light on his face. Leon was surprised that his stats were so different from last time. He noted that he hadn't started training the aura yet, and it was already level 3. Raising his finger, Elsid reported that Leon had used acceleration before he had even awakened the aura. The sacred weapon noted that the main character can use the aura sense. Memories of how his body was shrouded in a sense of aura popped up in his mind. Else stated that this goes beyond the first two levels. The main character recalled how he used the sense of aura when fighting with Elmont. Putting a finger to his chin, Elsid reported that when Leon awakened his aura, the battle body had reached the second stage. After which, the sacred weapon stated that the main character can be safely taught how to use the sword. Leon's face was filled with joy. Clenching his hands into fists, the protagonist was thrilled to be able to learn the fencing technique of Rodrigo himself. Directing his gaze to Elsid, Leon asked if they would start today. Sacred Weapon asked if the main character had fully recovered. The hotel's windows were filled with light. Elsid noted that he understood Leon's desire to become stronger, but before training, he needed to tell him something. Pointing its hand towards the window, Sacred Weapon reported that their enemies had appeared in the city. The main character's face was very surprised. A light haze rose over the city. Elsid said he didn't know exactly where they were, but he could feel their aura. Aiming its gaze at Leon, the sacred weapon spoke of the hero's enemies. Elsid noted that Leon, as a future hero, will have to be able to deal with enemies. With rage in their eyes, sacred weapons reported that from time to time, heroes defended the world from the invasion of monsters and bandits. Surprised, Leon asked who they were. With an angry look on his face, Elsid noted that it didn't matter right now. Sacred weapon stated that if the protagonist needed to name them, they could call them evil or devil's minions. Clenching his hand into a fist, Leon thought about the hero's enemies. Closing his eyes, Elsid felt that the main character was still too exhausted for new battles. Leon's face was frozen in place. Raising his fist in the air, the protagonist asked if he should still take the risk. He noted that he is determined to become a hero. Pondering, the sacred weapon turned its gaze towards Leon. Folding his hands, Elsid assumed that the enemies had been lurking somewhere for a while, which was why he couldn't sense them. Sacred Weapon thought that in about two months, they would start to move. With complete confidence on his face, Elsid said that for now, they would continue to destroy the monsters and train further, after which they would fight back against their enemies. Pointing its finger at Leon, the Sacred Weapon declared that from now on, it would know its true purpose by going through a sea of blood and hatred. The guild flag fluttered violently in the wind. Lee reported that she had received a message from the guards on the wall. She noted that after that, there was no news from Leon, which is why she was very worried. Being embarrassed, the main character put his hand to his head and assumed that he had kept himself waiting. A blush appeared on Lee's cheeks. She sensed that Leon had changed. Taken aback, the main character said that he had achieved a lot by destroying monsters. Lee's face was filled with admiration. She stated that this is an occasion to celebrate Leon's promotion. After which, the main character froze in shock. The guild walls were decorated with their banner. He asked her to repeat it again. A happy lie repeated that she congratulated Leon on getting the C rank. The main character's gaze was directed at the brightly shining emblem. After picking it up, the main character was amazed that he got a rank without any checks. Lee noted that it was unusual, but Leon had hunted ratmen and stone slimes, and as a result, he received positive reviews. Memories popped up in her head, where the joyful knight talked about the main character's hard work. Lee reported that he had been promoted to the next rank through the use of thank you letters. With a smile on his face, Leon stared at the guild's logo. He was glad that he had received a rank increase after completing the quests. Elsid grinned and praised the main character. Sacred Weapon noted that Leon can now take on tasks slightly higher in difficulty than before, which makes it easier to find evil. The joyful protagonist asked if he could now take rank C quests. Lee noted that he could do so from now on. 
The main character's face was directed at the C-rank task sheets. In her mind, Lai was surprised that as soon as he got promoted, he decided to immediately take on the tasks. She believed that Leon was completely different from the steel adventurers who were here. Elsid's gaze was directed at the confused Lee. Sacred Weapon thought she was wrong. He was surprised by her divine aura and power. After the main character studied the tasks, he asked what Elsid thought about it. Sacred Weapon pointed out that there were several tasks that would suit Leon perfectly as training. He didn't think he'd seen anything unusual or new. Startled, Lee watched the protagonist talk to the void. Leon asked if he should focus on training. Clutching the task sheet to her chest, Lee asked if he needed a hint. She noticed that the main character takes on those tasks where there are a large number of monsters. Taken aback, Leon said that this was not the case. He put a hand to his chin, thinking, pointing his hand in Lee's direction. The protagonist asked if they had any tasks related to the slums. Leon noted that not everyone takes on such tasks. Lee's face was filled with horror. She asked if the main character was out of his mind. An image of people sitting in the old back streets of the city appeared in her mind. Lee reported on rumors that the slum is inhabited only by poor people. She noted that Blaine's slums were a little different. The plot showed us the criminals who live in the slums. Lee told the main character that there is a territory of illegal criminals. With confidence on his face, Leon believed that he would find what he was looking for there. Looking down, Lai reported that there weren't any tasks that were directly related to the slums right now. Taken aback, she noted that the slums were mostly occupied by mercenaries, not adventurers. Thinking about it, Leon thought that adventurers don't come into conflict with humans. An image of men fighting each other appeared in his mind. The main character believed that almost all that is done in the slums is fighting. Leon imagined an army of knights in his mind. He understood that unfortunately, he couldn't become a mercenary due to some restrictions. The main character believed that just loitering around the slums without a goal could be dangerous. Lee put her hand to the paper and asked what Leon thought of the assignment. Picking up the task sheet, the main character read that he needed to destroy the living armor in an abandoned house. An image of a ghost in armor standing in front of the old house appeared in his mind. Lee talked about the decorative armor that is lying around in an abandoned house, it turned into a monster in a living armor. She noted that this task has been with them for a long time. Putting a finger to her cheek, Lai stated that although the reward was small, only a couple of people in this city were capable of destroying living armor. With his head down, Leon was thinking about the fact that he had a holy sword, which shouldn't be a problem. Startled, Lai reported that the mansion was located next to a slum. She noted that this will help the main character to move around the territory. Hearing this, Leon froze in one position. Holding the task sheet in his hands, he believed that thanks to this piece of paper, he would be able to get there. There was a painting of their coat of arms in the guild. The main character thought that even if the power of the slums was strong, they wouldn't conflict with the adventurer's guild. Leon believed that if they attacked a weak adventurer, there would definitely be adventurers ranked much higher. An image of a D-rank adventurer being attacked by bandits appeared in his mind. The main character gave the example of a rank adventurers who solved national issues. He was thinking about how higher ranked adventurers would free the weaker one from problems. A smile could be seen on Lee's face. Leon put his hand to his head and looked confused. The sun glinted off the guild building. The main character thanked Lee and said that now he is her debtor. Taken aback, she replied that it was not worth doing and that it was her job. Lai smiled and handed the main character a bag of rewards. She reported that this was a reward given to him for clearing the fortress of stone slimes. Lee noted that the amount is not small, as the platoon commander decided to slightly increase the fee. Leon picked up the bag and shook it. A grin spread across his face. Raising his finger in the air, the protagonist turned to Lee. He asked if he could ask another question. She accepted his request. Leon's face was in shadow. The main character asked if he could tell where Blaine's church was. Lee's face was filled with surprise. Shocked, Lee asked what exactly Leon meant. Turning his head to the side, the main character said that he needed to see something. Her face was full of excitement. Leon's gaze was directed in Lee's direction. He was thinking that everything had happened as expected. Just like Elsid said, if Rise took me for a new hero, then I need the Order's help, the protagonist continued to think. An image of the knight who had appeared in front of the cleric appeared in his mind. He thought that there are exceptions when you can use an ordinary church. An image of knights fighting off enemies appeared in his mind. Leon believed that no one dared to desecrate this monastery afterward. The main character was sure that regardless of the origin, the rules for everyone will be the same. He was thinking that the same reason applies to the Iron Chain Knights. Shocked, Lee reported the Prima area to the northeast. She said he was number 13. 
Raising his hand, the protagonist thanked her. After which, Lai fell into a stupor. Putting her hands to her mouth, she thought of a hero looking for a denomination, which she assumed meant that a powerful enemy had appeared somewhere. Falling to the floor in surprise, Lai thought that even as a guild employee, it took her a while to realize. She thought she was stupid. Elsa grinned, noting that this was unusual. As they headed down Blaine Street, Sacred Weapon stated that this was the most effective way to avoid revealing their true identity. Elsa believed that the hero who was a D-rank was now a C-rank adventurer. He guessed that this might cause a lot of suspicion. Holding up his finger, Leon stated that the main thing right now was to hide his identity. He asked if that was the case. The main character was sure that if the guild found out something about him, he would be in trouble. Therefore, Elsid is right, I should pretend to go to church, only as a last resort I can use it Leon continued to think, closing his eyes. Directing his gaze to the hand where the holy sword mark could be seen, the protagonist thought that the seal of Elsid hadn't fully opened yet. He believed that in order to qualify for the title of Saint Sword Wielder, he needed to hone his skills and abilities. Clouds drifted slowly across Blaine's sky. The main character was talking about live armor. He asked if she was a monster in armor. Directing its gaze at Leon, Sacred Weapon reported that this wasn't quite the case. Elsid noted that living armor is a rare natural phenomenon. An image of an aura-controlled armor appeared in his mind. The Sacred Weapon claimed to be the power of magic or witchcraft. He also suggested that they were taught that the armor could move and live. In front of him, he imagined an army of magic armor. Elsid pointed out that they didn't know how to think, and that it was just a piece of iron that obeyed someone's whims. An image of a mage crushing enchanted armor appeared in Leon's mind. The main character asked if the creator could just remove his spell. Elsid pointed out that it would have made no sense then. In his mind, Sacred Weapon imagined a pile of rocks falling down. Elsid stated that removing a spell is the same as destroying your creation. Sacred Weapons noted that it was simply not profitable for them to do so. In his mind, Leon imagined the image of the wizard being crossed out with a sign. The main character believed that wizards were useless. Leon said they didn't care who was behind it right now. His gaze fell on the task sheet, where the enchanted armor was depicted. The main character noted that this is an armor with a silver coating. Frozen in one position, Elsid wondered if he was such a light opponent, why he hadn't already been neutralized. Folding their hands, Sacred Weapons assumed that this problem would have been solved long ago. He believed that the armor was not simple. Leon's face was in shock. He began to stare at the image. Surprised, the main character assumed that the armor's regeneration ability was good. In his mind, Leon was thinking that from his helmet to his gaiters, he was broken, but he responds in 10 minutes. An image of the man who had defeated the armor appeared in his mind, but after 10 minutes, it recovered. The main character believed that a simple weapon could not defeat him. With a smirk, the sacred weapon stated that it was. Elsid guessed that Leon was thinking that this armor was made of ordinary metal. Clutching the task in his hand, the protagonist stated that they would find out when they reached their goal. He asked Elsid to go there right away. The streets of the night city were shrouded in light from street lamps. Leon was shocked that this was a slum. Looking at the area, the main character turned his attention to the people who were having a conversation. Leon noticed that it was much busier than he had thought. The sacred weapon agreed with him. The excited protagonist turned to Elsid. Leon reported that as soon as he stepped outside, he felt an unpleasant feeling. The main character asked if there were any enemies who were chasing him. Hand on side, Elsid noted that if the enemies were nearby, he would have told him right away. After thinking about it, the sacred weapon stated that it could guess why Leon was feeling this way. Surprised, the main character asked why this was so. Elsid claimed that this was because of Ossens. An image of a man with an aura appeared in sacred weapon's mind, being watched by many creatures. Elsid reported that the solar aura is sensitive to the dark aura. Sacred Weapon noted that since Leon looks young, the surrounding people are looking at him and examining him. The main character drew attention to how many incredulous eyes were directed in his direction. Elsid stated that their evil aura enveloped Leon, making him feel strange. The excited protagonist crossed his arms. Leon noted that it was even worse now. Leon's body shook violently. The main character said that this feeling is like needles on the body, he thought that these views are terrible. The sacred weapon asked him to be careful, directing his gaze at Leon. Elsid stated that the evil aura wouldn't harm him, but some of them might be dangerous. Sacred weapon noted that people here were wary of strangers. The youth who was standing behind the wall was watching the main character. Elsid asked Leon to focus on the task and pay attention. The protagonist's face was filled with excitement. Slowly drifting clouds gradually covered the shining moon. Raising his head, Leon stated that this place was here. His gaze was directed at the ancient house that was shrouded in darkness. He noticed that the windows of the house were broken. 
Elsid reported that a living armor lived here. The walls of the house were shrouded in cobwebs. Leon supposed he should be here. In one of the rooms, there was an armor that was completely covered in spider webs. Suddenly, a mysterious red light appeared in the helmet. Opening the door, the main character froze in one position. His shadow stretched across the floor. Elsid took out the holy sword and said that he would help Leon. The room of the old house was covered with light, which was reflected by the weapon. Delighted, the main character noted that it is very convenient and all thanks to Elsid. The sacred weapon said that next time Leon needed to bring a flashlight. Elsid thought that the main character was lucky as there were no other people here. Grinning, Leon said that he would definitely bring a flashlight next time. The boy's eyes were focused on the darkness that shrouded the corridor. Elsid reported that the monster was coming. Enchanted armors appeared in front of them, holding weapons in their hands. A bright light shone in the monster's eyes. He plunged his weapon into the floor, after which, it started to let out a strong roar. Grinning, the protagonist noted that this is the first time he has encountered an opponent who uses a halberd. His gaze was focused on the enchanted armor's weapon. The main character thought that the monster, swinging, strikes blows that are pierced through or just cut from the shoulder. Holding his sword in both hands, Leon prepared for battle. More important, he knew, was the fact that they were separated by a distance of two meters. Bracing himself, he traced the distance to the enchanted armor with his foot. The main character believed that the distance to overcome which he needs to take a few steps, the monster can fill only one length of the weapon. The enchanted armor charged at Leon. Having dodged his punch, the main character believed that such an advantage can only work if there is an owner. With a powerful attack, Leon broke the monster's weapon into two pieces. The halberd blade flew to the floor. The main character thought that with a hollow armor weighing 20 to 30 kilograms, no matter how powerful the halberd was, the enemy would not be able to crush it. With confidence on his face, the protagonist stated that this was the price for the monster closing the distance with its own feet. Attacking the enchanted armor again, the main character chopped off his arm. Frozen between the wreckage of his arm, Leon noted that there was more to come. With lightning speed, the main character cut the enchanted armor into small pieces. The remnants of the armor flew in all directions. Turning to Leon, Elsie asked if he had used acceleration. Sacred Weapon noted that if you didn't take into account the chaotic movements of the sword, it was pretty good. Putting the sword on his shoulder, the main character stated that despite this, he finished off the enemy in a few seconds. Leon added that somehow, thanks to mastering the aura, he is now able to wield the sword more freely than before. After directing his gaze at the armor fragments, the protagonist reported that the report said that even if the armor was smashed to smithereens, it would revive. Taken aback, Leon froze in anticipation. The remnants of the armor reflected the glare of light that came from the main character's sword. Leon noted what he had heard about such individuals, who have a high ability to recover. The main character wondered if this was the case. Else it assumed that this information was incorrect. Drawing attention to the sacred weapon, Leon said that it was possible, but false reports were considered a second-degree crime by the guild. In his mind, he imagined a blackboard with pictures of criminals who were supposed to pay a high price for their capture. The main character noted that if because of this there will be cases with a fatal outcome, the guild will be the first to appoint a reward for the capture of the unfortunate informer. Leon's face was filled with excitement. Something was bothering him. The main character didn't know if there was anyone who would take such a risk just to avoid disciplinary punishment. Leon turned his gaze back to the remnants of the enchanted armor. The main character believed that the situation seemed strange to him from the very beginning. Leon had thought that living armor was an unpleasant opponent, but he believed that if the team was really combined properly, it would be able to withstand any number of opponents. Putting his hand to his chin, Elsid said that nothing came to mind. The sacred weapon suggested that there were some differences between the individuals. Leon noted that this is an option. Directing his gaze towards the glowing holy sword, the protagonist wondered if he should catch a few more pieces to test. Folding his hands, Elsid noted that he didn't need to go very far. The sacred weapon assumed that they were advancing from that direction themselves. Sounds could be heard from the depths of the darkness. A crowd of enchanted armors appeared in front of the guys. Thinking about it, the main character froze in one position. He put his hand to his forehead and said that he couldn't see anything. Leon asked if Elsid could add some more light. The indignant holy weapon wondered if he was a holy sword or a torch. The holy sword started to increase its glow. Suddenly, a bright light lit up the entire room. Directing his gaze to the sword, the protagonist was struck by a bright light that didn't hurt his eyes. In his mind, Leon called it the noble light. After which, the startled protagonist heard some screams. The enchanted armor screamed in pain. Leveling his sword at them, Leon didn't understand what was happening to them. A bright red light could be seen from the armor. Enraged monsters rushed at the main character. After which, Leon started dodging multiple attacks. Parrying their blows, the main character thought that they decided to attack altogether. After blocking the blow with the halberd, Leon knew that he could guess the direction of their attacks, 
but the attack itself was complete. The main character's face reflected the light from Elsid's technique. After cutting the armor in two, Leon wasn't sure if they could be called real military power. The main character wondered how long, according to the enchanted armor, attacks that are executed as if according to a textbook will work. Frozen in one position, Elsid turned to Leon. Suddenly, the main character heard some sounds from behind. At the last moment, he managed to dodge the monster's attack, after which, he decided to step back. Turning his gaze to the sacred weapon, he asked what was wrong. Elsid reported that these monsters are not living armor. An ominous aura enveloped the monster army. Leon didn't ask who they were. With confidence on his face, Elsid asked Leon to use the essence contemplation technique. Sacred Weapon noted that now the main character will see it through his eyes, after which everything will become clear to him. After focusing his vision, Leon applied the Elsida technique. The main character saw that mysterious monsters were placed in the armor. Leon didn't know where the smoke came from. In his mind, the sacred weapon imagined the image of a monster that was sucking the soul out of a person. Elsid reported that the black smoke is a kind of death breath, so if it touches Leon's body, it will consume his life force. Folding their hands, the sacred weapon noted that if there was a sun aura, then there was an opportunity to hold out. Elsid noted that when you come into contact with them, the main character should not expect something good. Taken aback, Leon guessed that was why they had such a reaction to the holy sword glow. When he closed his eyes, Elsid informed him that his guess was only half correct. In his mind, the sacred weapon imagined an image of black smoke coming out of the armor. Elsid reported that living armor is something that has no ego, no emotions, and even no vocal cords. Sacred weapon stated that the act of shouting was impossible. He thought about how the monsters had put their hands to their heads. Elsid reported that for this reason, the armor should not have screamed when it came into contact with the holy sword, turning its gaze to Leon. The sacred weapon noted that only demonic creatures could experience such an aversion to the light of purification. An image of a monster wrapped in armor appeared in his mind. Elsid reported that they were looking at phantom armor. Sacred weapon noted that the number of them made his situation a bit difficult. Elsid told me that the armor is inhabited by spirits who have lost their peace. A memory of standing in front of the broken armor popped up in the protagonist's mind. Thinking about it, the main character believed that their emptiness turned into anger towards the living. The monster in front of him was connecting the armor together. Leon understood why the monster he had hacked to pieces hadn't been reborn. The main character thought that the armor, which is controlled by an evil spirit, is indestructible until the anger runs out. Leon knew that even if his shell was broken by force, he would only come back to life again and again. An image of exactly how to exercise the evil spirit appeared in his mind. The main character believed that the only ways to subdue the phantom armor were to exercise the spirits with powerful magic and break the connection between the spirits and the armor with the power of aura. After directing his gaze to the weapon, Leon was glad that he had the holy sword, which is the main sacred weapon. The main character felt that the number of monsters put him in a difficult position. In front of him was an army of phantom armor. Leon knew that if it was indeed a phantom armor that was infused with spirits, then it would be more profitable to retreat now and start the battle in the daytime. After directing his gaze at the monsters, Elsid stated that there was no doubt that the number of monsters was quite unusual. He was sure that they could not have appeared in such a mass by accident. The main character asked if it was an accident. With complete confidence, sacred weapons reported that they were dealing with phantom armor where defective items would continue to appear. Else pointed out that even if they were to use the correct magic formula, the fact that after countless failures, whether artificial or accidental, so many monsters have formed and successfully completed their reincarnation, the sacred weapon continued. At the moment when night fell on the street, evil spirits headed for the old house. Elsid stated that this meant that countless spirits had arrived at this mansion. A look of shock appeared on the protagonist's face. He was amazed that so many people had lost their lives in this city. The enchanted armor was shrouded in evil spirits. Sacred Weapon reported that the activity level of evil spirits is very low. He noted that they cannot overcome long distances and also live for a long time. Elsid said that they can't move from district to district yet. Directing his gaze to the sacred weapon, Leon guessed that they could only live in the slums. An image of a bloody gun and a bag of money appeared in his mind. The main character thought that this area is separated from the law and the authorities. Leon thought this was the only area that fit that description, namely a slum where you could get what you wanted with money or violence. The protagonist's face was filled with excitement. The main character knew that with his current experience, he wouldn't be up to the task. The holy weapon shimmered with a bright light. Leon believed that even a holy sword that could make the church itself move was useless if he couldn't figure out the purpose of the secret organization. Having prepared for the attack, the main character thought that he should think about this in the morning, after returning. He understood that fighting strong enemies would help him become stronger himself. 
With just one punch, the protagonist pierces the enchanted armor. With multiple attacks, Leon cut the armor into small pieces. The main character's body was shrouded in a sacred aura. Outside the window, the sun was gradually rising. Elsa had thought that they had more or less managed to eliminate the spirits. Leaning on his sword, Leon agreed with him. Almost the entire house was littered with the remains of fallen armor. The exhausted protagonist noted that fighting while being intentionally surrounded was not so easy. Thinking about it, Elsa had guessed that it was due to Leon's blind spots. The main character reported that this is so. An image of his field of vision appeared in his mind. Leon reported that his viewing angle is quite high, but all people have a limit. The main character stated that no matter how he turns his eyes, he will not be able to see what is behind his back. Leon noted that he couldn't fight while standing against a wall all the time. The remnants of the armor reflected the bright glare of the sun. Elsa agreed with him. After the sacred weapon spread its hands and reported that third-rate people are controlled by the conditions, and second-rate people adapt to the conditions. Holding up his finger, Elsa noted that first-rate people turn conditions into their strength. A grin spread across Leon's face. Heading for the exit, the main character noted that he would have to learn this because he wanted to fight in the slums. An image of dangerous criminals with a trap placed in front of them appeared in his mind. Leon knew that the level of danger there was much higher than in the sewers or underground tunnels. He thought he might encounter a trap in the middle of the path. Leon was sure that the people who set the trap would be aiming for his blind spots. Putting his hand to his face, the protagonist believed that if he continued to rely only on his eyesight, he might fall into a trap from which he would not be able to escape. Blaine's sky was covered in snow-white clouds. The people sitting on the street did not pay attention to the child who was standing in the middle of the street. The child's eyes were filled with tears, but suddenly, he noticed that a stranger was walking in his direction. At the same time, fear covered his face, after which, he pressed his mouth hard with his hands. A stranger was walking beside the frightened child. The people's faces were shocked. The guy said it was Khan. Khan himself was accompanied by a crowd of people. The guy mentioned that he is the head of the scumbags of the strongest gang in Blaine. The head of the gang was in his hideout. The man said that they had surveyed the 23rd and 25th districts, as Khan had requested. He noted that they did not see that at least one of the subordinates returned, once there. All the gang members had the same hairstyle. Turning to Khan, the man said that the people around the estate were dangerous, so they did not get close. He asked if they should get closer. Listening to the man, the gang leader sat on a throne. Khan informed them that they need to continue observing from the same distance. He believed that if they got any closer, they would only attract unnecessary attention. After that, new members of the gang came to him with a report. They reported that they had analyzed the water that flows out of the 23rd and 25th districts. The man said that in addition to ordinary water, they were able to find blood, organs and the like. A memory of collecting the remains of organs from the bloodied water popped up in his mind. He noted that there were a lot of human remains, after which they decided that about 30 people died in one day. Pointing a hand in his direction, Khan asked what the mage had said. The man believed that the mage's fame was a lie. He noted that even a black magic ritual would be less wasteful. Khan's face was filled with anger. Closing one eye, he ordered them to collect all of this and stuff it into a single report, as well as attach all the evidence that was enough to make the guild or church act. With a cry of surprise, the man said that even though they didn't know what they were doing there, the commission they were getting from human traffickers would drop if they did it now. The face of the guy standing next to him was covered with blood splatters. Dead, the man collapsed to the floor. With a wicked grin on his face, Khan stated that if you don't know when to stop, you die. He gave the example of a dead man. All the gang members were in shock. The guy was impressed by Khan's great technique. In his thoughts, he noted that he hadn't been able to notice anything. The guy assumed that their leader just shook his hand. An image of a mysterious sect appeared in Khan's mind. Khan stated that these pathetic worms are not like them. He pointed out that they won't be able to use them, so they shouldn't even try. Khan felt that forming a relationship with them would only hurt. Pointing his finger at the startled young man, he said that he didn't care who they were, cult fanatics or spies from another country. Khan felt that there was no reason to get involved with them. An image of the church army appeared in his mind. He said that they will come to an end if the church starts taking direct action. Khan thought they were pushing them into a corner of the continent just because they were sharing money with them. A grin appeared on the faces of the gang members. The head of state said that the church's hangman squad knights of the sacred iron chain will do this. Closing his eyes, Khan informed them that they would retreat for this reason. The head asked if there was any more news. The guy reported that this is so. In his mind's eye, he imagined an old house teeming with evil spirits. The guy reported an abandoned estate that is located at the entrance to the area. He told Khan about the rumor that an adventurer had come there on request. The headmaster's face became alert. The guy noted that more than a week had passed since that moment. He said that the adventurer earned his name by destroying all sorts of monsters, such as ratmen and stone slimes. 
The plot showed us how the main character delivers the tales of the Ratman to Lee and then returns from the underground passage with bags full of stone slime. The guy said that before this adventurer was called Cat and now Cleaner. Evening was gradually falling on the city street. He assumed that the adventurer's nickname was due to the fact that he takes orders thrown by others. With a smirk on his face, Khan was interested in the main character. Putting his hand to his chin, the head talked about an adventurer who takes cheap orders. Khan suggested that he will be able to use the main character. Night fell in Blaine. Leon's window was shrouded in a powerful flood of light. Concentrating, the protagonist closed his eyes. His body was shrouded in a holy aura. The training process gave Leon a lot of pain. Exhaling, Leon dropped the sword to the floor, then tried to catch his breath. Directing his gaze at the main character, Elsid asked if he felt the aura move through his body. A tired Leon reported a strange feeling. Folding its hands, the sacred weapon declared that a sincere, ordinary person was far better than a sloppy genius. He was encouraged that Leon was doing well in his training. Leaning on the bed, the main character said that he feels as if he is dying and resurrected with each passing test. Leon noted that because of this relief, he doesn't feel like he's growing at all. With just a flick of his fingers, the sacred weapon unleashed a technique that allowed Leon to see his stats. He asked the main character to look at it. Leon's gaze was directed towards the screen that informed him of his current skills. Surprised, the protagonist asked why he had such a weak aura. Leon noted that the last time she was at the elementary level. With a smirk on his face, Elsid noticed the main character's rapid growth. Sacred Weapon noted that all of this was expected, as he was teaching it. Elsid stated that Leon learns what other people spend hundreds of hours doing. The main character's face was filled with confusion. Leon noted that the Seven Star Sword wasn't added here. Enraged, Elsid stated that the main character couldn't call himself a sword master if he couldn't even learn one technique. Sacred Weapon asked if Leon had a conscience since he still couldn't figure it out. The plot showed us a cluster of stars that came from Rodrigo. The Seven Star Sword is also known as the Great Chariot, the secret art of swordsmanship developed by Rodrigo in his youth. Sacred Weapon noted that Leon can only be called a true master when he can use all seven forms of the arcane art. With complete confidence on his face, the protagonist stated that he wanted to learn at least one of them before meeting Molly's. Leon asked if he could combine a Seven Star Sword and a Saint, then he wouldn't be able to defeat his opponent. Folding his hands, Elsid said that anyone would die, with the exception of a rank a master. Leon thought that would be enough. Clenching his hand into a fist, the main character said that since he could not become stronger than the enemies in the slums in two months, then he needed a trump card, which can be used as a last resort. Even knowing how to manifest weapon aura is useless if you don't know how to use it properly, Leon continued. The sacred weapon turned its gaze to the windows behind it. Motivated, the main character asked Elsid to start. He noted that he will train while he can. Sacred Weapon reported that they were happy with the protagonist's enthusiasm, but they would finish today. Shocked, Leon wondered why. Watching the angry gang members, Elsid informed them that they had guests. After the main character went to the window, he asked if they were guests. Sacred Weapons considered that they were clearly not tenants. Pointing a finger at himself, Leon assumed they'd come for him. While observing the gang members, Sacred Weapon reported that it couldn't sense any monsters or anyone stronger than them. Elsid thought that you could tell from their appearance that they were bullies. Shocked, Leon suggested that they might be from the slums. Looking out the window, Sacred Weapon guessed that they weren't friendly. Also, Elsid didn't think they wanted to fight. The main character believed that they should be met. He assumed they had a hunch about finding Molly's. A bright light shone from the doorway. After Leon opened the hotel door, the gang members appeared in front of him. Pointing his finger in the direction of the main character, the guy asked if he was a cleaner. Leon said it was true. With a smirk on his face, the man apologized for coming unannounced. The guy said they were here on orders from above. They hoped for understanding. Surprised, the protagonist asked them again. Putting their hand to their face, the guys reported that they were members of a gang called Scumbags. Leon was taken aback as he watched the gang members stand in a pose. An image of Khan appeared in the protagonist's mind. Leon had heard about them when he was gathering information. Leon thought that it was a gang led by Khan Feng, who is known to everyone as the man who divided the slums in three. Pointing his finger at Leon, the guy informed him that the head was looking for him. He said they were told not to push if the main character didn't want to go. The guy believed that Leon would obediently go with them. Closing his eyes, the main character asked for directions. The gang members' faces were filled with shock. Leon felt that Khan wouldn't have called him out for nothing if he wasn't planning on doing something with him. The protagonist's face was brimming with confidence. Leon thought that as long as he mentioned the name Khan Feng, most will immediately get out of his way. The main character was sure that this was his chance to get into the heart of the slums. Sacred Weapon's face was filled with doubt. Elf stated that he can tell what Khan is up to. Leon knew that. The moon was shining brightly, and clouds drifted slowly across it. 
The main character assumed that Feng wanted to entrust him with a job that he couldn't ask the guild for. A grin spread across his face. Leon believed that if Khan was planning to use him, then he would use Khan too. The man stopped and pointed to the door where Feng was standing. Suddenly, at the corner of an alley, a running youth appeared in his path. With his shoulder, he accidentally brushed the man. After which, the young man fell to the ground, dropping the bag of apples. He apologized to the man. His face was filled with fear. Directing his gaze at the man, he assumed that he was from the gang of scumbags. The enraged man started beating up the shocked youth. He asked him why he wasn't looking where he was going. The main character's face was filled with hatred. Turning his attention to Leon, Elsa ordered him to be patient. After looking at the main character, Sacred Weapon stated that he needed to be careful with his emotions. Elsid believed that if Leon showed bloodlust in front of Khan, he wouldn't get anything. Closing his eyes, the protagonist froze in one position. Calming down, Leon said that he would be more careful. The night sky was shrouded in stars. Heading after the man, the main character realized that this was the base of scumbags. Their headquarters was a mess. Elsid wondered if they knew about the cleanup. Leon turned his gaze to the blood splattered on the walls of the house. Turning to the sacred weapons, the protagonist suggested that it looked like they weren't being deliberately killed. Elsid thought it was a classic form of intimidation. The gang leader was standing behind Leon. With a smirk on his face, Khan asked if he was a cleaner. Alert, the main character unsheathed his sword. Leon then attacked Feng. Khan deflected the main character's attack with a chuckle. With a smirk on his face, Feng stated that the nickname cleaner didn't suit him. The main character's face was filled with shock. Enraged, Khan swung his fist at Leon. The main character froze dead in one position. He thought he might die. Fang's powerful punch caused dust to appear everywhere. Khan stopped his fist a centimeter away from the protagonist's face. Leon's nose started to bleed. Drops of blood gradually began to drip onto the floor. As he continued to stand there in a stupor, Leon didn't think he could have dodged it. The main character was shocked by the terrifying power just from the wind pressure alone. Leon believed that if Khan had finished the punch, his head would have been gone. The main character asked if he was a fan. With a confident expression on his face, Khan said that Leon has a lot of guts. Feng thought that the main character was weak, as his rank was only C. Khan gave Leon a light slap on the chest and said that was enough. Feng said that he had made up his mind about the main character. After cleaning the blood from his nose, Leon asked what exactly Khan had decided. Feng turned away from the main character and talked about his mission. Khan asked if Leon had realized that on the way here, the protagonist's gaze was directed at Feng's back. Khan stated that he will give Leon what he wants. Leon asked what exactly Feng wanted to give him. With a smirk on his face, Khan revealed that he knew about the main character's past. An image of his academy appeared in the main character's mind. Feng reported that Leon had always been ranked second among the commoners for the past two years. After Khan raised his hands, he pointed out that the main character is a guy who defeated inept nobles with his own hands, after which he decided to drop out of school and join the Adventurers Guild. Feng noted that now, in order to gain more experience, Leon takes on simple tasks to become one of the strongest people. The main character's face was filled with shock. Leon was surprised that the slum leader had complete information about him. Closing his eyes, Khan revealed that he understood why the main character dropped out of the academy. Pointing his finger in Leon's direction, Feng stated that he himself also didn't want to ever become a knight to serve the nobles. Khan also mentioned that he didn't want to obey anyone. Hearing this, the main character was taken aback. Feng believed that after Leon defeated the nobles, he decided to become an adventurer. In the main character's mind, there was a memory of how he defeated a member of the gang of the second son of the Count. Khan noted that unlike those who are chasing money, Leon is trying to go all out in order to become even stronger and more influential. The main character recalls how he deals a decisive blow to Elmont, after which Helmut announces his victory. Feng believed that this was the reason why Leon had managed to raise his rank to see after completing just two tasks. In the main character's mind, a memory surfaced of how he dealt with rat men and stone slimes. After which, a joyous lie hands him the guild emblem. Khan asked if he was right about that. Leon's face was filled with shock. Holding up his finger, Feng said that if Leon wasn't so stingy about money, then he was right after all. Khan suggested that the main character originally had one goal. With confidence on his face, Feng declared that it was Leon's honor. Khan believed that the main character wants to prove the aristocrats wrong, and then show them what is above their status and rank. With a smirk on his face, Feng stated that in this criminal slum, the main character followed his call. Half of Khan's face was in shadow. Feng informed him that if Leon accepted his terms, he would fulfill his most cherished wish. After which, the main character froze in thought. Taken aback, Leon didn't understand why Khan was so insistent. Putting a hand to his chin, Elsid thought it sounded strange, but it was a good idea. 
Judging from the tasks I've completed, I didn't have any thoughts of chasing glory, the sacred weapon continued. In his head, the main character imagined how he raised the sword above his head at the moment when Lee admired him. Leon thought that even she had mistaken him for a hero. A grin appeared on the protagonist's face. He didn't think he had any reason to explain himself right now. Feng continued to watch Leon. The main character believed that Khan did not even know that he was his enemy. Leon suggested that if Feng thought he wasn't threatening him, then it could be used for his own purposes. Extending his hand, the protagonist noted that this sounds very interesting. After which, Khan warmed his gaze. Gradually, the clouds moved towards the shining moon. Feng reported that people in the slums are very wary of strangers. Khan felt that this was why there was no point in refusing his help. After saying that, he brought the bottle of alcohol to his mouth. Slamming the bottle down on the table, Feng declared that the weak ones here were the first to die. The boys were sitting at the table, having their own conversation. Khan noted that those who survive try to become one of the strongest. Feng said that this is how life works in the slums. Khan revealed that three or four months ago, when the exiles were becoming more numerous, he did not pay much attention to them. An image of masked men surrounded by intense flames appeared in his mind. Feng noted that the exiles hadn't started taking the 23rd and 25th districts in their area. Khan reported that in this way, they had about 200 new corpses every night. At this moment, the main character remembered the living armor. Leon thought that it was an evil that had taken up residence in the mansion as a living armor. Feng held up three fingers on his hand. Khan revealed that there are three people who rule in this slum. He told me about a pawnbroker who was given the name Golden Pig the plot showed us Simon, who was surrounded by untold riches. Also, Feng told Leon about an unknown killer that no one knows. The story introduced us to the Undertaker, around which there were crosses. Pointing to himself, Khan revealed that he stands at the top of it all. The main character remembered that when he first saw him, he could not recognize him as the main character. Feng reported that the 23rd and 25th districts were Simon's. A memory popped up in his mind, in which the hooded man was enveloped in flames. Khan told Leon that at that time, there was a fierce battle that killed more than 200 people, and Simon suffered huge losses. Feng noted that in the end, he decided to fight them back, after which, he sent out almost 500 mercenaries from D to B rank. An image of a huge army appeared in his mind. Khan's eyes were filled with worry. He said that all of them were destroyed. Shock enveloped the protagonist's face. Looking at Feng, Leon asked how this could have happened. Khan has stated that he doesn't know this. Covering his mouth with his hand, the protagonist reflected on the colossal power that was required to destroy such a large number of mercenaries. He believed that the Empire should have been watching this. As lawless as the slums are, this is beyond reason, Leon continued to think. A memory of fighting the enchanted armor army popped up in his mind. The main character believed that if you believe Khan's story, then this explains the reason why all sorts of phantom creatures appear in an abandoned house. Feng noticed that there was no alcohol left in the bottle. Khan said that anyone who tried to find out was simply killed. He noted that this affected everyone except him. Clutching the bottle in his hand, Feng assumed that their piglet was scared. Khan thought he decided to stand back and watch. Feng noted that no one is going to interfere in this war at the moment. The main character's face was frozen in one waiting position. Well, if it wasn't for me, there wouldn't be a wet spot left, Leon mused. Directing his gaze to Khan, the main character asked if there was any point in continuing. Feng noted that it would be rude of him to do so. He said that he decided to trust the main character, pointing a finger in his direction. Khan called him an adventurer who chases fame. Wary of his gaze, Feng told him that he had been studying it for a while and had learned something. Khan noted that in the face of fear, Leon does not lose heart, but goes forward without giving up. He felt that if the main character was really like this, then he should join him. Putting his hand to his chin, Leon said that Khan might trust him with some kind of contract killing. The main character suggested that through him, Feng wants to attract the guild. A smirk appeared on Khan's face. With a smile on his face, he called Leon a smart guy. Feng believed that it was better to have one of the guild members on hand, rather than a hundred unintelligent subordinates. The main character reported his unwillingness to participate in this project. Leon understood that Khan didn't want to give up his position and lose men in the fight against the Vagabonds. Feng closed his eyes and leaned on the sofa. The main character believed that this is the reason why Khan borrows power outside of the slums. Leon wondered if Feng was really going to use him, who had only recently joined the guild. The main character was sure that by doing so, he would create even more problems on his head. Opening one eye, Khan turned his attention to Leon. After which, the main character wary of his gaze. Leon believed that Feng would become a very big threat in the future. The main character asked the question about attracting a guild. Pointing a finger at the documents, Khan asked him to look at them. After which, Leon picked them up. A look of shock appeared on the protagonist's face. A memory of an ancient manor popped up in his mind. 
The main character was surprised that the document that Khan showed him was proof that the people in the slums were victims of evil spirits that destroyed them all. El Cid's face was filled with emotion. He reported that there were hundreds, and in the worst case, thousands of victims. Putting his hand to his mouth, the main character thought that he was going to throw up. Leon understood that they were in a blind spot of the law, so if they disappeared, the country wouldn't suffer much of a loss. Shocked, Leon hadn't thought that such terrible things were happening in Blaine. After which, the main character clenched his fist with all his might. The sacred weapon spoke to Leon. Directing his gaze downwards, the protagonist asked if it was okay to leave things as they were. Khan said that this is not the case, because the district heads know their strengths and positions, which is why it is so easy to defeat them. Wary of his own eyes, Feng noted that if Leon had doubts about someone, then he should not trust them. The protagonist's face was brimming with confidence. Leon finally understood why they needed him. Holding up his thumbs up, Khan stated that the main character has proven his true identity. Feng pointed out that it would be enough for them to make the pathetic worms above them believe in the atrocities that were going on here. Khan believed that this is why the main character should somehow survive and help in this. Leon grinned and said it was rude. The main character realized that in any case, he must survive. Leon noted that if he died, he would not be able to bring any evidence. He asked Feng not to doubt him. After which, Khan started laughing hard. With a smirk on his face, Feng asked if Leon accepted the terms. Banging the table, the main character agreed with Khan. Feng closed his eyes and thought. The main character thought that it was hard to find such information in the slums right now. Leon knew that if he accepted this assignment, he could save a lot of lives. In the hands of the main character were a blade and a small bag. Khan revealed that Leon can pick it up. Drawing the weapon, the protagonist realized that it was a dagger with his mark engraved on it. With a malicious grin on his face, Feng stated that if anyone was going to push Leon, he should just show them the mark. Khan pointed out that if the situation calls for it, then he should cut the most expensive thing they have. Leon threw the gun on the floor and said he didn't want to take it. Outraged, Feng asked him to be a man. Opening the bag, the main character saw magic scrolls. Khan smiled and asked Leon to let him know if he needed anything. Feng pointed out that if he didn't need them, he could just sell them. Khan stated that the main character can consider this as a first advance. Leon lowered his head and asked one last question. In his mind, a memory of Feng pointing his fist in his direction appeared and then froze in one position. The lamplight flickered across Leon's face. The main character asked if Khan had thought about stopping from the very beginning. After which, Feng wary his gaze. With a smirk on his face, Khan revealed that this was not the case. Blaine's night sky was shrouded in bright stars. The windows of the headquarters were filled with light. The main character was on the bed. An image of Feng appeared in his mind. Thrilled, Leon thought that Khan was incredibly strong. The main character understood that he needed to train more to become stronger. Turning to the sacred weapon, he asked if he had any guesses about the documents, else had reported that it was so. An image of a man with a mask covering his face appeared in his mind. Sacred weapon said that he wanted to clarify everything in more detail. He pointed out that dark magic was out of place here. Else had thought it was a lot more serious than they thought. On Leon's desk were a blade, spell scrolls, and documents. The main character suggested that he should see it with his own eyes. The sacred weapon stated that this was the case. Thinking about it, Leon knew it wouldn't be easy. The protagonist was thinking of infiltrating the area where 500 mercenaries were killed. Leon wondered if this was an assignment for professional fighters. Getting out of bed, the main character said that he needed an assistant. Leon believed that this person should not be fixated on money who is talent and is able to become his support without any hesitation or doubts. Surprised, Elsid asked if the conditions were too high. Leon gave them a thumbs up and said that wasn't the case because no one would ask them there. The night sky of the city was covered with stars. Sacred Weapon pointed out that if it was that simple, then he wouldn't mind. The main character asked if 13th Street was in this area. Blaine's morning sky was overcast. Leon's face was filled with shock. In front of the main character was an ancient church. His gaze was directed at the elder who was sitting in front of the church. Leon didn't understand why there was a church in the slums. Else had noted that priests had long been sent to such places. An image of a priest offering his prayers to God appeared in his mind. The sacred weapon reported that those who are blinded by money are easily tempted. He noted that those who are obsessed with lust and debauchery are easily manipulated. Else had said that the priest does not belong to any of the parties because he is different from everyone else. An image of a divine being that was shrouded in light appeared in his mind. The sacred weapon revealed that the only things the priests hold to are their own beliefs and the teachings of the goddess. Elsid believed that none of these methods could fool them. The main character noted that no cheap tricks will work on them. Leon's face was full of confidence. The main character stated that there was nothing they could do. Leon noted that he doesn't want to call himself a novice, 
but he will try to try something. The main character appeared before the clergyman. Leon believed that if he revealed his identity, he wouldn't be able to reach the priests. The main character was sure that he needed to be quieter than water and lower than grass. Smiles filled the faces of the townspeople. Leon reflected that it was unlikely that normal people would be found in the slums, but looking at the common people, he could tell that these were just mere speculations. The main character was sure that the people who live here simply do not look at his pockets and belongings. He believed that this was proof that trust between people remains. Leon's hair fluttered gently in the wind. The main character wondered if this could be called the influence of the Holy Church. Leon was wondering who the bishop in the slums was. After he arrived at the entrance, the protagonist knocked on the door. The man asked who was there. Taken aback, Leon introduced himself and said that he was an adventurer. He noted that he had something to say to the bishop. Suddenly, the main character felt something strange. His body was covered in a mysterious aura. Leon guessed that the aura reacted like this to the person behind the door. Opening the door a crack, the light shrouded the man's robe. A clergyman appeared before the main character. His body was covered in a sacred aura. He explained that he was the bishop in charge of this place. The man said his name was Jezar. Leon was shocked to see an elf in front of him. In his hand, Jezar held a mug of hot tea. The children were sitting in one of the rooms of the church. Jezar assumed that the protagonist was shocked to see Bishop Elf. Leon pointed out that this was not the case. Raising his hand, the bishop said that he understood. Jezar noted that many people are surprised when they see an elf in front of them. The bishop said that the goddess loves all races equally. Jezar noted that this is the reason why he decided to dedicate his life to the church. The main character's mug was slowly steaming. The bishop said that he was well aware of Leon's exploits. The bishop said that the main character got rid of the monsters of the sewers and under the fortress walls. A small smile appeared on his face. Jezar reported that thanks to Leon's hard work, their water supply had improved significantly. The bishop noted that in this regard, fewer people began to develop infectious diseases. Jezar stated that the goddess is also happy with the main character. Taken aback, Leon thought the bishop was exaggerating. After which, Jezar's eyes narrowed. You said you have something to say to me, right? The bishop asked. Leon's face was frozen in place. Holding out the documents, the protagonist asked if the bishop could take a look at them. After which, Jezar began to study their contents. His eyes were filled with anger. The bishop believed that they should not delay in such situations. Leon was taken aback when he heard this. Jezar's hands reflected the sunlight. The bishop noted that the source of information raises questions for him. Jezar considered this document very questionable, so he said that he would ask trusted people to conduct a second investigation. Putting his hand to his chin, the bishop said that for this reason, his answer would be delayed a little. Leon said he understood that. Holding out his hand, the protagonist said that he was looking for someone who could investigate the 23rd and 25th districts with him. Leon asked if Jezar could recommend someone. After a moment's thought, the bishop said that he didn't have any armed adventurers in mind. Leon's face was covered in beads of sweat. Jezar said that he knows people who can be a support or auxiliary force. The bishop didn't think these people were capable of anything more. Frustrated, Leon turned his gaze downwards. He was upset that his last hope was gone. With confidence on his face, Jezar declared that he could go on his own. The main character's face was filled with shock. Turning to Leon, the bishop said that he could entrust his work to someone else. Jezar pointed out that he could therefore go with him. He said that his position was in no way meant to avoid the dark forces. The main character didn't know if Jezar could fight. Leon thought that at most, he expected to see adventurers equal to him, not a bishop. The excited protagonist asked if Jezar was sure about this. The bishop's face was filled with doubt. The bishop held out his hand and asked if Leon didn't trust him. The main character froze in anticipation of further actions. Pointing his hand to the side, Jezar concentrated before starting to cast the spell. His hand was covered in a powerful red aura. A fiery aura appeared in the bishop's hand. The light from Jezar's technique enveloped the entire room. The main character beheld an aura reaching the limit of density, which seeps out and burns the surrounding atmosphere. Leon understood that this technique that could tear even Mithril apart was like a piece of paper. Being blinded, the main character covered his face with his hand. Elsid pointed out that judging from the speed of activation, it could be assumed that Jezar had mastered the technique through countless hands on experiences. The holy weapon believed that the bishop could be compared to Khan in terms of strength. In that moment, Leon realized that Jezar was a bishop for a reason. After finishing the demonstration of his abilities, Jezar asked what the main character thought about it. The bishop asked if Leon thought he shouldn't cling to him. Taken aback, the main character said that he was worried about the fact that, just the same, he would have to cling to the bishop's hand. Leon's words made him laugh. The bishop noted that it is not necessary to praise him too much. An image of a powerful army of clerics appeared in his mind. Jezar said that even 50 years ago, 
He was a member of the Holy Iron Castle Knight Order. Right now, he's just a sick old man. The main character was shocked that the bishop belonged to the Knight Order of the Holy Iron Castle. Leon thought about what Jezar had said about being part of the strongest order on the continent. Leon shook the bishop's hand and said that he sincerely counted on him. Jezar believed that he was the one who should count on the main character. Moving to the other room, the bishop said that he needed to get his weapons. He asked if Leon could wait for him in the courtyard. The main character agreed with him. Encouraged, Leon was extremely happy to be working together with a talented man who had once served in the Order of the Iron Castle. The main character believed that being near the bishop, he gets the feeling that he got a thousand soldiers and horses in one fell swoop. An image of Jezar holding a bow appeared in his mind. Leon hoped the bishop's weapon was a bow, like a wood elf's. Closing her eyes, Elsid called him the most naive. The holy weapon asked him if he had seen the massally on the bishop's arm. The massive mace clattered to the ground. With a smile, Jezar held his formidable weapon in his hands. The guys were shocked. Together with Leon, the bishop headed towards the huge stone. Readying himself, the bishop began to spin his weapon. After which, he released the mace towards the stone. The stone opposite them was shattered to splinters. Jezar noted that it had been a long time since he'd handled his expensive weapon. The bishop said that he enjoyed smashing the heads of heretics with this mace. Even now, so many years after leaving the front line, Jezar noted, his blood still boils when he thinks about the past. After hearing this, the guy's faces were shocked. The bishop said that this was the destruction of evil and at the same time the eradication of sins. Turning his gaze to Leon, Jezar informed him that the goddess would also extend her protection to their temple. The bishop asked if he was right. The startled protagonist assumed that this would be the case. With a smirk on his face, Jezar stated that it will be beyond any doubt. Lane's evening sky was shrouded in clouds. Leon walked down the city street, lost in thought. Turning to Elsid, the protagonist asked if the bishop was following them. Sacred Weapon reported that this was the case. Leon didn't think Jezar should go into a criminal den dressed as a priest. The main character mentioned that for this reason, he asked him to change into the clothes that are usually worn in the slums. The bishop wore a hood over his head. The main character's body was shrouded in an aura. Leon thought that some things seemed strange to him. The main character knew that he was sensing the bishop's presence thanks to his sense of aura. He was surprised to be able to detect it with any of his senses. Directing his gaze at Leon, Elsid reported that it was all a vegetable garden or a skill. The sacred weapon said that by using his aura, Jezar seemed to erase his presence. Elsid noted that this skill is quite difficult to use while driving. Sacred weapons thought the bishop was experienced enough for this. As the drunk man walked forward, he bumped into Jezar. Indignant, he asked the bishop to be careful and take off his shoes. Suddenly, the man realized that Jezar had disappeared. Elsid guessed that the bishop had a lot of experience in disguise. Leon turned his head and reported that he could sense his absence with his aura sense. The sacred weapon suggested that this was due to the properties of Leon's aura. Elsid reported that let the bishop be erased by the aura skill, and no one should of his presence. Sacred Weapon noted that depending on the characteristics inherent in a particular aura, situations may arise that go beyond this limitation. An image of the sun towering over the main character appeared in his mind. Elsid told Leon that his attribute was the sun. He assumed that judging from the main character's reaction, Jezar's attribute was moon. An image of the bishop appeared in his mind, with the moon above it. Sacred Weapon noted that the reason why the protagonist can sense the bishop's presence is because in his eyes, which are the owner of the sun attribute, the opponent's concealing skill is his weakness. In his head, the main character imagined the sun and moon being next to each other. Leon assumed it was a coincidence or an unavoidable fate. After finishing their journey, the guys stopped in front of the entrance to the 23rd district. At the moment when the main character took out the blade, Elsid noted that Khan's dagger came in handy. Leon said it was true. The eyes of the local bandits were fixed on the newly arrived guys. Leon stopped and pointed at the mark on his dagger. The main character was amazed that as soon as they just showed the dagger to the bandits who met them on the way, they immediately gave way. The excited criminals immediately dispersed in different directions. With a smile, Jezar noted something he'd never imagined they'd find their way into this slum so easily. The bishop said that the main character is really an outstanding person, as they say. Thinking about it, Jezar assumed that all this was due to the patronage of the goddess. The bishop wondered if they could arrange a trial for impudent heretics who engage in blasphemy. After hearing this, the guys were shocked. Opening the door that led to the basement, Leon informed them that this was the beginning of the realm of evil. The main character noted that it is dangerous to be on the surface, so they are used by the sewer tunnel, as Khan taught him. Using a special technique, Jezar illuminated the tunnels with light. Water flowed in the vast sewers. Suddenly, the guys heard some sounds. The bishop asked Leon to be quiet. Their eyes were fixed on the grate above them. 
The man asked if that was all for today. He reported that one victim rebelled, so they were unable to meet their quota. The man said that they had to deal with another 12. Although, to be honest, 70 people is a bit much for one day, he continued. Leon's face was in shock. The man noted that even if it was possible to deal with everyone before midnight, the ceremony can continue further until dawn. A bloody body lay above them. He said that all the trouble fell to them. Rage enveloped the protagonist's face. He was shocked by the ceremony of 70 people a day. Leon couldn't believe that they had been killing so many people every day for months. He thought it was an unforgivable act. Pulling out his mace, Jezer announced that he would go ahead. Then, with the help of his weapon, he broke through the ball of the sewer. The bishop pointed the mace at the man. With a single swing, Jezar knocked him down. After getting out, the main character saw how the bishop managed to deal with two opponents. Jezar remembered that they were planning to sneak in secretly. Mysterious red smoke began to emanate from the stranger's mask. With a powerful blow, the bishop aimed his mace at the stranger's head. After which, his face was thrown into shock. Jezar's weapon stopped a centimeter away from the stranger, who blocked the attack with a magic shield. Many small protective barriers appeared around the stranger. He stated that I don't work against this armored sword. From behind the shield, the stranger asked if they had dared to attack. He believed that the guys wanted a quick death. How wonderful it all turned out, we just missed the same thing, the stranger continued. After which, his head flew off his shoulders with lightning speed. With just one attack, the main character took the head off the stranger's shoulders. Leon's face was flickering with color. Calling the main character a pathetic worm, the man asked if the one he dared to disturb knew. At that moment, Jezar's hands went to the side of his neck. Instantly, the man's neck was broken. After which, the members of the secret organization fell to the floor. The bishop's face was filled with joy. Jezar was surprised that the main character had already managed everything. Leon asked if the bishop should say such things. Putting his hand to his head, the main character noted that the members of the secret organization had good weapons. Jezar noticed that Leon had gotten his hands on their weapons. The bishop believed that he was thus able to ignore their witchcraft tricks. After the bishop's words, the main character fell into a stupor. Turning to Elsid, he asked him what he thought of it. Sacred Weapon stated that this was exactly how it was planned. Raising the weapons above him, Elsid revealed that he had cast a special spell on them to change his current appearance. Sacred Weapon noted that because of this, other people saw an ordinary sword like the one used by scumbags. Closing his eyes, Leon pondered on the holy sword that was too luxurious. The main character believed that anyone who was familiar with the Holy Order or Holy Emperor Rodrigo would be able to recognize that it was a holy sword just by looking at its shape. An image of Rodrigo holding a sacred weapon appeared in his mind. Leon didn't know what else to do. The main character believed that their penetration could not be considered successful. He noted that they were able to harvest a large harvest, revealing the true nature of the enemy. At that moment, Leon was reminded of a stranger who had a magic barrier placed in front of him. The main character stated that they had no more clear proof than the use of witchcraft, which is prohibited by the church. Thoughtfully, Jezar put a finger to his chin. The bishop believed that their secret infiltration had not failed. Smiling, Jezar noted that it was like a murder with no witnesses. The bishop wondered if if they exterminated everyone, it wouldn't be considered a secret infiltration. According to Jezar, the main character fell into a stupor. Their eyes were fixed on the old iron door. Leon suggested that the bishop go there. After hearing his suggestion, Jezar agreed with him. After that, the guys threw open the old iron door. Their eyes fell on the many scattered skulls and medical instruments that were covered in blood. Horrified, the protagonist put his hand to his mouth. He thought the sight was like a nightmare from a dream. Leon was amazed at the number of people who were sacrificed. The main character couldn't understand how much pain they were experiencing here. The holy weapon's face was frozen in one position. He tried to cheer Leon up. Directing his gaze to the shocked protagonist, Elsid noted that this horror is not something you can get used to. The sacred weapon asked Leon not to turn his back on the tragedy. Elsid stated that even if everyone forgot, the hero should remember it. An image of skulls and rebellious members of a secret organization appeared in the main character's head. Sacred Weapon believed that this tragedy was an enemy that Leon would have to fight for the rest of his life. Staring down, the main character asked if the Demon King was his enemy. Elsid was surprised that Leon thought his only enemy was the Demon King. Directing his gaze to the main character, Elsid said that this world is not so easy to save if he kills only one villain. After which, Leon was thrown into shock. The image of the Demon King appeared in Sacred Weapon's mind. Elsid claimed that the Demon King was behind the poverty of the poor and the sickness of the sick. Sacred Weapon asked Leon if he thought there was a reasonable solution to this calamity. In his mind, Elsid imagined the image of a powerful holy sword. The Sacred Weapon asked if it was possible to destroy poverty or order diseases with the holy sword. Elsid reported that compared to this, a Demon King that can be slaughtered with a sword is nothing. 
With confidence on his face, he stated that a hero is someone who tries to make tomorrow a little better than today. Sacred weapons believed that this was the goal and duty of a true warrior. Elsid pointed out that this was the reason why they had to fight endlessly. He asked the main character not to look away, no matter how terrible it was. Leon's face was filled with anger. Sacred Weapon reported that only when the main character can stare at such horrors, then he will be able to cut off the root of evil. Calming down, Leon exhaled. Half of his face was covered with hair. In his mind, he was glad that he could finally talk about himself. His eyes were fixed on Jezar. The main character was amazed that the bishop, seeing such a terrible sight in front of him, was able to make a decision in a matter of seconds. He was shocked by his willpower. Leon's eyes narrowed as he turned to Jezar. The bishop reported that the space they had just passed through was just a room where members of the organization disposed of corpses. Jezar guessed that this was the beginning of a truly properly fortified area. An image of one of the organization's members appeared in the main character's mind. He knew that there were at least two enemies ahead. Leon thought that if they entered blindly, they might be in big trouble. At that moment, the main character remembered Khan's words about the things he gave him. Taking a scroll out of his bag, Leon reflected that if possible, he wouldn't want to use it. After which, the main character began to study the contents of the scroll. Suddenly, the print on the sheet began to activate. Surprised, Jezar asked if it was a scroll. As he concentrated, Leon's body was covered in a powerful aura. After studying the scroll, the main character used the insight technique. Elsid was overjoyed and suggested that the magic gave the user a temporary ability to see through the walls of space. A bright red light was coming out of Leon's eyes. Sacred weapons believed that this way, they would see their full background. Activating the technique, the main character began to explore the place where the members of the secret organization were located. On the scroll, the aura from Leon's technique sparkled. Blood gradually began to drip onto the floor. Startled, Jezar ran up to the main character. Holding his hand to his face, Leon said he was fine. The main character noted that the underground layout does not seem so spacious. Leon reported that there were about 24 people in all the rooms. The main character told that east, west, south and north go in order. His gaze was directed at the members of the secret organization who were having a dialogue behind their backs. Leon was talking about the 10, 5, 5 and 4 other people who were there. Focusing his vision, he watched the man who was heading forward. After which, he directed his gaze towards a certain room that was located underground. The main character reported that in the center there is an impenetrable room, the entrance of which was in the east. After wiping away the blood, Leon asked Jezar if he thought there was a core in there. Warily, the bishop assumed that this was the case. Jezar noted that it is not necessary to exclude that there may be a trap that is based on this guess. The bishop explained to Leon the basic strategy of outsmarting the hunter. An image of a fishing rod appeared in his mind. Jezar pointed out that nothing is more common than the logarithm of the inverse action. The bishop reported that what was considered a weakness is actually a strength. Jezar pictured a huge predatory fish swallowing a small fish. And perhaps this empty shell used to dispose of corpses could be the entire 25th district? The bishop continued. After hearing this, the main character was taken aback. Clenching his fist, Leon noted that Jezar's words were correct, but he still wanted to check out that place. Raising his hand, the protagonist suggested that the next time they came, the borders might not be as loose as they were now. Leon thought that today was their biggest opportunity to explore. Jezar tilted his head down in thought. Turning to Leon, the bishop asked if they should do everything as quietly and quickly as possible. The members of the secret organization standing near the door were engaged in a dialogue. Suddenly, a chain appeared around their necks, after which, they fell to the floor. Their screams could be heard all over the underground passage. Foam began to flow from the man's mouth. Seizing the chain, Jezar claimed that they had destroyed twelve of their opponents. Holding the mace to his face, the bishop said that he had now stretched his body a little. Jezar noted that due to his age, he is not as fast as before. Approaching the wall, the main character put his hand to it. The bishop asked if it was the same impenetrable wall. Leon couldn't figure out how it opened. Leaning against it, the protagonist noticed that there was no door handle. After which, Leon added that the wall remains stationary, even if he pulls or pushes it. His gaze fell on the unidentified inscriptions that were dark red in color, which were like blood flowing from a wound. After spinning up his weapon, Jezar asked the main character to step aside. The bishop's mace was pointed toward the door. She hit it and bounced out of the way. After that, the guys were shocked. They couldn't believe that the mace just bounced off. Jezar tried to hit the door again. Leon's mind flashed to the memory of the bishop's powerful attack destroying a huge rock. The main character was thinking that just recently, Jezar broke a block of stone into small pieces. Leon recalled how the bishop smashed the stone floor and then launched an attack on the members of the secret organization. The main character could not understand how after such a strong blow, not a scratch was left on the door. Putting a hand to his chin, 
Else had suggested that it might be a non-standard magic. The sacred weapon stated that the door was made of otherworldly dimension material. Else had reported that it is a substance that is based on laws that do not exist in this world. An image of various iron ores appeared in his mind. The main character asked if the sacred weapon was talking about non-standard material. He said it was true. Else had told him about exhibits that freeze when heated and burn when exposed to cold. The sacred weapon presented an image of ores that react at different temperatures. Else had suggested that this door is a non-standard material that rejects any physical interference. Leon continued to stare thoughtfully at the impenetrable door. He believed that this is not just a confrontation with the use of physical force. The main character was thinking about how recently he couldn't even see what was inside when he used the scroll. Leon guessed that the door in front of them wasn't even affected by magic. The main character believed that if this is a door through which it is impossible to pass with the help of physical and magical power, then he has only one choice. Raising a hand in front of him, Jezar addressed the goddess. Concentrating, the bishop asked her to place a cleansing light in his hands, after which, Jezar directed the tech towards the door. The main character wondered if this was a sacred reception. The sacred weapon stated that this was the case. Elsid reported that it was a holy power that couldn't be trained in the same way as an aura. He noted that it wasn't as well researched as magic. Elsid stated that its formation is due to the accumulation of pious devotion and good deeds. Jezar's technique emitted a powerful bright light. After the bishop put his hand to the door, a strong crack appeared on it. The sacred weapon noted that heretical magic tricks cannot stand up to holiness. Leon's face was filled with joy. He was surprised that the door was broken. Smoke was emitted from the place where the technique was used. Jezar applied the technique to the door again. Putting his hand to his mouth, the protagonist turned to Elsid. He asked if holiness should not prevail over heretical practices. The sacred weapon stated that it should be like this. Turning his gaze to the door, Elsid guessed that if the door had resisted the bishop's holy trick, it was incredibly secure. He didn't think the door was being used as a trap. Elsid thought Leon needed to tap into the opening process. The sacred weapon noted that if anything happens, it will provide support. Clutching the weapon in his hand, the protagonist agreed with him. The main character's body was covered with a powerful aura. Jezar's face was filled with surprise. Concentrating, Leon prepared to hit the door. With a serious look on his face, he drew his weapon behind his back. The main character's punch left a trace of aura. Bright light from Leon's aura spread throughout the room, after which, the door was destroyed. The main character was shocked by this. Elsid noted that initially this matter could not exist in this world. Surprised, the bishop declared that Leon had delivered a stunning blow. Shocked, Jezar noted that he had underestimated his abilities. Confused, Leon put a hand to his head. He thought the bishop was flattering him. The main character noted that almost all the work was done by Dejezar. The boy's eyes were focused on the darkness of the room that had previously been blocked by a door. The bishop said that he did not feel anyone's presence outside the door. Jezar suggested that they leave this space empty and then perform their rituals there. Next, they slowly entered the room. Leon noted in his mind that they couldn't see anything because of the darkness. The main character was once again struck by the smell of blood. With the help of technology, the bishop consecrated the expanse of the room, which was covered in darkness. After that, the guy's faces were shocked. They found a substance in front of them. Leon's face was frozen in place. His eyes were filled with an insane fright. A huge monster appeared in front of him, which occupied almost the entire territory of the room. Under Leon's feet was one of the monster's parts. Holding back the urge to vomit, the main character was amazed that all of them were alive and all of them were breathing. Elsid turned his gaze to the nearby monster growing capsules. At that moment, the sacred weapon realized what was going on. Elsid reported that members of the secret organization strip the flesh and extract the blood from intelligent species, and then process them into chunks of meat with life force essence infused into them. The huge monster's hands were moving randomly in different directions. Sacred weapons believed that the purpose of the secret organization was extremely clear. Elsid told Leon about the satanic art of summoning a monster, which is used as bait for a huge number of sacrifices. He noted that the monster devours an entire city just by opening and closing its mouth. Sacred weapons stated that the calamity was called. Wiping the drool from the corners of his mouth, the protagonist asked what exactly the calamity was called. An image of a huge monster that devoured everything in its path appeared in Elsid's mind. He stated that the disaster was called the City Devourer. The main character's face was filled with horror. The sacred weapon said that it takes a lot of time and effort to summon it. He noted that once the monster starts to act, there is no way to stop it. Elsid revealed that there was a dimensional being outside that even the best of the best would not dare to face. The sacred weapon stated that the monster would be summoned to this world and simply return to another dimension after devouring the city in one bite. In his mind, he imagined an image of a creature that appeared from the other world, using a portal. An image of Blaine appeared in the protagonist's mind. 
Leon couldn't believe that the city would become food for this monster. Sacred Weapons reported that despite the many attempts of the heretics, 99 attempts out of 100 usually ended in failure. In his mind, he imagined an image of how many people were flying towards the monster's mouth. Else said that the problem is that if they manage to succeed even once, then disaster will become inevitable. Raising his hand, the protagonist asked if this ritual had ever been successfully completed. Folding his hands, Elsa assumed that the chronicle entries were left because something like this had happened. In his mind, he imagined the image of books that were placed on the floor. Sacred weapons reported that the special thing about satanic arts is that no one knows what phenomenon they will bring until they are activated. Elsid noted that most of the countermeasures against heretical practices that the Holy Church possesses were created after any incidents. Putting a hand to his chest, Leon wondered what countermeasures could be used against the city devourer. He believed that they would have to face a monster without a plan. Sacred Weapon's face was filled with doubt. Elsid reported a bad feeling. He noted that this place seems to be nothing more than a place where sacrifices are processed for the city devourer. His gaze returned to the monster growing capsules. Sacred Weapons felt that this volume wasn't enough. Elsid noted that the level of security in the dungeon was extremely low. A memory of how the boys had dealt with the members of the secret organization popped up in his mind. The main character suggested that they had already collected the necessary amount of sacrifices. Sacred Weapons estimated that they had collected a minimum of 90%. Elsid believed that soon the members of the secret organization would begin the ritual. An image of the pentagram that was drawn on the floor appeared in his mind. Sacred Weapon assumed that as soon as Leon tried to evacuate the townspeople, the members of the secret organization would immediately start performing the ritual. The main character's face was filled with shock. Raising her hand in the air, Elsid invites Leon to go straight ahead. An image of a powerful army appeared in Sacred Weapon's mind. Elsid stated that they would gather all the armed forces in the city to conquer the 25th district. Sacred Weapons reported that a satanic art like the city devourer would require a large-scale ritual. Elsid was confident that the problem would be solved if they beat them all up earlier. Turning his gaze downwards, the main character was talking about all-out war. Sacred Weapons believed that the cornered members of a secret organization would hide in their shells like turtles and cling to the last resort. Elsid pointed out that a terrible characteristic of satanic art is their defensive abilities. In his head, he imagined the image of a turtle hiding in its shell when startled. Sacred Weapons reported that these skills are based on the principles of the otherworldly dimension. Elsid was sure that members of a secret organization have any power other than the sacred one. Closing its eyes, the sacred weapon noted one thing. With a smirk, Elsid reported that Leon had it, the holy sword. Turning their gaze to the main character, Sacred Weapons stated that they would reduce their strength through all-out warfare, after which they would immediately wipe out the few depleted elites. In his head, Elsid imagined that he was controlling Leon like a game of chess. He noted that so far, the members of the secret organization have no idea that there is a holy sword nearby. The Sacred Weapon said that they would be checkmated, from which they will not be able to escape anywhere. The main character's weapon reflected the glare of light. Leon thought this was the best way. He knew that the members of the secret organization weren't fools, and they probably already realized that the plans were revealed during the attack. The protagonist's face was filled with determination. Leon was sure that they should place a bet. Adjusting his cloak, Jezar addressed the protagonist. Wary, the bishop thought they should get out of there. He assumed that the members of the secret organization realized that they were trespassing on their territory. Picking up the monster from the floor, Leon agreed with him. He wondered what was the point of leaving the monsters alive in this form. His eyes fell on the contents in his hand. The bishop's mace was only inches from the floor. Jezar readied himself and struck at the monster. Chunks of the monster's flesh flew all over the room. After that, the guys left the room and headed for the exit. Turning to the main character, the bishop suggested speeding up. An enraged member of the secret organization reported that the intruders were fleeing. The man was saddened that the victims, on whom a lot of time was spent, were destroyed. There was a huge commotion in the 23rd district. The man ordered to stop the pursuit. He believed that if this place was discovered, then it should be blocked. The shining moon was gradually blocked by clouds floating forward. After catching his breath, Leon assumed that they had decided not to pursue them. Jezar agreed with him. The bishop reported that the energy of those who were chasing them gradually began to recede. Jezar told me that he had disturbed a hornet's nest as a child. He noted that he felt the same way now. Leon was taken aback when he heard this. The bishop's mind conjured up an image of hiding from angry wasps as a child. Jezar said that at that moment he just jumped into a nearby pond. The bishop noted that this time the situation is a little more dangerous. He stated that there is no tolerable reservoir nearby in which they can hide from the impending threat. Jezar believed that a place infested with monsters couldn't be compared to a hornet's nest. An image of the room in which the creature was located appeared in his mind. 
the bishop had a premonition that any reinforcements they requested from the church would arrive too late. Wary, the bishop asked what Leon thought of the whole situation. The protagonist's gaze was filled with doubts. Elsid closed his eyes and thought. Leon knew that in order to implement Elsid's plan, he needed to find an unsurpassed speaker. The protagonist's holy sword was wrapped in a powerful aura. Leon thought that from the very beginning, he only thought of showing the weapon as a last resort. Although the bishop doesn't count, I would like him not to be revealed to others, the main character continued to think. A memory of him and Jezar dealing with members of the secret organization popped up in his mind. Leon assumed that the bishop had some ideas while they were fighting side by side. The main character reasoned that if the bishop sincerely wants to hear his opinion on this matter, then he will speak out. Leon held out his hand and said that he had a wonderful plan. After that, the guys went to the church. On the table was a part of the monster that the main character took from the underground shelter of members of a secret organization. Thoughtfully, Jezar put a hand to his chin. He noted that there are some nuances that are a little unclear to him. The bishop thought they should take the risk. His gaze was directed at Leon. Jezar pointed out that they still had nothing else to try but this. Part of the monster was lying on a piece of cloth. The protagonist asked if the bishop agreed. Jezar said it was true. Overjoyed, Leon knew that this was too complicated an explanation for anyone to believe. In his thoughts, the protagonist noted that this is why he was sure that a real strategist would laugh if he heard something like this. In his mind, Leon imagined the image of a huge monster. The main character understood that information about the city sink was classified even in the church. Leon wanted to pretend that this was a deduction so as to avoid further suspicion. An image of the holy sword that rose above the sun appeared in his mind. The main character was thinking about neutralizing the barrier. Leon felt that if you remove keywords like holy sword from his vocabulary, he would have no excuse but to say that the sun aura was much more effective against the satanic one than Jezar thought. Raising his hand, the bishop noted that even in the holy church, sun aura was ranked number one when it came to attacking. A small smile appeared on Jezar's face. The bishop said that it is so rare that even he has seen it in his entire life, only in the main character. Jezar had some idea why that was. Clenching his fist, Leon declared that their decision had been made. The main character reported that they would mobilize the army guild to block the members of the secret organization from breathing by forcing them to lock themselves in, and then sneak in and defeat them with the help of a small number of elites. Above his head, Jezar held up two fingers. The bishop stated that they have two mandatory conditions. With a confident expression on his face, Jezar said that the first condition concerned the mobilization of the army guild, and the second one concerned the formation of a team that would infiltrate their base. The main character was sure that the first condition is quite simple to fulfill, since Jezar can speak out against the cult. An image of an armed member of a secret organization appeared in his mind. Leon believed that the problem was that they needed people who could stand up to the elite warriors of the satanic art. The main character was thinking that the team should consist of people who, by guild standards, have at least a rank. Leon put his hand to his chin and talked about the rank. Suddenly, the main character's face was shrouded in joy. Leaping up from his chair, Leon suggested that the bishop recruit strong men from the slums. Taken aback, Jezar didn't understand what the main character meant. With a thumbs up, Leon stated that even in the slums, there are people who are not inferior to a rank warriors. He wondered if Feng and the Undertaker would be a great addition to their team. The main character believed that they would definitely cooperate. Taken aback, the bishop asked to leave the discussion of their abilities. He asked if Leon was sure they would join the war. The protagonist believed that if Jezar told them this, they would have no other choice. Pondering, the bishop turned his gaze downwards. Encouraged, Jezar suggested that this would be considered conscription grinning. Leon said it was an opportunity to do good things in the name of the church. The main character was sure that without any doubt, they would follow the bishop as soon as he showed the stamp of the Holy Iron Castle. After hearing this, Elsid fell into a stupor. Sacred Weapons was sure that if the people they were talking about overheard their conversation, some of them would have already been stabbed a couple of times by the sword. In the protagonist's mind, the memory of Khan stopping his fist a centimeter away from his face popped up. Grinning, the main character noted that he was not going to take revenge for the fact that his nose bled. The guild flag fluttered in the strong wind. The adventurers' faces were shocked. Dumbfounded, Lai greeted the protagonist and the bishop standing next to her. Leon grinned and closed his eyes. Jezar appeared in front of Lee, fully equipped in full armor. The eyes of the shocked adventurers were directed towards the guys. They assumed that the person in front of them was a knight of the Order of the Holy Iron Castle. They were curious about what business he was doing at the guild. Turning his head, Leon informed Lee that he wasn't here today to make a request, but to ask for cooperation. Removing his helmet, Jezar passed away. The bishop stated that he requests the full support of the guild in the name of Holy Iron and Chain. Hearing this, Lai was thrown into shock. Bright rays of sunlight could be seen from the guild window. 
Bernard folded his hands and announced that he was a guildmaster from the Blaine branch. Bernard noted that despite the reason for their acquaintance, he is counting on the guys. Shocked, Leon thought that he was even bigger than Khan. The main character had heard that Bernard was in a rank at one time, but had to retire due to a leg injury. Closing his eyes, the guildmaster declared that he was fully aware of the severity of the situation. Bernard pointed out that the importance of the problem was so great that it might well have led Jezar to request a meeting with him. Leon guessed that the guildmaster's experience had a significant impact. The main character noted that the explanation of the situation and the discussion of countermeasures went like clockwork. Bernard's gaze was directed at the little monster provided. Leon pointed out that the guildmaster's face darkened when he heard how little time they had left and the approximate extent of the damage. The plot showed us a girl whose face was hidden by darkness. The main character pointed out that according to the guildmaster's information summary, out of the four rank people currently active in Blaine, there is only one adventurer who can mobilize, as everyone else is completing requests. The children's eyes were focused on a small house with a bright light. Leaving matters with that adventurer to the guildmaster, the protagonist and the bishop headed to the slums to recruit Khan. Leon noted that the meeting between Khan and the bishop was not so bad. The boys' faces were filled with anger. The main character revealed that Khan had no choice but to accept the call. Leon suggested that this was due to accusations that he had been collaborating with evil for some time. With a smirk on his face, the bishop stated that if Feng refused, he would put every last one of them on the list of heretics. Jezar said that if that was the case, his gang would be better off running to the edge of the continent and hiding in a rat hole somewhere. The main character noted that Feng soon gave up because of so much open threat. Taken aback, Khan put his hand to his face. He was amazed that he had fallen into his own trap. Feng thought this was a chance to exterminate them and annoy the guild long enough. Wary, Jezar stated that this recommendation also applies to the Undertaker. The bishop pointed out that if Feng didn't want to suffer alone, he should give him this message. Turning his attention to Jezar, he asked about himself and the Undertaker. Looking down, the bishop said that two would be enough to form the main group. For the rest, Jezar thought it would be enough to evacuate and isolate the city's inhabitants before starting the battle to conquer the 25th district. Grinning, Feng asked if she could cut off the snake's head with a small number of elite warriors. The bishop remarked that for a thug, Khan has a pretty good head. The main character's gaze was directed in the direction of the guys. He felt that they should not exclude Khan from this mess. Leon understood that they all needed to unite against the city devourer. The main character was sure that it was better than if they all died together. A light wind slowly blew the main character's hair. Leon was shocked that such a large number of warriors had gathered in two days in the event of an emergency. His gaze fell on the countless army. The main character, along with Jezar, stood on the edge of the cliff, watching all this. Lee directed her gaze at Leon and informed him that an urgent request had been delivered to all guild members of C rank and above. She noted that most of the audience is made up of adventurers. Raising his hand, Bernard guessed that there were about 1,500 people there. The guildmaster believed that they would witness a real battle. A memory of the monster brought to him and the tactics of attacking the 25th district popped up in his mind. Bernard claimed that thanks to the physical evidence they provided, he was able to convince the king. The guildmaster thought that the garrison was already laying siege to the 25th district. Bernard pointed out that close combat would be reserved for adventurers and mercenaries, while troops with insufficient individual abilities would be responsible for rear support by conducting long-range attacks. In his mind, he imagined ranged and melee warriors. Putting a hand to his chin, Elsid noted the wisdom of the decision. Sacred weapons believed that if the attacker was too inexperienced, they would only fall victim to satanic techniques. Elsid was sure that instead of encouraging the enemy to win, it would be much better to constantly get on his nerves, even if only in a slightly passive form. Grinning, the main character thought that they were the main forces here. Behind Leon was the powerful Jezar, the head of the thugs gang Khan. Raising his hand, the bishop said that even if it was only one fighter, the lord had sent his own man to them. A man in armor appeared in front of them. The man claimed to be a senior knight of the Blaine Count family, Kandart. The knight of the Count family greeted the guardian of the goddess. Embarrassed, the bishop noted that Kandart was flattering him. Jezar wished him the blessing of the goddess. The main character was amazed that Kandart, being only a free knight, had already gained fame for his martial art. Folding his hands, Feng noted that he felt out of place here. In his mind, Leon was thinking about Khan being the boss of a slum dweller, which explained his reaction. Coming up behind the main character, the stranger asked if he was late. Wary, the knight of the Count's family asked who he was. The stranger's body was wrapped in a mysterious aura. He noted that they had called him. The stranger was surprised that they would then ask who he was. With a smirk on his face, Khan stated that he and the stranger are now in the same boat. Feng asked him to take responsibility for the task assigned to him and not break orders. The stranger's eyes were shining. He said that he would act only at his own discretion. 
The stranger noted that he was a murderer, which is why the approaches to the case were very different. The main character's face was filled with fright. Turning his gaze downwards, Jezar said that if the stranger did his part properly, he would not interfere with him. Alert, he clenched his mace in his hand. The bishop noted that if he did not follow along with them with the belief in secret sorcery, he would make them realize that there was no place to hide before the goddess Radiance. Taken aback, the stranger noted that Jezar's words had startled him a little. Then, gradually disappearing, the stranger began to laugh. Leon was amazed that even with the ability to sense the aura, and using the swiping technique, it was impossible to detect the presence of a stranger. After which, only smoke remained from his presence. Blaine's evening sky was covered in snow-white clouds. Jezar informed them that all they had to do was wait for the last member of the squad. The main character mentioned that he should be on the guild's side. Raising her hand, the girl asked if she was too late. Waving her hand, she noted that she didn't really know anything about the operation, so she had to make a lot of preparations. The girl said her name was Karen. The boys' faces were shocked. The main character couldn't understand how the members of the same team could be so different. Karen smiled and walked over to Leon. The main character was thinking about a gangster and two adventurers, after which, he directed his gaze towards Jezar and the Knight of the Count's family. Leon thought of the retired Knight of the Holy Iron Castle and the senior Knight of the Count's house. In his mind, he imagined the image of a stranger. Putting his hand to his head, the main character understood that it would be wrong to hope for a spirit of unity with such a composition. In his mind, Leon noted that they were all teaming up just based on their skills. With a serious look in his eyes, the protagonist announced the start of the operation. The vast expanse of the 25th district was shrouded in powerful flames. Towering above the members of the secret organization were weapons covered in fire. The area's license plate was covered in soot. The man reported a sudden attack. Raising his head, he spoke to the main bark, after which, his gaze fell on the multiple fire volleys flying towards him. The heads of the members of the secret organization were hit by arrows. Frightened, the man ordered to quickly print out the abomination. The corpses of the members of the secret organization lay in a pile of rubble. A huge monster appeared in front of them and let out a roar. The knight of the count's family ordered to open fire on him. The adventurer's arrows were pointed in his direction. After which, the monster raised its hand. With just one punch, he smashed the stone hill where the warriors were stationed. The injured adventurer was shocked that the arrows didn't work. The enraged guy called the ranged warriors weaklings. He stated that it was now the turn of the mercenary squad. The guy ordered to destroy everything in its path. The bishop's gaze was focused on the fierce battle. Jezar noticed that the front line was frozen in place. Watching the battle, Elsid reported that the countermeasure was executed brilliantly. Holy Weapon noted that Abomination wasn't such an easy opponent. He believed that the monster would be able to withstand their attacks within an hour. In his mind, the sacred weapon imagined a turtle. Elsid said that according to their strategy, those who understand that all-out war is unprofitable will try to hide in their shells. The main character's face was shocked. A powerful tornado appeared in front of them. Elsid thought that it didn't seem like a natural phenomenon. Wary, Leon assumed that this was the work of members of a secret organization. Rushing forward, Jezar announced that now it was their turn. The four of them immediately headed towards the natural disaster. The main character was amazed at their speed, after which, he assumed that it was him who was too slow. After stopping, the squad faced a huge tornado. Leon caught up with the squad and tried to catch his breath. Taken aback, Kondart noted that he hadn't thought of the main character. The Knight of the Count's family apologized to him. Concentrating, Kondart said he would start first. Kondart unsheathed his fire sword as he headed towards the tornado. He was interested in testing how strong the barrier created by the secret organization's satanic techniques was. After preparing for battle, the Knight of the Count family cast a fiery aura, after which, the tornado was completely covered in powerful flames. Putting his hand to his chest, the protagonist noted that this was to be expected from a Knight of the Count's family. While watching the tornado, Kondart reported a barrier. Laying a hand on the shoulder of the enraged Knight of the Count's family, Khan said that the weaklings had better go to the side. Feng concentrated all his strength in his fist and prepared to attack after which, he directed his strike towards the natural disaster. The main squad watched as nothing happened after Khan's attack. Kondart grinned and noted the magnificence of Feng's punch. The eyes of the enraged squad members clashed head-on. Jezar said that he could break the barrier with a trick. The bishop noted that he needed to protect the holy power as it was unknown what was waiting for them inside. Stretching his shoulders, the main character said that he had already seen enough of unsuccessful attempts. The gazes of the surprised squad members were directed at Leon. Putting his hand to his sword, the protagonist asked if Elsid had accumulated enough strength. The sacred weapon reported that its energy was surging over the edge. Elsid said that he was overflowing with energy thanks to the members of the secret organization that they had slaughtered last time. 
The holy sword was completely enveloped in a majestic aura. The holy weapon was amazed that a single heretic could do more good than a thousand demonic spawns. Grinning, Elsid asked the main character not to worry about saving energy and just hit with all his might. Leon's mouth was steaming. After agreeing to the sacred weapon's request, the protagonist asked not to destroy the disguise due to his overexcited state. Leon's body was filled with the might of the holy sword. The faces of the squad members were shocked. Concentrating, the protagonist pointed his sword towards the tornado. After Leon's powerful punch, the secret organization member's technique disappeared. The main character's attack left a huge hole in the ground. The bishop reported that the satanic barrier had been destroyed. Next, he ordered everyone to head forward. The main group headed for the enemy's hideout. They were puddles of water on the floor. With the help of technology, Jezar illuminated the room. Alert, the bishop asked if the undertaker was there. Emerging from the shadows, he announced that he was nearby. Leon was glad that all six members of the squad had entered safely. Directing his gaze at the children, the protagonist was struck by the fact that even though the bishop and knight of the count family were wearing armor, there was no rattling sound when walking. Closing his eyes, Elsid reported that this meant that their basic movements were on a completely different level. The main character understood that he had a long way to go. Pointing her finger forward, Karen asked everyone to stop. She reported that there was a door leading down ahead. Their eyes fell on the swinging doors. Jezar thought it was too suspicious. Khan suggested that it might be a trap. Kandart was sure that it would be better for them to just pass by. Raising her hand, Karen informed him that this was the only door that led to the lower level. He thought they should try going down first. The knight of the Count's family was amazed that Karen was so easily ready to throw herself headlong into the pool. Turning to her, Jezar asked if she could tell if there was a trap set up here. Leon remembered what the guildmaster had said about Karen being a tracker. Turning her gaze downwards, Karen noticed that it was quite difficult. Her gaze was directed at the stairs that led to the lower tier. Karen reported that there were two completely different spaces outside and outside the stairs, so she wasn't able to explore it until she got inside. With a serious expression on his face, Jezar invited them to go downstairs. The bishop believed that if they delayed, the situation would only get worse. Kandart, alert, suggested that they hurry. The main squad members headed inside the lower tier. As Leon walked slowly down the stairs, he was surprised that he still didn't feel the undertaker's presence. Because of that, he had no idea if he was following them or not. Gradually, the main character descended the stairs. Suddenly, he noticed that strange red lines appeared on the stairs, after which, the floor under Leon's feet evaporated. Out of fear, he closed his eyes. Opening his eyes, the main character found himself in a certain room. Leon didn't know where he was. Turning his head from side to side, the main character was surprised that everyone had disappeared. Leon thought about how his aura sense didn't sense anyone's presence. Tapping on the wall, Elsid guessed that it was a maze. Sacred weapons considered this to be a classic deceptive technique. Elsid reported that there was an expansion and distortion of space to increase its area. In his mind, he imagined the image of the room surrounding them being formed using the technique of the members of the secret organization. The sacred weapon suggested that the others had been thrown to other locations in the maze. Elsid pointed out that if they were lucky, they might run into them soon. Raising her hand, Karen turned her attention to Leon. She noted that after she fell, she immediately bumped into him. Elsid considered that luck was indeed on their side. With a smile on his face, Karen noted that the main character was worried about being alone in such a gloomy place. Taken aback, Leon asked if she was alone. Cautiously, Karen reported that the pathetic worm had followed her. The main character was shocked by her words. A shadow formed in front of the guys. After the undertaker came out of the shadows, he asked who was pathetic. Pointing her hand to the side, Karen asked if there was another pathetic worm besides him. With a scornful look, she said that if the undertaker didn't like being treated like this, then he should step out of her shadow. Karen didn't understand why he continued to annoy her with his slow way of speaking. The undertaker noted that he decides where to stay. Furious, Karen started insulting him. The main character was glad that he was able to reunite with Pathfinder immediately after the release Karen. Leon didn't think Bishop, Khan, and Kondrat were the ones to worry about. The mysterious maze was illuminated. The main character suggested that the guys move on. Karen noticed that she liked Leon's confident tone. Holding up a finger, she wondered if the main character deserved her trust. Leon smiled and said he wouldn't disappoint her. After which, the guys headed forward. Their eyes fell on the many passages of the maze. Karen held up a finger and said they should follow her. Taken aback, the protagonist thought that even when he tried to trust his instincts, it was impossible for him to move so fast. He didn't know if it was normal for him to follow her blindly. Turning to Leon, Elsid stated that she had never made a mistake, he asked him to just follow her. Sacred Weapons noted that Karen's tracking abilities were superior to those of the Wood Elves. 
In his mind, he imagined the image of an elf standing next to an adventurer. Leon put a hand to her face and asked her if she was that gifted. Else had assumed that it was due to the properties of the aura. Sacred Weapon considered the dark place to be an advantage to her, on the contrary. After which, Karen raised her hand up. She asked Leon to stop. Karen reported that she sensed the presence of enemies. There were three members of a secret organization standing around the corner of the maze. She noted that there is no way to bypass them. Crean turned to the main character and asked what they would do. Leon believed that he could sense a stronger energy through his aura than the members of the organization and the 23rd district. He pictured them in his mind. The main character understood that they were at a level where even with the power of the holy sword, it was impossible to guarantee an unconditional victory. Wary, Leon said that they should be destroyed. Grinning, Karen noted that the main character was too snobby for C rank. She thought that after making such a statement, it would be shameful to ask for help. The main character thought that Karen would burn with shame if she lost to him. Drawing her dagger, she agreed with Leon. Karen's body was covered in a green aura. She suggested that the main character arrange a small competition. Leon was struck by the green-colored aura, after which, Karen pushed off from the ground. With the help of technology, she could stand on the ceiling. Surprised, Leon asked if this was also an aura skill. Elsid reported that using her aura, she glued the body to the wall. Seeing how masterfully Karen was doing it, Sacred Weapon was sure that she had gone through some very hard training. Elsid noted that if the main character is going to keep up with her speed, then he needs to focus on his legs. Leon struggled to catch up with Karen, who was rushing into the distance. The main character noted that he knows this even without the sacred weapon. Around three members of the secret organization, a rock fell, after which, the man raised his head up. Karen waved happily at him. The man said that there were enemies there. The faces of the members of the secret organization were shocked. In an instant, multiple daggers were stabbed into their heads while watching Karen. Leon was shocked that she threw the daggers with her hand at such speed. Digging his claws into the floor, the man considered her act impudent. A group of monsters appeared before Karen. The man asked if she knew where she was now. Grinning, Karen thought it was an odd question. Rushing to the attack, she reported that she was in a slum without a master. After dodging the attack, the guy declared that these trinkets would not harm them. Suddenly, a rope wrapped around his leg. With her help, Karen pulled the guy to her side. Grinning, Karen said the daggers were just a distraction. With a lightning attack, the Undertaker took the man's head off his shoulders. Taken aback, the main character thought that he was afraid. Leon was extremely glad that these two were in league with him. He couldn't figure out who his opponent was. Suddenly, an invisible projectile was pointed in his direction. A Percy's appeared on Leon's cheek. Elsid thought that the main character was unlucky. The sacred weapon noted that Leon was the most powerful of the three monsters. Before the main character appeared a member of a secret organization. Leon was startled that Elsid had said this just now. After concentrating, the main character believed that if he used the providence technique and hit with full force, a memory of a member of the secret organization throwing an invisible projectile at him popped up in his mind. Leon wondered what exactly he had thrown at him. The monster's chest was completely covered in spikes. Seeing this, Leon was thrown into shock. He thought back to how he had fought the stone slimes. The main character suggested that he had already encountered this kind of attack. After which, he thought of the stone slimes. The monster's spikes were rapidly heading towards Leon. The enraged protagonist prepared to defend himself. With multiple attacks, Leon cut through the monster's spikes. Next, he charged towards the shocked monster. The member of the secret organization couldn't believe what he was seeing. The monster asked if Leon meant to say that he had shredded his spikes. With the help of a powerful attack, the main character cut the monster into two parts. He knew that if he didn't have the foresight skill, he wouldn't be able to react properly. The holy sword was filled with a powerful aura. Leon believed that without the holy sword, he wouldn't have been able to cut this heretic in half. Folding his hands, Elsid noted that this was due to the efforts that the main character made to deal with this force. Sacred weapons considered that Leon was still far from perfect. Smiling, Karen was surprised that the main character had already finished. She noted that despite the fact that Leon took down the opponent a few seconds later than her, he still did well. In her hand, Karen held a portion of the monster's tentacles. The adventurer stated that despite being ranked C, the main character dealt with the heretic alone. She assumed that Leon was one of those who lacked achievements compared to their skills. Karen called the main character newbie. Taken aback, Leon said that the adventurer can think as she pleases. Suddenly, the main character went into shock. He didn't know what the feeling was. His gaze was focused on the remains from the monster that Karen had destroyed. The sword marks left by two people who have nothing in common somehow look too similar, Leon continued to think. The head of the defeated member of the secret organization froze in one position. The main character thought that if you look closely, the cross-section and depth of their wounds are very similar. Leon's face was filled with shock. Putting his hands on his side, Elsid asked if the main character had finally noticed. 
The sacred weapon claimed that he was right. After the fight was over, Karen put away her daggers. Smiling, the adventurer noted that thanks to Leon, dealing with the members of the secret organization was much easier. Turning her head in the direction of the undertaker, Karen said that she wasn't sure about the pathetic worm. The adventurer didn't think that he would be able to keep up with her. Grinning, she assumed she was mistaken. Directing his gaze downwards, the main character asked the sacred weapon to show Karen's stats. After which, Elsid used his technique on the adventurer. The plot showed us Karen's abilities. The screen indicated that Karen's title was Mortician Killer. The main character's face was shocked. Smiling, the adventurer invited Leon to continue on their way. The shocked protagonist agreed with her, calling her a respected senior comrade. His face was full of emotion. An image of Karen, who was depicted on the map, appeared in his mind. The main character was surprised that in the sun, she is in a rank adventurer, Karen, while in the shade, she is an elite assassin called the Undertaker. Leon's face was filled with excitement. He was shocked that he was currently exploring a maze with one of the three great evils of the slum. The main character thought it was very risky. Leon couldn't believe that the beautiful adventurer who created a fun atmosphere around her was actually one of the leaders of the slums. An image of Karen and one of the slum Esther appeared in his mind. The main character thought that this is a fact that no one guesses. After thinking about it, Leon suggested that Khan wasn't aware of this. He believed that the guildmaster would have told him too if he knew about it. An image of Fang and the guildmaster appeared in his mind. In his mind's eye, he pictured the face of an enraged Jezar. Wary, the protagonist knew that if the bishop discovered this deception, Karen would not be able to handle the consequences. As Leon watched the adventurer, he reflected that at the moment, he was the only one who knew the secret of Karen's true identity. He didn't think that anyone else knew that fact. The main character didn't understand what he was getting himself into. Leon was sure that in this situation, she would not leave him alone. In his mind, he imagined Karen reincarnating as the Undertaker. The main character understood that for the killer, his identity is the most secret secret. He believed that any means were used to silence forever anyone who found out this secret. Startled, Leon was sure that he needed to be extremely careful. The main character believed that he should monitor every, even very minor, change in his facial expression. He knew that the assassin was watching him closely at the moment. Karen raised her fist and told them to turn left here. The adventurer noticed that there were enemies ahead again. Their eyes fell on the enraged monster. Saliva dripped from its mouth. The monster's saliva had a powerful effect that could burn through the floor of the maze. Peeking out from the corner, Karen stated that the monster's appearance made her no longer have any desire to fight. The main character suggested that it's not just about her aesthetic taste. Directing his gaze in Leon's direction, Elsid informed that Karen would have a hard time resisting him just by throwing daggers at him. Sacred Weapon stated that if that monster was summoned through the satanic summoning technique, then it would also have regeneration abilities. Raising his head up, the main character asked if they could somehow get around the monster. The adventurer reported that it would take another 30 minutes from the top. Scattered around the enraged monster were the bones of the enemies it had eaten. Leon knew that he couldn't be certain that they wouldn't encounter the same monster on their way around. The main character believed that he still had to fight him. Looking out from the corner, Leon guessed that the members of the secret organization intended to stall for time until the monster devourer was activated. The main character was confident that if they managed to activate it, the victory would be in their pocket. Leon knew that there was no need for them to face them directly. He was thinking about what he needed in this situation. Staring down, the protagonist turned to the Undertaker. Emerging from the shadows, he waited for Leon's words. The main character asked if he could deal a fatal wound to the monster. Thinking about it, the Undertaker asked what if that was the case. Leon turned his head and said that he and Karen would tie his hands and feet, and he asked the Undertaker to be ready for this. Whether you like it or not, we're in the same boat, so wouldn't it be more profitable to fully cooperate now? Continued the main character. The adventurer's face was frozen in one position. After some thought, the Undertaker agreed with him. Delighted, the main character stretched out his hand forward. Leon was thinking that almost all of the stamina he'd spent trying to get this far had been restored. The main character believed that now he needs to try his best. I heard some sounds, and the monster turned its head. He watched the enraged Leon who was heading in his direction. After which, the monster let out a strong roar. A mysterious technique was forming in its mouth. Leon's holy sword was shrouded in a sacred light. The main character turned to Elsid. Sacred flames completely enveloped the room where the monster was located. Leon thought about the proven ability he had experienced when facing the phantom armor. A memory of fighting a fierce battle with the enchanted armor popped up in his mind. The main character understood that this is one of the main functions of the Holy Sword, which erases any power and substance that is life-threatening. Seeing the light, the monster let out a powerful roar. With a swing, the protagonist aimed the Holy Sword towards the monster's throat. A Perseus appeared on his throat. Leon was disappointed that he had inflicted too shallow a wound. 
The monster's paws were pointed in the main character's direction. After dodging, Leon started to step back. The main character believed that he wouldn't be able to dodge next time. His face was filled with fright. After which, Leon applied insight. Concentrating, the main character once again appeared before a powerful monster. Leon believed that at least once more, he should repel his attack. Suddenly, Karen appeared behind the main character. The adventurer asked Leon to hit the monster again. Thinking about it, the main character could not understand whether to trust him or not. After thinking about it, Leon charged towards the enemy. His weapon gave off a powerful aura. Many of Karen's daggers were flying towards the monster. Using its tails, the monster deflected the adventurer's daggers. After which, the main character pointed his sword towards his neck. After being hit, the monster once again let out a powerful roar. As a result of the failed attack, Leon decides to retreat. The main character was amazed that this time he also barely touched the monster. Leon's face was filled with emotion. He believed that he needed to move even faster and put more force into the punch. After preparing to attack, the monster began to swing its tails. Suddenly, his face was thrown into shock. The monster's eyes were fixed on its paws. Surprised, Leon thought about the monster's movements. Under his paw were the Undertaker's daggers. The monster's entire shadow was consumed by the weapon of one of the slumdog evils. Emerging from the shadows, the Undertaker froze in one position. He directed his gaze at the monster and ordered it to die. Immediately, the monster's body was pierced by many huge shadow blades. Because of that, the monster let out a roar. After which, the bloody corpse collapsed on the floor. Shocked, Leon couldn't believe that an Arank ability was displayed in front of him. Stunned, Else noted that the monster's wound didn't regenerate. The sacred weapon suggested that an attack that exceeded the monster's regenerative ability was made. A lot of blood splattered on the floor. The protagonist was thinking of a deadly lunge that would bring down a single opponent, once and for all. After finishing the attack, the Undertaker pulled the daggers in his direction. Leon believed that such an action really corresponds to the image of the killer. Putting her hand on the main character's shoulder, Karen noted that for a hastily assembled group, they have a good teamwork. She asked if the boys thought so. Closing his eyes, Leon agreed with her. The main character stated that throwing daggers at Tails was unimaginably cool. A memory of an adventurer attacking a monster with a ranged weapon popped up in his mind. Raising her hand, Karen noticed that it was nothing compared to the pitiful worm's attack. The adventurer had no idea that the Undertaker could use such a grandiose martial art. Her gaze fell on the monster's corpse. Karen noted that this can be called the highlight of the killer. Closing her eyes, the adventurer believed that the Undertaker had not set his sights on the place of the King of the Slums for nothing. Pointing a finger into the distance, Karen asked if they were going any further. She assumed they didn't have a second's respite. Smiling, the main character said that it was time for them to move out. Leon understood that this sweep operation was based on a battle against time. The main character believed that victory or defeat depended on whether they could arrive at their destination before the ritual was completed. Leaning against the wall, Karen began counting the members of the secret organization. The room was full of them. The adventurer reported that there were eight heretics. She assumed they were moving too fast. Alert, the boys peered out from under the corner of the maze. Karen said they were going to have to work hard this time. Watching the heretics, the main character thought that when it came to judging the power of their enemies, there was no one better than Karen on their team. As he watched the member of the secret organization, Leon thought that each of them was so powerful that it involuntarily made one's body shudder with fear. The main character understood that even in a battle with previous opponents, it was extremely difficult to guarantee victory to a group of two or three people. Leaning down, Leon stated that in the current situation, they had no choice but to wait for Karen's mission companions to join them. After that, the main character noted that they can go in search of them themselves. The adventurer reported that both options are problematic. Karen pointed out that if they arrived too late, or if they already missed each other on the way, then it would all be over. The adventurer's face was filled with emotion. Leaning against the wall, Karen was upset that they'd come all this way and had to roll the dice for luck again. In his mind, Leon thought that from the outside, Karen looked like an ordinary adventurer. The main character noted that he feels uncomfortable because he knows her true identity. Suddenly, Leon heard some sounds. The walls of the maze began to shake. Karen didn't understand what was going on. Cracks began to appear on the walls of the maze. Directing his gaze upward, the main character believed that it was very close. Elsid reported that it was a shock wave that was caused by the collision of huge forces. Alerted, the protagonist assumed that someone from their squad was fighting. The members of the secret organization were discussing something. Hearing some sounds, half of them headed towards him. Looking out from the corner, Leon thought that the four of them had gone to the place where the sound was coming from. 
He knew that in this scenario, they had a better chance. His gaze was directed at the startled heretics. The main character wondered whether to go to the rescue of their comrades who are now fighting, or to attack the enemies, of which there are many times fewer, and break through. Leon's face was covered in beads of sweat. Raising his hand, the main character suggested that it would be better if they teamed up with the others. Leon pointed out that if the breakaway group of enemies gained the upper hand in return, they would have to fight on two fronts. The main character believed that if one of their team was defeated, a huge hole would appear in their strength. Raising his fist, Leon asked if they should try their best to gather all their strength. Closing her eyes, Karen realized that the main character's reasoning was correct. The adventurer reported that the remaining four didn't look like an easy target either. Putting her ear to the ground, Karen said that before they moved out. After listening, the adventurer froze in one position. A field formed around her that showed her the way. Karen held up her finger and told Leon to follow her. Watching the walking adventurer, in his thoughts, the main character noted that the level of extrasensory perception of Karen was beyond human capabilities. He suggested that this is an ability that combines insight and sound detection techniques. Screams continued to come from the depths of the maze. As the boys watched, the monster plunged a claw into the back of their comrade. Their faces were filled with shock. The body of the Knight of the Count family was pierced by many attacks. His lifeless body hung on the monster's claw. Kondrat's mouth was bleeding. Enraged, Leon lunged in his direction. He understood that he was surrounded by two enemies. Many tentacles tried to attack the enraged Leon. The heretic who was standing opposite the main character asked that this baby be left to him. Leon's face was filled with hatred. He thought about being attacked by one when Karen was attacked by two. The adventurer was waiting for the members of the secret organization to attack. Watching the corpses of the heretics, the protagonist realized that those who were lying on the floor were killed by a knight of the Count's family. Turning to Leon, Elsid said that he didn't need to worry about Karen. Sacred Weapon noted that what was more important was that his opponent was extremely strong. Elsid asked the protagonist to put aside all extraneous thoughts and focus entirely on who was standing in front of him. The secret organization member's face was enveloped in a red aura. The heretic folded his hands and spoke of love and justice. After applying the technique, a mysterious blue aura appeared all around Leon. The shocked protagonist thought of the blue mist. The heretic said that Leon should take it as an honor. He said that the main character can go to Polly just by touching the mist. The secret organization member's body was shrouded in a powerful technique. Using a wandering ghost on some small fry like you means giving a luxurious death. The heretic continued. Wary, Elsid assumed that a member of the secret organization had used Summoner. An image of the members of the secret organization appeared in Sacred Weapon's mind. Elsid reported that in general, heretics fall into two categories. The Sacred Weapon tells the protagonist about mutants who use satanic techniques on their bodies, such as the monster they encountered earlier. After which, Elsid told him about summoners, which summon creatures from other dimensions. His gaze fell on the heretic standing in front of them. Sacred Weapons noted that all of them didn't possess even a shred of sanity. Leaning the sword against his face, the protagonist asked if the member of the secret organization was talking about a luxurious death. With an angry look on his face, Leon claimed that the heretic had stolen the line from him. After which, the main character threw his punch. Grinning, the member of the secret organization thought that he had come across a very stupid guy. The heretic asked if Leon thought that a sword that represented a physical body would affect spiritual powers. At that moment, the secret organization member's technique was destroyed. The heretic's face was frozen in shock. Grinning, Leon noted that there were always exceptions. The main character was confident that as long as he had the holy sword in his hands, he could destroy anything. Startled, the heretic thought it was nonsense. He pointed out that no matter how much aura power was put into the weapon, it was impossible for it to destroy his satanic technique. After which, the heretic once again placed his hands in the seal to activate his technique. A pentagram appeared above the head of the member of the secret organization, from which a huge monster gradually began to climb out. With just a swing of his sword, the main character cut the monster into two pieces. The dumbfounded heretic raised his hands, after which, Leon pierced his chest with his sword. Blood gushed out from the secret organization member's chest. While holding Leon's sword, the heretic asked if he thought his attack would have any effect on him. After paying attention to the wound, the member of the secret organization couldn't believe that it wasn't healing. The heretic did not understand what kind of blow would bring the satanic art to naught. A shocked member of the secret organization suggested that Leon, the heretic's face was filled with fear. After the protagonist destroyed the heretic, he placed the holy sword in its case. Leon's gaze was directed in the direction of the adventurer. With an indignant face, Karen wondered if she could have lost. She thought that this was a real shame that had fallen on her head. In his thoughts, the protagonist noted that the adventurer was fighting against two opponents. Taken aback, Leon said that he had come across a weak opponent. 
Their eyes fell on the place where the sounds were coming from. Karen thought it was more important to find out what had happened to Conrad. The heavily injured knight of the Count family apologized for appearing before them in such a sorry state. Conrad said that in this state, he will not be able to go further, along with other team members. He asked the boys not to waste time on him and go to the others as soon as possible. Leaning against the wall, the knight of the Count's family declared that even if it was late, it would be as soon as his body recovered. Karen turned to Conrad. Alert, she asked him how much time he had left. The knight of the Count family was surprised by what she already knew. Turning her gaze downwards, the adventurer wondered if this meant that the power was so low that Conrad, who possessed a high-level aura, was unable to stop the bleeding. The main character's face froze in one position. Putting his hand to his wound, Conrad said that he could hold out for at least another hour. The knight of the Count's family noted that he had no idea what would happen next. Watching Conrad's wound, Leon was shocked at the time remaining. He didn't know if they could clear the city of evil in an hour. In his thoughts, the protagonist wondered if they would have the opportunity to heal the Knight of the Count family immediately after the battle was over. If I wasn't able to do something, I wouldn't even waste time thinking about it, but right now I have the Holy Sword, Leon continued to think. After which, the main character put his hand to his weapon. Thoughtfully, he turned to Elsid. Sacred weapon agreed with him. The main character leaned his hand against Kondrat's wound. Elsid stated that if he repeated after him word for word, the holy healing art would be activated and the wound would heal. Karen's face was in shock. Concentrating, Leon turned to the goddess. The maze room was covered in a powerful holy aura. The protagonist asked that the light of those dedicated to justice not be shaken by the cold wind in Death Valley. The Count family knight's wound gradually began to heal. Conrad's face was filled with emotion. A shocked Karen believed that this was commensurate with the bishop's sacred reception. The wound on the Count family knight's body had healed. Delighted, Conrad told Leon that it was he who had planned the attack on the 25th district. He noted that after seeing the main character's abilities, he understands why he is a leader. Conrad said that it was now very clear to him why Dijezar trusted him so much. A knight of the Count's family has declared that Leon is a candidate for the Cardinals of the Holy Order. With a smirk on his face, Elsid was surprised that the main character was first a paladin candidate and now a cardinal candidate. Having calmed down, Conrad noted that he was behaving too tactlessly for a man who owed Leon for the rest of his life. The Knight of the Count's family reported that it was impossible to fight, after which, he stated that he didn't have enough strength to heal on his own. Taken aback, Conrad assumed that revealing Leon's identity wasn't what he wanted. As long as you don't take a high spiritual rank in the future, Sir Conrad sitting in front of Stoy will keep his mouth shut. The Knight of the Count's family declared, holding up his finger, sacred weapons believed that misunderstandings accumulated like a snowball. The dumbfounded protagonist thanked Conrad. Karen said she would give him a healing elixir. She asked the Knight of the Count family to stay here while they returned to their original mission. The main character noted that they should hurry. Conrad waved to the members of the main squad who were walking off into the distance. Leon's face was shrouded in many doubts. Interested, Karen turned to the startled protagonist, pinning him to the wall, the adventurer asked if what Conrad said was true. Her face was filled with delight. Karen felt that being a candidate for the Cardinals during the Leon years was not unprecedented. Embarrassed, the protagonist averted his gaze to the side. The adventurer noted that the attribute of Leon's aura is the sun, so he also mastered the sacred example, which was not inferior in level to the bishop's art. Karen thought that Leon was quite worthy of such a position. After which, the adventurer noted that the main character is also very good at using aura weapons. Her gaze fell on Leon's holy sword. Karen asked who taught the main character how to use it. Closing his eyes, Leon declared that he was not a contender for the cardinal post. Folding her fingers, the adventurer assumed that the main character was a disciple of the Holy Iron Castle Order. She asked Leon to teach her too, as she is burning with curiosity. Turning around, the main character reflected that if he did not know the true nature of Karen, he might have succumbed to her persuasions. Leon noted that if they became friends in the future, he would share a couple of secrets with her. Continuing to look at the main character, the adventurer stated that contrary to her expectations, he turned out to be an impregnable wall. Karen wondered if all the boys from the Order were like that. Tying her ponytail, the adventurer noted that usually, if she asks for something, almost all men immediately comply with her request. In his thoughts, the main character did not understand who could remain indifferent to seduction in such an open form. Turning his gaze downwards, Leon asked Karen to put all the jokes aside for later and think about how they should proceed. The adventurer's face was filled with displeasure. Directing his gaze in Karen's direction, Leon asked if they would look for other team members or if they would try to break through together. After finishing her hair, the adventurer declared that they wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. Hearing this, the main character's face was covered with many questions. Karen smiled and told him that he would know when they were there. 
After that, the guys went on their way through the maze. Before their eyes, one of the heretics fell dead. Their eyes fell on Jezar and Khan, who were among the many corpses of members of the secret organization. The bishop was glad that the main character had come to them. Fang noticed that the little ones were reaching out to them. In his mind, Leon felt a little sorry for the heretics. Jezar smiled and said he was glad to see the boys safe and sound. The undertaker came out of the shadows and asked if the bishop was happy to see him. Turning away, Jezar said he had no idea he was there, either. Hearing this, one of the evils of the slum fell into a stupor. The walls of the maze were shrouded in darkness. The main character reported that Kondrat was seriously injured, because of which he is now restricted in movement. Khan folded his hands and listened intently. Leon noted that a knight of the Count's family needs about two hours to fully recover. The main character thought that they had time to wait for him. Putting a hand to his chin, Jezar knew there was nothing he could do about their situation, and the five of them would have to go ahead. Turning to Karen, Feng asked if she was an adventurer, if she had any useful artifacts. Khan pointed out that if she doesn't want to lose face due to excessive greed, then she needs to get everything out of her pockets quickly. Grinning, Karen asked who Feng was to talk to her like that. The adventurer called Khan a bloodsucker who siphons blood from the common people. Feng's face was filled with rage. Taken aback, Jezar asked everyone to calm down. The bishop said that now he will announce their plan. With confidence on his face, Jezar stated that he, who has the greatest resistance to satanic techniques, will be in the vanguard, while Khan and Karen will move in the middle of the formation. Pointing his finger at Leon, the bishop stated that he would stay at the back of the formation to protect the team's rear. Jezar pointed out that they should keep the main character as their trump card. Grinning, Khan was surprised that Jezar wanted to use the main character as a trump card. Taken aback, Feng agreed to the bishop's terms, wondering what would happen to the undertaker. Raising his hand, Leon noted that if no one objected, he would like one of the slumdog evils to join him. The main character said that while they were heading to the rest of the team, the undertaker helped them a lot. Karen smiled and noted that he had contributed to a successful reunion. In his mind, Leon thought that it was obvious that the adventurer was in a desperate situation. Putting his hand to his head, Khan noted that the undertaker doesn't listen to anyone, so it would be best to leave him to Leon. Turning his head, Jezar asked if they were going any further. Strange sounds came from the depths of the maze. An entity was heading for the main squad. Wary, Feng said that the whole air is saturated with bile energy. Sounds were coming from the strange entity. Khan thought it was like a space that was created using satanic techniques. Concentrating, the bishop was covered in a powerful sacred aura. Heading into the portal, Jezar asked me to follow him. After that, the guys went on their way. Making his way into the depths of darkness, the main character realized that whatever it was, if you do not take into account the sense of aura, then he did not see or hear anything. Leon compared this feeling to being stuck in a swamp, which is slowly being pulled into a quagmire. The main character's hand moved towards the light. Leon was glad when he finally got out of the portal. Alarmed, Jezar turned to his team. From all sides, the guys were surrounded by members of a secret organization. The eyes of the heretics were shrouded in a red aura. The main character assumed that the members of the secret organization knew that they would come here. Grinning, the man didn't think that he would have to wait so long for the main team. A couple of heretics were standing behind him. The man noted that it was an honor for them to visit their humble abode, but he did not expect that they would be so slow. A satanic sign was placed on the face of the heretic. Grinning, the man expressed his gratitude to them from the bottom of his heart. When he saw the man, Jezar went into shock. The heretic's face was filled with emotion. Horrified, the bishop assumed that the man was a preacher. The heretic was amazed that he recognized him at a glance. Wary, the protagonist asked if the preacher was the head of the heretics. Elsid reported that this was exactly the case. He noted that evil also has its own hierarchy. An image of a member of a secret organization appeared in Sacred Weapon's mind. Elsid told Leon that this was a novice using a satanic technique he had received from someone. Sacred Weapon reported that a believer who, in the course of self-exploration of satanic techniques, was consumed by this power. Elsid noted that he was finally spreading the satanic teaching everywhere. He stated that this was someone who deserved the title of leader, who was called a preacher. Sacred Weapon's memories conjured up images of the many heretics they encountered along the way. The preacher's body was wrapped in black robes. Elsid noted that when compared with the Holy Church, he is a high-ranking bishop. Raising his hand, the leader of the heretics thought that today was truly a wonderful day. The preacher noted that the ritual was successful, and the worthless lives they sacrificed still bore fruit. Jezar's face was filled with anger. Raising his hands, the leader of the heretics declared that he would never have thought that he would be able to demonstrate the teachings of the true god in front of an ignorant servant of the goddess. The boys' faces were shocked. They thought the preacher was crazy. Doubtful, Khan asked if the ritual was successful. Feng noted that nothing had happened. 
The members of the secret organization called the main squad a bunch of pathetic worms. The guy said that they will not be able to fix anything. With a malicious smile on his face, the leader of the heretics reported that the process had already started. He noted that only a few seconds remained before the end. The preacher said that they would soon see that all their efforts were pointless. Alert, Leon turned to the sacred weapon. The main character asked if the preacher said that the ritual was successful. Leon guessed that in that case, their plan was completely doomed to failure. Else it informed them that they still had time. An image of a hook being lowered into the portal appeared in his mind. Sacred Weapon reported that the summoning principle of City Devourer is similar to fishing. Elsid noted that using the essence of life force as bait, monsters are being lured away from outside the otherworldly dimension. Leon's face was filled with excitement. He was thinking about the so-called fishing trip. Elsid said that they still had time before the fish was found and bitten. In his mind, Sacred Weapon imagined the image of a monster trying to devour the hook of a fishing rod. The main character suggested that they had absolutely no idea when the monster would find their bait and take it. Thinking about it, Elsid noted that it could be said that way. In his mind, Leon knew that they might have an hour or even just a few seconds left. The faces of the heretics were wreathed in a malicious grin. The main character believed that in the end, it all comes down to a race against time. Alarmed, Leon turned to the bishop. Concentrating, Jezar turned to the merciful goddess. He asked her dream to send her soft light to them so that they would not be lost in the darkness. The bishop's hand was pointed toward the moon. Suddenly, a sacred ray of light appeared above the heads of the members of the secret organization. Jezar's technique enveloped the entire maze. The dumbfounded heretics began to cover their eyes with their hands due to the intense pain. Due to the powerful holy stream, the main character put his hand to his face. Elsid said that this is a composite technique that combines aura and sacred technique. Sacred Weapon noted that the sun technique was certainly not enough, but it would be enough to hold back the satanic summoning technique. Elsid had said that using his light would be much more efficient. The preacher's face was filled with anger. Leon noted that in any case, this will stop the satanic technique of summoning members of a secret organization for a while. After which, an enraged Karen charged in. Using the heretic's body, the leader dodged the adventurer's daggers. A fierce battle began in one part of the maze. The main character was thinking that the preacher still hadn't joined the battle yet. He thought it meant that the place he was protecting was the core of the ritual. An image of the place where the leader of the heretics was located appeared in Leon's mind. Having prepared for the attack, the main character understood that while the members of the secret organization are not able to use their satanic techniques, it is necessary to destroy the circle. Grinning, the preacher called the main squad not smart worms. He asked them if they thought they could seal the spell that way. Many satanic seals appeared above Leon's head. From these seals, the paws of monsters gradually began to come out. Before the main character was a lot of angry monsters. Horrified, Leon didn't understand why they all looked like dogs, without exception. Placing his hands on his side, Elsid reported that since the satanic summoning technique was broken, the preacher must have used a defective satanic technique to create a chimera and summon it. The sacred weapon noted that it was an imperfect creature, so it should destroy itself soon. The main character believed that even for such an imperfect creature, it was enough to buy a little time. The core of the ritual was filled with a powerful red aura. In his mind, Leon speculated that this might mean that the activation of the ritual was imminent. Enraged, Khan said he would show the monsters their place. Then, with a powerful attack, he knocked the monster down. Feng's hand pierced through the monster. There were blood splatters on his face. Khan's hand was covered in the monster's blood, which was eating away at it. Karen threw a dagger at the roaring monster. The shocked adventurer couldn't believe that daggers didn't pass through the monster's poisonous armor. Further, Karen suggested that they were devoid of pain reflexes from the very beginning. Turning his head in Leon's direction, Jezar informed him that at this rate, they were going to have an endless battle until their strength ran out. The bishop noted that the longer this continues, the greater the danger will hang over them. The main character completely agreed with his words. Clutching the holy sword in his hand, Leon believed that in this situation, it was necessary to break through to the core of the ritual as soon as possible. The main character was thinking that it was hard for him because he couldn't use the power of the holy sword to its full potential. Being wary, Elsid stated that if the monsters noticed the hero's existence, the situation would become much more complicated. The sacred weapons believed that they would put their lives on the line and try to restrain Leon's actions. He asked the main character to keep in mind that the situation can only be changed in their favor by catching them off guard. Concentrating, Leon said he knew it. The main character understood that at the moment, his role was to deliver the final blow. The preacher's face was wreathed in a malicious grin. The faces of the main team were shocked. Behind the leader of the heretics, the ill-fated technique they were trying to prevent was activated. Overjoyed, the preacher noted the monster's appearance. The leader of the heretics reported that the city devourer had answered their call. 
a monster gradually began to climb out of the satanic portal. Leon clutched at his heart, thinking that it was pounding too fast in his chest. A powerful red aura emanated from the portal created by the preacher. The protagonist was thinking of an overwhelming terror that he had never experienced before. He understood that it was a city sink. Alarmed, Leon turned to the sacred weapon. Elsid noted that he wasn't allowed to use the holy sword yet. Sacred weapons believed that they needed some sort of gap to break through. Elsid asked the main character to use a sacred move, using half of the accumulated power. Taken aback, Leon asked if the sacred move would work. Folding his hands, the sacred weapon noted that it would be hard for him. Elsid thought that thanks to the moon that Jezar had created, he had an idea. With a smirk, the sacred weapon turned its gaze towards the moon. Elsid reported that to fully reproduce the symbol of the goddess, the sun and moon were needed. In his mind, the sacred weapon imagined the image of Leon, who represented the sun, and the bishop, who represented the moon. Elsid noted that people with auras of the sun and moon were gathered here now. Sacred weapon stated that, among other things, it is a combination of bishop and hero, which allows for a complex sacred move. Elsid noted that this is truly an unfortunate set of circumstances for evil. With the help of the technique, the sacred weapon allowed Leon to see the sacred technique. He asked the main character to read it. Leon's face was frozen in place. The main character turned to the great goddess, who carefully observed the sun, moon and all things. A powerful stream of sacred light appeared around Leon. The main character noted that they are always grateful to her. He said that her open eyes were her divine love, and her closed eyes were her heart's concern. Dumbfounded, the bishop thought that this was the writing of the first song of the goddess. Surprised, Khan suggested that another sphere had formed at the top. An image of the sun appeared above the towering moon. Karen raised her hand and felt warm. Concentrating, the main character said that on a day when the sun and moon rise simultaneously, those who look at the sky kneel and sincerely pray. Raising his hands, Leon used the technique to activate the shrine. The holy light shone on all the nearby heretics. Putting his fists together, Elsid declared that the sanctuary was the perfect counter to satanic techniques. The sacred weapon noted that the resulting space rejects all alien beings and principles. After attacking one of the heretics, Jezar informed them that they needed to take action. After which, the main squad charged into battle. Enraged, the leader of the heretics called them unholy signs of the human race and worthless henchmen of the goddess. With a snap of his finger, the preacher declared that he would destroy them all. After the heretic leader's command, the monsters turned their gaze towards him. The hearts of the monsters were ripped out in an instant. After which, the preacher clasped them in his hands. The infuriated leader of the heretics said that he was sorry that he had to sacrifice the valuable lives of heretics to stop a bunch of pathetic worms. Gripping the monster's heart in his hand, the preacher ordered the main squad to see God's true favor. After which, the heretic leader's body was enveloped in a powerful red aura. After finishing the rite, the preacher reincarnated into a monster. Sharp spikes appeared on its body. The boy's faces were shocked. After reincarnating, the leader of the heretics asked what they had to say about it. The preacher said that he would prove to them that their god, who gave power to insignificant people, is true. Red smoke was coming out of the heretic leader's mouth. The protagonist's face was filled with excitement. Elsid reported that the shrine's effect, which is activated at Leon's current level, is not very long-lasting. Sacred weapons believed that if he was able to do something like this during the sanctum effect, then when the technique was dispelled, they would have no way to resist him. The dumbfounded protagonist froze in one position. Members of the main squad rushed to attack the preacher. The boy's abilities couldn't possibly break through the heretic leader's defenses. There was a powerful satanic aura in the air. The preacher asked if that was all they could do. Grinning, the leader of the heretics declared that now it was his turn. With a powerful attack, the preacher delivered his punch. The members of the main squad flew to the side. When the main character tried to stand up, he realized that they had too big a difference in size. In his mind, Leon believed that his strength was overwhelming, and his regenerative and defensive abilities were beyond the limit. Gripping the holy sword in his hand, the protagonist assumed that the effective means against him was to use the full power of his weapon. Leveling his gaze at the preacher, Leon didn't know if he could defeat him with a single blow. The protagonist wondered if, if he succeeded, they would lose their only remaining way to stop the heretic leader. Grinning, the preacher noted that he was brimming with power. The heretic leader believed that they were indeed like small bugs. Alert, Leon started scanning the area after the preacher's punch. Unconscious, Jezar and Khan lay in a pile of rubble. Enraged, the protagonist couldn't believe that he had defeated everyone in one blow. Leon wondered if he had a way out of this situation. Wounded, Karen put her hand to her head. Heading towards her, the main character asked if she was alright. 
Karen said it seemed so. Wary, the adventurer noted that it was quite dangerous. Karen reported that neither the Undertaker's attack nor its techniques had any effect on the preacher. The main character's face was shrouded in darkness. In his mind, Leon knew that Karen was the Undertaker. After which, he turned his attention to the adventurer's ability called Shadow Walk. Inspired, the main character asked Karen to help. He claimed that he needed her power. Surprised, the adventurer assumed that Leon had come up with some worthwhile idea. The main character announced that he would sneak up from behind and destroy the magic circle in order to interrupt the ritual. His gaze fell on the satanic portal that was located behind the heretic leader. Leon said that their main task now is not to defeat the preacher at all. Spreading her hands, Karen noted that it was impossible. The adventurer asked Leon exactly how he imagined breaking through the heretic leader's defenses, and he was left behind. Karen wondered if she looked like a sorceress. She believed that the main character was planning to launch something like a teleport. The main character said that you can try to make a jump through space. Closing her eyes, Karen asked him exactly how he was suggesting she do it. Leon's face was frozen in place, shouting with indignation. The main character said that since the adventurer is an undertaker, then she is quite capable of this. Leon pointed out that he wouldn't reveal her secret, so he asked her for help. Hearing this, Karen was confused. Raising his hand, the protagonist noted that he did not know why the adventurer leads a double life. Leon stated that if they failed the mission now, they would all die. After which, Karen jumped away from him. Her gaze was shrouded in doubt. The protagonist's face was filled with excitement. With her head down, Karen agreed to Leon's request. She noted that it is not difficult to help her. Putting her hands to her face in shame, Karen asked when the main character knew who she was. The adventurer stated that if Leon knew this, he should have told her right away. Covering her hands with her face, Karen said that she was going to burn with shame. Taken aback, the main character asked not to make him laugh. He noted that if he had spoken, she would have plunged a dagger into his throat. Putting the dagger to Leon's throat, the adventurer reported that it was so. Grinning, Karen noted that women's secrets were too valuable. Feng's gaze fell on Jezar, whose face was completely covered in blood. Khan bent down and asked how long the bishop planned to stay in bed. Grinning, Feng called him a weakling. Jezar's face was filled with rage. The bishop became agitated and asked if Khan was tired of living. Karen stopped and said she would leave Leon there. She said that the main character needs to go further himself. Turning her head, the adventurer noted that if she followed him, the preacher would immediately see through their plan. Leon smiled and asked Karen not to die. Hearing this, the adventurer's face turned red. Calling the undertaker, Karen noted that in her life, she had heard many times the speeches of priests who were concerned about her fate. After that, the main character went on the road. Elsid said that shadow walking is a technique that allows you to cross space. Sacred Weapons had noted that traveling long distances was difficult even for high-ranked wizards, so Karen most likely used this technique to make the small rolls needed to kill. Leon's gaze fell on the leader of the heretics. In his mind, the protagonist believed that in other words, it would be enough to get behind the preacher's back. With the help of Karen's technique, Leon was behind him. Watching the satanic portal, the main character realized that he had arrived at the place. He was thinking that this was the core of the city devourer summoning ritual. Leon's face was filled with excitement. While observing the core, the protagonist assumed that there was a clot of life force there. Sacred Weapon reported that this was the case. Their faces were shadowed by a red aura. Else had guessed that this was the result of sacrificing more than 10,000 lives. After which, the main character clenched the holy sword in his hand. Completely covered in a powerful aura, Leon declared that he would never forgive such a thing. Startled, Jezar turned to the main character. His eyes were frozen in place. The protagonist's heart was pierced by the preacher's claw. Leon's mouth was bleeding slowly. Dumbfounded, Elsid tried to call out to the main character. The leader of the heretics turned and ordered Leon to surrender, calling him a mud of the goddess. Lifting him off the ground, the preacher said that the main character is a sucker who missed his last chance. My god bless you, accept certain death, the preacher continued. The leader of the heretics raised Leon's body above his head. The terrified members of the main squad rushed to his aid. After which, the preacher waved them aside. Turning his head, the leader of the heretics asked them not to worry as it would soon be their turn. While watching the main character, the preacher asked if he had already died. Exhausted, Leon thought he might die. He was upset that he had never been able to stop the evil and not do something that could be worthy of the title of hero. At this time, the sacred weapon was trying to tell him something. In his mind, Leon thought about how he couldn't hear Elf's words. An image of mountains appeared in his mind. The main character recalled that they agreed to go to the Titanium Mountains together with the sacred weapon. He assumed that he wouldn't be able to keep his promise. Gradually, the main character began to lose consciousness. After which, Leon completely stopped thinking. An image of Lion reaching out to him popped up in his mind. His friend said that he believed in his promise. Lion was confident that the main character would fulfill it, no matter what. 
a glimmer of sacred light appeared in the protagonist's eyes. Angry, the protagonist pulled out the preacher's paw. Leon cut off part of his leg and jumped out of the way. The leader of the heretics watched him, alert. The main character's bloodied body was lying on the floor. Leon struggled to his feet, wounded. As Leon tried to catch his breath, he knew that he had no chance of success. He believed that nevertheless, the destiny of a warrior meant striving for victory. Standing up, the main character thought that this was the teaching of his teacher, who always stood behind him. Holy Weapon's face was filled with shock. Raising the sword above him, in his mind, Leon believed that being a hero, he should defeat the preacher and save everyone. After which, the leader of the heretics laughed out loud. Calling the main character a bug, he said that he recognized his willpower. The preacher noted that even moving with his last breath, he did not let go of the sword in his hands. As the leader of the heretics prepared for the next attack, he said that in that case, Leon should try to hold out against it. With his head down, Rodrigo informed him that he had given him no choice. Appearing next to the main character, Rodrigo noted that he had done everything in his power. The hero said that this is the reason why he will help him. Rodrigo grinned and asked Leon to watch him closely. A smile appeared on the protagonist's face. While directing his gaze downwards, the main character was talking about the Big Dipper sword. Concentrating, he activated the Great Chariot. With lightning speed, Leon charged towards the preacher. A sacred light radiated from the main character's body. Taken aback, the leader of the heretics wondered what was going on here. He couldn't figure out exactly when Leon had gotten past him. At the same time, the preacher's head flew off his shoulders. She fell away from the body and quickly fell to the floor. Sneering, the leader of the heretics noted that the main character had once again managed to wound his body. After that, the preacher asked if Leon really thought that all this would end the moment his head fell off his shoulders. After which, the leader of the heretics tried to use regeneration. He was shocked by the fact that it didn't work. Grinning, Leon noted that even with his head cut off, the preacher was still alive. It made him sick. Putting his hand to his neck, the protagonist asked if the preacher planned to show him his pathetic appearance. He wondered how the leader of the heretics viewed sticking to this role until the very end. The main character noted that even without a head, the preacher can function perfectly. Enraged, the leader of the heretics wondered what kind of disrespect this was. With a cry, the preacher spoke about the insult in his direction. The leader of the heretics noted that it would not be enough just to wash it off with blood. Thinking about it, Leon turned his attention to his injured hand. Rodrigo noted that due to the injury, the power of the destructive force was insufficient. Towering over Leon, the hero wasn't sure if his body could withstand a second attack. After which, Rodrigo asked if he was ready to try his luck. After a while, the main character nodded his head. Delighted, Rodrigo said that in return, he would give one lesson, which in another situation would have cost him a penny. After that, the hero used the great chariot again. Concentrating, the main character rushed towards the barely alive preacher. Horrified, the heretic leader couldn't understand why he couldn't regenerate. Angry, he noted that his power was draining away. After preparing to create the technique, the preacher said that in this case, he would drag them all with him. The maze room was filled with a satanic aura. The preacher ordered everyone to die. He was saying that they would all die with him. Placing the holy weapon on his shoulder, Rodrigo noted that he knew it would be like this, which was the reason why he didn't attack at full power. Grinning, the hero said that he did this in order to finally give him a good kick in the ass. The preacher's face was filled with horror. Smiling, the hero asked Leon not to lose sight of anything. Rodrigo said that the entire essence of the Sword of the Big Dipper is based on the connection between the stars. The hero noted that Leon, as not an experienced warrior, can be difficult to cope even with the first step. All over the maze room, the protagonist's holy sword that he held in his hand shone brightly. The hero noted that if Leon redirects the repulsive power of the technique to the holy sword, it will be possible to reproduce a one-time killing technique. After which, the great chariot was once again formed in the constellation. Rushing into battle, the main character used the holy cross. Leon's technique emitted powerful glints of sacred light. Concentrating, the main character directed the technique in the direction of the preacher. After which, the satanic core was destroyed. Holding onto a part of the floor, the heretic leader declared that he couldn't self-destruct to take everyone to the next world with him, and the life force core was also destroyed. The desperate preacher thought it all made no sense. The terrified preacher screamed as he was sucked into the portal. The infuriated leader of the heretics believed that things couldn't end this way. Once on the back side of the portal, the preacher flew straight into the mouth of the city devourer, after which, the monster slammed its mouth shut. A large earthquake started in the maze room. And then, the satanic portal finally disappeared. As he left Leon's body, Elsid noted that they were on the verge of death. Taken aback, the protagonist asked if there was a scavenger in front of them. Sacred Weapon reported that this was the case. Although the life force clod is destroyed, but it seems that that pitiful worm was a much more appetizing bait, Elsid continued. 
With a smirk, Sacred Weapon noted that if they were even a fraction of a second late, they would also become the City Devourer's snack. The main team members who regained consciousness clutched their heads due to the intense pain. Elsid thought Leon had done an excellent job. After which, the main character fell to the floor. The main character's body was filled with pain. Startled, Jezar ran to him. The bishop said that Leon should not waste his energy on talking. He said that he would immediately start treating him. Concentrating, Jezar applied the technique to Leon's open wound. Putting his hand to his heart, the bishop noted that a great disaster had almost happened. Closing his eyes, the bishop considered it a blessing that they had managed to deal with everything in time. Taken aback, the main character said that Jezar needed medical attention. Karen smiled and asked if they had won. The adventurer reported that when she regained consciousness, she saw a bright flash, after which, the preacher disappeared without a trace. Karen asked if Leon had killed him. Horrified, Khan wondered what had happened to the ritual. Feng said he was waiting for some explanation. In the main character's mind, a memory of the wreckage that was left after the failed summoning popped up. Leon reported that the activation of the city sink was stopped. The main character noted that the preacher was dragged into his own interdimensional portal where he finally died. Exhausted, Leon turned to Jezar. The main character suggested that he might lose consciousness now, so he asked him to take care of him. After which, Leon collapsed on the floor. Elsid grinned and praised Leon. A faint smile appeared on the protagonist's face. Suddenly, in one of the rooms of the maze, a strong earthquake began. Horrified, Karen assumed that everything was being destroyed. The bishop believed that this was a completely natural outcome, because the creator of this space had died. The floor of the maze began to split into huge cracks. Khan said it was time for them to wrap up their analysis of the situation and get out of here as soon as possible. Taken aback, Karen noted that they needed to bring Kondrat with them. The shocked knight of the Count family watched as everything crumbled in his path. The flustered Feng thought this whole situation was completely insane. The sun was beginning to rise over Blaine. Taken aback, Rodrigo thought that this time the situation was dangerous. The hero believed that Leon hadn't even learned how to form an aura properly. Rodrigo noted that with all this, he was forced to face a conspiracy whose goal was the absolute absorption of the city. Sacred Weapon stated that if the hero was watching him, then if should help him. Rodrigo closed his eyes as he listened. Elsid thought that the hero had nothing to do with himself, Elsid assumed that he was just idle. Rodrigo's face showed a hint of displeasure. Sacred Weapon asked if everything was okay. Outraged, Rodrigo called him stupid. He wondered what use the saint would be if the hero died. Rodrigo asked if the hero should be his top priority. Calming down, he reported that Elsid had managed to overcome the crisis. He noted that heroes often face similar problems. Rodrigo thought that what had happened would be a good lesson for Leon. Folding his hands, he asked how the fine was going. Putting his hand to his face, he felt that there was nothing he could do about it. Rodrigo talked about how he had to use the force without removing the seal. Laughing, the hero thought that he would figure it out on his own. Rodrigo pointed out that if Leon continued to train hard, he could quickly reach the B rank. He stated that then he would be able to advance at least two steps in the Big Dipper sword technique demonstrated. Rodrigo's face was filled with doubt. The hero believed that Leon should be able to take care of himself before going to the Titan Mountains. The guild flag fluttered violently in the wind. Sunlight fell on the walls of the rooms. The main character was in bed. Opening his eyes a crack, he saw sunlight streaming through the windows. Leaping out of bed, Leon wondered where he was. Suddenly, his entire body was covered in intense pain. After which, the main character began to scream violently. His hands were covered in medical bandages. Fragments of memories of his battle with the preacher surfaced in his mind. Then he thought about how he had notified Jezar that he might lose consciousness. Standing up, Leon assumed he was in the guild infirmary. The main character thought that this was quite a luxurious hospital room for a C-rank adventurer. Raising his hand, he spoke to the sacred weapon. At the same time, Elsid emerged from the seal on his hand. Surprised, Leon thought that the appearance was not the same as usual. Elsid appeared and asked the main character to listen carefully to him. Sacred Weapon reported that if the main character plays this message, then he has already come to his senses. Leon's face was filled with shock. First of all, Elsid congratulated him on his recovery. With a smirk, Sacred Weapon noted that the victory was won thanks to him, so Leon would not receive his congratulations. Hearing this, the main character was indignant. With a serious expression on his face, Elsid declared that he would finish with the jokes and get to the main point. The Sacred Weapon reported that for one month, he wouldn't be able to talk to it. Leon's face was filled with confusion. Elsid asked if he was upset. After which, he stated that there was nothing to be done about it. The plot showed us a holy sword bound with iron chains. Sacred Weapon reported that the problem was that he had come of his own free will, breaking all the taboos. Elsid pointed out that this was the reason why the power of the holy sword restricted its creation. 
by pointing at yourself. The main character asked if it was because the sacred weapon was using his body, after which, Elsid stated that the problem was that he was too good. Taken aback, Leon couldn't see what the fact that Elsid was too good even had to do with what had happened. Raising a finger, Sacred Weapon asked if the main character understood what he said, and then he repeated about one month. An image of a guy with an aura concentrated in his hand appeared in Elsid's mind. The Sacred Weapon reported that the next time they met, Leon would be able to demonstrate a perfect aura formation. He hoped Leon could handle it. Elsid stated that he personally showed the use of the Big Dipper sword technique, so the only thing that remains for the main character is to work out what he saw. Leon's face was filled with doubt. Grinning, Sacred Weapon asked the protagonist not to overexert himself until he was fully recovered, unless he was eager to become a cripple. Leon's mind flashed to the memory of how he had used Rodrigo's technique to defeat the leader of the heretics. In his mind, the protagonist understood that his C-ranked body still had a certain limit. Leon reflected that it was hard for him to imagine how amazing it would have been if he had been able to see Rodrigo personally use this technique in the past. Placing a hand on his chest, Elsid declared that this was the end of his message. Sacred Weapon noted that as a teenager, getting involved in a conspiracy like the summoning of the City Devourer wasn't an easy task. After which, he praised Leon. With a grin, Elsid said that the main character did a good job of solving the problem. He asked Leon to train hard in his absence. Smiling, the main character asked to leave this matter to him. Leon swore that he would be up to the task at hand. After which, Elst reported that this message would self-destruct in five seconds. Upon hearing this, the main character was thrown into shock. Blaine's sun was slowly starting to set. Thinking, Leon turned his gaze to the hand. A memory of using the great chariot on the battlefield popped up in his mind. He thought it was an amazing technique. The main character recalled how Elsid controlled his body. In that memory, there were glints of holy light in his eyes. Leon thought that after all the other thoughts left his head, his eyes became transparent as glass, and a completely different world appeared before his eyes. An image of the terrified preacher appeared in his mind. The main character thought about the flow of atmospheric air and the wavelength of vibrations and the ability to see through the distortion of space. Leon believed that this is the final stage that can be achieved in the art of seeing through space. Clenching his hand into a fist, the protagonist understood that only with the help of Aura and a similar level of the art of seeing through space, one could fully demonstrate the power of the Big Dipper Sword technique. Leon was sure that he would definitely learn it. An image of Elsid appeared in his mind, telling him that he had dealt with the problem quite well. Pondering, the main character lowered his head down. Leaning up from the bed, Leon realized that he couldn't say that his mood was bad. After which, he stated that for some reason, Elsid's words gave off a dull pain in his head. Turning his head, the protagonist heard knocks on the door. Jezar was standing in front of him, holding a small basin and towel in his hands. The bishop was glad that Leon was awake. A smile appeared on the protagonist's face. His eyes fell on Jezar's hands. After that, the main character turned to the bishop. He asked me how many days had passed since he lost consciousness. A flying bird towered over Blaine's sky. Leon reported that according to the bishop, their battle with the heretics ended three days ago. In front of the adventurers' faces, the city devourer was destroyed. The main character noted that at the moment when five members of the advance party got out of the maze, it collapsed and all the monsters disappeared. Leon suggested that there was a specific satanic technique that was known to them. Next to the passing people were the corpses of people who had suffered as a result of the siege of the 25th district. The bishop reported that 56 were killed and 107 were seriously injured. Jezar stated about the rumors, which said that other victims received minor injuries. The bishop said that it took a lot of sacrifices to successfully complete the operation. Then, as he opened the curtains, Jezar noted that evil had failed to carry out its evil plans. The bishop felt that they had the right to call such a result a victory. The main character regretted not saving more lives. The sky of the evening city was shrouded in slow-moving clouds. Leon said the bishop was right. Jezar reported that he had made inquiries about the city sink the bishop thought it was a truly terrifying monster. An image of the scavenger appeared in his mind. Jezar noted that it was only thanks to Leon's incredible efforts that they managed to prevent the tragedy. Taken aback, Leon didn't think so. The main character stated that De Jezar and other members of the team made it possible to carry out the plan. Pondering, the bishop turned his gaze to the window. Jezar smiled and said that he didn't even know if that was the case. Turning his head towards V. Leon, the bishop noted that if the hero hadn't joined the team, then most likely the result would have been completely different. Leon's face was in shock. Taken aback, the bishop assumed that the main character was very surprised. Leon couldn't believe he knew that. The sun could be seen through the window, gradually sinking into the sunset. Jezar said that after seeing his actions during the operation, he was finally convinced of this. In his mind, the protagonist understood that the bishop's words meant that he had guessed all of this from the beginning. 
Jezar stated that this was primarily because he was a member of the Iron Castle Knight Order. A memory of standing in the ranks of the army surfaced in his mind. The bishop noted that his life experience is as vast as the lifespan of an elf. Pondering, the main character lowered his head down. In his mind, Leon knew that Jezar wasn't the type to be fooled for long. Jezar believed that no matter how powerful Leon's strong aura was, he couldn't cut down such a serious opponent so easily. In the bishop's mind, a memory of the protagonist using Rodrigo's technique to destroy the preacher popped up. After that, Jezar noted that the hero's abilities were not yet sufficiently refined to be called a master. To my shame, Tet, I agree with you, Leon said. Closing his eyes, the bishop declared that there was nothing to be ashamed of. Jezar said that on the contrary, he admires the courage of the main character very much. The bishop was amazed that Leon would dare to take the risk even though he knew he was inexperienced. Hearing this, the main character was taken aback. Jezar noted Leon's blow at the end, which proved decisive. A memory of how the main character used Rodrigo's technique popped up in his mind. Turning his gaze to Leon, the bishop informed him of the creation of the greatest warrior in history, Rodrigo. Jezar reported that this technique is called Big Dipper. A silhouette of a hero shrouded in stars appeared in his mind. The bishop told him about the great chariot. Jezar remembered seeing this mention of the technique in a book describing the actions of a past hero. The bishop pointed out that Rodrigo had long since left this world. Smiling, Jezar said that the probability of the hero showing his face again is one on the Dodecalion. Taken aback, the protagonist noted that after the bishop's words, he would not be able to dodge the answer. Turning to Jezar, Leon asked if he remembered the sword he had used in the maze. At that moment, the image of the holy sword appeared in the bishop's mind. Putting a hand to his chin, Jezar noted that if his memory was correct, he had disappeared at some point. After that, the bishop said that it was for this reason that he was not able to take it with him when they got out. While in his thoughts, the protagonist reflected on the words of Elsid, who informed him that even in his absence, he could still use the holy sword. Concentrating on the seal, Leon activated the holy weapon summon. Suddenly, the room was shrouded in a sacred light, and a holy sword appeared from the protagonist's hand. Jezar's face was in shock. The towering holy sword gave off a powerful aura. The bishop's face was frozen in place. Upon seeing the sacred aura, he immediately prostrated himself. Dropping to his knees, Jezar prayed to the goddess. Dumbfounded, the bishop noted that it was the first time in his life that he was so confused. Jezar asked for forgiveness for being extremely disrespectful and not recognizing the divine energy of the goddess. Taken aback, Leon also apologized for hiding the fact. As the bishop watched Leon seal the holy sword, he asked if he planned to continue hiding his identity. After finishing sealing, the main character reported that it was so. Leon noted that the seal on the holy sword hadn't been removed yet, and his skills weren't honed enough. Raising his fist, he declared that when he wasn't ashamed to call himself a hero, he would reveal his true identity. A small smile appeared on Jezar's face. In his confusion, the bishop noted that in his eyes, the main character already looks like a worthy warrior. After which, he stated that Leon was very modest. Jezar said that in that case, he would also keep it a secret. Wary, the bishop wondered if he could share this information with a single person. Hearing Jezar's words, the protagonist was taken aback. An image of the girl appeared in the bishop's mind. He said he was talking about a saint. Jezar noted that the handover ceremony is not yet complete, but such news will help her to cheer up. The main character's face was filled with confusion. In his mind, Leon believed that if it was a saint, then he didn't have any objections. Leon smiled and said he didn't mind. The main character noted that he fully relies on the bishop in this matter. At that moment, Jezar was overwhelmed with happiness. He expressed his deep gratitude to Leon. Suddenly, the boys heard a knock on the door. Being wary, Jezar said that the main character can be calm since a spell is installed on the room, which does not allow you to hear anything from the outside. After that, the bishop noted that not a single bug would know what they were talking about. After the door opened slightly, Jezar announced that a person could enter. Holding a fruit basket, Karen greeted Leon. The adventurer noted that they first see each other after three days. The guy's faces were a little agitated. Surprised, Karen couldn't understand why there was a strange atmosphere in the air. Embarrassed, the adventurer asked if her arrival was too unexpected. After which, she said that she would come back later. In his thoughts, a dumbfounded Leon noted that they were on a mission together, where he found out that Karen's true identity is the killer nicknamed The Undertaker. An image of an adventurer appeared in the protagonist's mind, behind which was one of the grudges of the slum. Leon was talking about an undertaker that even Khan couldn't recognize. The main character remembered that during the battle he promised to turn a blind eye to Karen's double life. The flustered adventurer's body was covered in a green aura. In his mind, Leon believed that no matter how one looked at it, his promise was a verbal contract that could be broken at any time. The main character knew that if he were in Karen's shoes, he would want to hear a clearer answer. Leon thought it was a very bad time for her to be here. 
The main character couldn't understand why Karen was here with the bishop. At that moment, Jezar was slowly pouring tea. Closing her eyes, the adventurer declared that everything was fine. Karen noted that the bishop caught her red-handed. Hearing this, Leon froze in one position. The main character's face was filled with shock. The bishop smiled and said it was his aura. An image of the main character's aura and him appeared in his mind. Jezar reported that since the sun Leona and his moons have the ability to resonate, after which, he noted that their auras are sensitive to interference in this regard. Turning his gaze to Karen, Jezar wondered about the possibility that two people with such a rare shadow attribute would suddenly end up in the same place. The bishop asked if this fact was too strange. The main character suggested that Jezar understood everything at the moment when the jump through space occurred. Leon's mind flashed to the memory of the mortician wrapping his body around him. Taken aback, the protagonist asked if the bishop would scold him. Leon noted that he knew who Karen was, but kept it from him. Raising the mug to his mouth, Jezar wondered if he had the right to judge whether this secret was worth revealing to the world or not. After that, the bishop asked her if she had the right to judge Leon for giving someone a chance to show their best side. The main character's face was filled with surprise. The bishop said that initially he was not eager to cooperate with the killer. Images of Khan and Karen attacking popped into his mind. After which, Jezar noted that the adventurer remained on the battlefield until the very end. Closing his eyes, the bishop said that while she was shedding her blood, she was still fighting alongside them. Jezar didn't think Karen would be able to purge herself of all her sins with her dedication. He noted that at least the adventurer had done something worthy as a teammate. The image of Karen, her weapon shrouded in blood, appeared in the protagonist's mind. Leon believed that if the essence of an adventurer was a cold-blooded assassin, then such a choice would simply be impossible. Flustered, Karen guessed that the atmosphere in the room had softened. In her mind, she wondered if she would be able to hope for a successful outcome in this case. Surprised, Karen couldn't understand why the boys were smiling so strangely. She assumed that they had already secretly set a date for her death penalty. Alert, Jezar turned to the excited adventurer. Turning his gaze to her, the bishop said that he would like to hear her story first. Turning to Karen, he asked her why she had become a murderer. After which, he asked her why she was performing various requests using the adventurer's identity. Karen's face was full of excitement. The sun shone through the curtain. The boys were waiting for the adventurer's response. With her head down, Karen asked who they thought the most hated person in the world was. The boys' faces were shocked. With a stony look, Karen stated that she was talking about an orphan. After which, she asked them to add mixed race to the mix. In his mind, the main character thought that the past that the adventurer decided to reveal did not look like an easy story at all. An image of little Karen standing in her rags appeared in his mind. Leon understood that the adventurer was not just an orphan with no parents to protect her and no money to pay for food, clothing, and shelter, but was several steps below a tramp with a body covered in all sorts of injuries. The main character thought that she was a representative of the lowest class, in the truest sense of the word. Crowds of people towered over the terrified Karen, insulting her in every possible way. Leon thought that she was the one who had been exposed to all sorts of dangers in the slums, who had once been saved by one person. With a malicious grin on his face, the man extended his hand to the small and defenseless Karen. In his thoughts, Leon was upset that unfortunately, the outstretched helping hand was filled with evil, from the base to the tip of his fingers. The distressed adventurer reported that she was now talking about a fairly common phenomenon. She noted that everywhere you could find those who catch orphans, on the death of which no one cares at all, raising them out of cold-blooded murderers. After that, Karen said that even if you manage to train only one professional killer out of a hundred children, it will be quite enough to recoup the invested funds with interest. She thought that even for the person who had caught her, the further development of events was extremely unexpected. Karen was a half-breed with both human and dark elf blood in her veins. An image of her delivering a fatal blow to a man appeared in the adventurer's mind. Karen reawakened her talent and succeeded in numerous murder orders, earning her the nickname The Undertaker. The faster Karen's hands moved and the sharper her blades became, the stronger the organization became, and her status gradually rose, and in the end, she reached the second step when only the boss was above her. The plot showed us the boss of an adventurer sitting on a throne. Grinning, Karen noted that it was a piece of cake. The adventurer stated that it didn't take her more than seven seconds to deal with the boss. The plot showed us the boss lying in a pool of blood. After eliminating the organization's boss with her own hands, Karen rose to the position of one of the three main forces of the slum. She became an undesirable killer and repeatedly committed murders that many did not like. The adventurer's deadly dagger fell out of her hand. But the most important thing was that Karen didn't want to live as an undertaker anymore. Opening the room, the adventurer saw a group of girls standing in front of her. After clearing the organization of garbage, Karen freed the orphans who had been captured for the same reason she had once been. An image of her secret identity appeared in the adventurer's mind. 
Karen said that her work as an undertaker has become a rarity. She said that when she had the opportunity to start living a normal life, she began to work as an adventurer and slowly wash off the dirt that had accumulated over the years. Despairingly, Karen noted that in the end, her deception was exposed in this way. The boy's faces were filled with excitement. Raising her hand, the adventurer stated that when her identity was revealed, she didn't think she could escape from the holy church. Putting her hands to her face, considering the help she had received in completing the mission, Karen begged for a sentence like hard labor because she hated prison bars. Hearing this, the guys were taken aback. After that, Jezar turned to the main character. At that moment, Leon was filled with excitement. A soft smile spread across the bishop's face. Shocked, Leon couldn't believe that Jezar was going to leave the matter up to him. Grinning, the main character thought that such behavior was quite logical, since the sentencing was entrusted not to him at all, but to the hero. Leon's gaze was directed towards the Holy Seal. A lot of memories related to Karen popped up in his head. In his mind, the main character believed that she did not become a murderer by choice. Leon was sure that neither Karen's performance in the fight against evil, nor her desire to live a new life, seemed false. Lowering his head down, the protagonist understood that in this situation, even the hero would not have the right to talk about forgiveness. Leon was sure that he saw no need to point his sword at someone who was remorseful. After which, the main character turned to the excited Karen. Holding up two fingers, Leon said he would give her two options. The main character noted that the adventurer is free to choose any of them, and they promised to respect her choice regardless of which one she chooses. A look of shock crossed Karen's face. Taken aback, the adventurer asked why the decision was made by Leon and not the bishop. The dumbfounded protagonist was thinking that he himself had told the bishop a moment ago that he didn't want to reveal his identity. The image of a saint and a bishop appeared in the main character's mind. In his mind, Leon knew that the only people who knew that he was a hero were Jezar and the saint. The protagonist's face was filled with doubts. Leon couldn't figure out if he could tell Karen that he was a hero. Grinning, the bishop asked if they thought it was a pretty good idea. With a smile, he was sure that Karen would be useful to Leon in the future. Putting her hand to her face, the adventurer couldn't understand what Jezar was talking about. Raising his hand from the seal, the protagonist turned to Karen. Leon stated that after he showed her something, the adventurer should make her choice. Instantly, the entire room was enveloped in a sacred light. The holy sword could be seen in Karen's eyes. The main character fully recovered and left the guild only a week after the battle with evil. The sun's rays were reflected in the windows of Blaine's guild. Leon was grateful that the boys had taken care of him all this time. Taken aback, the guild head was confused. He noted that the main character saved the city. It seemed to the guild master that, on the contrary, he hadn't really done anything for Leon as a token of gratitude. Putting his hand to his beard, Bernard asked if the main character was satisfied with such a scenario. Leon, who was standing across from him, said so. A smile appeared on the guild master's face. Putting his hand on the main character's shoulder, Bernard said that he was pleased to see such a beautiful young man like him. The guild master pointed out that if Leon changed his mind, he could come to him at any time. Bernard said that he had very extensive contacts, which is why he knew many street singers. Blaine's evening sky was gradually becoming overcast. The guild master said that he will make sure that in two months the name of the main character will be sung on the other side of the continent. Taken aback, Leon noted that this was a bit unnecessary. Next to the guild's entrance, citizens were leisurely strolling around. After leaving the guild, the main character set off on his way. Karen was waiting in front of the Blaine exit. She turned to Leon. Seeing the adventurer, a smile appeared on the protagonist's face. Karen's cheeks were flushed. Grinning, the adventurer noticed that Leon had matured a lot in the time they hadn't seen each other. Hearing this, the main character was taken aback. Removing her hands, Karen said, I heard that you met with the guild head right after your discharge. The main character reported that this is so. Leon told the adventurer that it was about his reward for helping her. The main character noted that this situation was completely different from what he had encountered before. Surprised, Karen started asking Leon about the reward. The main character stated that the conversation was about raising the adventurer's rank to embarrassed, Leon noted that he refused to do so. Karen's face filled with confusion. Putting his hand to his head, the main character told her that the head of the guild offered to provide it to the lord. Taken aback, the main character noted that he also refused this offer. Dumbfounded, Karen asked if he was a sucker. Putting her hand to her head, the adventurer said that Leon is a hero, and at the same time, not a smart guy. Karen believed that Leon had suddenly pulled out a lucky lottery ticket and thoughtlessly threw it in the trash. With his head down, the protagonist stated that if he had taken the chance, then his role in that decisive battle would have become public knowledge. A startled image of a group of heretics appeared in Karen's mind. Leon believed that this would only mean that other evil groups would find out about his existence. After directing his gaze to the seal, the protagonist revealed that he had borrowed the power of the Holy Sword so far to resist the occultists, 
but was not yet able to solve any problem on his own. Leon believed that he needed to train more and develop his skills to become a warrior like the Holy Sword. Hearing this, the adventurer froze in one position. Putting her hands to her chest, Karen guessed that was why Leon had made the same offer to her that day. In her mind, a memory of the protagonist coming to his senses asked if she was willing to become his ally, marching under the banner of the Holy Sword Elsida, popped up. Gradually, the sun began to set. Karen asked Leon to give her some time to think. Following the adventurer, the protagonist asked if her answer was ripe. When Karen stopped, she said it was the perfect spot. They stopped in front of a huge tree, its branches blocking out the last rays of the sun. The adventurer reported that for the elves of the forest, the trees are as sacred as the goddess. Karen noted that she was also no exception, because she had elven blood in her veins. The adventurer thought that on that day, Leon's suggestion was like asking if she wanted to live confidently in the sun and not in the dark. Karen said that before accepting the offer, she wanted to have a clear conversation. Her hair was gently wrapped in the evening wind. As she watched the shadow on her hand, the adventurer noted that she felt no remorse for the bloodshed before today. Karen believed that if she hadn't done this, she wouldn't have been able to survive. Clenching her hand into a fist, the adventurer said that for her, who was born at the bottom of a ditch, the death and suffering of those people provided an opportunity to change her life for the better. With a sad expression on her face, Karen hoped that someone like her would never be born again. The wind slowly blew the fallen leaves from the tree. The adventurer noted that she was born without parents, Having survived without a bit of love in her heart, having learned only the art of ruthless murder, she would like there to be no more people living such a life. The main character's face was shocked. Junior comrade, that is, a hero, if you are able to fulfill my wish, if you promise that you will definitely make this aspiration come true, Karen said. Kneeling before him, the adventurer declared that from now on, she would devote herself to serving him for the rest of her life. Closing her eyes, the adventurer waited for her next move. Leon's face was frozen in confusion. With a grin, Alcid noted that this was the hero's goal and duty. Sacred weapons believed that the hero needed to do better today than yesterday, and tomorrow, better than today. Holding out his hand to Karen, the protagonist thought that for the sake of a future in which there would be at least one less person suffering like her. The adventurer took Leon's hand. That day, the undertaker died and only Karen survived. Sitting under the shade of a tree, the protagonist asked what had happened to Kong. An image of a grinning feng sitting on the remains of the heretics appeared in his mind. Leon noted that he hadn't heard anything from him. He suggested that Khan had simply returned to the slums. Pointing a finger to the side, Karen wondered if Leon really hadn't heard anything. The adventurer reported that Khan had escaped. Karen told the protagonist about the rumors that Feng packed up all his belongings and left the city walls the day after the decisive battle. An image of Khan and his gang walking off into the distance appeared in her mind. Folding her hands, Karen noticed that Feng was quite an agile worm. The adventurer thought that it was unlikely that someone would be able to sit on his tail. Thinking about it, Leon decided that there was nothing unexpected about Khan's escape. The main character thought that because of the operation, the slums were destroyed almost half, and now nothing else remains but to demolish them completely. His memories flashed back to the times when Feng had fought fiercely with the members of the secret organization. Leon believed that despite Khan's achievements during the decisive battle, as long as there were records of cooperation with evil, even if only temporarily, he would not escape the punishment of the Knights of the Holy Iron Castle. An image of the Order's army appeared in his mind. The main character understood that Feng would have been waiting for hard labor, or a prison sentence for an indefinite number of years. Continuing their conversation, the children enjoyed the picturesque sunset. Leon pointed out that even if Khan's hand wasn't in his favor, he didn't expect him to run away the very next day. Karen claimed that Feng's snout was full of fluff, which caused him to run away without the slightest hesitation. Many images of one of the evils of the slums filled his mind. Smiling, the protagonist suggested that it was just his imagination that they would ever cross paths again. Standing up from the ground, Karen asked what exactly Leon was planning to do. Watching the sunset, the adventurer noticed that she still didn't know anything about his plans. After which, Karen wondered if Leon was going to move forward without any plan. Turning in his direction, the adventurer called him a hero. The protagonist's eyes were frozen in one position. An image of the mountains they were planning to go to with Elsid filled his mind. In his mind, Leon knew that the plan itself certainly existed. The main character was thinking that after being promoted to B-rank, he was planning to go on a trip to the Titanium Mountains. Leon thought back to the words of the sacred weapon, which believed that a hundred days would be enough to refine his aura. Elsid noted that this period of time is quite enough to reach at least the B-rank. The main character believed that if the time frame is limited to a hundred days, then he has plenty of time in reserve. Alert, Leon thought about the problem, which was that Elsid was currently drifting off to sleep. Surprised, Karen watched Leon's dumbfounded expression. 
Inspired, the main character turned to the adventurer. Startled, Karen noticed that she didn't like his tone. Leon was thinking that this was Karen, an a rank adventurer ranger and part-time professional assassin. In his mind, he imagined an image of an adventurer exploring the territory. The main character knew that she has sharpened all five senses, and also, she is able to use the environment for movement, and much more. After which, Leon recalled how Karen used various abilities when they were besieging the 25th district. Smiling, the main character said that he would count on Karen for a while. The adventurer's face was filled with confusion. Quickening his pace, Leon said that they would have to go to the bishop first because they would need a spacious seat. Shocked, Karen tried to find out exactly what the main character was going to rely on her for. The adventurer noted that she still has an uneasy feeling. She ordered Leon to respond immediately. Outraged, Karen asked if the main character was acting like this on purpose, knowing what her character was like. An image of the chained holy sword appeared in his mind. Leon knew it would be another three weeks and two days before Elsid woke up. The main character believed that until then, he would need to hone his aura skills to save face. A memory of using Rodrigo's technique popped up in Leon's mind. The main character was sure that he should try to challenge the Big Dipper technique and master at least basic lunges. As Leon ran away from Karen, he waited impatiently for Elsid's reaction. The plot takes us to Prima, the 13th district. The sun's rays fell smoothly on the walls of the houses. The man said that fortunately, they have food supplies. He noted that all this is thanks to the church and the bishop. There was a large amount of bread on his table. A queue of people in need was lined up opposite the building. He held out the loaf and asked the woman for more. The man noted that she has two babies. He thought she'd had a hard time getting out of the 23rd district. The excited woman thanked him for this. Handing the food to the child, the man said that the bread is not personal property. Pointing a finger to the side, the man noted that if the woman is grateful, then she should go to the temple and show her gratitude to the goddess with a prayer. He believed that if there was no church, they would not even be able to hope for such mercy. After which, the woman turned her head. Her gaze fell on the nearby church. Praying in front of the church, the woman thought that the atmosphere here was not the same as in the 23rd district. She thought of the peace of mind on her soul. Suddenly, there was a huge explosion behind the church. The faces of the townspeople were shocked. With a swing, the main character rushed towards Karen. There was a dagger in the adventurer's hand. With their help, she deflected Leon's blow. Karen concentrated all her strength into her legs, after which, she disappeared from the protagonist's field of vision. The adventurer was right behind him. Her dagger almost reached Leon's face. As a result, the main character put all his strength into his legs. Leon jumped out of the way, dodging Karen's punch. As she stood waiting for her next move, the adventurer noticed that the main character was moving his legs better than she thought. Watching Leon, Karen noticed that he would have been more suited as an assassin than a knight. Hearing this, the main character fell into a stupor. The adventurer reported that Leon's movements are similar to those of a talented recruit. After covering the body with aura, Karen noticed that the main character's techniques were not bad, but the gaps were obvious. With a flash of lightning, the adventurer announced the start of their training. Using the technique, Karen was split in two. After focusing his vision, the protagonist was shocked that the adventurer had created an illusory doppelganger in just two steps. In his mind, he knew that if he was going to keep up with Karen's speed, then the holding technique would help him. Using the technique, Leon tried to calculate a copy of Karen. Swinging his sword, the main character realized that the fake is on the left. Taken aback, the adventurer froze in one position. Dumbfounded, Karen managed to dodge his punch at the last moment. The shocked adventurer asked if the main character wants to say something that can distinguish between the original and the fake. After finishing the fight, Leon tried to catch his breath. Standing on one leg, Karen noticed that she didn't use much aura, and she moved as if she were in a real battle. As she prepared to attack, the adventurer wanted to test the extent of Leon's insight. At that moment, the protagonist's face was shrouded in doubt. Karen, who was advancing on him, used the mirage technique. A memory of how the adventurer had only created one clone popped up in his mind. The main character was thinking that earlier, he clearly saw an illusory double. After which, Leon assumed that he was currently facing an elementary cloning technique. When she was ready, Karen asked if she could start. In his mind, Leon realized that the adventurer's speed was slower than before. The main character believed that the problem lies in the many faces that made his eyes ripple. Leon was surrounded on all sides by Karen's clones. The main character thought that there is a complete disorientation in space. When Leon focused his vision, he couldn't tell if the original was on the left or right, with his arm outstretched or bent. The protagonist's eyes were so intense that he thought they were going to pop out of their sockets. Suddenly, the real Karen attacked him from behind. Leaning her dagger against Leon's throat, the adventurer declared that he was dead. Grinning, Karen stated that their score was 102 fights and 102 wins. Taken aback, Leon said he was giving up. 
the main character asked if it was fun for Karen to bully a junior who hadn't even reached B rank. The adventurer noted that this is excellent fun. Spreading out her arms, Karen reported that the aura's actions were similar to strengthening the body. After that, she noted that there were no throws in their fight. The adventurer thought that Leon should consider the fact that they were fighting in an open area. Grinning, Karen noted that all the conditions were extremely favorable for the main character, but for all this, he could not win a single victory. Then Leon sat down on the ground with his knees drawn up. The adventurer asked if he was okay. In his mind, the protagonist thought that Karen's words were more frightening than her daggers. Memories of how he had fought fiercely in the 25th district popped up in his mind. Leon was sure that since he had performed well in the last battle against evil, he thought that he had achieved a significant growth. Watching Karen, the main character realized that the gap in strength with her is colossal. At that moment, Leon was thinking that the adventurer was fighting him at full strength. Grinning, the protagonist asked what Karen thought of the latest attack. Thinking about it, the adventurer noticed that it was quite passable. Leon's face was filled with indignation. Karen laughed and said she was joking. She said that the main character did a great job. Surprised, Leon asked if this was true. Smiling, the adventurer said that if the main character is able to see her illusory double, then she can safely conclude that even a first-class assassin will have a hard time fighting him. Karen reported that Leon's abilities had already surpassed B rank. Surprised, the main character was noted that with all this, he does not manage to materialize his aura. An image of a hand that had been absorbed by the aura appeared in the adventurer's mind. Thinking about it, Karen noticed that the aura was indeed a powerful weapon. After which, she said that if Leon dodged the blow, it would be all over. The adventurer said that his vision and body movements had reached the level at which it is possible to make such a maneuver. An image of a broken axe appeared in Karen's mind. The adventurer talked about a tangible aura that can cut iron and break stones, after which, she noted that by itself it is not able to pursue and defeat enemies who evade blows. Imagining the image of a man being followed by an assassin, Karen reported that most thugs often went one step behind adventurers of similar rank. The adventurer believed that the only way to win was to outwit the opponent by using any means necessary. An image of herself towering over her fallen enemies appeared in her mind. Karen noted that this is also called a victory. She reported that the Undertaker also simply hit targets at a distance. Turning her gaze downwards, the adventurer felt that if she listed the pros and cons of Leon, she would recognize that the foundations were very stable. A memory popped up in her head, in which the main character, with the help of his technique, was able to distinguish a fake from the original. With a serious look, Karen stated that since Leon had a sharp eye, it wasn't easy to fool him. After which, the adventurer pointed out that he was just not letting himself be deceived. Karen thought that he didn't have the skills to deceive his opponent at all. The adventurer suggested that this is why it is difficult for Leon to take the initiative after repelling the attack. Putting his hand to his chin, the protagonist thought about Karen's words. Grabbing him by the neck, the adventurer told him not to worry too much. Karen thought that cheating was just filling a skill gap. The adventurer was talking about a base for creating a base for maneuver. Closing her eyes, Karen noted that she didn't know who Leon's mentor was. She suggested that his mentor might be a prodigious genius or a hitherto unseen monster. An image of a grinning Elsid appeared in the protagonist's mind. The sun's rays were reflected on the leaves of the tree. In a word, the adventurer could call it the lack of any creative streak in attacks or movements. Karen smiled, noting that Leon didn't have to repeat her words. The adventurer thought it was a good idea to have a few different cards up your sleeve. After which, she once again called Leon a hero. Thinking about it, the main character realized that Karen was right. He suggested that he should not neglect the tricks that can ensure an unconditional victory. As Leon clenched his fist, he thought that he might actually become stronger if he added more variety to his arsenal of techniques. Suddenly, the main character found a hand on his shoulder. The Undertaker believed that there were enough one-on-one -on -one matches held today. He asked if Leon would mind moving on to the next class. The dumbfounded protagonist noted that the Undertaker had scared him. Karen smiled and told him not to dwell on what he'd just heard. After which, she stated that they would try to make his aura tangible to create an aura weapon. Watching the sunlight that filtered through the curtain, Karen asked where they had left off last time. The adventurer assumed that they ended up with the relationship between the aura attribute and the training method. Continuing her story, Karen said that in continuation of what was said earlier, it is worth noting that the aura is a force created by filtering the body of its owner. Raising her finger, the adventurer noted that in other words, this is a kind of disclosure of the essence of the owner of the aura. Alert, Leon thought about the entity. An example of a man fighting several at once popped up in her head. Karen stated that the basis is the subject's life experience and worldview. The adventurer noted that even if we consider as an example the situation with the inevitable collision with the enemy, someone boldly enters the battle, someone hides behind someone else's back, and someone just runs away. 
Folding her hands, Karen stated that it was impossible to distinguish good from evil based on signs alone. The adventurer noted that no matter how strong the desire for justice is, it is only necessary to deviate slightly from the planned course and this will immediately result in the formation of excessive self-confidence in their abilities and extreme selfishness. Karen believed that training the aura meant making it purer and more powerful, after which, she gave an example of how to train the fire attribute aura. At that moment, an image of a young man using a powerful aura appeared in her mind. The adventurer said that for her training, you need to constantly destroy something, fight someone, or exhaust yourself to the limit. Karen noted that most of these actions lead to the formation of the purest consistency of a fiery aura. The plot showed us the process of creating a fiery aura in the hand of a master. Taken aback, the main character noted that in his opinion this is somehow scary. Sitting down on the windowsill, Karen said that depending on the attribute, the difficulty of learning differs. The adventurer noted that in the case of her shadow attribute, the training consisted of completing the missions assigned to her. Turning to Leon, Karen noted that if we talk about the attribute of the sun, then it symbolizes the goddess and from generation to generation is shown in the hero in one era or another. Confusion appeared on the protagonist's face. Leaning towards the protagonist, the adventurer asked what comes to mind when he hears the word sun. Embarrassed, Leon turned his head to the side. An image of the sun shining through the majestic mountains appeared in his mind. Thinking about it, the main character talked about the infinite light that brightly illuminates the world or completely dispelling the darkness around him. At that moment, alert, the main character came up with the idea of a brightly lit light. Leon froze in place and stared thoughtfully at his hand. Surprised, Karen thought that the main character drew some kind of parallel. An image of lava flowing rapidly across the expanse appeared in his mind. In his mind, Leon guessed that due to his extreme training, he could feel a boiling aura spreading through his veins like magma flowing beneath the surface of the earth. Concentrating, the main character thought that with the help of the power of the spirit, he needs to pull the flow and collect it with a sense of concentration at the tips of his fingers. He thought of the intense heat, as if something in his hand was on fire. The main character's hand became overflowing with aura. After which, Leon wondered how he could release the aura outwards. Prying his eyes, he thought that if it was the sun, there was no doubt about it. Trying his best, the protagonist managed to release the sun's aura outside. Karen looked surprised. Observing the aura created, Leon believed that it was all about the light. Realizing that the volume is too large to use as a weapon, in his thoughts, the protagonist noted that he still managed to release a clot of aura. The power of his technique overwhelmed the entire room. Interrupting the process, Leon grabbed his arm. Startled, Karen asked if he was alright. A memory of the last fight in the 25th district popped up in his mind. While pondering, the protagonist didn't know that when he borrowed Elsid's power, the limits of aura materialization were so high. Smiling, the adventurer praised Leon. Karen reported that the creation of a material aura is based on controlling the aura flowing out of the body, just as it is done inside the body shell. After finishing the training, the main character tried to catch his breath. The adventurer noted that even if it was just a light or something, the main thing was that for a few seconds, Leon was able to hold the clot of aura in his hands. Karen felt that there wasn't much difference between what the main character did and using an aura weapon. The image of the hand that was wrapped in an aura once again appeared in her mind. The adventurer pointed out that if Leon was able to use his aura more steadily and increase his range of coverage, then his training would be fully completed. Surprised, the main character talks about coverage and stability. Putting a finger to her chin, Karen didn't know how to explain it to him properly. An image of her body appeared in the adventurer's mind, where aura currents were actively spreading. Karen reported that this is similar to recognizing the flow of aura, like a blood vessel, and gradually pulling it out of the body. The adventurer stated that aura weapons consume a lot of energy, which is why stable circulation is important. As soon as Jezar entered the room, he noticed that it was too much of a gamble to materialize an aura based on a single mental image. The bishop believed that with a strong release of the aura flow, prolonged use would become impossible. Jezar reported that it was similar to an aura weapon, such as a fire attribute explosion or eruption. While watching the bishop who was putting his robe on a hanger, the protagonist assumed that he had finished his inspection. Jezar said it was true. Enraged, the bishop said that he had received a preliminary assessment of the damage that the guys had caused to the church some time ago. Their faces were filled with shock. Blaine's sun shone through the room's window. The bishop said that they would discuss the repair bills later. He asked the boys to let him get to the main point. Holding the letter in his hands, Jezar announced that he had brought a message from the saint. Leon's eyes filled with surprise. The bishop said that if his memory serves him correctly, the succession ceremony is in full swing right now. Powerful gusts of wind whirled the snow falling on the rocks. Huge towers were located in the very depths of the mountains. The light in these towers spread throughout the area. A mysterious glow appeared between the rocks. The saint's face was frozen in one position. Dumbfounded, the clergy watched on. 
One of them said that she personally received the sacred power of more than ten bishops. The man noted that even someone who had reached the limits of unsurpassed skill couldn't suppress such a force and would explode. A cleric could believe that she would break through the power of the former saint during the succession ceremony. The saint's sacred aura enveloped the entire room. The plot introduced us to the eighth Sveta Elohim. The man said that today the strongest saint supporting the hero was born. Elahan's eyes reflected the crosses. A group of clerics was heading into the room. Their eyes fell on the weapon that was stuck in the stone floor. Approaching the weapon, the clergyman told that 300 years ago, the first saint accompanying the great hero, His Holiness King Rodrigo, during her travels realized her helplessness. Behind the majestic hero, a saint stood dumbfounded. The clergyman noted that she not only needs to pray for the well-being of the hero, appealing to someone's strength of their own free will. He stated that the saint herself must have the power to defeat evil. In her hand, she held a weapon. The clergyman said that the iron castle was created by order of the first saint. He noted that now their church has become one of the strongest armed groups on the continent. Leading a powerful army, the saint held a weapon in her hand. The cleric said that under the name of the goddess, from generation to generation, saints received the title of vice-captains. He believed that this place was created to support the hero. The cleric said that if we proceed from this, then he could say that a great grace descended on them. Smiling, he noted that Elahan can fight with the hero side by side. He believed that this was the life that all saints dreamed of and aspired to. The inspired saint declared that this was so. The cleric announced the beginning of the last test, which was to prepare for battle. At that moment, Elahan started to take off her raincoat. Throwing it to Naple, she headed forward. After which, a sacred aura enveloped her body. Elahan was completely covered in armor. The saint extended her hand towards the weapon. Elahan picked up the weapon and pointed it forward. The shocked cleric spoke about the mace, which was the weapon of saints of past generations. Standing behind him, the young man noticed that it was an amazing sight. A group of clergymen left the church and found themselves in the snow-capped mountains. Powerful gusts of wind continued to whirl the newly fallen snow around. The cleric said that before the saint, the king left the biggest sword mark in this world. He told her about the rumors that said the king had left this mark with just a single swipe. In place of the same mark, a strong incision was visible. The cleric noted that the traces carved on the rock are what the saints, including him, left during the succession ceremony. Looking at Elahan, he informed her that it was her turn. An unimaginably strong wind blew the saint's cloak from side to side. Elahan's face was covered by her hair. She was thinking about the hero. The saint recalled the transmitted words, which said that the hero is active. The plot showed us the battles that the main character won. Thinking of Leon, Elahan was struck by the fact that Oracle Day was still six months away, and he had already done so much for the good of the community. Closing her eyes, Elahan thought that she, who was finally officially a saint, wouldn't make him blush. The image of the hero reappeared in her mind. The saint could even imagine how brave and courageous the hero was. Inspired, Elahan believed that she needed to become a saint who would be completely like him. After concentrating, a powerful aura began to radiate from the saint's body. Elahan swung her mace and declared that the sinners would be punished. After which, the saint made a powerful strike on the stone. Due to the saint's powerful impact, dust rose up around them. The faces of the clergy were shocked. Elahan's blow split the rock in two. Smiling, the saint thought of the hero again. The saint's cheeks were flushed. She thought that even though she wasn't strong enough, she hoped that the hero would let her be by his side. Holding the letter in his hands, Jezer announced its contents. As the one who inherited the name of the Iron Castle Church, I will gladly dedicate my life to you, the bishop said, turning his gaze to Leon. Jezar noticed that at the end it was written about the saint's hope to see the hero as soon as possible. The main character's face was filled with surprise. Surprised, Karen didn't understand what was happening to Leon. The protagonist felt as if he had been thrown into a vat of cold water. In his mind, Leon felt that trouble was about to come knocking at his door. Looking out the window, the protagonist wondered what kind of person the saint was. Jezar said that she is considered one of the most outstanding in history and not only for her faith, but also for her qualities. The bishop thought that this would definitely be a great help for the hero. Frozen in one position, the main character does not understand whether this is good news for him or not. In his mind, Leon was sure that if a saint who had been considered a hero's companion for generations was so excellent, then he needed to become a skilled warrior who wouldn't be ashamed to stand next to such a saint. Putting his hand to his chin, the protagonist was glad that now he finally grasped the essence of using the aura weapon. He knew that all he had to do was form an image. Pointing his hand in Jezar's direction, the protagonist asked if his aura attribute was moon. The surprised bishop said that this was so. Taken aback, Leon apologized for the tactless question. Then he asked if he could find out what image Jezar was using to complete the aura weapon. The bishop's face was shocked. Karen almost screamed in outrage. After which, she started waving her hands at the main character. The adventurer thought that he should be backed up. 
Karen was sure that such a strong aura owner shouldn't be asked such a question. In her mind, she believed that revealing the image of her aura weapon was the same as revealing all of her weaknesses. Taken aback, the bishop said that he would tell Leon about the image of his aura weapon. The bishop said that in his head O represents the phases of the moon. Jezar said that he uses a tiny month with a small amount of power. At that moment, he recalled how he used his mace to chop off the head of a heretic. The bishop stated that he uses half of the moon at average power. A memory of the battle with the monster popped up in his mind. After that, Jezar said that he imagines the full moon at the moment when he is fighting at the limit of his capabilities. He thought back to the fight with the huge monster. The bishop noted that there are also such transformations as a transparent moon and a lunar eclipse. Shocked, Leon was amazed at the number of variations of the bishop. Karen wondered why Jezar had said it so easily. She couldn't believe that he trusted her and Leon so much. Thinking about it, the main character thought about the five lunar forms. The plot showed us variations of the moons at which the bishop's power is activated. In his thoughts, Leon noted that unlike the moon, the shape of the sun is constant. The main character understood that in this regard, he would not be able to build an image like that of Jezar. Alert, Leon remembered one thing. An image of the sun shining brightly and the moon blocking it appeared in his mind. The main character believed that it was quite possible to create an image of a solar eclipse. Putting a finger to his chin, Leon thought that if they understood the image of an eclipse as an accumulation of power, then the sun, which always burns brightly, is itself the personification of continuity. The main character believed that this is why in this situation he just needs to solve the problem of his simultaneous existence with the eclipse. The bishop smiled and assumed that Leon had had an epiphany. Encouraged, Leon said it was true. The main character would like to demonstrate what he has realized right now in order to give a clearer form to the thought that has visited him. After that, the guys went to the open area, which was located outside the church. Raising his sword, Leon asked them to start their training. As he spun the mace, Jezar noticed that he liked the look on the main character's face. The bishop wanted Leon to show him what kind of insight he had. After concentrating the sacred aura in the sword, the main character wanted to try to do everything properly. Throwing his mace in Leon's direction, the bishop announced that he was advancing. Putting the holy sword to the chain, the main character was able to repel his attack. A powerful blow from Jezar's mace left a huge hole behind Leon. After preparing for the next attack, the protagonist grabbed his weapon with both hands. His face was frozen in place. Leon was wary, thinking that this wasn't the right feeling. In his thoughts, the main character understood that active use was still difficult. Leon noted that in this training session, he only needs to respond to the bishop's attack. Watching the mace in Jezar's hands, the protagonist believed that even though he was adjusting his power, he should not forget that he was dealing with an aura weapon. Leon knew that the slightest contact with the chain would tear his flesh apart. At that moment, the bishop once again pointed his weapon towards the main character. In his mind, Leon believed that it was impossible to constantly only block and dodge his attacks. Imagining the space surrounding him, the protagonist knew that he needed to calculate the trajectory of Jezar's weapon and aim for the gap in the defense. Leon believed that for a weapon like Chains, keeping your distance was life. As he dodged the bishop's attack, the protagonist thought that if he got close, he would be able to block half of the techniques. Leon was sure that the first thing he needed to do was dodge. At that moment, Jezar's chain flew in front of his face. The main character's body was surrounded on all sides by the bishop's chains. With a smirk, Jezar asked if Leon was confident that he could dodge this attack. Anger enveloped the protagonist's face. He didn't know if it was possible. By concentrating his aura in his legs, the protagonist understood that he needed to put his doubts aside because he, by all means, had to cope. After which, his body was covered in a sacred aura. The bishop's face was shocked. Leon's aura sparkled in the chains that covered him. After imagining the eclipse, the main character thought that he should use the reproduction of the Big Dipper sword. As Leon swung his sword, he thought about what the eclipse sword would demonstrate. An image of a constellation lined up in a row appeared in his mind. The main character thought that the first thing he wanted was the second technique of the Great Chariot Merak. At that moment, Leon recalled how, with the help of Rodrigo's technique, he defeated the preacher. The main character believed that this should not be an unconscious repetition, but a manifestation of his own will. As Leon concentrated, he realized that first he needed to compress the aura and put it into the sword's blade, not allowing it to go beyond its limits. In his mind, the protagonist understood that the problem was releasing the aura. Leon's eyes were filled with a powerful sacred aura. Thinking about all this, he realized that the solution to materialize the aura that he had managed to find was the Eclipse Sword. From the protagonist's holy sword, bright flames radiated out, shrouding everything. The bishop's face was shocked. With a single swing of his sword, Leon destroyed the chains in Jezar's mace. The bishop froze in a dumbfounded position. The main character reported that it was just an unstable technique. In his mind, Leon thought that before fully mastering the Big Dipper Sword, it was like before the moon. 
As he continued to ponder, he realized that this was the reason why he would use the Eclipse Sword. An image of stars forming a constellation appeared in his mind. Trying to catch his breath, Leon believed that it could be said that he had created his own personal simplified method to use the perfect technique in an incomplete form. Delighted with the result, the main character thought that whatever it was, now in his personal arsenal there is a technique with which he can strike at the enemy. Looking at his destroyed weapon, Jezza reported that Leon was great. Taken aback, the main character tried to apologize to him. Putting her hand to her mouth, the adventurer asked you guys to look here. Karen said that Leon had a visitor. Confused, Lai was very happy to meet the main character. Leon smiled when he saw Lee. Sunlight softly enveloped the expanse of the church. Sitting at the table, Lee assumed it was the first time they'd met outside the guild. She asked Leon about his state of health. The main character said that everything was fine with him, thanking her for her concern. Lee stated that she was worried about him, so she took a high-quality tonic with her. Handing the box to the protagonist, she informed him that it was a reward given to him by the Lord. Watching the contents, Lee explained that it was a bracelet with a space charm. She noted that it is not very large, but Lee was sure that it would be useful. Karen was shocked that the bracelet contained a space charm. The adventurer noted that such a thing would cost several hundred gold coins. Dumbfounded, Karen thought that if it wasn't for the simple design, it would have been possible to snatch more than a thousand gold coins for it. Hearing this, Lai noticed that the adventurer knew a lot about such things. Pointing to the jewelry, Karen said that her earrings have the same charm. Taking out a dagger with the help of the technique, the adventurer noted that due to the small compatibility, she can only store small things inside. In his mind, the protagonist finally understood where she was getting all those daggers from. After that, Leon put the charm bracelet on his arm. Using the technique, the main character placed the potion inside. At the same time, the potion began to seal itself into the magic artifact. Looking at the bracelet, Leon noticed that it was quite a handy magic tool. In his mind, the main character was surprised that the Earl of Blaine, who gave him such a thing, is much more generous and generous than he thought. Holding the badge in her hands, Lai revealed that the second reason for her coming was because of his promotion to B-rank. After showing the badge, she pointed out that since the main character already had everything necessary to raise the rank of the condition, he just needed to show the aura weapon, after which she would immediately provide him with a token. As Leon thought about it, an image of Elsa appeared in his mind, which spoke of the hundred days. He was surprised that he had reached rank B long before the deadline. Clutching the holy sword in his hand, the protagonist wished that Elsid would be able to see it. After which, Leon showed Lee his aura weapon. Taken aback, she confirmed the presence of the aura weapon. The B-rank token was handed over to the main character. Raising the badge above himself, Leon recalled that when he was studying at the academy, he could not even dream that he would ever become an adventurer of rank B overjoyed. The guys congratulated the main character on raising the rank. Then, Lai revealed the latest purpose of her visit. Holding the document in her hands, she stated that they had received the request that Leon was looking for. The main character didn't understand what Lai was talking about. After which, she wondered if Leon was going to be responsible for the guild's security duties. Hearing this, the main character fell into a stupor. At that moment, Karen watched Leon's shocked face. Lee said that the trade caravan was heading for the Titanium Mountains, and Blaine was just a temporary stopover. A route popped up in her head. Lai pointed out that as soon as the supplies were replenished, he would be on his way again. Holding up a finger, she asked if the main character had forgotten who she was. Lee said that since Leon had asked her for a favor, she had had a hard time finding a place for him. Karen's face was filled with anger. Turning to Leon, she asked about a certain place. After which, the main character asked the adventurer to wait. Leon noted that at the time, he still didn't know if she would follow along with him. The main character thought that in order to fix the problem, he decided to seek help from the bishop, who had strong connections with the guild. After finishing the conversation, the guys said goodbye to the departing Lee. In his thoughts, Leon noted that Lee also happily agreed to contact him if there were any changes. After that, the main character's training resumed. Leon believed that as long as there was no response from the guild, they would continue to train hard. In her hand, the adventurer held a dagger. Alert, the protagonist thought of Karen's unimaginable speed. Watching the adventurer, Leon believed that the only thing more dangerous than the art of throwing daggers was her speed. Karen threw her punches with incredible speed. The main character continued to fend off the adventurer's attacks. Karen supposed it was just that his eyes weren't looking right at his opponent. The adventurer believed that one couldn't rely on one's eyesight alone. Leon's eyes were strained with all their might. In his thoughts, the main character believed that the first goal of this training was to fill in the shortcomings of the Providence techniques. The space surrounding him on the battlefield appeared in his mind. Leon was sure that he needed to improve his ability to sense the aura. The main character believed that this way, he would be able to use the Eclipse Sword more confidently. Leon knew he had to concentrate to do that. 
watching Karen, whose body was covered in a green aura, the protagonist thought about the change in the gusts of air. After which, Leon felt a slight tremor in the ground. The adventurer behind her prepared to attack. Frozen in place, the protagonist managed to feel it. Next, Leon turned his head towards Karen. The adventurer's face was filled with surprise. Karen stepped back and landed on the ground. Trying to catch her breath, the adventurer thought Leon's result was amazing. The adventurer never expected that the main character would master the sense of aura so quickly. Leon grinned, noting that it was all thanks to Karen. After which, he thanked her. The adventurer's face was shrouded in confusion. She didn't understand what the main character was talking about. Grabbing Leon by the neck, Karen indignantly asked him what he had just said. Smiling, the main character believed that if he did not forget this feeling and continued to use it, from time to time, he would be able to become much stronger than now. Taken aback, Jezer congratulated Leon on his excellent result. The bishop noted that the main character once again showed great growth. After which, Leon turned to him. The main character said that he had good news for the bishop. Leon explained that he had arranged to meet with the guild head this afternoon. Jezar's face was full of joy. The bishop reported that the guild had set up camp not far from here. Therefore, he thought that with a face-to-face -face meeting, he would easily be able to solve the problem that had arisen. Overjoyed, the boys appeared before the bishop. Blaine's evening sky was shrouded in slow-moving clouds. From the high ground, Leon noted that they had arrived just in time. Inspired, the main character turned to the surprised Karen. He asked if they were going to the camp. The glare of the sun's light was all over the place. The guys went to the tent, which was located in the open spaces of the camp. The man asked if Leon was a guild member. After showing the guild token, the main character reported that this is so. Sitting on a chair, the man said that his name was Arnold, and he was from the Stom Guild. Reaching out, Arnold noted that they were a small guild, so he looked forward to their mutual cooperation with Leon. The main character said that he also thinks so. After that, the guys shook hands. Arnold's eyes narrowed as he looked at Leon. Looking at his hand, the protagonist noticed that the adventurer's palms were not the same as those of a swordsman. In his mind, Leon believed that he was facing a changed life. The hand formation that is characteristic of the scribe. An image of the recording hand appeared in his mind. The main character thought that this person, conscientiously and sincerely living much longer than he holds a sword in his hands. Arnold grinned and said that Leon's handshake was full of courage. A smile appeared on the protagonist's face, after which, he once again extended his hand to the guild member. The guys unanimously said that they fully count on each other. Above the guild tent, there was a flag that slowly fluttered in the wind. After listening to the main character, Arnold realized that he needed another seat. Guild member Stom pointed out that they are limited in budget. Arnold wasn't sure if they had the option of hiring another escort. While sitting on a chair, Leon reported on the destination, which is the Titanium Mountains. A member of the Stom Guild pointed out that this was the case. The main character asked if he knew how dangerous it was to climb the mountain. Arnold said it was. An image of the Titan Mountains appeared in his mind, the bowels of which were shrouded in lava. Leon held up a finger and said, If Arnold's caravan is going to be accompanied by an Arank adventurer on such a dangerous journey, then does he understand how reliable insurance will be in his hands? Upon hearing this, the Stom Guild member was thrown into shock. Putting a hand to his chin, Arnold noted that this was indeed a reliable insurance policy. He believed that hiring an adventurer was worth a lot of money, and that the daily ration needed to be added to all of this. After thinking about it, Guild member Stom said that the most important thing he doubted was that an Arank adventurer would guard such a small guild. After which, Karen handed him a token that confirmed that she was an Arank adventurer. Leaning on the table, the adventurer asked for forgiveness for presenting it so late. Next, Karen introduced herself. Cheers could be heard from the campsite. Elated, guild member Stom welcomed such an expensive guest to his tent. Arnold pointed out that someone who calls himself a merchant must have a sharp eye. He felt that he was still not good enough in this regard. Pointing at Leon, the adventurer asked the Stom guild member not to worry about money matters. Karen stated that she was here to accompany the main character. She noted that for this reason, it is possible to set the award at the level of rank B. After that, Arnold put a seal on the document that confirmed their contract. The Stom guild member's face was filled with joy. Arnold said that they are extremely limited in funds. He asked to be forgiven for daring to take advantage of their concession. A member of the Stom Guild said that next time he will definitely repay the services of the guys at the A-rank level. Taken aback, Karen realized that she should be the one to apologize to him for suddenly showing up on his doorstep. Satisfied, Arnold said that he would provide them with the most comfortable wagon and provide them with all the necessities they needed. Confused, Leon turned to the adventurer. He asked if it was okay for a member of the Stom Guild to fawn over them like that. Karen stated that this is how it should be, because she has an A-rank. As time passed, Blaine's sun gradually began to set. After directing his gaze at the adventurer, the protagonist asked if everything was really alright. 
Karen pointed out that Arnold had managed to hire an Arank adventurer on a cheap basis, and that was why they could enjoy the facilities provided with peace of mind. Leon turned his head when he saw something. His gaze fell on the mercenaries who were stationed in the campsite. Grinning, Karen asked if this was the first time Leon had ever seen mercenaries in front of him. Leon noted that he had watched them from a distance, but never up close. A memory of when he and the main squad had laid siege to the 25th district popped up in his mind. The main character said that even during the operation, he did not have a chance to cross paths with other armed forces. After which, Leon noticed that every single one of them looked very strong. His gaze was directed at the mercenaries, who had an intimidating smile on their faces. In his thoughts, the main character thought that the looks thrown in his direction were not friendly at all. Turning her head to the side, Karen stated that mercenaries have some biases against adventurers. She believed that it would be fine if both sides didn't provoke each other. On the face of the main character could be seen the glare of the sun going into the sunset. As Leon watched the expanse of Blaine, he knew that he would soon be saying goodbye to this city. After which, he wondered if he would ever come back here again. Memories of leaving the academy's confines and breaking through the thick of the dangerous forest with Elsa surfaced in his mind. The main character thought that after he left the birdcage called the Academy, a lot of things happened to him in this city. At that moment, his memories were shrouded in various events, such as joining a guild, meeting Kon Feng, and meeting Jezar. With a smile, Leon was sure that even if other places were erased from his memory, it would be difficult for him to forget this city. The main character, if possible, would like to leave immediately after Elsid wakes up. An image of a sacred weapon that was chained up appeared in his mind. Leon believed that if he missed this request, he would never know when he would get a similar chance again. The main character understood that it was extremely rare for trade caravans to head towards the Titanium Mountains. In his mind, he knew that he couldn't rely on Elsid alone. He believed that even if at the end of their operation, he had no choice but to accept his help. A gust of evening wind covered Leon's eyes with his hair. He was sure that it was more appropriate for a hero to not sit idly by, even if the sacred weapon was temporarily absent. The morning rays of the sun slowly covered the expanse of Blaine. The children standing in front of the church wanted to say goodbye to the bishop. May the goddess bless your path. Yes, said Jezar. The bishop noted that during the day in the form of the sun, and at night in the form of the moon, the goddess will watch them. Lowering his head as a sign of respect, the protagonist hero thanked Jezar for all that he had done for him. The embarrassed bishop thought that these words should, on the contrary, be said by him. Jezar noted that if not for that fateful meeting, they would never have been able to cope with the city devourer. An image of a powerful monster that had subsequently destroyed the leader of the heretics appeared in his mind. The bishop believed that this could be called the will of the goddess, which led them to this goal. At that moment, he was thinking about how the main character, with the help of Rodrigo's technique, destroyed the preacher. Jezar held out his hand and said that there was something he would like to pass on to Leon. He was holding a piece of jewelry in his hand. The bishop said it was a necklace that contained sacred power. Jezar pointed out that it was an item that could be used for healing purposes. He asked Leon to use it when he was in a situation where it would be difficult to draw the holy sword. Wearing the bishop's gift, the protagonist thanked him for it. Leon said he would keep it carefully. In his mind, the main character believed that in other words, now that Elsid is immersed in a dream, he really needs this item. Smiling, Jezar informed him that this relic also had one hidden function. Holding the necklace, Leon asked him again. An image of the holy army appeared in the bishop's mind. Jezar stated that if the main character showed this necklace to someone from the top leadership of the church, he would be able to summon all the knights of the Order of the Iron Castle nearby. Hearing this, Leon was thrown into shock. After that, the bishop asked the main character to use the necklace very carefully. Jezar noted that anyone who is not its owner can use this feature only once. Looking at the bishop's gift, Leon thanked him again for such a valuable gift. Holding the token from the necklace in his hands, the main character understood that the ability to mobilize all the forces of the Order of the Iron Castle, even if the call is one time, is an insanely expensive thing. In his mind, Leon was sure that if a situation like the one in Blaine came up, this necklace would be a huge help. Slowly floating clouds gradually blocked out the afternoon sun. A huge number of horse carts were located in the vast expanses of the city. A happy Arnold wished the boys a good morning. Guild member Stom asked if they were done with their morning routines. He asked them to answer the breakfast prepared for them. The children's eyes were focused on the plentiful amount of different food. Taken aback, Leon said that Arnold didn't have to show so much concern. The protagonist's happy exclamations could be heard from the tent. Leon said he'd eaten too much. He thought that a member of the Stom Guild was overdoing it. Grinning, Karen asked if this was the first time the main character had been treated like this. The adventurer noticed that Leon's expression looked like he was about to sink through the ground with embarrassment. 
the main character said that it was all because of her. After which, the adventurer's face froze in one position. Smiling, Karen assumed they'd have a little extra trouble. The main character's face was filled with confusion. Alert, he turned his head to the side. At that moment, many mercenaries were watching him closely. Grinning, Leon noted that he didn't know if there really would be a few of them. Turning to the main character, Karen noted that there are a lot of people who got them across the throat. Her face was shrouded in excitement. Leon froze in place, alert. It was gradually getting dark outside. The guild members continued on their way. During the trip, the guys settled down in one of the carts. Leaning against the wall of the wagon, the protagonist noticed that they were moving faster than he thought. While half asleep, Karen reported that this was due to two horses pulling the body with a spell carved on it. Magic seals were placed on the guild carts. The adventurer stated that lightweight is one of the most common and useful spells. Karen thought it was cheap and could be used for a long time. With the help of the adventurer's spell, the carts moved at an amazing speed. Karen noted that while the spell was convenient in many ways, it wasn't all powerful. The adventurer reported that when used on carts, there is also a disadvantage in that they become unstable to impact. An image of the place they were going to appeared in her mind. Karen stated that in steep terrain such as the Titanium Mountains, she would have to disable the lightweight spell. The adventurer noted that therefore, now, driving the horses at full speed, the caravan drivers, thereby, try to gain more time. As time passed, the sun began to set. Having stopped, the guild members decided to set up camp in the vast expanses of this land. Falling asleep, Karen said that there was no other way, because it was getting dark quickly here. Leaning on the base of the carriage, the protagonist invited the adventurer to go outside. Karen said she didn't really want to do it. Once settled in the carriage, the adventurer noted that she wasn't hungry yet. She asked Leon to take a walk alone. Karen noted that if something happens, the main character should immediately call her. The main character was watching the lively guild members. His gaze fell on the woman who was preparing dinner and the elder who was feeding a tired horse. As Leon stood by the wagon, he thought that everyone was making the necessary arrangements so that everyone could get as much rest as possible during the rest stop. Seeing that the entire guild moved so smoothly, as if it were a single organism, the main character believed that it was safe to say that these were people who had been working together for a long time. Suddenly, Leon heard some sounds. A crowd of mercenaries was standing in front of him. Alert in his mind, the protagonist knew that they would approach him if he was alone. Turning to the man, Leon asked if they had any business to attend to. Grinning, the man noted that the main character speaks as if he is some kind of employer. Closing his eyes, Leon stated that if he thought that, then he was really speaking like a boss. The man's face was filled with rage. He thought that the main character was playing the role of an important bird just because he was here in the company of an Arank adventurer. The man said that Leon's thoughts weren't mature, and neither was his snotty face. Taken aback, the main character noted that they rushed the whole crowd at one. Leon believed that in this situation, it was very clear who was really trying to show off their strength. The main character asked to speak bluntly. Grinning, Leon noticed that his stomach was starting to cramp at the thought that some brat had turned his abilities and experience to nothing and now he had to endure this terrible treatment. Enraged, the man called him a pathetic worm, after which, they collided head-on. Behind them, Karen ordered them to stop. With hatred on her face, the adventurer asked, since when do big boys only fight in words? Karen stated that if the mercenaries didn't believe in Leon's abilities, they could have a duel. Their faces were filled with shock. The mercenaries asked if she was serious. Pointing to the main character, Karen asked if they were afraid that she was on his side and could intervene at any time. Dumbfounded, the mercenaries reported that this was not the case. Stretching out his hand, the guy stated that if the adventurer is willing to provide a fair judging, then he would like to clash in battle with the main character. Overjoyed, Karen agreed. Turning to Leon's side, the adventurer asked if he would be willing to fight right now. Surprised, the main character agreed. Startled, Leon thought that things were going exactly as Karen had said. A memory of the adventurer's words popped up in his mind. Karen had said that if the mercenaries here had any preconceived notions about them, then all she needed to do was use the force to teach those small minds a good lesson. The adventurer believed that skills decided everything here. Turning his gaze to the seal, Leon wondered if Elsid was right next to him, what he would say to him. After imagining the image of a gloating sacred weapon, the protagonist thought it best not to think about it. The mercenaries' faces were filled with rage. While thinking about it, Leon couldn't understand why he felt like he wouldn't lose, despite the fact that his opponents were mercenaries who were B-rank veterans. Strong screams were heard in the vicinity of the camp. The protagonist believed that the friction between adventurers and mercenaries, two professions that split the guild into two camps, was a long-standing problem. In his mind, Leon guessed that it was extremely unpleasant for them to see him as a B-rank novice adventurer being in the same boat as an A-rank beauty adventurer. 
Grinning, the protagonist couldn't say that he didn't understand their feelings. Satisfied, Karen announced that the bet would close in 10 seconds. She talked about making sure that people had time to place a bet. A crowd of mercenaries formed in front of the adventurer. The stranger wanted to bet five silver coins on Hanson. The guy noted that he also puts three silver points on the mercenary. The young man said that in this case, he will bet on the baby adventurer. Being in shock, the main character understood that a man should be able to quickly solve his problems. He assumed that Karen had started all this to expand her playground. Putting her hand to her mouth, the adventurer announced that they were going to have a duel between a mercenary and an adventurer of rank B. Karen wondered who would win the battle for pride. Pointing her finger at Arnold, the adventurer asked if he would like to place a bet. Approaching her, a member of the Stom Guild informed her that this was the case. Overjoyed, they turned to look at the dumbfounded Leon. In his mind, the main character was clear about who Arnold had bet on, and he didn't understand why they were whispering like this. After which, Karen announced the start of the match. Crowds of cheering onlookers stood behind the main character. The adventurer reported that adventurer Leon will be fighting against a representative of the Steel Claws Hansen mercenary group. The mercenary's face was filled with rage. Standing between the participants of the match, Karen said that direct hits from weapons are prohibited. After which, the adventurer pointed out that it was also forbidden to use weapons that weren't mentioned beforehand. Karen added that any fraudulent fraud, including the use of scrolls, is prohibited. Raising a finger, the adventurer pointed out that first of all, they should follow her instructions without question. Karen stated that there was no time limit and that it was impossible to leave the wasteland. She noted that if one of the participants harms someone from the audience, they will immediately lose. After which, the adventurer asked if they understood the rules of the event. Heading towards the enemy, the main character declared that he understood everything. After preparing for battle, the mercenary declared that he understood everything. Next, Karen announced the start of the fight. Holding his sword, Leon watched Hansen defend with his shield. While studying the enemy, the main character was thinking about the mercenary's spear and shield. While in his thoughts, the main character noted that the person in front of him wasn't even rank C, after which, he pointed out that among those who had reached rank B, it was very rare to find fighters using a shield. As Leon continued to study his opponent, he froze in one position. Paying attention to the shield, the main character suggested that the silver scratches on the shield indicate that he is looking at unusual protective equipment. Leon was wary and noticed that Hansen's shield wasn't as simple as it first appeared. Grinning, the mercenary stated that it was true. Hansen reported that although in a small amount, Mithril was added to the alloy. An image of a dwarf appeared in his mind. The mercenary revealed that he had saved a dwarf a few years ago and received a shield as a token of gratitude. Taken aback, the main character wondered if it was possible to share such information with such ease. Encouraged, Hansen thought there was nothing to hide. He noted that after a couple of punches, Leon had guessed it all by himself. Leaning his shield against his face, the mercenary stated that he had not originally intended to play tricks in a duel with a child. Turning his gaze downwards, the protagonist realized that Hansen considered him a rubbish opponent. Grinning, the protagonist was sure of something that would make him regret it. Turning around, Leon suggested that he should start with a lightning strike. Then, with incredible speed, he charged at Hansen. At that moment, the waiting mercenary unsheathed his spear. Jumping up, the main character aimed to deliver the first blow. Due to the power of his punch, the ground under Hansen's feet disintegrated into small pieces. The dumbfounded mercenary couldn't understand where Leon's strength came from. Concentrating, Hansen readied himself to strike with his spear. The main character skillfully parried multiple attacks of the mercenary. As he continued to dodge the enraged Hansen's attacks, Leon realized that the one-handed spear and mithril alloy shield were a mix of restraining strikes and instant attacks. In his mind, the main character believed that this is a style of fighting that focuses on defense. The crazed mercenary kept trying to strike at Leon. The surprised protagonist understood that rushing into the attack, he deals damage only to himself. He felt like he was looking at a hedgehog with spikes all over its body. After imagining the image of using a powerful technique in his mind, Leon thought that he could get rid of this shield by using Eclipse, he wasn't sure if he would end up cutting the shield in half alone. As he continued to dodge Hansen's incessant attacks, the protagonist realized that with such pressure, he left him no choice. With his hand on the ground, he thought about retaliating. The surprised onlookers couldn't understand why Leon was squatting down. Karen's face was frozen in place. At that moment, with unimaginable speed, the main character disappeared from the mercenary's sight. Leon used his leg to attack Hansen directly into the shield. The mercenary's face was filled with incomprehension. After the main character pressed himself to the ground, with a powerful kick attack, he knocked Hansen down. While in a fighting stance, Leon wondered what the mercenary thought of his attack with his foot instead of his sword. Hansen's face was filled with rage. He was sure that the main character was a true swordsman who adhered to strict canons of combat. 
Before he could recover from the previous attack, Hansen found Leon flying towards him. As he prepared for its attack, he hid his head behind his shield, but the main character attacked him from behind. Grinning, Karen saw that it was the killer's footsteps. Due to the unrealistic speed, after being hit by Leon, the mercenary falls to the ground, after which, he screams out in great pain. When the mercenary recovered, he saw a blade pointed in his direction. Hansen couldn't believe that he had lost. A hero towered over him, holding his sword. Karen announced the end of the fight. The adventurer reported that the victory is awarded to Leon. The mercenary's faces were filled with shock as a joyful Arnold stood with huge bags of money. Looking at the happy Karen, the main character thought that the technique he mastered with her help was very useful. An image of Elsa appeared in his mind. While in his thoughts, Leon was sure that if the sacred weapon saw this, it would start sawing at him, saying why on earth was he imitating an assassin. The main character believed that if necessary, it is better to have as many different techniques in your arsenal as possible. Leon guessed that there was hardly anyone else besides Rodrigo who could defeat anyone with just one head on attack. The mercenaries' faces were filled with anger. The guy standing next to them asked them to stop it. Turning to the male commander, Gustav noted that even after seeing the battle with his own eyes, he still can't realize how big the difference is between the main character and him. Putting his hand to his cheek, the man said that he understood this. Watching this guy, Leon assumed that he was the commander of the Steel Claws mercenary group. Bending down in respect, Gustav apologized to the main character. The commander believed that Leon's skills deserved to be ranked B. He claimed that they were simply blind. Gustav said that it was their fault that they started blaming their age and caused a stir. Hearing this, the main character fell into a stupor. Fighting back tears, the commander noted that it was a little sad for him to realize that despite his mature years as Leon, they were on the same level as him. An image of a carriage appeared in his mind. The commander reported that they, four men, were traveling in the same cart. After which, he imagined an image of the main character standing next to Karen. Gustav was upset that Leon was sharing the same carriage with such a beautiful woman. In desperation, the captain stated that it was for this reason that they were a little blinded by envy. Clenching his fist, Gustav apologized to the main character for being so petty and narrow-minded. Karen, standing behind him, could barely contain her laughter. Reaching out, Leon asked the mercenary squad to continue living together. The mercenaries' faces were shrouded in the protagonist's radiance. Gustav shook hands and said that they were now deeply in his debt. Bending down, the commander noted that someday they would wash away this stain of shame. Taken aback, Leon asked not to talk about any debt. Hugging the main character, Gustav asked him not to talk nonsense. The commander said that a man's duty is more precious than his life. Gustav noted that the main character may not accept their will. After which, he asked Leon to remember that they would definitely pay him back in full. Then, Gustav invited the main character to have a drink with them. The night sky gradually became overcast. The happy mercenaries clashed their mugs together as they made a toast. Grinning, Gustav started offering the main character alcohol. After many rejections, Leon still agreed. Next to her, Karen watched. The sun rose brightly over the expanse of the wasteland. Standing next to the sleeping Leon, she said that if he could imagine how funny the story would be about how the brave hero stretched out his legs after taking a sip of alcohol. At this time, the main character continued to sleep soundly. On the territory of the temporary camp, the guild members lit bonfires. Leon noted that after reconciling with the mercenaries, the atmosphere within the guild had greatly improved. Sitting across from the mercenaries, the protagonist thought that even he had received an unexpected benefit. Leon reported that the mercenary Hansen, who came from the Northern Army, taught him how to fight the mountain orcs. Watching the army of monsters, the main character noticed that the place where they were going was teeming with orcs, so such information was very valuable to him. At that moment, Leon remembered the proverb that said that if you are warned, you are armed. Watching one of the mercenaries, the main character noticed that not only Hansen, but also other mercenaries, proudly told their stories and shared methods of attacking monsters every time they met him. After that, Leon thanked him for such an informative story and for answering each of his endless questions. With confidence on his face, the mercenary informed him that it wasn't worth thanking. Then, turning to the main character, he also wanted to ask him something. Karen was sleeping in the wagon. The mercenary asked Leon about his real relationship with the adventurer. The main character's face was shocked. The morning sun shone on Karen's sleeping form. Dumbfounded, Leon thought about the matter that affected his relationship with the adventurer. Taken aback, the protagonist wondered what the mercenaries were talking about. Putting a hand to his chin, the mercenary assumed that Leon was trying to hide something. In his confusion, the mercenary noted that the mere fact that a girl and a boy who had reached maturity were riding in the same carriage spoke for itself. Outraged, Leon said that this was not the case. The man standing in front of the tree suggested that in that case, they should consider the two of them as teacher and student. 
Wary, he said that what he meant was that their movements looked pretty similar. The man noted that they communicated with each other without much ceremony, which is why it was unclear to him who is more important. Thinking about it, the main character assumed that the man's name was Hamel. In his mind, he knew that Hamel was a former forest ranger, which was why he had a good eye for observation. Leon was amazed that the mercenary immediately managed to emphasize the common features and the movements that he saw only once. Putting his hand to his head, the main character said that they got closer by performing joint requests. He noted that this is not the relationship that the mercenaries are hinting at. Watching Leon's reaction, they asked if he'd hit on her yet. Taken aback, the main character said that they were wrong. Karen, who was listening to their conversation, was very confused. As Leon strolled through the open spaces of the temporary camp, he noticed that not only was there an A-rank adventurer accompanying the caravan, but she was also traveling in the same carriage as a B-rank boy. The main character believed that anyone who looked from the outside would think that she needed him for her pleasures. In his mind, Leon was sure that he was being mistaken for a boy who thought the request was nothing because he was hiding behind a woman's skirt. Clenching his fist, the protagonist couldn't believe that he didn't deserve a better opinion of himself. He believed that he should not relax for a second. As Leon stared out over the expanse, he thought that when they stopped for the night, or even when they got off the wagon for a short time, he should make good on every moment. Gustav's face was filled with surprise. The sounds of battle could be heard in the temporary campgrounds. Drops of blood were visible on the ground. The wounded Leon tried to dodge the attack. Due to the commander's powerful thrust, a large crack was formed in the ground. The dumbfounded mercenaries were surprised by the duel with Gustav. The shocked guy thought that Leon is not a bass so. The young man was amazed that the main character so fearlessly challenged the commander to a duel. Gustav grinned and noted Leon's strength. The commander never expected the protagonist to withstand his direct attack. Leon, who was wounded, said that he could barely stand up. Turning to the main character, the commander asked him how he thinks if there are many people who can also react. There were blood clots on the tips of the protagonist's mouth. Gustav said that he did not use any technique, but simply decided to hit with all his strength. As he shouldered his blade, the commander noted that he had never imagined that Leon would not dodge, but take the blow on himself. Leon, sitting on the ground, said that he was also a little disappointed. Hearing this, Gustav laughed hard. The commander stated that the more he looked at the main character, the more he liked him. Leaning on the ground, Leon thought that reacting to force with force and to speed with speed was a pretty bad tactic that only worked during a duel. After wiping away the blood, the main character realized that if there was a real fight now, he would have already been beheaded, because he hesitated before taking a defensive stance. After which, Leon thanked Gustav for following through with his request. He noted that it was a very good lesson for him. In his mind, the main character believed that this is an opponent who is difficult to defeat even once out of ten fights. Leon was sure that the commander was a B rank, breathing down the back of an A rank. Gustav smiled and noted that the main character could address him at any time. The commander thought that it would be useful for him to cross swords a couple of times with such a talented fighter as Leon. Stopping, the commander said that they would not be able to fight each other for a while. Pointing to the thick of the forest, Gustav informed them that they would reach their borders tonight. The commander pointed out that if they made any more noise, all sorts of annoying monsters would come after them. Wary, the protagonist asked how long it would take them to completely cross the forest. Observing the many trees that shrouded the forest, Gustav stated that in a good scenario, they would need about three days. After that, he noted that if something goes wrong, their journey will be delayed for five to six days. Encouraged, Leon assumed that they would be fighting monsters. With confidence on his face, the commander reported that this was the case. Watching the horse carts, the commander noted that a caravan of this size could be attacked or bypassed. After that, he added that they should keep in mind that the forest has a medium level of danger. Looking thoughtfully into the distance, Gustav stated that if they encountered a monster of the middle hand, it would definitely attack. Surprised, Leon asked him again about the monster. An image of a terrifying monster appeared in the commander's mind. Gustav reported that there were swarms of trolls scurrying around in the forest. Alerting himself, the protagonist realized who he was talking about. Presenting an image of a troll standing next to Leon, Gustav stated that adult trolls are between 4 and 5 meters tall. The commander noted that they were quite agile compared to other types of monsters. Gustav told Leon that despite the fact that they are the owners of a decent belly, there are even those who can climb trees. The dumbfounded protagonist presented an image of a troll climbing trees. Folding his hands, the commander noted that those who have never seen it, do not take their word for it. Gustav believed that forest trolls can be safely dubbed ape-like. At that moment, Leon's face was filled with delight. Continuing his story, the commander and the main character sat down on a felled tree, being near the fire. In his thoughts, Leon noted that even though he didn't know anything about trolls, the information Gustav shared with him was completely out of the ordinary for him. 
Recalling the words of the commander, the main character reported that trolls attack in groups, not singly, and they can also use goblins or orcs as subordinates. Listening with pleasure to Gustav's story, Leon thought that something like this is not taught in the academy, since it is knowledge that can only be obtained by facing an opponent face to face. The main character was genuinely happy that he was able to be here. At the head of the group, Arnold announced that Carvin was about to enter the forest in front of them. Guild member Stom noted that those who are responsible for security should properly perform their duties. Then, by torchlight, the caravan headed deeper into the forest. While in his thoughts, Leon noted that after passing through the boring plains, he finally found himself in a forest where monsters live. Leaning on his sword, the protagonist believed that he needed to concentrate. Putting a hand to her head, Karen suggested that it was time for some work. While studying the surroundings of the forest, Leon stated that they couldn't have known when the enemy would appear. Taken aback, the adventurer informed Leon that because he was a novice, there were many things he didn't know. As she continued, Karen noted that the monsters would arrive tomorrow at dawn or in the afternoon. Making herself comfortable on the pillow, the adventurer declared that Leon could rest. Sitting down on the carriage, the protagonist thought that since Karen said so, he would also take a nap for a while. Thinking about it, Leon realized that he still hadn't moved away from the fight with Captain Gustav. In his mind, the main character believed that before fighting the monsters, he should clean himself up. Not a single cloud could be seen in the night sky. The guild caravan still continued on its way through the vast expanse of the forest. Wary, the adventurer turned to Leon. There was a hamel on the roof of the wagon. Sensing a strange smell, the mercenary began exploring the area. After which, he raised the bow above his head. An arrow was launched into the sky, alerting everyone of the attack. A standing girl watched the bright glow in the sky. A crowd of angry trolls emerged from the bushes. Karen jumped out of the cart and asked Leon to follow her. While holding a bow, the mercenary activated the aura arrow technique. After which, he released arrows that flew at an incredible speed towards their designated target. With the help of his technique, Hamel was able to destroy a small group of trolls. Putting his sword on his shoulder, Gustav praised the mercenary for the job he had done. Grinning, the commander noted that now it was their turn to work hard. After which, a group of mercenaries rushed into battle. With powerful attacks, they destroyed one troll after another. In his mind, a dumbfounded Leon thought that this was very different from participating in a punitive unit to eradicate evil. Watching the fierce battle, the main character noted that if at that time they were breaking through enemies, relying on their individual skills, now there is a situation in which they will have to make various attacks, fighting side by side with each other. Leon was sure that this was a completely different battle pattern. Gustav's face was shocked. Looking at the startled protagonist, the commander asked if this was the first time he had participated in such a battle. Out of anger, Gustav put his hand to his face. With a cry, the commander informed Leon that he was being attacked from the right. Grabbing the sword with both hands, the main character rushed into battle. In his mind, he thought that he should try to attack. Taking off from the ground, the main character hung in the air above the two trolls. With just a swing of his sword, he chopped them into small pieces. Surprised, Leon thought about the feeling on the tip of the sword. Paying attention to the weapon in his hand, the main character noted that if we are talking about goblins, then he has already encountered them when training with Elsid in the forest. Leon was surprised that he was able to strike with more ease now. Grinning, the main character suggested that he had become much stronger. The warning salvo was still clearly visible in the sky. The man ordered the mercenaries to hold the formation. He asked the archers to kill the monkeys in the trees. Pointing his finger forward, the mercenary informed the commander that the scum attacking the caravan from behind had been destroyed. Hearing his words, the commander ordered to deal with the remaining monsters in the center. Watching the mercenaries, the main character was shocked by their teamwork. He thought they were all great fighters. In his thoughts, Leon noticed that there were some who were particularly outstanding among the mercenaries. Gustav let out a powerful roar as he attacked the goblins. Chopping down one monster after another, the commander watched their remains fly away. Watching Gustav, Leon was amazed that he could wield such a massive two-handed sword so easily in the middle of the forest. After which, the main character realized that he should also try it. Suddenly, one of the mercenaries bumped into his back. Taken aback, the protagonist apologized to him. Brandishing his sword, the stranger claimed that Leon almost ran into his sword, after which he asked him to be careful. Crouching low, the dumbfounded protagonist begged for forgiveness. Accidentally stepping on the mercenary's cloak, Leon apologized again. Throughout the battle, the main character faced various challenges in every possible way. Distressed, Leon thought that someone like him would only get in everyone's way. He was sure that if he continued to fight like this, he would only get in everyone's way. Furious, Leon knew that he should have known how to keep a reasonable distance from his companions. After which, the main character wondered if he was able to make the sense of aura more perfect and stable. 
In his mind, he believed that he needed to focus in order to avoid overlapping with the trajectory of other fighters' strikes. The estimated attack range of the mercenaries appeared in his mind. He believed that he needed to stick to his space and find gaps that he could fill with himself. At that moment, his gaze fell on the goblin attacking from the back. The main character was glad that he could see the trajectory, after which, with lightning speed, he cut the monster in two. Taken aback, the mercenary thankfully on for his help. Karen smiled and noticed that the main character was growing fast. The bright green projectile gradually began to descend. The remnants of the defeated goblins could be seen on the battlefield. Grinning, Gustav declared that they had destroyed all the monsters. He reported repelling the goblin attack. After which, the commander wondered if anyone had been hurt by the monsters. Leon stood beside Karen, looking excited. Gustav said that the scouts would have to do a little more work, and the rest of them could go back to their wagons. Turning to Leon, the commander asked if he could stay for a while. Gustav told him about the other work he had to do. He asked if the main character would like to help him. Looking at Leon, Gustav reported that it was a troll hunt. Hearing this, Leon fell into a stupor. Putting a hand on the main character's shoulder, Karen assumed that the security team was determined to catch the troll. Putting his hand to his mouth, the commander said that it was so. Gustav noted that he also discussed this issue with the head of the guild. Imagining the image of a monster in his head, the commander explained that trolls have completely different attitudes towards strong and weak opponents. An image of the fleeing monsters that had discovered Karen appeared in his mind. The commander believed that if an Arank adventurer showed off her strength in front of them, they would most likely run away from the area without a backward glance. Cautiously, Karen assumed he was telling her not to interfere. Startled, Gustav noted that it was only a recommendation. The commander said that if the adventurer didn't like his suggestion, they could just give up on catching the trolls. Karen turned to Leon and asked what they would do. The main character didn't understand why the adventurer would ask him this. Karen pointed out that it was a troll. Grinning, she assumed that the main character had never encountered them before. The adventurer asked how Leon felt about taking this chance to fight the troll. The plot showed us the image of a troll. A troll is a medium-sized monster that usually lives in forests and swamps and dominates the terrain due to its unique regenerative ability and physical strength. A troll that appears at least once in any adventure story. In addition, it is completely different from the monsters summoned by satanic techniques. The story reminds us of the main character's battle with monsters and the leader of the heretics. Leon thought that the experience he could gain from fighting him would be quite important. The memory of how he was able to defeat the enchanted armor using the holy technique popped up in his mind. The main character believed that if he is offered to fight a monster whose body is superior to a human, and has special abilities that cannot be purified by fighting with a holy sword, then. Encouraged, Leon said he accepted the challenge. Karen smiled and realized that she knew it. Putting her hands behind her head, the adventurer noted that she was insured for this expedition from all sides. She felt that it was a sin for her to complain about not having to personally participate in the battles. Raising her finger, the adventurer announced that she had one condition. Karen turned to Gustav and asked him to give Leon a chance to fight a troll one-on-one. -on -one. Surprise enveloped the protagonist's face. He was surprised that an adventurer would offer him a one-on-one -on -one battle with a troll. With a smile, Karen pointed out that if they agreed to this condition, she would assist in the troll hunt. Pointing a finger at the dumbfounded commander, the adventurer stated that if the main character kills the troll, then he must pay him, as expected, for the work done. Gustav said that in any case, they had already discussed everything with the guild head. The night sky was shrouded in tiny stars. Torchlight helped guide the caravan on its way. Watching the coachman, Leon declared that it was almost the fourth day since they had entered this forest. The main character noted that on the first and second days there were goblins, and then gnolls and kobolds. Images of terrifying monsters appeared in his mind. Leon had no idea that the monsters would attack them now. The main character believed that this is a pattern that no one can foresee. He noted that despite the fact that we are talking about monsters, they are also no stranger to fear. Leon turned his head in Karen's direction and said that they hadn't made it halfway through the forest, moving day and night without stopping. An image of the route appeared in his mind. Being in his thoughts, the main character suggested that this was due to the search for trolls. Leon believed that they were the target of all the monsters in this forest. Imagining the image of a troll and goblins in his head, the main character understood that the power of intruders is not a big threat, but the fundamental decision was to catch the one who manipulates them from the shadows. Leon wondered if it was possible that after all the watching, the trolls wouldn't attack their caravan. While tossing her dagger, Karen noted that such a scenario was also possible. The adventurer's face was shrouded in fright. Surprised, Leon asked if Karen was okay. A huge rock was flying towards the caravan. After which, the stone landed on one of the carts. Strong screams could be heard in the thick of the forest. The man didn't understand what had happened. 
the mercenary reported that a rock suddenly flew out of the sky. Looking at the stone under which the bloody body was visible, the man said that it was instant death. He said that no one was killed in the previous raid. The man couldn't believe that they had just lost three people in just one attack. The mercenary believed that only monsters could do such a thing. Paying attention to the eye patch, the protagonist recalled the mercenary he saved from the goblin's surprise attack. Lifting the blindfold, anger enveloped the protagonist's face. Wary, Karen announced that they were here, and Lon needed to get ready. A huge rock flew towards the guys again. The man was sure that they were trolls. The mercenary stated that the stones were falling again, so they needed to prepare for a retaliatory strike. The startled mercenary noted that they had no idea when the next stone would fall. In his desperation, he believed that they would all die. Having prepared for defense, the main character grabbed his sword. As he watched the rock fly toward him, Leon assumed it was like a catapult attack. Gustav ordered everyone to scatter around the area in order to avoid the rocks. Frozen in one position, the main character didn't know if he could cut a rock flying towards him by using Eclipse. He was sure that he had to do it. At that moment, Gustav kicked off the ground and ordered everyone to be quiet. Frozen in midair, the commander tried to cut through the huge rock. Concentrating, Gustav continued to try his best to stop the stone. As a result of a powerful blow, the commander managed to cut it into two parts. The mercenaries' faces were shocked. Falling to the ground, the commander turned to formation C mercenaries of blue, purple eagle, crimson sword, and sharpshooter hide the wagons in some shelter. Gustav shouted, after which, he asked the adventurers to watch out for monsters that might appear out of nowhere. Watching the commander, the main character was shocked that he calmed the people down in the blink of an eye and gave clear instructions on how to proceed. The roar of approaching monsters could be heard from the thick of the forest. Enraged monsters were advancing on the halted caravan. Angrily, Gustav believed that if this continued, there would be no end to the monsters. The commander said that now their priority is to destroy the trolls. His eyes fell on Hamel and Hansen. He asked them to take four mercenaries with them and find out the location of the trolls. Gustav stated that as soon as they saw them, they should immediately join the battle so that they could no longer throw stones. Enraged, the commander ordered them to finish off all the monsters, after which, the mercenaries obeyed his order. Next to him, Karen turned to Gustav. The adventurer said that they will go to the one that is farthest away from everyone else. The commander assumed that they had already determined the location. He was counting heavily on the boys. After that, the guys went on their way. A group of enraged goblins met on their way. Grinning, Karen was surprised that they were trying to block her path. The adventurer believed that the monsters wanted to play the box as soon as possible. Enraged, Karen rushed towards the goblins, after which, they continued on their way again. Turning to the main character, the adventurer reported that they had almost arrived at the place, which is why he should get ready. Finally, a huge troll appeared in their path. In its hand, the monster held a huge rock. Frozen in place, Karen announced that she would block the escape route. She said that the main character can fight him to his heart's content. Grinning, the adventurer wondered if Leon had forgotten about the one-on-one -on -one battle with the troll. An image of the monster's field of vision appeared in his mind. The main character understood that if he used the remote distance from other mercenaries, they would approach him faster than he could notice them. In his mind, Leon thought that if he could now take advantage of the fact that the monsters had night vision. Suddenly, the troll noticed the sounds coming from behind him. After preparing for battle, the main character applied a cleansing light. Leon's powerful technique blinded the troll. Rushing in his direction, the main character believed that he could take him down with one blow. But suddenly, small particles of rocks flew towards him. His eyes fell on the troll's hand, which scooped up a handful of rocks. The enraged monster continued to throw them in Leon's direction. The main character suggested that due to the loss of vision, the troll began to attack indiscriminately. Taking cover from the rocks flying at him, Leon believed that no matter what, he had to break through. A look of shock appeared on the protagonist's face. Watching the troll, he couldn't believe that it had already regained its sight. In his thoughts, he noted the incredible power of healing. The monster's face was filled with rage. Taking out a club from behind his back, the troll headed in the direction of the main character. Leon was shocked that the monster had a weapon. After which, he realized that it was nothing more than a gnarled log. In his thoughts, the main character believed that if the blow fell on him from such a height, then a fatal outcome could not be avoided. At that moment, a memory of his training match with Gustav popped up in Leon's mind. Leon knew that even though he had managed to deflect the frontal attack, it was only a training exercise. An image of the commander holding a sword appeared in his mind. Grinning in his mind, Leon declared that he couldn't make a single mistake from now on. The enraged troll continued to run towards the main character. Leaping to the side, Leon managed to avoid the monster's attack. As Leon sprinted in his direction, he noticed that he was faster than he thought. 
the main character believed that if he launched a counterattack from here, then he needed to get a little closer. As a result of multiple attempts, Leon managed to gradually get closer to the monster that was beside himself with rage. After parrying the troll's attack again, the protagonist thought that he needed to get a little closer. Enraged, the troll scooped up a handful of rocks again, after which, he blinded Leon with them. Jumping to the side, the main character was confused. In his mind, he assumed that the troll's attack consisted of a club in one hand and a lump of dirt in the other. Wary, Leon was angry that he couldn't get any closer to him. The main character believed that in order to hit him with his sword, he needed two more steps. As Leon concentrated, the monster left him with no other choice. Suddenly, the main character's sword was enveloped in a sacred aura. While continuing to create the technique, Leon thought that since this technique requires improvement, he decided, if possible, not to use it. At that moment, the monster still managed to discover the main character. The grin appeared on his face. After which, the troll charged towards Leon. Perhaps you intended to take the chance while I was focused on my aura to deal me a crushing blow? This is exactly what I was aiming for, the protagonist mused. There were glints of light from the sacred aura on his face. The main character used Eclipse. With a lightning attack, Leon cut off the troll's leg and arm. A part of the monster's body was suspended in the air. After which, his limbs landed on the ground. An image of the sun appeared in the main character's mind. He was thinking that the attribute of his weapon was the aura of the sun. Among the intermediate techniques that represent light and heat, the main character was interested in how the monster tastes the combat power and super high heat from Eclipse. The wounded troll began to cry out in pain. After which, the monster tried to escape. In his anger, Leon thought that he had come all this way to kill the troll. The main character was amazed that the monster thought it could escape. Watching the startled troll, Leon noticed that he was using monsters that were weaker than him as pawns. Fear covered the monster's face. The main character believed that the troll is able to attack only unilaterally, when he is sure that his life is not in danger. Furious, Leon wondered if the monster really thought that someone like him would be able to sneak away. A memory of the night's feast with the mercenaries popped up in his mind. In his mind, the protagonist believed that even though they hadn't known each other for so long, neither of them deserved to die so needlessly. He thought of the mercenary who had died because he was pinned down by a huge rock. Leon's body was filled with a powerful holy aura. The enraged protagonist turned to the monster. Then, with unimaginable speed, he set off in pursuit of the troll. Imagining the constellation in his mind, Leon used the great chariot, and then Merak. Due to the main character's lightning-fast speed, there was a trace of holy aura left in the thick of the forest. A massive rumble could be heard all over the area. After cutting the troll in two, Leon froze in one position. After which, the main character collapsed on the floor. His face was full of joy. He couldn't believe that he was able to do this. In his mind, Leon thought that he might miss it. After calming down, he noticed that he could now breathe out a sigh of relief. The main character had no idea that unlike Eclipse, which focuses power only on the blade of the sword, Merak consumed such a huge amount of aura. Turning his head to the side, Leon believed that even if his body was in perfect condition, with the aura reserve he currently had, he wasn't capable of using this technique twice. Surprised, Karen noticed that Leon was actually able to defeat the monster. As expected, Mr. Hero is great. The adventurer added. Grinning, Karen said that just in case, she had blocked the monster's escape route. After which, a shocked Leon assumed that he had been working for nothing all this time. The adventurer reported that this was not the case. Karen noted that the main character did a great job. While observing the sword, Leon felt that the technique wasn't perfected properly yet, but he had implemented its basic principle correctly. Raising his hand in joy, the protagonist noted that without the help of Karen, using only his own strength, he achieved success. After which, Leon began to slowly fall down. After losing consciousness, he landed on the adventurer's feet. As Karen watched Leon sleep, she guessed that the last technique he'd used had a hard time of it. She asked the main character not to worry, as she would deal with everything else. Placing a hand on his forehead, Karen praised Leon. Lying on his back, Leon floated in the darkness, surrounded by countless glowing particles. With his eyes closed, the hero thought about when he had fallen asleep and enjoyed the calm, noting that he had not felt this way for a long time. He opened his eyes abruptly, not letting himself relax, and his face became very tense at that moment. Leon started to get up, looking furious that someone might have been wronged while he was resting. In addition to the furious look on the boy's face, a grin appeared when he decided that he should become stronger than Leon. He definitely shouldn't lose to this smug blonde guy who always looked down on Leon. Leon rose into the abyss in an aura of radiance, motivated by the image of his arch-rival, an aristocrat. The hero's brown eye opens abruptly. Leon woke up in disbelief on the wooden floor of the wagon, lying on a roll of cloth and covered with a blanket. He hadn't expected to find himself in a wagon on a clear day in the middle of a forest, but as he tried to get up from his makeshift sleeping place, he remembered yesterday. Leon raised his hand slightly, 
but suddenly a lot of electric shocks seemed to penetrate the body, causing the guy to scream heart-rendingly. He collapsed back on the bundle of cloth, realizing that it was almost impossible to recover from such a fight in one day. Suddenly Leon remembered that he had a special remedy for such cases, trying to reach his chest with a shaking hand. The boy had managed to get hold of the sacred pendant that the bishop had given him, and now he held it with a hand that was shaking with weakness. He clenched the item in his fist and brought it to his chest, activating recovery magic. Having achieved the desired effect, the boy stood in absolute surprise, realizing the power of the glittering locket around his neck. Leon remembered the bishop smiling and assuring the boy that there was nothing unusual about this thing. Karin leaned over the hero to make sure he was awake, watching him with her green eyes as her large breasts, white strands of hair, and dark blue cloak slid down without resisting the force of gravity. Surprised by the way the girl is holding onto the cart, Leon said that he was able to recover thanks to the bishop's relic. As the heroes walked past the white tents, Karin told the guy that after he passed out, the others continued to hunt trolls, catching three out of four. Even the one who managed to escape was badly hurt, and a ferocious green monster with fangs and glowing red eyes would not dare to appear in the forest a second time. Hearing the story, Leon clenched his jaw so hard with anger that a vein popped out of his neck, while Karin, with a slight smile, began to reassure the hero, assuring that in the near future monsters would not come into this forest. Leon's eyes were drawn to the green mountain. Right in front of the heroes lay three corpses of captured trolls, each of which was missing a part of a limb. When Karin noticed the green bodies, she enthusiastically thought that the hunters would get as much as 90 gold coins for this case, explaining to Leon the high cost of monsters by saying that their blood is a component for advanced level potions, and their corpses are happily bought by mages. The huge figure of the girl, surrounded by green stripes, towered over the guy, judging him for cutting the troll in half, leaving almost no blood in it, which means that for his body you can only get half of 30 gold. Leon looked scared, sweating profusely, and said he was sorry. Karin turned and ran away, waving her arms and jokingly calling Leon a fool, while the boy turned away and stared at the troll bodies. It seems that the first of them was killed by at least four weapons, the second was killed by the guy himself, and the last one stopped thinking. Looking at the bulky yellowish body with the damaged head, Leon realized who had dealt with this troll. It was Chief Gustav, who was savagely stabbing with a cleaver. Leon and Karin were hailed by the master and mistress, both of them looking sharply at the source of the sound. They were addressed by a merchant in a turban, accompanied by a servant. On this clear day, clouds drifted across the azure sky. The merchant and Karin were talking animatedly about the job they had done in capturing the trolls, while Leon stood silently to the side. At one point, he broke the silence, asking with a serious face how many people were injured. The merchant and Karin looked at him sideways. After a short pause, the man said that eight people had died and another twenty-one were injured. Leon's entire body trembled with tension, and a vein appeared in his clenched fist as the merchant talked about the wounded and promised that the guild would help with the funeral of the dead. Leon's face slumped, which made Karin nervous. To break the silence, the girl decided to find out about paying for trolls. Throwing his hand behind his head, the merchant good-naturedly explained how much he was willing to pay for the trolls, adding that despite the fact that one of the corpses was cut in half, he was willing to pay all 30 coins for it. Karin started haggling, saying that 15 coins would be enough, which unsettled the merchant. Fluffy clouds continued to float across the clear sky as the merchant and the girl finished their argument. As he walked away with Karin, Leon asked curiously why the older girl had refused the money. The blonde, looking at the guy with her big blue eyes, explained that if someone is good-natured to you, then one day you will have to pay them back in kind. Leon looked at Karin in surprise when she said that there was no need to depend on anyone else because the main character was next to her. A dark, beefy hand appeared in the air. Brutal Gust have put his arm around Leon, glad that the guy didn't get hurt too much. The head added that the main character on the task can simply call him Gustav or even Hyam. Gustav looked suspiciously at Leon and started talking about the troll that the guy had taken down. The man decided to clarify what technique the younger one used, because it didn't look like the monster was hit with a sword. Leon replied with a slight pathos that it was his secret swordsmanship technique, which made the head apologize guiltily. Leon asked seriously how the boys were feeling. Gustav's stony face took on an expression of dismay for a moment. He said that they had no problems, Hansen and Hamel escaped with only minor scratches, and Leonik was just the same as always. Gustav patted the main character's hair, asking the surprised guy not to fill his head with bad thoughts. The head explained to Leon that they were engaged in dangerous work, and everyone in the team was ready to die, many of them even carrying a wool on their chest. Gustav slammed a dark fist into Leon's chest and said that the young man would always regret the deaths of his comrades, the main thing was not to let this feeling destroy him. After finishing his speech, the head turned towards the camp, waving goodbye to the guy. Leon stared at the man in awe as the wind whipped the leaves past. 
Karin, who was standing on the sidelines, added that it is natural to regret and grieve because of death, it is these feelings that make the heart beat. Looking at Leon gently, Karin said that even if he becomes a hero for the people, these feelings in himself will not change in any way. Karin patted the boy's head, making sure she was able to give him some comfort. Elsid had once said something similar, remarking that a man driven only by a sense of duty would not last long. Beliefs are personal values that go with us through life, but they are not a source of endless fuel. Karin interrupted Leon's thoughts and held up a finger to see if he knew the desert area. Hearing this question, the guy was taken aback. The desert area. The surface there is covered with sand, not earth. There is almost no rain, and the temperature at night is very different from what it was during the day. Under the white, bright sun, the dunes stretch in an endless ridge. This is an unbearable environment, especially for living things. Among the sands, you can find the bones of a dead animal. The nomads who roam the vast sand plains had to fight countless monsters every day, such as the bloodthirsty sandworms that were as tall as a person. After describing this creepy place, Karin said with a serious face that she understood everything. Winking at Leon, she added with a smile on her face that the desert wasn't that big near the border and you could cross it in a cart in just a week. The wary hero reflected that according to Karin, they were not going to the desert at all. Horse-drawn carts trailed across the sand, while one of them was engaged in a heated discussion about how long it would take to reach the desert. Looking down at his sword with warmth, Leon hoped that perhaps his mentor Elsid would wake up by the time he crossed the desert. The one-eyed spirit hadn't been heard from in about a month, and he even missed it. Karin stared in fascination at the changing scenery outside the carriage, while Leon looked back at her in bewilderment, not understanding the reason for her joy. Looking around, she guessed that they were finally out of the woods, and that the wagon was now covered in sand with the tracks of horses and wheels. Under the hot sun closer to sunset, a camp is already located among the sand dunes with white tents, benches and bonfires throughout the territory. Leon was squatting in the wagon, wailing, trying to find a map in his backpack. Suddenly, the main character's sword began to sparkle, releasing rare blue bolts of current. More and more bright lightning bolts began to come out from the stone on the hilt of the blade, causing the weapon to shake. Elsid burst out with a shout of triumph, fists outstretched, screaming with joy. Surrounded by the light of lightning, Leon screamed in surprise. Sitting on the floor of the carriage, the terrified boy saw a glowing sword and a familiar spirit come out of it. Noticing Elsid, the guy smiled softly, delighted to meet her. The one-eyed spirit stared at the guy sitting on the floor in surprise, trying to figure out why he had fallen, to which Leon, pointing at Elsid, explained that he had appeared with such a scream that he had startled the guy. The spirit, surrounded by lightning bolts, twisted its mouth in a snarl. As Leon cleared his ear of the loud sound, he realized that Elsid was screaming now, because he had finally been able to wake up after a month of sleep, and now the spirit wanted to wake up with all its might. Averting his eyes from Elsid's flushed freedom, Leon quipped that he already wished he could go back a month, which caused his mentor to get upset and start wailing. The enraged spirit began to explain to the guy that he should not behave like this, then the main character clarifies whether Elsid was the same. The bewildered spirit replied that he was self-taught, which meant that he could not have had a teacher. Afterward, Elsid glanced at Leon and smiled maliciously, asking her to tell him what had happened in the past month. Leon looked confident, agreeing to spill the beans. The sunset sky was turning peaky pink. After the full story, Elsid was simply shocked, his mouth wide open and his single eye bulging. He asked for more information about Karin, who at first disguised herself as an adventurer, and Leon replied that despite the past of an assassin, the girl can be trusted. Elsid assumed a philosopher's pose and gave out that Leon didn't need to give the girl any weight, since she could teach him important skills. After mentioning the skills, the spirit asked with sarcastic curiosity if the boy's skills had improved at all. Leon looked at Elsid with a smirk, certain that the spirit had no place to get this information. The guy was wrong, because as soon as Elsid snapped his fingers, a table with a description of the main character immediately appeared in front of him and Leon, where all his skills were indicated. The spirit and the young man stared at the scoreboard in a daze, not taking their eyes off it. Leon noticed with pleasant surprise that he had surpassed the abilities of his main rival Leon. The guy remembered that he was able to see the real strength of the blonde only at the moment when he himself clashed with him with swords. Of course, these few months Lion was not idle. Leon concluded that when studying at the academy, there is a limit to the ability to gain various experiences, which means that his opponent does not train harder than he does. Elsid began to be sarcastic, saying that the guy's data probably had a system error or he had slept for two or three months because such a person. As Leon is not capable of something like this, and even in a short time, which began to irritate the young man very much. The spirit also noticed that the guy had been working hard in his absence and had even acquired the level 1-7 star sword skill. 
Leon told Elsid that although Elsid had shown him various techniques, so far, apart from Merak, who could cut everything in his path, which the hero used in the battle with the troll, the young man had not learned anything else. Closing his eye, a satisfied Elsid praised the disciple, saying that he might have an innate talent for learning. Sniffling, Happy Spirit thought that all the guy's success was due to his mentor, noticing that he was just trying to save a mediocre student, and in the end helped his development. Leon listened to the spirit's speech with absolute indifference on his face, trying not to pay attention. Elsid, pleased with himself, called himself a natural mentor, while the main character sarcastically thanked him. Smelling the sand, the spirit hurried to find out where they were now. From the movement of the carriage, it was clear that they had gone somewhere quite far away. Holding up his index finger, Leon informed them that they were heading to the Titan Mountain Range, where they had also received an accompanying mission. Elsid liked the idea, but wondered why he would have made such a big circle through the desert. Leon, not understanding what he was talking about, said that this path, although quite expensive, seems to be considered the shortest. Looking at the map with the spirit, Leon said that he didn't even know if there was any road that went through the mountain range or canyon. Elsid looked shocked. Taken aback, he began to yell, asking why there was a desert in the area they were traveling through, to which Leon, surprised, replied that the same desert was here 100 years ago. Pointing to the sand around him, Elsid said that 300 years ago there was a wide field on the place of dunes, and since there is no sharp temperature drop in the area, no desert could have appeared during this time. This couldn't happen for natural reasons, unless someone deliberately turned this place into a desert. Elsid gravely began to argue that it was definitely impossible to create such a thing in a short time, because people could not have failed to notice the changes, which means they did it for a very long time, disguising everything as natural changes. If magic poured down on the city in a large stream, it would incinerate it. But then it was unclear how such a huge piece of land could have been turned into a desert without its help. Elsid replied that it is possible to do this, but it seems somewhat doubtful. Leon looked anxiously at the ghost, wondering if it really thought it was someone else's plot. Elsid, looking up from his thoughts, looked at the guy in bewilderment and replied that he did not know, and also remarked that there was no point in investigating and it was better to do something useful. Leon shouted to Elsid if she could teach him something new. He thought warmly that they had been linked to the spirit for less than half a year, but it had already taken up so much empty space for the main character. While spending time with Elsid, Leon was very happy that the spirit appeared in his life. Karin stood off to the side and stared in disbelief at the cart where Junior was chatting enthusiastically with someone. A procession of several horse-drawn carts crossed the desert in a blazing sun. Karen, sweating profusely, complained of the heat, pulling at the fabric of her clothes in an attempt to cool off. A sound behind her distracted her, and she turned to look at him with a look of annoyance on her face. Leon, despite also being covered in sweat, was smiling happily and polishing his sword with a white handkerchief. Karen, using her palm as a fan, pretended to ask Leon what was the reason for such a good mood. As she waited for Leon to respond, she closed her eyes and put a hand to her forehead. Leon turned away from her, explaining that the reason for his joy was that Elsid was back. Elsid hovered high in the air while his steady gaze was fixed on the desert horizon. Leon noted that he was very aware of Elsid's absence, even though it hadn't been more than six months since they'd met. A dark-skinned man in light-colored clothes and with a long scar on his eye was sitting on a horse, ordering everyone to stop to set up camp, build a fire, and prepare dinner. Leon, looking out of the wagon toward the desert, was surprised at the early halt. Karen, holding her hood between her fingers, rested her hand on Leon's head and explained to him that the desert nights were much darker and colder than he could possibly imagine. Leon said nothing, and Karen added that taking such temperature changes lightly could lead to big problems. Then Karen ran forward, calling Leon to follow. Leon turned around with a big smile, turning his gaze to Elsid and reminding him that they should go too. Elsid, as before, remained motionless in the air, looking straight ahead. Leon, getting no response from Elsid, called out the spirit's name. Elsid shared that there was not a single small clearing left from his memories. He thought of the dense green forests and the land covered with fresh grass where Rodrigo had walked. Elsid said that he never thought that after 300 years everything would turn out this way. Leon was standing behind Elsid. The radiant smile that had once been on his face was gone, and now only a slight surprise could be seen on Leon's face. Elsid turned to Leon and apologized. In the distance, Karen stood with her hand held high, her mouth open in a scream directed at Leon. Elsid informed Leon that his name was, I think. Neat stew was being cooked in a black pot over a fire of stones and wood. A man with long pale red hair and brown hued clothes was sitting on a log in front of the fire, holding a plate. Raising one hand up, the man praised the dish. The man sitting next to him, dressed in the same outfit but with short hair, was calling for his older sister and Leon to taste the food. Elsid opened his eye wide, as if startled by something. Leon and Karen were talking and laughing. The man with the longitudinal scar on his eye had one arm around Leon's neck. 
Leon's face was slightly uncomfortable, and he was holding the man's hand on his neck with both of his hands. A man with long light red hair and a man with short hair sat side by side, chatting amiably. A smile curved the corner of Elsid's mouth, revealing a small fang. Elsid reflected that he had given himself up to idle thoughts. His gaze became soft and relaxed. Elsid realized that there was no difference between a desert and a meadow. The blue-violet night sky spread out in front of Elsid, studded with hundreds of stars. He continued his thought, it flashed through his mind that the person living in this era was Leon, not Elsid. Leon sat with his eyelids closed and a gentle smile on his face as he faced the fire. Night fell, turning the sky black. The fire had been extinguished, and only the red hot ends of the wood smoldered scarlet. In the darkness of the night, a dark blue-colored carriage was parked in the middle of the desert. In it, Leon was sleeping peacefully on the floor, using a rolled-up cloth as a pillow and covering himself with a gray blanket. He suddenly opened one eye, startled by something. Then he immediately abruptly got up from the floor, resenting the unpleasant feeling of discomfort. Karen raised her index finger to her lips, silently asking Leon to be quiet. Karen's face was incredibly tense. Behind her, Leon was looking in the same direction as her. He called out to her uncertainly. There were a dozen blue carts on the flat, deserted ground, with a red and white tent in the middle. Unknown creatures were rapidly approaching the campsite, crawling under a layer of sand. Karen asked Leon what they should do, mentioning that there were quite a lot of heads. When Leon asked if there was an enemy outside, Karen said yes. Karen said she didn't notice the creatures until they got close, because they don't emit any killer energy. Leon then asked about the sentries who were standing outside, chatting casually among themselves and not noticing the approaching enemy creatures. Karen replied that if we are not talking about an experienced person who can feel vibrations, then no one will notice the movement of an enemy who is buried in the sand. Suddenly, Karen exclaimed that the attackers were approaching the cargo. The three enemies were indeed heading for the cargo wagons. Karen concluded that it looked like they were going to steal and run away. Then Karen turned to Leon, asking him how to proceed. Leon considered raising the alarm and informing the others about the intruders, but dismissed the thought immediately, because sleeping unarmed people wouldn't be able to immediately restore themselves to proper combat readiness. Two men were lying on the floor, fast asleep under brown blankets. Helsid stated that those enemies also knew that they couldn't win against the guild guards if they tried to move against them. He then added that this is why these creatures came here with the intention of stealing things, not expressing the intention of killing anyone. Elsid's lips curled into a smug grin as he announced that Leon and Karen could win if they were woken up and fought back, but that they would not be able to avoid casualties on their part. Leon pointed out that Elsid seemed to be having fun. Elsid explained that he would finally be able to see his apprentice's skills in battle for the first time in so long. Leon frowned and asked his older companion about the exact number of enemy creatures. Karen replied that there were 14 opponents moving towards the cargo, and 22 more were on patrol. Leon's eyes went blank, and he pressed a hand to the lower half of his face. He thought about how he was intimidated by the number of enemies, and that the first clumsy move might play against Leon's side. Suddenly, as if struck by a decision, Leon turned to Karen, and she responded with an unwavering expression of readiness. The enemies under the layer of sand were inexorably approaching. Karen sat on the roof of the wagon as her cloak fluttered in the wind. Her black brows were drawn together over her emerald eyes. Then Karen abruptly soared up. It hovered in the air above the carriage, emitting a bright green glow. After touching the earring in her ear, Karen used space charms and aura weapons. Numerous daggers with the same glow appeared around her, shooting out electric bolts. Karen used a charm to throw the daggers down, and the weapons fell to the ground with numerous explosions. Men in black clothing and gas masks emerged from the sand, wounded and bleeding scarlet. On one of the carts, there was a silhouette of a man with a sword held high in the air. The sword lit up in a blinding flash. It was Leon, who roared deafeningly about enemies, warning the people in the carts. The sleeping people were awakened by a loud shout about the enemy's attack. The enemies in gas masks, standing motionless, were covered with beads of sweat from excitement. The man with the scarred eye was in the lead, holding a sword in his hand, and motivated the people behind him to protect the cargo and the guild leader. There were screams, clouds and explosions of sand. The two thieves were standing behind the cart, away from the fight. One of the thieves had red gas mask lenses and carried a large bag on his back. This intruder he resented Karen's daggers. Raising his fist in the air, he informed his allies to retreat. A man with a scar on his forehead, looking at the departing enemies, ordered not to let them leave. Karen, addressing the enemy with a load, threw a dagger at him, telling him to leave someone else's and get lost. The enemy kept running while the thrown weapons were flying at them. He caught the dagger by the blade with one palm. Behind the eyepieces of his gas mask, his face was covered with swollen veins, and his eyes were fixed on Karen with a sharp and hateful gaze. Stunned, Leon wondered how this enemy had managed to stop Karen's attack with just one hand. Dropping the dagger and leaving it lying on the ground, 
The enemies sank back into the sand and retreated. Karen looked devastated and disappointed as she stared after the thieves in silence. The man with the scarred eye was angry at the fleeing enemies, informing Leon that they were approaching his side. Behind Leon, who was looking at the man, flew a grinning Elsid. The two under the sand were quickly being approached by their opponents. Elsid declared that it was time for him to take a look at the skills of his unlucky student. Then Elsid, the grin fading from his lips, turned to Leon, who had lowered his head. He was clutching the hilt of his sword. Then, frowning, Leon raised the weapon. Raising the sword above his head, Leon thought that the Big Dipper's secret technique would help him finish off a dozen more enemies. In Leon's mind, half of his face was covered in blood. He was dumbfounded that they were facing ordinary thieves. Standing in his thoughts with a dirty sword in the middle of a sea of blood, Leon decided that he didn't see the point in starting a one-sided massacre. Elsid watched Leon closely. Elsid said there was nothing wrong with having doubts. He stated that there is no solution to this problem, and Leon is a hero, not a bandit. The spirit explained that Leon had to find his own answer, burn out everything in your path or punish evil in the name of justice. Almost all of Leon's face was hidden by dark hair, and only the corners of his mouth were visible. Leon fell into deep thoughts about the standards of good and evil, realizing that he could not set his own. Leon placed an open hand on his chest, trying to think of solutions to the problem, stab the thief to death, suppress his powers without taking his life, or try to reform the enemy. He came to the conclusion that although every decision comes from a righteous heart, each person has his own opinion about the righteous path. As Leon sheathed his sword, he suddenly realized that his own values had not yet been formed. With a confident look, Leon raised his head and announced that one day he would find his own answer. The man with his bound hands fell hard to his knees. Three men sat on the ground with their hands bound and wearing gas masks, looking at the man in the orange vest standing in front of them. A red and white handkerchief held a light. A man in a green outfit with gold patterns and an angry expression was talking about the stolen cargo earlier. There was a crowd of people in the tent, including Leon and Karen, as well as a man with a scar on his eye, shouting in displeasure. The man in green didn't understand how thieves caught off guard were able to steal something. Karen, twirling the dagger on her finger, startling the scarred man, assumed that the enemy who was carrying the pack was their boss. Karen noticed that he was relaxed and secretive, not giving away his presence. Thinking about the intruder's skills, Karen asked if there was an artifact or some other kind of power involved. Looking to the side and still twirling the dagger on her finger, Karen summed up that the fact that the enemies had descended in droves was a great stroke of luck. The people in the crowd thought the same thing. Leon thought that even if the thieves were using artifacts, they shouldn't forget how the enemy boss managed to catch Karen's dagger with one hand and how sharp his eyes were. The man in green, looking completely confused, asked people to track the stolen cargo, as it has a very high value. The man with the scarred eye turned around and asked Hamel what he thought about it. The man with the light red hair said that if there was going to be a chase, we should move out right now. He added that even for him, a former mountain ranger, the desert is an uncharted place where footprints are quickly erased. Hamel also stated that even if they gave chase immediately, their chances of catching up with the thieves were still only 50%. Karen, dagger in hand, said with a sly smile that she could catch the thieves. She explained that the hand of the boss who had caught her dagger earlier had the mark of her weapon left on it. The green-robed man blushed and bared his snow-white teeth in a wide grin, clearly enjoying the news. He promised Karen a reward, to which she agreed. Karen said that Leon would go with her, and he nodded happily in response. Turning around, Karen added that she would need Hamel's help. Hamel's cheeks immediately turned pink, and he declared that he was ready to give up his life. The man in green handed Karen the compass, saying that she would definitely need it. Karen picked it up and questioned its working order, but the man in green replied that the compass was enchanted and would look for the specific cargo that the three of them needed. The man added that within a radius of 10 meters from the cargo, the compass needle will accurately point to it. Hamel, bow slung over his shoulder, called out to Leon and Karen as they left the tent. The three of them moved like lightning across the desert with Karen at their head. The man with the scarred eye watched them go and reasoned that the pursuit squad would win since there was an rank adventurer among them. The man furrowed his brows and curled the corners of his lips downwards, wondering if they would catch or miss the enemy. The man then gave a loud order for everyone to be on their guard until sunrise to avoid making such a mistake again. Karen's eyes looked confident and determined under her furrowed brows. She could see the trail of her dagger growing brighter and brighter. Karen suggested that they speed up. Leon was sweating from running when Elsid, flying beside him, noticed that his apprentice's stamina had increased. Leon panted and asked Elsid to be quiet. Karen suddenly raised her fist in the air, signaling the traveler's arrival and suspending them. A bright blue trail ran deep into the desert, down to where a split in the rocks had been. Hamel said he couldn't believe there was such a valley in the middle of the desert. Karen said nothing, and Leon called out to her. 
placing her hand on the desert rock, she deduced that this place was the work of human hands, that is, it was created artificially. Leon was surprised that this place was created by hand, and Karen confirmed that it was created about 100 years ago. Karen found an inscription on the stone, but it was unreadable because it was old. Leon froze as if startled, thinking back to 100 years ago. Elsid read Leon's mind and told him that he was thinking correctly. Elsid shared his hunch that it was this place that caused the area to turn into a desert. Leon asked in a whisper if the depressions in the ground turned the area into a desert. Elsid replied that this was absolutely not the case, because not all the mines available in this world are located in the desert. Elsid explained that they were dealing with an unusual place, where there was the center of a spiritual vein that once flowed through clearings and meadows. But now Elsid can't find anything of this energy, no matter how much he searches, because the soil has turned into dead land, on which nothing else can grow. Leon frowned as he asked who had excavated the spirit vein and why. Elsid told Leon to try to find out now. The three pursuers moved through the night on a trail of alien footprints. When Karen asked Leon if he felt anything, he said yes. Looking at the sullen Leon from under half-closed lids, Karen informed him of the three guards ahead, and also that there are more than a hundred more enemies behind them. Leon's eyes widened and he froze in shock, and then he heard a question about what they should do. Apparently, the thieves found this abandoned structure and started using it as a base. There were three guards standing in front of the gate, and Karen reminded herself that she could sense the presence of more than a hundred people behind them. With a playful grin, she asked if she should kill them all. Leon snatched up his sword. He once again imagined himself in the middle of a sea of blood. Leon didn't know if he should complete the mission by killing every single one of them, but he thought that in that case, his actions would be no different from a brutal massacre. Suddenly a voice jerked him out of his reverie. They were gas-masked guards discussing today's cargo-stealing raid. One of the guards felt that they should not have touched the guild caravan, because it was better to attack travelers in small groups as they had already done a couple of days ago. The father of the family, with folded hands in a prayer gesture, asked the robber to spare at least the child. And the robber did as he was told, there were two bloody corpses of a man and a woman lying on the sand, with their living son standing beside them. Another guardian, however, found the story boring. The attacker of the family did not agree with him and said that the child abandoned in the desert will slowly wither under the scorching sun, and this is quite a funny sight. The other guard heard this and laughed out loud. Leon, who had overheard the conversation between the two brutal guards, realized that there was no need for him to try to find a reason not to kill the two. The sword in Leon's palm shone with a golden light. Leon remembered what Elsid had said about hesitating being okay. He remembered how Elsid had told Leon to find her own answer. The two guards, seeing the golden flash between them, started up. Leon used Eclipse and attacked people wearing gas masks, causing them to fly into the air. Leon raised the sword with both hands closer to him. He told himself that was his answer. Elsid looked at his apprentice with pride. The trio, having dealt with the guards, rushed on. Karen noticed that although the enemies were weak, they had a numerical advantage, so it was better to attack small groups first. Smiling softly, Karen told the boys to just follow her while she took the initiative. Moving forward with extraordinary speed, Karen left Leon and Hamel standing behind in speechless amazement. Hamel, who looked completely dumbfounded, noticed that his sister was really upset and Leon couldn't help but agree with him. Karen attacked the enemies from above, attacking them with daggers. When she landed on the ground, she raised a large pillar of sand. The opponents in gas masks lying on the ground were bleeding profusely. One of the enemies who had managed to hide was watching Karen from afar. He was about to inform the chief about the situation when a creature wearing a black robe with long claws and a bird's beak mask appeared next to him. There was a scream and a burst of sand. Karen waved a lock of her long blonde hair, pleased with herself after taking down an entire gang. Putting on a proud pose, the girl with drops of blood on her face and clothes broke into a happy smile, saying that the battle had refreshed her. After all, until now, she had only been sitting in the carriage, so her whole body seemed to be petrified. Drawing the surprised looks of Leon and Hamel, Karen, holding a kunai in her hands and breaking into a smile, said that you need to constantly do such a warm-up so that life is full of life. The man asked the young man if the mercenary was always like this, to which he received an awkward affirmative answer and suggested that the young master must be having a hard time. While calling Karen Sr., Leon noticed that there was blood on her face as he wiped it off the girl's cheek with his finger. When Leon touched Karen's face, the girl blushed with embarrassment, afraid to move. As soon as the guy finished, she immediately turned around, walking away from the main character while he continued to stand motionless with his thumb outstretched. Moving further away, Karen suggested that the heroes speed up their pace. Hamel came up to the guy and hugged him, praising him as a professional, smiling Leon asked what the man was talking about. The man with the face of a maniac leaned over the guy and said that he would understand everything later and let out a light laugh, which made the guy even more perplexed. 
Doors appeared in the stone corridor, lit only by a torch, and two guards in long bladed gas masks blocked the way. Peeking around the corner of the stone wall, Karen concluded that the heroes needed to go there, because the compass points to the door, which means that the stolen cargo should be right behind it. The girl said that she would enter there in the form of a shadow and check her guest, giving the guys the order to deal with the guards at this time and start the invasion. Standing in front of the heroes, Karen said to start, and at that moment, dark matter appeared around her, raising sand. As she disappeared into the swirl, Hamel stared at the black smudge in the sand, noting that even though he had heard about Arank's amazing abilities, his sister was beyond praise. As he drew his bowstring, the man said that they should start. At the very end of the arrow was a cloth bomb with a lit fuse. With a precise shot, the arrow hit the door directly, shocking the guards. Several robbers tried to open the box with daggers, but nothing came of it. Their enraged masked leader with red eyes, who was looking down on them, was already running out of patience and was rushing his subordinates. Tony the robbers finally managed to open the crates. At that moment, the shelter's doors were blown out by a strong blast wave. The stunned leader hadn't expected a surprise attack at all. He peered carefully at the passageway, which was filled with smoke from the explosion. Leon appeared in the doorway, sword in hand, and Hamel holding one of the guards by the scruff of the neck. The enraged leader immediately identified them as guild members. The boys continued to stare menacingly when Hamel said they were here to get their stuff back. Thinking about how the swordsman and archer had managed to reach the shelter without a scratch, the rogue concluded that some of them were clearly higher than B rank, which meant that it wasn't worth facing them head on. Just as the leader decided to run, a figure wearing a plague doctor mask with glowing purple eyes and a blade raised to strike appeared behind him. The man behind him swung sharply, striking the blade straight at the other's ankle. The leader flew away, trying to dodge. The man in the plague doctor mask appreciated this attempt, because according to the plan, the robber's body should have already cooled down. The warrior with the beak noted that his opponent was now a thief, and even four years ago he would not have given a chance to touch even the ankle. Glaring at his assailant, the robber tried to figure out how he knew about him. As the plague doctor's figure approached, kicking up sand all around, the rogue finally realized who was standing in front of him. Under the plague doctor's mask, Karen's furious face appeared. Looking at the robber, she called him a mole. The latter, overwhelmed by the encounter with an old acquaintance, could not believe that he was looking at an undertaker. Leon stood there with a stony expression on his face as the two gas-masked enemies behind him prepared to attack with their swords in their hands. Leon and Hamel successfully repelled their attacks, and the blood of the men in gas masks splattered in the air. Looking around at the bodies of his opponents on the floor, Hamel concluded that they seemed to have taken out all of them. Leon, however, turned away from the enraged Hamel and asked him about the leader. Leon watched as Karen stood in the distance, her plague doctor mask hovering over her shoulders, looking at the mole sitting on the ground in front of her. The thief leader's ankle was cut open and bleeding profusely. Karen twirled the kaunai around her finger and sauntered over to her opponent, reminding him how she had once asked him to leave this realm forever, otherwise she would have ended up killing by him with her own hands. Maska Karen's plague doctor mask behind Hera and Pina began to shimmer with black and purple hues. A circle of daggers appeared from the shadowy aura in the air as the girl, full of determination, stretched out her kunai forward, flashing a green eye in the darkness. In her utter madness, Karen wished the mole would do how Glazek the green flames continued to burn in her eyes. The ringleader's red-lensed eye was covered with capillaries that had burst with anger, and his skin was covered with throbbing veins everywhere, he clarified how serious the girl was. Leaning his palm on the sand, the mole became much more aggressive and determined, asking Karen not to make him laugh. As the leader of the thieves approached her with lightning speed, he declared that he was no longer the same as she knew him, and the cloth blades pointed their ends at the approaching enemy. The mole remembered the old image of the Undertaker, a formidable warrior towering in the green light Vigodi as Fithat had been known as the terror of the Dark World during his reign. As Thimol picked up speed and picked up the sand, he knew that the odds were not equal in battle, and the winner was known from the very beginning. Karen was surrounded by long tracks from the mole's movements under the layers of sand, dark blades and a purple glow hovering in the air, ready to attack. She reminded the mole Thatch had given him an order. After clarifying that the order meant death, the girl attacked the mole with many black swords. One of them slammed into the leader's shoulder, knocking out a desperate moan of pain, and blood spurted from the wound. Karen looked down at her opponent and asked him how many times he could withstand her attacks. The mole and the blood-stained mask and clothing raised its hands, the terminal phalanges of its fingers shining in the shape of sharp claws. Karen used her own weapon to fight the mole in Sea Orogy, while the mole fought him off with deft hand movements. Some of the swords still grazed Yiguo, leaving deep cuts on his body, gushing blood. Suddenly, a deafening explosion was heard, blowing the robber off his feet in a shockwave. 
Dust and sand particles flew in the air. The mole was on its knees, its mask pulled off to reveal an open mouth missing several teeth, and its entire body was covered in dark patches of fresh blood from head to toe, its clothes torn in places. Hamel and Leon watched the situation intently from the side, putting on a stern look. The mole fell to its elbows, spattering blood on the sand as the girl stood in the distance, surrounded by dark swords pointed at the man. Karen scornfully I stared at him while he grunted. However, the corpse pale mole's grunts turned into hysterical laughter, accompanied by drops of blood from its throat as it praised Karen's fighting skills, comparing her to a monster. When the mole asked why Karen was being so cruel to him, she looked worried. Choking on his own blood, the mole screamed to the girl that she was living well, because no one had killed her parents or stolen from the family. The mole recalled how an orphan was simply picked up on the street and made stronger. The startled opponent didn't understand why so much resentment had accumulated in Karen's heart. The mole was barely able to stay on one elbow, yelling about how there was no need for Karen to destroy the entire organization, even if she had killed the boss. The adventurer frowned, rhetorically wondering if she had ever asked to be made stronger. With a chuckle, the mole replied with a smile that was missing a couple of teeth, that without the organization that had sheltered Karen during this time, the girl would have died long ago in some gutter. With a calm look in her eyes, Karen said that it might be possible, but avoiding the worst-case scenario doesn't mean that all other options are better. The mole snidely asked at her what she meant. Karen explained that her life consists only of what she never wanted, from becoming a killer to getting magic. That's why Karen decided to get her hands on what her heart craves. The mole, its mouth covered in blood, broke into a frenzied scream, asking Karen what she had wanted then. Clenching her fist, the adventurer spoke of freedom. The mole's eyes and mouth opened in utter bewilderment and incomprehension. But a moment later, he burst into a bloodthirsty and evil laugh. He yelled that if he did, Karen could just walk away and not share that freedom with everyone. The mole added that none of his people wanted this freedom, the Emayat wanted each other. He reminded Karen of how she had thrown only one dagger at the children's feet, and they had no other way or hope of survival. Karen's gazed him noticeably and froze. The mole pressed his hand to half of his face, concluding that he was, after all, only a ghostly darkness. Karen held out her hand to the defeated enemy. Sitting down next to him, she put her arm gently around his shoulders. The adventurer asked for forgiveness. K-R-O-T looked startled, and Karen added that maybe it was the result of her turning her back on them. Karen glanced at Leon. He was standing at a distance, his eyes wide. Karen thought back to their first meeting. She released herself from the mole's embrace, giving him a new order to live. Karen added that he should survive and find her, and the mole stared at the ground, discouraged by what he had heard. Karen darted to Leon. He greeted her, and she apologized for the delay, asking how the box was going. The travelers gathered up their belongings. With a gentle smile, Karen invited them to leave. Suddenly, an explosion was heard, reverberating through the stone walls. Karen and Leon turned around in confusion. A gloved hand was pressing a large red button. It was the mole, who, although dripping with stream-soft scarlet blood, was looking at the trio with a smug smile. Leon informed Karen that this was a self-destruct button, so they had to leave immediately. Explosions boomed from every crevice in the canyon. In the middle of them, a mole was sitting on the ground with its head down down. The explosions increased in frequency, turning into a consistent chain. One of the guild members spoke to the commander with the scarred eye, who had already turned in the direction of the loud sounds. The commander just grinned, closing his eyes. In the middle of a desolate landscape with a scorching sun, three black silhouettes could be seen. It was Karen, Leon, and Hamlu returned safely. As the caravan marched through the desert under the scorching white sun, Leon talked about how it was possible to forget about exploring that canyon because it was destroyed by a mole. However, Leon admitted that getting out of there alive was already a great success. Elsid, who was frowning, replied that whoever had made the place more than a hundred years ago, it was unlikely that the creator had left a single clue. Leon reacted with interest, and the spirit closed its eye in exhaustion, inviting the disciple to discuss the matter later. Leon was called out by Karen, who was sitting in a lotus position on the roof of one of the carts. Her emerald eyes glittered with joy as she looked ahead and urged Leon to do the same, because they had made it. Car Avon stopped in front of a deserted fortress city of impressive size, M called the longboat. Leon opened his mouth slightly, admiring Akrav Shimsia the view. A procession of carts was approaching the city's sky-high main gate. Leon was surprised by the height of the fortress wall, but Karen explained to him that this was due to the fact that this city is a border town and it is ruled by a marquee. Karen added that this is why it is a city where the king gave the right to have independent troops. The caravan drove into the city, stopping at a small market directly opposite the well. A man in green with gold patterns was telling someone that the procession planned to stay in the city for three days to clean up the caravan and restock its supplies. 
Glancing back at Leon and Karen, Guildmaster Arnold asked, with his brows drawn together, what the two of them were going to do with me. Karen and Leon looked confused and uncomprehending, and a light sweat broke out on their faces. The man explained that the two men could either stay where the caravan had temporarily stopped or do something else, but return before they set out. Karen announced that there was one more thing she wanted to find, and that she would occasionally show up at the place where the guild was staying if given an address. The green-clad man gave her the address of a three-night stay where senior management rooms were rented, pointing out a local tavern called the Song of the Goat as a landmark. He added that Leon and Karen can use a large room on the top floor with a huge double bed. The last two words sent an electric shock through both Leon and Karen. Leon haltingly asked the man if he and Karen would share the same bed, to which the guild leader gave an affirmative answer asking if it would be more convenient for the couple. Imagining herself in the same room with Karen, Leon's cheeks turned red in an instant, and her eyes widened. The adventurer noticed this and threw her arm over Leon's shoulder and, giving the guy a sly squint, she asked him why he was embarrassed. Looking at Leon playfully, Karen asked if he had any expectations. In response, the guy only began to deny it through stuttering, and then completely ran away. Karen giggled and suggested that she had done something wrong again, giving the man in green a genuine shock. With a wink, Karen shared that she wouldn't be able to sleep at night anyway. Turning around, she left her companion, but he turned to her, asking her if he could get another room ready. Karen said nothing. Pausing, the girl tried to force out only one short word. The second time, she managed to say no. Even though her back was turned, her neck and cheeks could be seen blushing. After saying a quick goodbye to the chief, Karen disappeared, and the man felt awkward as he watched her go. Karen was catching her breath. She was sitting on the roof of one of the longboat buildings, her hand on her leg. Karen reflected that the hero would always have powerfulies at his side. She indulged in the worry that even though she had become Leon's ally, someone more talented might appear. Karen put her hand to her chest, wondering if that would give her the chance to be with him. The adventurer came to the conclusion that this city is a place where she has the opportunity to prove her skills and value. Karen's gaze was steely as she decided that she was going to make Leon want to be around her. Karen sat on the edge of the roof, looking down at the city. Her eyes glittered with an emerald light, and her lips stretched in a satisfied wound Kaio as she finally found her target. Leon, still terribly confused, talked to Elsid about how he was destined to share a room with Karen for the next three days. The spirit looked annoyed, thinking of its young charge's stupidity. The two men were distracted by a man in green with paint on his cheeks coming up to the guy and coughing awkwardly. He apologized to Leon for embarrassing him. But Leon, scratching the back of his head awkwardly, assured him that he hadn't done anything so bad that it was worth apologizing for. Abruptly changing the subject, Leon asked the man what kind of cargo is in the blue box, which he had previously been so desperate to return and, apparently, it was something special. The man, frowning and raising his fist to his chin, concluded that this was an important secret. Leon's face and posture betrayed his interest and impatience, and the man decided that he shouldn't be too hard on the person who returned the cargo, but asked to keep what he heard a secret. Leon agreed, and the man abruptly approached him, his eyes narrowed as he scanned the area around him. Then he leaned in, covering his mouth with a gold-ringed hand. He said that the secret valuable cargo is something called a black crystal, and since we are talking about a first-class product without impurities, the cost price of this precious stone it consists of almost a thousand gold coins. But the main reason why this crystal is so precious is because it was commissioned by Lord Reuben, the steward of the city through which the caravan will pass. Dripping with sweat from excitement, the man explained that the lord was a high-ranking noble with the title of count, and if someone from the guild suddenly displeased him, he would take revenge without considering who was right and who was wrong. Leon asked with a polite smile if that was the reason the man had said that the cargo had to be returned. Closing his eyes, the man admitted that the guy is right, because his life depends on this grus. The weather was pleasant, and the sunset sky was turning from blue to lilac and purple. Leon pushed everywhere for the vanished Karen. When he opened the blue cloth, he didn't see it in the cart either. However, I saw a note on the wooden floor, recorded with the help of a friend Taunai. Picking up a piece of paper from the floor, Leon carefully read the message in which the adventurer wrote that Skoro would return. Leon deduced that she wanted to find something and had already begun to act. Suddenly Leon was distracted by a question from behind about whether he was alone. Turning around, he saw a crowd of men from the guild with serious faces, among them were Hamel, Commander Gustav, Lenik, and others. Leon, feeling slightly perplexed, confirmed that the older man had gone somewhere. Hearing this response, the men in the crowd all expressed their disappointment at Karen's absence. Leon looked at them blankly as they talked about how much they had been looking forward to meeting their sister. Suddenly, the commander put a well-muscled arm around Leon and told the young master to go with a friendly smile, which caused him to ask questions. Making a stupid face at the lack of understanding of his junior's reaction, 
The commander explained that they were going to a tavern, still hugging Leon. The commander shouted in the direction of the disgruntled subordinates, reproaching them for promising to go to the place with the young master. The subordinates, however, did not expect this, and the air was filled with numerous dissatisfied remarks addressed to the commander and Leon. A group of men, together with Leon, moved into the tavern to the main character's screams as the sunset appeared in the sky. From the ledge, as Ka Ren surveyed the surroundings of the longboat's sand-walled city, she concluded that the place she was looking for was somewhere nearby. Green eyes glittering, the girl stared at her find with a focused expression and a satisfied grin. In the Inkai sky, the moon's shining disk was hidden by clouds. A man with long brown hair and a trickle of blood on his face was lying on the sand, his teeth clenched from exertion, pinned down by a leg, cursing as he struggled to get out. Around him, several corpses of young men lay in pools of blood, their faces contorted with horror. Men often have images of the recent past in their heads, where he and a group of friends noticed Karen passing by on her own business. The daredevil decided to approach a buxom blonde in a long dark raincoat and put his hand on her shoulder, smiling contentedly and looking at the lonely beauty. Now the man was paying the price for a fatal mistake, lying on the sand under the girl's shoe with a bruised face and trickles of blood. Karen, lit by the moon's disc, she glared at the impudent man, towering over him and keeping her foot on his face. She called out angrily to the man, showing her disdain. Seeing the frantic expression on Karen's face, the former daredevil couldn't hide his fear, knowing that he was about to go straight to the next world after his comrades. Karen, having released the man from captivity, decided to ask him a question, to which the frightened impudent man, who was now crouching down, screamed, backing away from the mercenary and asking the girl to ask quickly. Without taking her eyes off the man, Karen decided with a serious expression to find out about the biggest serious gang in the city running the black market and smuggling. The guy with the oast stained face smiled broadly, trying to stall for time, because he knew that as soon as he told everything, he would immediately die and if he didn't say anything, he would meet the same fate. Night fell on the city, lighting up lights in the sky and in the windows of houses. Daredevil was lying on sand with his head turned around, a huge bruise on his face frozen in a smile, and a lot of thin streams of blood flowing out of the poor man's mouth, nose and ears. The survey was over. Turning away from the corpse and frowning, Karen realized that she still knew who was controlling the area. This is done by the notorious Golden Owl Gang. This is an organization of merchants whose main occupation is smuggling and the black market. In addition, they hold high government positions because they earn a lot of money. But it is also rumored that Marquez, who is the owner of the local land, also supports them. Karen walked with the sand rising under her feet. She thought that the group's association with a high-ranking official was adding to the hassle. The girl's legs were now at rest after the intense walking. It reached the headquarters of the Golden Owl organization, which was signaled by their sign in the form of a night bird on a stone wall. As she approached the door, Karen noted that the last time she had visited this place was about 10 years ago, but her feet still remembered the way. For a moment, the girl remembered the conversation in the forest with Leon, who was curious about the meaning of her nickname, which she did not hide from the younger because she had long since left the path of murderers. Karen explained that she had acquired the call sign mortician because of the coded communication method, which slightly puzzled Leon. The girl explained in more detail that any dark organization has its own individual method of secret messaging, in the case of the spider organization, in which she was a member, all information was transmitted by visiting a local funeral home and placing a request in a coffin. This explanation clarified the situation for Leon, and Karen added that organizations usually don't use such sophisticated messaging methods. For example, when a customer comes to them, they use a light that causes optical illusions to create a fake entrance. The real door will remain open only for those who are able to figure out the secret combination, and those who do not know the code will try in every possible way to open the fake door, leaving fools. Karen put her hand to the wall, claiming that optical illusions were nothing to her, who had a shadow aura. Her fingers began to penetrate the stone. The girl went straight through the wall without any obstacles. She found herself in a stone corridor with a winding staircase that descended into darkness. As she took a step up the stairs, she stepped right into a magic trap that sparkled with red lightning. She looked at the electrical discharges around her in disbelief. The man in the red robe was standing with his back to a wooden stand holding a candle that illuminated a small room. His suspicious gaze flickered back. The door to the room opened a crack. Karen was peeking out of the doorway, waving her hand innocently in greeting. A man in red was sitting at the counter with his hands folded into a lock. After greeting the intruder with his hands, he asked her with a malicious smile if she liked the warm welcome. Remembering the road with a huge number of hidden deadly traps, the girl replied that it was not so-so. The man behind the counter asked Karen to sit in the chair opposite, explaining why the guest had come without following the procedure, to which the girl replied that she needed to buy information. 
When Golden Owl's secretary politely asked what information was needed, the hero interrupted that she was interested in information about the Reuben thief, which caught the man off guard. While a white candle was burning on the counter, which is the only source of light, Karen asked not to try to hide anything from her. Since she was going to pay for information, and the option of not selling her anything at all was contrary to the principles of the organization. The secretary, without ceremony, called the price of 800 gold, which turned out to be expensive for the girl, and then she offered to provide her own information in exchange for a discount. The man lowered its price to 700 coins, which also did not suit Karen. The girl asked if it was possible to bring down the price a little more by changing her face at the end and calling the man the butler. The secretary squeezed his eyes shut, not understanding at all. Karen noticed that her disguise skill was not bad, but her eyes were not fooled, and she pointed at one of them with a sly smile. She recognized the executive director of Golden Owl, who was in charge of the local black market, as Glenn's butler, one of the Marquis of Balka's most trusted men. Taking off his hood and looking at Karen with glowing blue eyes, the man noticed with displeasure that the girl was very impudent. Karen, impatient, asked if Glenn was going to sell her the information, because he seemed very interested in what she offered in return for the discount. Glaring at her with his glassy gaze, the man concluded that she was an rank adventurer, and if she was a member of a large guild, then trying to get rid of her would have unpleasant consequences. Glenn coldly snaps off that 260's Lodi's is the last price, which suits Karen seriously. The man says that the thief of Reuben is like a hole in a sewer, the girl, frowning, asks again with incomprehension. Glenn, winking at her, explains that anyone who enters there can't howl. A long stream of frothy drink pours into a wooden mug. To the cheers of his companions, who have gathered at the local tavern in Karen's absence, Leon gulps down his drink without stopping. After draining the entire mug, the guy grimaced, gathering cheers and praise for his compania. Carrying a tray of food, a pretty waitress with blonde hair and large green eyes asked the mercenaries what their next destination was, to which Hamel, embarrassed by her appearance, replied with a blush on his cheeks that they were heading Toth Ben Fief. Hearing this unfortunate name, the girl panicked, explaining that the other mercenaries were trying to avoid this place, and called the guys really brave, suspecting that they had not yet heard the rumors. Chief Gust have frowned, not understanding what the rumors were about. The waitress's story about a vampire ruling the streets at night puzzled Leon along with the one-eyed spirit of Elsid. A vampire, they are a race with an intelligence not unlike that of humans, with excellent magical abilities, and also having an immortality comparable to that of mid-level or high-level demonic monsters. There is the possibility of coexistence with humans, but they are rejected by society because of their habit of drinking the blood of the latter, so only a few of the race members survived and continue to exist in a very precarious position. Although the church has declared them an endangered species, but at the same time, no one recognizes their existence in their territories. While Leon and Elsid continued to be in complete shock, the group of guys called the girl's words complete nonsense. The guild members noted with a confident look that if a vampire appeared in these areas, they would immediately kill him. Elsid looked distracted, while Leon put a hand to his chin and pondered the monster story. The guy with a smile on his face admitted that it stirs his heart. Leon imagined himself armed with a sword, attacking a vampire in a long black and red cloak and medieval garb. Having changed his mind about attacking, the guy holds out his hand to the night-eyed C.H. Thony, wondering if he should try to settle things with a conversation first. Leon turns to Elsid, and the spirit immediately sees what the boy is thinking from the look on his face. He remembered that as Rodrigo's hero, there were very few vampires left in his time, because all the Strongons had joined the Demon King's army, and the blonde hero had personally killed every one of them with his sword. Elsid also noted that he had never met a normal vampire who didn't need to be punished. Thinking about it, Leon decided that he should try to talk about the possibility of coexistence of monsters with humans in any Raising his fist in the air, the guy said with complete confidence that as a hero, he should independently judge what is evil. Averting his gaze, Leon concluded that he should see and hear for himself, and the vampire trial should be postponed for now. With a powerful blow, the huge fist smashed through the wall. The guild members looked in one direction in disbelief. A huge bully with a vicious grin was walking straight towards them, indignant at how loudly the guys were discussing vampires. Gustav, without looking up from his drink, calmly said that this angry man's name was Jerome, and since he was here, then wait for the storm. With a single flick of his hand, the guild leader abruptly puts down the mug of booze on the table. Jerome, in a bad mood, stopped right behind Gustav, who, with a serious face, suggested that the man should not make a fuss in such a wonderful place. Throwing a disdainful glance at the guild leader, the bully with a cross scar on his face became angry because the man dared to order him around. Gustav, looking menacingly at Jerome, once again voiced his request, asking the bully to leave. Jerome leaned over to the head's mug and spat savorily into it. 
This action infuriated all the guild members who were watching from the sidelines. Smiling sardonically, Jerome asked if he didn't want to leave. With his hands on the table, Gustav pushed himself up from his seat, saying that the bully would only spoil everyone's mood. The veins in the man's forehead bulged with the effort, and he flashed his teeth at Jerome, calling him outside, since he was already waiting for him. So he wants to measure strength. A full moon loomed over the city, and clouds drifted past. As the guild members watched with furrowed brows, Leon called out to Elsid in a whisper. The two men were already standing in the street, surrounded by a crowd of onlookers, ready to tear each other to shreds, while Leon quietly tried to find out from the spirit if fights between mercenaries always happen so unexpectedly. With the air of a seasoned fighter, the spirit confirmed the guy's guess, adding that mercenaries always prove their worth by force, and if someone suddenly looks down on others, but does nothing, then their value will drop. Basically, the snarky Jerome, the focused Gustav, and the other mercenaries always get into an argument and strike back. Hamel eyed the bully suspiciously, finding his behavior strange, as if he had come here to start a fight from the very beginning and was now pushing recklessly at the commander, but Leon was surprised by his comrade's reaction. Hamel, with a serious face, told the younger that Jerome often quarreled with Gustav. However, Obugai, who is now breaking into a satisfied smile, has never challenged the commander to a duel so openly before, because if they fight seriously, it is absolutely obvious who will win. Leon and Hamel furiously began to discuss the unequal forces of the opponents. Jerome, who pulls out blades, has generally been known as a seeker of light work, but today his attitude is strikingly different from the usual, as if the bully believes in something. Hamel said that he had a bad feeling about this fight, surprising Leo with his words. Hearing the conversation of his subordinates, Gustav, determined, tried to calm them down, assuring them that he would win. Determined to fight, Jerome clarified the rules, to which he received the answer that everything is as usual, die or give up. Elsid told Leon to carefully observe the high-level biology. Holding their blades, the men prepared to attack. The fight began, and Jerome immediately flew up to Gustav with two machetes. The chief looked warily at the man as he raised his weapon in fury to strike. Jerome managed to make incisions on Gustav's cheek and shoulder, which started to bleed. Gustav pulled away from the big man, holding out his sword for protection. A smug Jerome placed the blades in parallel, covering himself, and asked if he now seemed like a small fish to his opponent. Watching the battle, Elstein noticed that Jerome Falcatai's holding unique swords with the center of gravity in the front. Determined, Gustav saw that his opponent's skills had improved significantly as he raised his sword to strike in the bright light. Jerome's pupils narrowed Ash noticed that the guildmaster had finally revealed his white aura with the steel attribute. Knowing that Gustav would take such a step, the Bugai flew at him very quickly, activating an aura with a water attribute and simultaneously remembering that he had recently mastered a new wave technique. Unwilling to lose, Jerome struck with one of his swords, but Gustav defended himself by holding out his sword. A fierce battle to the death ensued, sending a cloud of dust into the air. The shaking from the powerful impact spread throughout the entire night city. While everyone was still in shock at the scale of the battle, Leon tried to see the outcome of the fight through the rising dust, gritting his teeth and holding out his hand in an attempt to stay in place after the shock wave. In the resulting haze, two dark silhouettes could be seen, one of which had fallen to Lenny's knee, and the other was approaching him with a long sword in his hands. Jerome, blood at his mouth, was crouched on the ground, one hand resting on the ground, his weapon lying next to him. Gustav, his cheek covered with blood, glared down at the big guy and suggested that he stop, completely not understanding why he had challenged the man to a fight in the first place, otherwise one of them would have to die. Smiling broadly, Jerome quipped if Gustav had any idea that he would be the one to die. The bully emphatically said that everything had been just a warm-up before, and now he was going to demonstrate real power, which only angered the ready-to-finish guild commander, who continued to stand in front of him waiting. Gustav gave the big guy a blank look, puzzled at how he still had the strength to compete, and asked him to leave off the cheap bragging rights. Jerome's rage was aroused by the words, and black claws began to appear on his veined hands in the light of red lightning. Long fangs appeared in the big man's mouth, and his eyes glowed scarlet. Gustav watched his opponent's transformation, his sword ready to strike at the right moment, but Jerome disappeared from view. Hamel, who was watching the fight in the crowd, was very confused when he noticed this. Gustav looked around in confusion and panic, his mouth twisting in displeasure. A magical blue glow appeared in Leon's eye, spreading out in sharp rays as he tried hard to locate Jerome. The boy and Elsid both looked up at the same time, noticing Mercenaria. Jerome was silhouetted against the moon, eyes glittering fiercely, blades flashing, ready to strike, while Gustav kept looking around in panic. The big guy flew at the enemy with a frantic cry, and then he struck him many times with swords and landed on the ground with a malicious smile. The commander's clothes were covered with drops of blood. He screamed in pain as Jerome's blade sliced through him. 
Gustav didn't understand how the big guy had the power to cut through the steel aura. Leaving it behind Jerome looked around the crowd at his bleeding opponent, who was holding onto his sword and falling to his knees, looking like a satisfied predator with red eyes and a vicious grin. Jerome walked towards Gustav, who was sitting in a pool of blood, and the crowd couldn't understand what had happened at all because there was no sign of the attack. Gustav's subordinates only noticed the commander seemed to fall, but no matter how fast Jerome was, he was only rank B. However, Leon doubted the mercenary's wound since he was moving at the same speed as Karen when attacking. Gloating, Jerome kicked the defeated Gustav in the leg. The man screamed in pain. Not wanting to be humiliated by the commander, the guild members rushed into battle. However, a hand with claws like Jerome's blocked the angry guy's path. Two outsiders with glowing red eyes and long fangs threatened Gustav's subordinates not to interfere in the fight. The two boys stared dumbfounded at the familiar mercenaries who now looked nothing like themselves. Gustav, covered in blood, looked at Jerome from under his brows. The you guy loomed over him, waiting, a predatory grin on his face. He noticed that the opponent was already on his knees, so he could start begging for mercy. Jerome's mouth watered and her eyes widened. Elsid watched with a serious face. He ordered Let to unsheathe his sword and raise it as high as possible, scattering the aura light all around. The boy hurried to draw his blade from its scabbard. Leon raised his sword high above his head, lighting up the area in a flash of blinding light. In an instant, Jerome's face was covered with tiny scales, his red eyes turned to the source of the glow. He clutched at his face, letting out a heart-rending scream as streams of ash radiated from his body. The same thing happened to the two mercenaries who blocked the guy's path, who were now screaming in agony that they were very hot. The three men all fell into the sand, causing everyone present to wonder why they had lost consciousness. Leon stared at his sword, glowing and burning with aura, and whispered his thoughts to Elsid. The smoldering body of one of the mercenaries lay on the ground. Elsid informed Leon that these men were Dampiers. Leon, having heard the unusual name, asked the spirit in confusion if these mercenaries were vampires after all. Elsid explained to the surprised student that Dampiers are those who have taken a reagent made from vampire blood. In other words, they are creatures that stand on the border between vampires and humans. They are weak in the sun, but their strength increases at night. These creatures are no match for vampires, but their regeneration is much faster than that of ordinary mortals. On the other hand, silver weapons can cause fatal wounds, and although dampers can't use black magic, such creatures are very difficult to deal with in the middle of the night. Elsid assured Leon that he was only able to deal with these monsters thanks to the Holy Sword and the Sun's aura. When Leon asked if the Dampiers were related to the vampire the cute waitress mentioned, Elsid confirmed this assumption. Suddenly, Leon was hailed by Commander A, who, although his clothes were covered in blood, assured him that he was in perfect order. Leon, looking at his face, which was bleeding and swollen in places, thought that with such serious injuries, he couldn't be alright. Leon decided to be brief and told Gustav that these people were vampires, which stunned him. The full moon towered over the city at night, juxtaposing clouds and stars in the night sky. Jerome, lying on the ground, let out a faint moan, not understanding how he ended up in this position. Looking up, he saw his two fellow dampiers bound together. Above him, he saw Tran two dark silhouettes, their gloating smiles foreboding nothing good. These figures wanted to discuss something with Jerome, causing him to break out in a cold sweat of terror. The frightened man started shouting about breaking the rules. A moment later, his desperate cry spilled over the night city of the longboat. Leon sat on the huge bed in the hotel room, remembering that Jerome's testimony suggested that Count Reuben was the root of the problem. The next destination for the guild caravan is Reuben Fief. The Count organizes an army, making his subordinates mercenaries and adventurers from all over the world. Thinking aloud, Leon said that it would be a huge shock if this information reached the church. Leon racked his brain, trying to figure out why the Count was so eager to get his hands on the black crystal that guild was supposed to deliver to him. Leon, who had decided that tomorrow he would go with the commander to talk to the guild leader, was just about to go to bed when he suddenly remembered Karen, with whom he shared the same room, Cotter which you still had somewhere. Leon wanted Aventurous to get back quickly and they could go to bed together, otherwise they wouldn't get up the next day. Elsid, delighted by these words, asked if Leon and Karen would sleep together. Leon turned lazily and asked the spirit what he was talking about. The image off man in green talking about a huge double bed came back to me. Leon, remembering the words of the merchant who had arrived at the guild city, had intensely praised the room with a huge double bed. Finally, he realized what else had meant, blushed scarlet, and began to justify himself. Just as a confused Leon started to explain that he was waiting for Karen to come, because he was worried about her, the girl appeared at the window of the room behind him. Karen's eyes filled with genuine joy when she saw Leon, and she Voskuknala said that she had searched him. However, Karen didn't understand who Leon was waiting for, so she asked him, making him blush again. Leon stammered out that he wasn't expecting anyone, leaving Karen completely baffled. 
Raising her hands to her face, Lil Karen wanted to share the story with Leon. The adventurer told him that she had obtained some very important information. Taken aback, the protagonist tried to find out what information Karen was talking about. Satisfied, the adventurer asked him not to be surprised. No, or rather, don't be too surprised. That's right, Karen said. An image of Glenn appeared in her mind, Nad Kataram Bazushalas, with the guild's emblem towering over it. In her mind, she wanted to share with him the information she had managed to extract from the Golden Owl Guild. The aventurist felt that this was her chance to show Leon that she wasn't lacking in both strength and intelligence. Overjoyed, Karen reported that a vampire had appeared in Count Ruben's fief. The adventurer's face was filled with emotion. At that moment, she was waiting for the main character's reaction. Hearing this, Leon fell into a stupor. Taken aback, he noted that he was really surprised by this. Furious, Karen couldn't understand why he had such a rotten reaction. Upon hearing the adventurer's news, Arnold was filled with horror. Putting her hand to her face, Karen thought that this was exactly the reaction she'd expected. The daytime sky was gradually becoming overcast. A member of the Stom Guild reported that a vampire was hiding in Reuben's fief. Putting a hand to his chin, Arnold noted that in addition to this, there is a process of active military buildup. Wary, he talked about what was behind all this, none other than Count Reuben. After which, guild member Stom wondered if this information was reliable. Recalling what had happened in the tavern, Gustav said that based on the facts he had discovered, this was the case. The commander noted that vampires had also appeared. He believed that for this kind of monster to appear, there must be a connection to a real vampire. With a slight tilt of his head, Gustav was sure that someone was definitely behind Jerome. The commander noted that there is a high probability that we are talking about Count Reuben. Turning his head in Arnold's direction, Gustav said that fortunately, they had managed to find out this fact before they arrived at Reuben's fief. The commander believed that in this regard, they can take action. Alerted, guild member Stom reported that this was the case. After which, he noted that they, in any case, will not be able to avoid a meeting with Count Reuben. Thinking back on the attempted theft, Arnold felt that it would be better if the desert thieves stole the box, then they would have at least some excuse. Guild member Stom felt that if he said that he couldn't deliver the item once he was at the very borders of the Reuben fief, then the Count might consider the gesture as a personal insult. Being in doubt, Arnold reported that for nobles, their own reputation is more precious than life. Member of the Stom Guild he noted that being a simple merchant without a noble title, he would not be able to make such mistakes. Arnold suggested that in this case, they might very well be killed for showing disrespect to a member of the nobility. In desperation, Gustav stated that in that case, there was nothing they could do. Watching the Stom Guild member, the commander stated that they should step into the place of danger themselves. From a strategic point of view, this was the worst possible scenario. The protagonist's face was filled with excitement. Gustav noted that even realizing this, they can not just leave the business they started. Grinning, the commander said that if they refused to do their job just because they wanted their own skin, they would undermine their credibility and the reputation they had built up so far. Gustav believed that this way, the mercenary who took the request would be held accountable until the very end of the mission. Slamming the table, an enthusiastic Arnold declared that he was ready to spend all his spare cash. Raising a hand to his chest, he informed them that they needed to hire more mercenaries and provide them with silver pills and holy water, which were very effective weapons in the fight against vampires. Arnold said that he would not shamelessly beg for the life of only one person. Hearing this, a smile appeared on Gustav's face. After that, the guys shook hands. As Karen ran after them, she thought they would do just fine on their own. Wary, the adventurer asked if Leon could spare her a moment. The main character's face was shrouded in incomprehension. After which, they headed to the roof of the building. Surprised, Leon turned to Karen. The outraged adventurer said that it was really a big surprise. Karen told him about the difficulty of getting this information from the local guild. She noted that this is very valuable information. Upon hearing this, the protagonist fell into a stupor. As she approached Leon, Karen thought that if she hadn't put in so much effort, it would have been impossible to even guess what was going on. Taken aback, Leon agreed with her. Recalling the mole, the adventurer claimed that the reason Ith had been used to hunt them in the desert was because they had received clear instructions from Count Reuben. The main character's face was shocked. Leon was dumbfounded as he watched the overjoyed adventurer. Turning to the main character, Karen asked him to think about how the mole could still find out what exactly is the most valuable cargo. The adventurer noted that if such a huge bandit group was constantly rampaging in the desert, then there would definitely be some rumors about it. An image off crystal that she and the caravan were bringing to the city appeared in her mind. After which, Karen reminded the protagonist of the words of the guildmaster who claimed that there was no danger in the surrounding area. In his shock, Leon assumed that they had arrived unexpectedly to steal the box. Karen said that was exactly what it was. The adventurer believed that the mole actively collaborated with Count Reuben and did all the dirty work for him. 
The memory of channeling so many kin popped up in her head complaining in the direction of the mole. Karen pointed out that he was just extremely unlucky to have met her that day. Wary, Leon assumed that Count Reuben wanted them to stay out of his domain. An image of the mercenaries he knew appeared in his mind. Karen thought that even with the vast territory, replacing an entire caravan was extremely burdensome. She noted that we should not forget that the guards are also very loyal. Turning her head in Leon's direction, the adventurer state that the Count wouldn't have been able to get his hands on everything without being noticed. Karen believed that relying on the bandits for this matter was the best way out of this situation. Due to the strong wind currents, the main character's hair fluttered from side to side. In his mind, Leon was sure that even if Count Reuben was up to something in his fief, he was doing his best not to draw anyone's attention to his actions. An image of the Count appeared in his mind. While thinking about it, the chief hero assumed that this was why Reuben was trying to steal the cargo he ordered. As he continued to think, he noted that not only did the guild manage to protect the cargo, but they also used their forces to defeat all the enemies and, as a result, they came close to the borders of the Reuben fief. At that moment, the main character recalled exactly how the process of catching thieves took place. Leon put a hand to his chin and assumed that the Count thought he was having more trouble. He thought it was taking a dangerous turn. Remembering the unfortunate image of Reuben, the protagonist believed that the danger increased several times at the moment when the guild exceeded all the expectations of the Count. In his mind, Leon was sure that the Count would now prepare for a more thorough war in his fief. Holding Gift of Jezar in his hands, the main character thought that in this case, it is worth going to any tricks. As he continued to think, Leon thought that the necklace with the badge of the Order of the Iron Castle that the bishop had given him would be used. After that, the main character turned to Karen, who was taken aback. Alerting himself, he announced a place to visit. The moon was shining brightly above the night city. There was a strange aura coming from the window of one of the buildings. The man thought that Reuben fully deserved the title of Night City. While standing by the window, the young man was studying some notes. The moonlight glinted on his face. He wondered if he was back. At that moment, a novel appeared in front of him. His subordinate, calling the young man Highness, said that this was so. With a smirk, Yunosha noted that their clan was completely destroyed. He felt that such titles were no longer appropriate. Roman smiled and said that he would always be a prince to him. The subordinate was talking about a member of the vampire nobility, the one who inherited the Valahai bloodline among three generations of Nosferatu, your highness Tepesh, Roman continued. Looking out of the window, the subordinate reported that there were none of the Count's men within a one-kilometer radius. He believed that Tepesh could stay here for at least five days. Clenching his hand into a fist, the prince couldn't understand how this could have happened. Tepesh wondered why only he and Roman were left out of their entire clan. Enraged, the prince declared that his sins were great. Tepesh he noted that it was only because he was trying to find a place to live, but he never expected that he would bring such a calamity to the clan. Roman, who was behind the prince, believed that this sin belongs to the wicked. Tepesh said that even if the wrongdoer is to blame, this does not relieve him of responsibility for what happened. After which, he declared that he would definitely save his clan. Suddenly, the prince's eyes turned red. Startled, Roman turned to Teeps. Powerful streams of aura emanated from the prince's eye. Alert, the subordinate thought that he was using force. Roman reflected on the ability to share feelings with those with whom he shared his blood while in his thoughts. The subordinate noted that even if it was blood that he gave not of his own free will, as long as the source of power is in Tepesh, their minds are connected. At that moment, the mercenary group was reunited with the prince. In Teep's mind, Jerome's memories of the fight with Gustav popped up. The mercenary's blade was covered in traces of blood. But suddenly, the main character appeared in front of him, raising the holy sword above his head. Leone's face was covered in a sacred light. After seeing, it was the prince who grinned. After which, he started laughing hard. Turning to Roman, Tepesh stated that the goddess had not yet left them. A dumbfounded subordinate asked what the prince meant by that. Tepesh told him that he had seen the pathetic worms that had become the Count's puppets. An excited Roman assumed that the prince was talking about dampiers. Gradually, clouds began to obscure the full moon. Teep stated that this is the case. The prince reported that Dampirath dampiers had taken a hit from someone using sacred power. Noting the incredible strength of the main character, Tepesh was sure that this person occupies a fairly high position in the church. An image of Leon holding the holy sword in his hand appeared in his mind. The prince believed that if someone like the main character was here, then he clearly had information related to him. Wary, Roman suggested that in this case. Grinning, Teep said that this would be the key to the counterattack. Watching his hand, the prince called Andrew Rubin a pathetic blackman. Enraged, Tepesh declared that very soon, he would tear him apart with his bloody claws. The sun rose brightly over the morning city. Turning to Leon, Elsid asked if it was amazing. After that, he noted that Sovsum moved away from the main topic. Sacred Weapon asked where it left off. 
pricking up his guard, Elst assumed he'd been talking about a fight with vampires. The sacred weapon reported that in order to destroy all those associated with the Demon King's army, On had single-handedly invaded the Vampire Lord's castle. While half asleep, the protagonist continued to listen to him. Elsid noted that 90% of the high-ranking vampires had been destroyed there, including their lord. Sacred weapons added that they have since disappeared from the pages of history. Elsid I assumed that some of them managed to escape and thus escape. After which, he wondered, which was related to the fact that they only appeared after 300 years. Exhausted, Leon asked him to stop. The main character declared that he was fed up with it. Clutching his head, Leon noticed that he had stories of sacred weapons in his guts. He was amazed that Elsa kept telling him the same thing for a week. The main character was upset that there was no opportunity to practice in the carriage, and all he can do is listen to the heroic stories of the sacred weapon. Clutching his face, Leon couldn't understand why the road leading to Reuben Fief was so safe and why it was too peaceful and quiet. Being in despair, the main character noted that Elsa Elsa talks non-stop all week. He was amazed to be riding with the chatty sword king. Closing his eyes, the sacred weapon reported that this was the case. Elsid grinned and asked where he had left off. Outraged, Leon begged him to stop because he couldn't listen to him anymore. Karen, who was sitting on the roof of the wagon, announced that they had arrived. Overjoyed, the protagonist asked if this was true. The adventurer announced that they were entering the Reuben residence. The small city was surrounded by many majestic mountains. The caravan's cart stopped right at the residence's gate. In his mind, Leon believed that the residence couldn't compare to the longboat that was Khaled U Fortress City. The main character noted that it is quite large for a castle on the outskirts of the country. Finding something, Leon's face was filled with surprise. He didn't know if he was imagining it. The main character had the feeling that the fortress wall was shining. Mysterious lighting radiated from the walls of the residence. Observing the entrance to the residence, Elsid reported that it was a barrier. A huge magic seal towered over the guild caravan. The sacred weapon revealed that using a huge amount of silver, a spell was engraved on the castle wall, blocking access to vampires. Thinking about it, Elsid guessed that it had other uses. After that, he noted that he was not familiar with such subtleties. The main character was thinking about the barrier that blocked access to vampires. He assumed that their guesses were wrong. An image of the Count appeared in his mind. In his thoughts, Leon couldn't understand that if Count Reuben was a dark horse controlling vampires, then why put up such a barrier on the fortress wall? The soldiers standing at the entrance of the residence ordered the wagons to stop. The man asked about the guild they belonged to. Arnold came up to him and told him that he was the head of the Stom Guild. Hearing this, the man was glad that they had finally arrived. He noted that they were just waiting for their arrival. Turning to the young man, the man ordered him to escort the caravan to the castle. After which, the guild's caravan safely crossed the barrier's borders. Inside the carriage, Leon wondered if this was the power of the barrier. Chief Jeroy noted that his feelings are not the same as when he comes into contact with the sacred force. Startled, Karen couldn't understand what kind of unpleasant sensation was enveloping her. Turning to Elsid, Leon asked what would happen if they were vampires. The Holy Order suggested that they would have been baked. Remembering the guards at the city, Elsid he noted that the knights guarding the gate were neither vampires nor dampiers. Directing his gaze to the sacred weapon, he asked if it was true. The main character was genuinely happy that Elsid could tell them apart. Alerted, sacred weapon stated that they needed to be on their guard from now on. Elsid didn't know where exactly to expect the enemy to strike. After which, the sacred weapon began to study the residents of the residents. Elf said they weren't here. Reuben's evening sky was shrouded in clouds. The main character was amazed that they weren't here. In his shock, Leon couldn't understand what was going on here. While in his thoughts, the protagonist was surprised that on the way from the gate to the castle itself, they didn't encounter a dampier, let alone a vampire. The glare of the sun's rays was reflected on the huge palace of the residents. As he continued to think, Leon assumed that the information about Reuben hiding vampires was wrong. No, the sun is still high, so it might not be easy to figure them out, the protagonist mused. The guards stationed at the palace gate ordered the caravan to stop. One of them announced that he was a senior knight. He said his name was Brand. Brand noted that all my guild head and adventurers with mercenaries of B rank or higher can go further. The senior knight reported that it was an order from the Lord. Karen looked out of the cart and asked if they could go too. At that moment, the main character was talking about a special item that the guild head should give to the count. Leon couldn't understand why the Count was asking even the caravan guards to go inside. Being in his own thoughts, the main character thought that it was even better this way. He knew that now he would be able to find the answer to the question that plagued Iguo the most. The sun shone through the palace windows. The sculpture standing nearby was completely shrouded in light. 
the mercenary noted the luxury of what he saw. While exploring the palace, the mercenary reported that this was his first time in such a place. After that, he asked how to give a proper greeting. Hamel, who was standing behind him Kamal, said that he should just stand still. He noted that if he stared at the Count's face, his head might fly off his shoulders. The mercenary thought it was extremely cruel. After that, the guys found themselves at the entrance to the Count's room. Bran knocked on the door Bran and announced that Guildmaster Stom was here with a guard. Opening the door a crack, the Count asked them to enter. Reuben was leaning on the windowsill, waiting. Guild leader Stom knelt before him. After which, the main character bowed his head in respect. Leon turned to Elsid. After investigating the area, Sacred Weapon reported that this was not the case. Elsid claimed that Reuben wasn't a vampire. The dumbfounded protagonist asked if the Sacred Weapon meant that the Count was not a vampire. Watching Reuben, Elsid reported that this was the case. Grinning, he noted that the Count was a much more annoying creature. The Sacred Weapon claimed that he was only a human. When Elsid had finished exploring the room, he noted that everyone in this room was in a different position. These knights are ordinary people. In the main character's mind, an image of a vampire appeared, whose body was enveloped in an aura. In his thoughts, Leon assumed that if neither the Count nor anyone in his entourage was a vampire, then the information that blood drinkers were working in this fief was a lie. Reuben turned his attention to Arnold and greeted him. Watching the Count, the main character noticed that he did not feel the arrogance in his tone, so typical for high-ranking nobles. In his mind, Leon was sure that Reuben didn't look like a villain at all. Standing in front of the window, the Count noted that he would like to receive the item he had ordered before starting their conversation. Opening the box, Arnold handed him the contents. The crystal in the box reflected the sun's glare. Approaching the head of the Stom Guild, the Count picked up the crystal. Looking at it, Reuben said that he was completely satisfied. After his subordinates brought the chest, the Count announced that the promised thousand gold coins were there. Reuben pointed out that he would reduce the price of goods that would be purchased by the Stom Guild Master in his domain by 20%. Arnold thanked the Count for his concern. Reuben smiled and asked him to drop the formalities. The Stom Guild leader's face Stom was frozen in one position. The Count's body was wrapped in a mysterious aura. Reuben asked if they could get to the main point. The mercenaries' faces were troubled. The Count asked them not to be surprised that there were vampires hiding in it right now. Half of Reuben's face was in shadow. Hearing this, the main Jeroy froze in one position. The boys' faces were shocked. Startled, Arnold clutched his head. Taken aback, Guildmaster Stom asked for forgiveness for his tactlessness. Being in his thoughts, the main character thought that Arnold might well be surprised. Leon couldn't understand who had ever expected the Count to bring up the subject in person. A group of knights studied the room in every possible way. Reuben noted that even though they were searching the citadel day and night, he had come to the conclusion that it was too difficult for his knights to find the vampires hiding in the city because they were originally monsters that hid well. The Count was concerned that the knights had never fought monsters before. Turning his gaze to the mercenaries, Reuben asked them what they thought of taking up vampire hunting. Everyone, including the main character, froze in one position. The Count said that he would guarantee them a decent reward, as well as provide them with silver weapons and holy water. The mercenaries' gazes were alarmed. Alert, lost in his own thoughts, Leon thought that this was a completely incomprehensible situation. As he continued to think, the protagonist realized that there was only one answer they could give under the circumstances. In the windows of the palace, light could be seen coming from the rooms. Karen reported that everyone, without exception, had been placed in the VIP mansion. The adventurer knew in her gut that something wasn't right. As Karen sat on the couch, she assumed that the Earl was trying to keep an eye on them all. Arnold assumed that they had no choice but to accept Reuben's offer. Putting a hand to his chin, Gustav found it difficult to say anything. The commander asked what was the probability that everything the Count said was true. After which, he focused his attention the fact that Reuben was the first to mention the existence of vampires made Gustav uneasy. With a serious expression on their faces, the boys continued to listen to the commander. Gustav pointed out that the Count's suspicious behavior was ultimately just their assumption, since they had no proof. Arnold held up his hands and begged them to just do as Reuben said. Guild leader Stom was afraid that the people behind the Count would find out that they were doubtful. Alcid suggested that things might have been different if the Stom Guild had been a huge organization capable of influencing entire kingdoms. Thinking back to the magic seal at the entrance of the residence, Sacred Weapon noted that this was a middle-class guild head, and for the Count, it was just a rich commoner. Alcid thought that Reuben could easily slander Arnold and behead him in plain sight. Sacred Weapon pointed out that they should not forget that they were currently in the Count's territory. Elsid was sure that without evidence, it was impossible to conduct an interrogation, and if they were found, then it was still impossible to attack in the open. Looking at him, the protagonist suggested that it was better for them that the Count wasn't their enemy. Leon's hair covered his eye. In his thoughts, the main character believed that Reuben. 
else had claimed that the Count wasn't a vampire, an image of Reuben popped into his mind. The sacred weapon reported that he was a high-ranked mage. Hearing this, Leon fell into a stupor. After that, Elsid said that he doesn't know much about this area, but the barrier on the wall is Reuben's work. Recalling the magic seal above the residence, the sacred weapon reported that the wave of magic power was the same. Thinking about it, the main character put his finger to his chin. An image of a vampire being chained up appeared in sacred weapon's mind. Elzide believed that if the Count really hated vampires, there was no reason for him to borrow their power. Holy Weapon noted that if Reuben only turned the defensive spell on the fortress walls into an offensive one, all vampires in theory would be burned to the ground. Elsid assumed that either the Count was trying to catch the vampires alive, or he was trying to silence the Stom Guild forever, using the extermination of the vampires as an excuse. An image appeared in his mind where the guild carts were wrapped in chains. Imagining Reuben towering over the caravan, the protagonist was sure that Elsid was right and the Count was undoubtedly plotting something in his fief. While thinking, Leon noted that there was a reason why Reuben was hiding the fact that he was a high-ranking mage. The main character thought that it would be correct to assume that the Stom Guild, being involved in this case, signed a death sentence for itself. As Leon continued to think, he assumed that the Count's intention was to separate the guards from the ordinary members of the guild. Remembering the encounter with the Dampiers, the protagonist thought that there was no guarantee that Karen and everyone else wouldn't turn into something similar at the hands of Reuben himself. Clenching his fist, Leon was sure that he couldn't allow such a situation to happen. The main character believes that now the big problem is. Looking at him, Elsidy claimed that the Count was their enemy. After that, he tried to inform the guys about this news. Putting his hand to his head, Leon knew that he couldn't possibly explain Reuben's true identity without revealing Elsid's identity. Karen's face was filled with indignation. Because of this situation, the guys were in deep thought. Raising her hand, the adventurer called it quits. Karen said she wanted to go for a swim and go to bed, and then discuss everything tomorrow. She didn't think it would do any good for them to sit there, sleepy and tired. The exhausted Arnold agreed with her words completely. After which, the adventurer wished everyone a good night. There were occasional stars in the city's night sky. Karen's face was turned into shock. She was amazed that the Count was a magician. Excited, Leon revealed that Reuben was a high-ranking mage. On the way to her room, the adventurer noticed that it was very dangerous. In her mind, she knew that this was a specific goal, since the Count was at a level that even she couldn't see. Directing her gaze to the main character, Karen noted that there was no guarantee that they would win with their current strength. The adventurer thought that they needed to buy time. Turning his head, Leon declared that they were lucky because, before they crossed the borders of Reuben, he sent a request for help to the Order of the Holy Iron Castle, using the necklace he received from the bishop. An image of a powerful army appeared in his mind. The main character noted that he does not know when they will come and in what quantity. Looking out the window, Karen thought of a situation where there was no telling if an entire legion of the Order would come or only a couple of people at most. Seeing the adventurer's worried face, Leon asked if it was okay. Standing at the entrance to the room, Karen reported that everything was fine. She wished him a good rest and said that they would see each other tomorrow. The main character wished her a good night. Entering the room, Leon hung up his cloak. After which, Karen closed the door. A misunderstanding appeared on the main character's face. In front of him was a confused adventurer. Karen's hands were pointed in Leon's direction. She knocked the main character down. Then, she threw herself on the bed. Leon's face was in shock. Smiling, the adventurer asked him to be quiet. The rooms of the palace were shrouded in bright light. The mysterious stranger was at the window. Peeking out from the corner, he began to scan the room. In it, he saw part of Karen's body. His eyes fell on the fact that the adventurer kissed the main character. The shadow falling from the window was reflected on the bed. Seeing this, the stranger fell into a stupor. Next, he left the Count's domain. The boy's faces were frozen in place. Sitting on the floor, Karen assumed the stranger was gone. The adventurer noted that everything immediately seemed suspicious to her. She didn't think they could have been spied on. Grinning, Karen noticed that it looked pretty realistic. Outraged, Leon said he couldn't have known that. Taken aback, the adventurer told Illa that she didn't know either. While in shock, Elsa I called them not smart. Rising from the floor, Karen thought it was time for them to start scouting. Dumbfounded, Leon asked if they needed to do it right now. Looking out the window, the adventurer noted that the enemy was spying on them, so they should respond in kind. Imagining the two of them sleeping together, Karen said that if they were doing something like that right now, they wouldn't even think they were going out. Confused, the protagonist reported that there were eyes everywhere in the castle. Turning to the adventurer, he asked if they could get out without being noticed. After activating her technique, Karen asked if Leon had already forgotten who she was. 
Putting her hand to her head, she asked where exactly she needed Todek the main character. A full moon rose above the night city. With the help of the Undertaker, the guys quickly got to the right place. After arriving, Karen cancelled the use of her technique. Standing on the roof of the house, the children began to study the territory. Watching the night city, Karen said they say that the night city is better than the day city, because at night the streets are charming with their night landscape, but it's not even midnight yet, so why are the streets so quiet? Looking out of one of the windows where the light was on, the adventurer noticed that inside the building she feels someone's presence. Turning his head in Karen's direction, the protagonist suggested that it might be because of rumors about vampires. The adventurer reported that there were guards in the city. Her gaze fell on the knights who were guarding the city's districts. Leon couldn't understand why he saw more patrollers on the streets than city dwellers. Watching the night, Elsid noticed that the silver weapons indicated that they were openly showing their willingness to fight the vampire. Wary, Leon asked about the Count's relationship with vampires. The main character thought that for enemies, the confrontation is too clumsy. After which, Leon added that if they are allies, then he does not understand why everything is so is Varachavatwisted. Looking into the distance, Sacred Weapon stated, in his opinion, the answer to the protagonist's question has already been given. Hearing this, Leon fell into a stupor. Closing his eyes, Elsid reported that the world is not always divided only into enemies and allies. The main character was struck by the fact that vampires may not be enemies and noties of the Count. Sacred Weapon stated that such an option is also possible. Wary, in his thoughts, the main character noted that he had not even thought about this. As he continued to think, Leon noted that in retrospect, they had come to the conclusion from the very beginning that vampires were enemies for no good reason. An image of the vampire and Reuben appeared in his mind. The main character suggested that both of them might be their enemies. Also, he was thinking that they should join one of the parties. After which, Karen turned to Leon. Turning his head, the protagonist waited for further words. Pointing her finger forward, the adventurer reported that she had already looked around the area in advance. Karen noted that this was where the slum started. She asked how exactly the main character was going to post. Leon's face was filled with doubt. The main character wondered if vampires would really hide Priatatsia in such a place. Presenting the image of a monster, Elsid he noted that vampires are quite arrogant and extravagant, so they could rightfully call the aristocracy of the night. The sacred weapon had told him that the vampire race was known for looking down on humans. Elsid reckoned that even just out of a sense of pride, vampires wouldn't be likely to hang out in such a terrible place. Grinning, he said that if it turns out that the monsters are hiding there, then they have reached the extreme limit and are truly not dangerous. After which, the main character asked Karen to follow him. Looking at the local slums, Leon thought it was rather gloomy. Karen couldn't understand why the air was so heavy. Paying attention to the old house, the adventurer reported that she did not feel the presence of people. Looking around, Karen noticed that despite the maximum spread of auric awareness, she was unable to detect any signs of life. The adventurer believed that despite the riches of the Reuben thief, there simply could not be a single poor person there. Being wary, the main character was sure that this seems to be something out of the ordinary. The image of a wealthy and poor man appeared in his mind. In his mind, Leon believed that if there are rich people, then there are also poor people. He believed that if there were people living in mansions, there were also those who couldn't even afford a single room. Continuing to explore the territory, the main character noted that despite this, there is not a single slum resident in the city. He understood that there were only traces of existence left, but the inhabitants themselves could not be found. When I pictured Reuben, Leon couldn't understand what he had done to the poor people of Foud to make this part of the city so empty. The boys' faces were filled with horror. The main character offered to return. Leon and Karen's eyes were filled with wild fear. A technique began to form in front of them. Taking out his sword, the protagonist suggested that it might be an attack. As he watched the adventurer, he was shocked that even she couldn't see it. Tepesh and Roman appeared before the children. Dumbfounded, Leon thought that they were moving, changing their bodies like a haze. The main character couldn't tell if they were magicians or high-class assassins. Wary, Elsid claimed that they were vampires. Hearing this, Leon fell into a stupor. The prince said that Leon recognized them immediately. Teeps revealed that among the three generations of Nosferatu, he is the last member of the Wallachian royal family. After which, the main character froze in anticipation of further actions. In his mind, he imagined the image of a vampire reaching for his neck with lightning speed for a bite. In his mind, Leon believed that with such an intimidating array of techniques, they could have attacked them earlier. An image of the vampire's attack sending blood flying in all directions appeared in his mind. The main character pointed out that they didn't do it. As Leon watched, still didn't know if they were enemies or allies. Leon was glad that at least he didn't feel any hostility towards Prince Teeps, who was now standing there with a serious expression on his face and his servant Roman. 
Leon exchanged glances with Karen and decided it was worth taking the chance since the vampires had given up on a surprise attack and were engaging in a dialogue. The boy, holding the sword in its scabbard, froze with his hand over the hilt, clearly changing his mind about drawing it. A large moon disk surrounded by clouds in the night sky illuminated the surroundings. Looking at the pair of vampires, Leon frowned as he asked the night creatures why they had appeared in front of the heroes without intending to attack and asked them to reveal the essence of the matter at the very beginning of the conversation. Teeps broke into a grin as his hopes for Leon were fulfilled. He decided to ask the hero only one question, remembering how he had masterfully dealt with Dampiers with the light of his aura. Keeping his red eyes on Leon, Prince Tepish said that he had seen through one of the Dampiers that the boy possessed sacred power and asked if he was a person from the church. Leon and Karen's tense faces were filled with confusion. Standing in front of the two vampires, who emit dark streams of energy, the heroes completely did not understand what was happening, because the CH Sonic creatures came, knowing that Leon was somehow connected with the church. Else had thought about it too, holding his hand to his chin, and revealed that if the vampire was harboring some evil intent, just by looking at the church's crest, he would try to avoid meeting her follower. Leon, remembering that he had once pretended to be a member of the church, decided to try the trick again, confirming the vampire's words with some awkwardness and receiving a reproach from Elsid for his shameless behavior. A jubilant Tepesh gently took the protagonist's palm in his clawed hands, not holding back the emotions that overwhelmed him. Holding Leon's hand, the vampire looked at his last hope with a wide fang smile and big red eyes, not hiding his puppy dog joy. He looked at the awfully happy vampire with a puzzled expression, completely unsure why the vampire had reacted so violently to his words. While Teeps couldn't believe his luck as he continued to stand with Leon's hand in his hands, his servant Roman, who was standing behind his master, let out a sigh of relief. It was a clear day outside, and the sun shone softly on the surroundings of Reuben Fief's Snow White Castle. Hamel and Leonic looked extremely puzzled. Gustav's mouth twisted with rage, and Arnold looked at him sideways, afraid that the man would lose his temper. The commander slammed his big fist down on the table with all his might, claiming that this was an unexpected turn. Gustav burst into a rage, unable to contain it, and as he screamed, he tried to realize that the Count was using the poor as food to breed several dozen vampires. Karen, leaning against the wall with her arms folded, calmly confirmed the commander's words, adding that she personally heard this information. Looking at the girl seriously, Leon was glad to have Karen by his side now, because the words spoken by an Arank adventurer carry more weight than his own. Without hiding their indignation, Leonik and Hamel were perplexed aloud after the story that Count Reuben is a high-ranking magician, and at some point a vampire appears, telling about the Count's intrigues, and the men also added that the matter is so serious that it seems unrealistic, but they cannot help but trust the information obtained by Karen herself. Having calmed his anger, the collected Gustav began to sort out the information on the shelves, briefly said everything again, concluding that Count Reuben was plotting something, sacrificing the poor of the city, and trying to keep the Stom Guild in his domain under the pretext of hunting vampires, thereby closing their mouths. Karen suggested that they hurry, knowing that the Count wouldn't be able to keep the Guild in his fief for more than ten days. The guild members looked very serious as they spoke, frowning as they looked at the commander. Gustav, who doesn't hide his disdain for vampires, suggested that maybe it was all a lie, not understanding how anyone could believe bloodsuckers. Prince Tepesh, who suddenly appeared right behind the shocked commander, responded to the man's objections by saying that vampires themselves are not particularly happy to suck other people's blood. Yelling, Gustav jerked away from the creature behind him, not understanding how the monster had entered the building. The dark, translucent shape of a vampire greeted him respectfully, explaining that he could function in an intangible body under the sun, and also stated that he didn't want to get into a fight. Looking at Gustav with narrowed red eyes, Teeps confirmed what Karen had said earlier. Gustav, looking at the vampire with disdain, snapped that he wouldn't risk the lives of his comrades without proof, while Arnold behind him, hands outstretched, backed against the wall in fright. Agreeing with the words of the man, Tepesh's evidence provided a document guaranteed by the church itself, which stated that the term of service of the church by the Vlacia clan had come to an end. Leonik and Hamel stared at the paper, their eyes wide with disbelief, unable to believe that vampires were in the service of the church. Tepesh said that 300 years ago, a part of the clan joined the army of the Demon King. They abandoned the path of coexistence with humans and committed a monstrous betrayal of the goddess, as a result of which most of the vampires were destroyed by the hero Rodrigo, and even clan members who did not join the demons were on the verge of execution. However, one priest stood up for them in exchange for 250 years of service to the church, which allowed some members of the clan to survive and continue their lives. Glancing at Elsid, Leon concluded that the vampire's words matched the information the spirit had given him. Elsid, bored by the vampire's story, reproached him for pretending, because 250 years for those who have immortality is not such a long time. 
other than being exposed to sunlight or receiving wounds that interrupt their regenerative abilities. Unless the heart and brain are destroyed by silver, vampires are a species that can live for thousands of years. Tepesh continued that after the church service ended, the remaining members of the clan looked for a place to settle down and tried to settle in Reuben. The enraged commander asked if he understood correctly that the Count had stabbed the vampires in the back, to which Tepesh replied in the affirmative. Holding his chin in his hand, Gustav concluded that there was no doubt in his mind that the guild was indeed in serious trouble. Turning to Leon, the commander asked the younger one when the summoned knights of the Order of the Holy Iron Castle would approximately be in the fief. The confused guy replied that he couldn't say for sure. Then Gustav, drawn by the excitement of the fight, announced with a sarcastic smile that the guild would have to confront the Count on its own. However, the commander was taken aback when Karen calmly said that it was impossible, because even Prince Teeps, who was not inferior in strength, could not fight the Count and was hiding. She concluded that wizards were more powerful in their own territory, and that there was no greater enemy than a trained wizard. If we are talking about a wizard who has stayed in his territory for decades, then it is impossible to say with certainty about victory or defeat, even if a swordmaster comes. Karen advised him to gradually weaken the enemy's forces in order to gain superiority, and Gustav, puzzled, decided to clarify what was meant by these words. A monk in a light-filled temple bowed before a statue of the Virgin. As expected, one hope is for sacred power. Arnold, who had been thinking all this time, concluded that he should wait for the knights to arrive, and Gustav added that until they arrived, the guild would try to reduce the Count's power by its own strength. The commander's plan was ruined by Hamel's objections, who reminded him that the guild members were under round-the-clock surveillance. Everyone gathered began to think hard, trying to develop a plan of action. The group's musing was interrupted by Arnold, awkwardly raising his hand to speak, and the man offered to pretend that the guild was fighting. This idea shocked both the guild members and Tepesh, and all the bewildered heroes asked the head again. In the darkness of the night, a massive explosion thundered in the middle of the city, shaking houses. Knocked down by the blast wave, the knights didn't understand what was happening. A cloak could be seen fluttering in the dust. Leon appeared before the knights in a proud pose and with a sword in his hand, asking if the men were all right. Brand, bewildered and bloodied, asked who was standing in front of him. The main character gave his name, with a serious look introducing himself to the accompanying caravan of the Stom Guild, and added that he was currently on a task for Count Reuben to destroy vampires. A figure in a long cloak with a glittering red eye appeared in the sky against the background of the moon. Without taking his eyes off Teeps, Leon informed the eldest knight that this was a vampire, which scared the man. Taking out a sword that glittered in the night, the main character asked to trust him, and a confused brand, hiding behind the guy, immediately agreed. Frowning, Leon unsheathed his blade and held it out in front of him, never taking his eyes off the vampire prince. Tepesh twisted his mouth into a grin, his eyes blazing, as he controlled the crimson currents flowing from the clawed hand. Events are transferred to the recent past, when members of the guild, together with Tepesh, developed a plan to confront the Count. Gustav looked pleased when Arnold suggested that they pretend to be fighting. Hamel and Lenik were overjoyed and decided that this was a good plan, since no one would even think that they were in league with the vampires. With her arms folded across her chest, Karen noticed that by pretending to fight, they would be able to choose the place and time for the fight as they saw fit. With a sly look, the girl added that this way the guild will have the opportunity to cause unrest in any place. Karen gathered the eyes of the commander and the head, and they decided to stick to the plan to give the Count a good beating. We're back on the battlefield, where a stream of blood is pouring down on the focused Gustav. With a cry of rage, he swung his sword to strike. The commander's blade deflected the vampire's powerful technique, which created an explosion in the distance. Roman and Gustav concluded that Karen and Leon were right. Tepesh's deflected strike revealed a view of a hidden obelisk with a magic symbol, proving that Count Reuben was a magician. There were identical buildings around the perimeter that the locals knew nothing about and where only the Count could enter. These towers turned the entire area into a huge magic circle. Pointing to the dais from the window, Karen stated with a serious face that if it was a wizard, he would place reinforcement structures and artifacts on his territory to increase the effectiveness of his own magic. Looking back at the obelisk, Gustav asked if they should destroy all such structures, and Leon added that most of them were probably empty distractions. A preoccupied Hamel asked if only the real towers needed to be destroyed when Leon shot him a furtive glance. The main character, frowning, coolly concluded that if they destroyed only real buildings, the Count would quickly become suspicious, so it should look like the obelisks were accidentally touched. An explosion erupted in the background of Leon and Elsid, sending a pile of dust into the air. Looking towards the epicenter of the defeat, the main character admitted that Commander Gustav and Roman are doing a great job. Elsid, observing the guild's actions, told Leon that the mercenaries had between four and ten days and warned her not to take too long, otherwise there was a risk that the Count would understand the plan. 
The spirit also advised the young man playing a battle with a vampire that only magic towers should be destroyed during their battles. Tapish braced himself for another blow, launching a blood ball at the hero with feigned fury. At this point, Elsa decided to make sure that Leon hadn't forgotten that he couldn't use aura in battle. These words sent the protagonist into a state of shock, causing him to break out in a cold sweat and open his mouth wide. A stream of blood was already flying down from above at the confused Leon. A huge explosion thundered behind the stunned boy, sending dust and debris flying into the air. Assessing the scale of the destruction, the guy broke out in a cold sweat and asked Elsid if it was definitely not worth using aura in a confrontation with such a strong opponent. After hearing the spirit's confirmation, Leon howled in incomprehension, aggressively shouting that if the fight was fake, then the power of the blows was real. Taken aback by the young man's insane reaction, Elsid began to chew that the hero's aura was the exact opposite of a vampire's, and even a light touch could cause heavy damage to Prince Tepesh. After the spirit's explanation, Leon began to yell angrily at the mentor as the difficulty of the task was now too high, because it was necessary to use only physical strength in a fierce battle with the vampire while dealing precise blows to the Count's magical abilities. The numerous impacts of the Tepesh caused all the buildings in the city to shake as Leon continued his furious screams. The vampire hovered in the air, making powerful blows with a stream of blood. Unable to use her aura, all Leon could do was dodge them while dodging around the battlefield. The vampire towered over the city, assessing the damage dealt by the blows. His eyes widened in disbelief. Right at the shocked prince, a focused Leon flew, surrounded by a cloud of dust, raising his sword to attack. The moment the boy's blade flashed, the vampire soared up sharply, dodging the attack. An angry grin appeared on Leon's face at the failed offensive, and the vampire against the moon was already gathering a stream of energy with glowing fingers, preparing to strike back. The bloodstream swept past almost hitting the main character, but he was able to confidently repel it with his sword. There was another devastating explosion behind Leon. Several magical obelisks were destroyed during the battle and sparkled with magical lightning at the location of the defeat. Leon raised his glittering sword again, preparing for another blow. Behind him, Elsid exclaimed with satisfaction, who considered the battle a good training for the young man, discouraging the hero with her comment. Leon gritted his teeth angrily to see if he was wrong about the seriousness of the spirit's statement. Elsid was surprised by the guy's aggression, not understanding anything. At this moment the main character realized that his mentor was not joking at all. Under the sounds of explosions, Leon exclaimed that such an unequal battle was indeed dangerous, cursing his magic sword. The darkness disappeared, and the moon was replaced by a bright sun. Hiding behind a dilapidated wall, Leon trembled weakly, barely holding his sword in his hand, and noticed that six days of endless battles had already flown by. Elsid, looking out at the scorching sun, concluded with satisfaction that the process was proceeding very smoothly. At least ten magic structures were destroyed, so the defense of the walls was greatly weakened, which means that the goal of reducing the Count's power was achieved. From the window, smoke could be seen coming from the ruined magical structures. The fist was clenched so tightly that swollen veins poked out from under the skin. Count Reuben put on three gold rings with a red, blue, and green stone. His eyes were filled with rage, glittering with magical light, and the same magical energy radiated from his ringed hand. It was a clear day, and the sun was hidden by a bank of cumulus clouds. Gustav leaned against the white wall and said that everything seemed to be going according to plan, to which Leon, sitting on the edge of the sofa, reacted with surprise because the Count still hadn't taken any action. Closing his eyes, the dark, muscular commander with his arms folded in front of his chest calmly stated that if Reuben still hadn't revealed his true identity, it meant that he still needed time, but the longer the guild waited, the more dangerous the situation became. When the commander decided to check if there was any news from the Knights of the Holy Iron Castle, Leon thought that it would be nice if they showed up as soon as possible. A black cloth appeared in the air, and the name Leon was heard from it. The young man and the commander turned simultaneously, looking for the source of the sound. Karen, who appeared in the room with the help of a shadow technique, happily informed her companions that the Knight of the Holy Iron Castle had finally arrived. The city was hidden in the darkness of night, the streets lit only by the light from the windows. As he approached the local restaurant, where tables need to be booked in advance, Leon called Karen's plan very original. The adventurer snuggled closer to the cavalier, wrapping her arms around his arm. The disgruntled guy asked if it was necessary to go so far, to which the girl reassured him that this was just a game, necessary in order to distract from suspicion during surveillance. The couple was greeted good-naturedly by a waiter at the entrance, asking what name the reservation was made for. Karen and Leon pretended to be happy lovers, and the girl replied that the table was reserved in the name of Noel, which confused the guy, because the girl just read his name in reverse. The waiter escorted the couple to the fourth floor, asking if they needed a menu, and received a request to bring today's dish. 
After asking whether to bring food for four, the man received a brief affirmative answer. The door to the room opened a crack and a discouraged man with a bow tie hurried away, wishing the couple a good time. A girl with pink ponytails was already sitting at the table where Leon and Karen were led, and a guy in a green raincoat was standing over her. The stranger frowned as he noticed the matching heroes. A pink-haired girl with her mouth hidden by a sweatshirt studied the couple closely, her pink eyes boring into them. Leon noticed with a serious expression that although the girl looked young, she immediately gave the impression of a talented fighter, which was to be expected from the largest armed organization on the continent. Proud of his pupil, Elsid noted that thanks to Karen, Leon became better at noticing details, praising the girl's strength, which has a beneficial effect on the ward. The pair strode amiably towards the strangers as Leon awkwardly greeted them, explaining that it was he who had requested the support of the Order of Knights. A dark-haired boy in green robes said that he had heard about the hero from Bishop Jezar and hurried to introduce himself and his companion. Damien clarified that Angelica can't talk, asking for understanding. While in the restaurant, the assembled heroes discussed the current situation with the Count. In the course of the dialogue, the knight realized that Leon and Prince Teeps had committed sabotage disguised as a battle. Demian explained that he only knew the situation in general terms, mentioning that he knew Prince Teeps well. He stated that the young vampire was well known for his volunteer work in the church. Demian noted with a displeased face that the Wallachian clan was truly unlucky to be in trouble after 250 years of hard work, and also asked Leon to describe the situation in more detail, telling everything from the very beginning. It was getting dark outside, and lights were on in some of the houses, which could be seen from the restaurant window. Slamming his fist down on the table with all his might, Damien was outraged by the Count's brutality for imprisoning a vampire clan and raising them like cattle, and he also noted that there was only one type of magic that could use life force in this way. Frowning, the boy suddenly said that the conversation was about black magic, realizing what Reuben was up to. Demian Leon, agitated by his thoughts, whispered to Elsid that the knight's expression showed how much more serious the situation was than previously thought, to which the spirit added that the guy had properly correlated all the facts. In the vampire race, there is no distinction between body and soul. The treacherous count tries to use them to accumulate energy using the black magic desiccation method, which works best for spirit bodies. He uses the poor for food, so that he can squeeze the juice out of the stronger vampires again and again. Leon slammed his hand down on the table and asked if it was even possible, to which he replied that it wasn't normally possible. It was explained to him that if the consumption of large amounts of blood made vampires infinitely strong, they would have conquered the whole world long ago, emphasizing that the consumption of large amounts of blood is taboo for creatures of the night, as it can lead to their self-destruction. However, the tyrannical Count Reuben does not care what state the vampire is in, because his goal is to continuously absorb energy. Mute Angelica held out her hand, showing three fingers. Karen and Leon fell into a stupor, not quite sure how to interpret this gesture correctly. Damien went on to explain that this is how the girl is trying to convey that the situation is level 3 dangerous, so the Order members are asking for the full cooperation of the Stom Guild. Leon tensed as he realized how critical the situation was. The case is equivalent to a disaster with a city sink. Level 2 refers to national level disasters, and level 1 refers to situations that threaten the entire world. So far, with the exception of the Demon King's invasion, level 1 danger has never been observed. Demian clarified with a stern face that if level 3 danger reached 2, the situation would require gathering half of the Knights of the Order or sending a request for cooperation to each country. If this happens and you have to use the power of a horde of Knights, then the world will immediately be in a state of chaos. Leon's face was set in stone, and the feeling of approaching terror made him break out in a cold sweat. Damien looked increasingly tense, veins showing on his face, and he menacingly concluded that they would question Count Reuben tonight, and if he dared to refuse to question him, the knight would judge him in the name of the church. There was a full moon in the night sky, illuminating the canyon in Reuben Fief, where a prison camp with a magic tower on the roof was located in the lowlands. Someone wearing a raincoat was making his way towards the building in the night, stopping at the edge of the cliff. Clumps of dark energy in the sky told Angelica, who was hidden in her hood so that only her pink ponytail could be seen, that this was the place where vampires were being held in secret. Teeps appeared behind the girl, along with the servant Roman, both of them looking very serious, and the prince greeted the girl. Unable to answer, she just gave the vampires a pink-eyed look. Roman hurried to explain to Angelique that they had already been told everything, and they had come with the young prince to help the prisoners escape and join the Leon squad. Looking around the prison, Tepish concluded that they had been targeting this facility for a long time. A servant hurried to inform the prince that the Count had placed a barrier around the building that reproduced the light of the sun so that vampire attacks would be useless. While the vampires were discussing the possibility of breaking the dangerous barrier, Angelica put her hands on the hood, intending to throw it off her head. 
Abruptly, the pink-haired girl took a leap backward, flying off the cliff in the moonlight. Teeps was taken aback by such maneuvers, worried about Angelica. She dropped safely from the rock ledge to the bottom of the canyon and followed it to one of the prison walls, drawing the attention of two confused vampires. Angelica confidently held out her hand, which was encased in a metal glove with spikes and the symbol of the Order of Knights. As the Holy Fist gathered its power, it sparked with lightning bolts. The girl decisively slashed her hand straight at the dungeon wall. Under the heavy onslaught of the sacred power, the building began to collapse right before our eyes, bright streaks of lightning shining in the places of cracks. Tepesh and Roman, completely unaware of the strength of such a fragile girl, stood with their mouths agape in shock. From such a powerful impact, the entire city shook. Leon even mistook the aftermath of the prison's destruction for an earthquake. Demian calmly explained to the guild members that the reason for this shaking was Angelica. In terms of strength, the girl is twice as strong as the knight, and in general, many knights of the order are inferior to her in strength. Casting a stern glance at the allies, the knight concluded that Angelica alone would be enough to settle the matter of the prison. He went on to explain that their squad, in turn, is a problem related to the punishment of Count Reuben, attracting the discontented gazes of the guilds. Commander Gustav, grinning with annoyance, asked the knight again, asking if their squad consisting of high-class mercenaries in alliance with a knight of the Order of the Holy Iron Castle was not enough to capture the scoundrel. With a frown on his face, Demian replied that at best it would be a battle on an equal footing. But if even one of the allies died or lost their combat capability, then there would be no guarantee of victory. The night was dark over the castle, and the sky was dotted with bright stars. Two sharp spears were crossed, blocking the entrance. The guards were outraged by the appearance of a crowd on the doorstep of the castle at such a late time and asked the audience to leave, referring to ethics. Demian's figure, a green cloak fluttering in the wind, strode confidently toward the entrance, which was blocked off by guards. The guy introduced himself with a stern look, noting that he was ranked 38th in the Order of the Holy Iron Castle Church, and also stated that he had come to this territory to ask questions about the sin of heresy, holding out a gold pendant in the form of the Order's emblem in front of him. The two guards yelled at once when they heard who was in front of them. The men were ordered to remove their spears from the entrance by the butler who suddenly appeared. This white-haired man with a full mustache and a maniac's look, dressed in a tuxedo, asked for forgiveness for the tactlessness of the men, saying that my lord had asked to escort the crowd to him, and told them to follow him. Elsid pouted as he thought about how confident the count was when he ordered a church official to be invited to his house after accusing a man of heresy, while Leon was perplexed by what was happening. It was completely dark outside the window. Facing the unlit room was an antique male bust. The mercenaries who entered the castle noticed that the atmosphere here was radically different from what it was during the day, and the view around them made them shiver. Leon and Karen kept glaring ahead, suspecting that this was a trap. Closing his eyes, the serious commander concluded that as long as the squad was inside the castle, no one would be able to leave, and Leon, who was standing behind the man, looked at him expectantly. Gustav turned around and asked the main character if his words were true. The latter, grinning menacingly, replied in the affirmative. The command forward followed. The door opened a crack, and a voice behind it asked the heroes to hurry through. As the party entered, Count Reuben himself strolled through the huge room with floor-to-ceiling windows, holding a glass of red drink in his hands, casting a shadow from the light of the full moon. Looking at the bright liquid in the cold moonlight, the man apologized for not being able to give the guests a proper welcome, dismissing the option of a joint tea party. Closing his eyes, Damien explained that he had not come at this late hour to make jokes, and asked the Count not to evade the question. In the next second, he glared at Reuben, telling her that the man was accused of detaining a Wallachian clan that had served its sentence in the Holy Church, as well as abusing its power by using the blood of innocent residents of the fief. When asked by the Count about where the mentioned facts came from, the knight noted that the man does not even try to justify himself. Elegantly raising his glass to his lips, Reuben said that no one would believe him if he tried to justify himself, so he saw no reason to waste time on such a cheap comedy. The mustachioed butler glanced contemptuously at the group. Right behind the enraged knight was Leon, looking at the enemy coolly. Breaking into a grin, the Count noted that the guild members had played him well, secretly teaming up with the vampires and breaking the protective barrier, which was too fearless of them. With a face disfigured by madness, Reuben gave his word that everyone gathered would die in terrible agony. Gustav grinned, calling the Count's words an unfunny joke, which puzzled Leon. The man with the glowing blue eyes asked again if he had imagined it. Calling the Count a leech, the commander smiled broadly, noting that if he confessed to the knight in heresy, then he wanted to quickly hasten his demise, to which Reuben received a rude comment. 
Gust have mockingly turned this against the Count, comparing him to a dog, which caused the main character to panic, thinking that it was almost impossible to win in a verbal skirmish with mercenaries. The wounded Count aggressively asked if the guild commander wanted to die on the spot, Gust have retorted, noting that initially the audience was promised terrible torments, and now they are going to regret them, and concluded that the man continues to talk all sorts of nonsense. The Count was completely taken aback by such statements, his pupils narrowed greatly, the veins on his forehead swelled up, and his whole body shook with boiling rage. He insulted Gustav, and also claimed, while pulling out a crystal pendant, that the squad had lost their last chance of survival because of their chatty commander. Count Reuben placed the purple gemstone in his open palm, clenching his ringed hand into a fist, the man crushed the crystal, leaving sharp shards of it. The Count with glowing red eyes, surrounded by streams of red energy, pointed his hands up, fiercely telling everyone gathered that they were about to die. An explosion formed right under Reuben's feet, sending waves of dust and small debris all over the space nearby. Numerous bolts of lightning covered the floor, causing the fighters to scatter around the perimeter of the room. Leon raised his sword with a stern face, preparing to attack. The Count looked like a mad puppet with his flaming scarlet eyes, bloodthirsty smile, and upturned hair soaring into the air above the opponents. Right above the castle, a huge red-colored magic symbol appeared in the night sky, emitting lightning bolts. Grinning, Karen noted the incredible magical power of the old man, never expecting such a thing from him. Casting a hard look at the distraught Count, Knight Demian explained that this was the magical effect of the necklace, breaking it, the man activated the magic barrier surrounding the building. The bloodthirsty old man noted with a frightening grimace that the members of the guild and the Knight of the Order, without knowing anything, stood in his way and now they must pay for their ignorance with death. Concentrating the blood energy ball in his palm, the Count extended his hand forward, eyes glaring fiercely. He abruptly released a powerful stream of energy at his first target. The commander held his sword tightly and gritted his teeth as he watched the blow, preparing to deflect it. The blood stream directly hit the spot where Gustav was, causing the others to freeze in horror. All the guild members, shocked by the power of the strike, looked back in fright. Behind them, the guild commander hung with his mouth wide open from the pain that shot through his entire body, slammed into the wall with a stream of blood. Looking at the Count floating in the moonlight, Damien noticed that the old man could use magic without even casting a spell. Looking truly stern, the knight asked if Reuben had been engaged in a sacrifice, adding with disgust that the tyrant had not had enough of the blood of the poor, so he also used the souls, while behind him Leon ran as fast as he could to the commander who was hit by the attack. The Count who had turned into a monster, his bloodthirsty eyes glittering, asked, so what? Gustav's blood-streaked face twisted with a piercing pain. Next to him, Leon froze with intense tension. He looked sharply at the Count, his eyes filled with hatred. Reuben stated that he wanted to bury everyone from the very beginning. The reason for his hatred of the church, he called the ban on the use of such effective black magic. The Count was preparing for another attack, intending to show off his full strength by drawing the fierce stares of his opponents. The commander continued to lie motionless. Leon couldn't contain his anger. The tense knight continued to stare furiously at the Count as he made sinful speeches. He decided to ask the monster floating in the air if it wanted to confess. Bursting into laughter, the bloodthirsty Reuben asked if the guy naively believed that the old man would buy the sermon and bow his head. The magic symbol still hovered above the castle, activating the Count's full power. Hamel's face fell in disbelief. A furious Leon walked straight towards the monster while his cloak fluttered in the light of the magical lightning. The guy heroically went ahead of the knight with a sword to the advantage. The enraged hero raised his blade to strike, and the blade lit up the space. The startled monster recoiled, covering himself with one hand. Looking at the sword in the young man's hands, Demian wondered if this was what the bishop was saying, noticing that the suffocating air in the room had instantly evaporated. Leon, who was in the lead, calmly gave the order to start. Lighting up the room with golden flashes, the knight began to recite a prayer with his eyes closed. While reciting the sacred phrases, the attendant extended his hand towards the light source. A golden star appeared next to the magic symbol, instantly expanding into a huge flash and breaking the magic barrier above the castle. The lightning coming from the count began to fade. Glancing worriedly at the ringed hand, he could feel the source of his power diminishing. Reuben fiercely ordered his opponents to stay out of his way, gathering all the absorbed power in torrents of blood. Hansen, armed with a shield, called out to Leonik, who was standing nearby. The man made a dent in the floor with a powerful kick, breaking the white tile. He stood behind Hansen, putting a hand on his shoulder. In front of them, the men slammed down a solid large shield. In this position, the men expected an attack. The blood energy surged towards them in a powerful stream, forcing the two guildsmen to make a huge effort to stay on their feet. After a strong impact, the current dissipated, leaving smoke on the surface of the shield. The impact made a deep hole on the floor, spreading out in two directions from Hansen and Leonik's hiding place. Men were silhouetted in the haze, and Leon called out to them. 
Hansen and Leonique's eyes were completely white, and steam was coming out of their mouths that were open in terror. Grinning, the smug count asked sarcastically if the men thought they could survive by hiding behind a shield. The arrow that was released was coming straight at Ruben's eye, giving him no chance to dodge. The shot sent the wounded count staggering backward. Demian and Leon looked horrified as they watched the madness unfold. Hamel, satisfied with the damage done by the shot, quipped to the old tyrant. Holding the bow in his hand, he concluded that he had hit the target right, causing Hansen, who was hiding behind the shield, to smile slyly. A dumbfounded Leon, noticing the signs of life, screamed, asking if his comrades were all right. The three men gave the younger man a thumbs up at the same time, but they didn't look all right. Noticing that Leonik and Hansen had survived the powerful blow, the Count cursed viciously for not being able to kill them. On one of its rings, a hole was formed in place of the red stone, from which smoke emanated. Reuben raised his hand, which only had two rings left after one had crumbled to dust, exasperated at having to waste the artifact because of an ordinary mercenary. Hamel was taken aback when he noticed that the bloodthirsty Count was able to survive his shot, because it landed directly in the enemy's eye, and it was also impossible to dodge the mithril arrow of the pursuing type. Damien realized that it was all about rings that could eliminate any damage, but only once. After losing such a precious item to a pitiful arrow, the ferocious Count was really angry. The old man created many magic circles around him, laughing madly with his arms outstretched. Dark entities began to emerge from the portals as the Count shouted wildly that no one would survive today. His red eyes shone with a predatory gleam as the old man declared that everyone would become his slaves. Leon and Damien were grinning at the chaos created by the Count's hands. The three from the guild were peeking out from behind the shield-shaped shelter in fright. The many eyed undead filled the room. Damien yelled in shock that summoning enslaved undead was a rank 5 or higher magic. Hamel tried to attack the evil spirits with arrows, eventually concluding that the attacks did not work on them. After Leonique's attempt to cut the essence, it became clear that all weapons against the undead were powerless. A dark hand reached for the light cloak, grabbing at it and leaving a burnt spot. In that instant, Leon realized what was happening and recoiled as the undead tried to drag him away. The five men sat in a circle, back to back, surrounded on all sides by demonic entities ready to tear them to shreds. Elsid suddenly appeared and told the protagonist that the spiritual body is difficult to destroy even with aura weapons. Then the hero asked if he should repeat the same thing they did when they defeated the phantom armor, blinding the knights with a bright light. The spirit with a disdainful look concluded that Leon should use the holy sword with caution, which is a major trump card in the current situation. The madly smiling count, floating high in the air, was surrounded by many mysterious and eerie crimson-colored seals in the form of symbols enclosed in a circle. While black, misshapen creatures were rapidly emerging from these seals, speaking with all their appearance about their danger, the count shouted that absolutely no one from the Leon squad would survive today. The mage's crazed eyes glittered with a scarlet light as he talked about how even after his death, the souls of his opponents would not be able to find peace, and they would all become his slaves to a single one. Hamel, firing an arrow from his bow, shouted to the allies that their attacks did not work on these frightening black creatures. Leonik also tried to attack the undead, but the weapon was completely powerless. Leon, Hansen, Leonik, Hamel, and Damien found themselves standing in a single heap, surrounded by shapeless creatures that were reaching out their vile hands to their victims. Suddenly, a familiar dagger flew from somewhere above and sank into the stone floor, leaving a branching web of cracks. The surrounded guys, whose faces were incredibly tense, looked over. Sharp daggers rained down from the ceiling, mercilessly slicing through the black creature's limbs. Leon looked up and saw Karen's figure floating in the air. The adventurer landed on the floor. Karen's weapon wounds on the creature's bodies healed in an instant. Karen saw this and said with a calm expression that even though she knew this method wouldn't work, she still didn't feel like fighting such ugly creatures. Placing her palm, pulsing with purple electric flashes, on the ground, Karen found another solution. Stretching her lips in a slight smile, the girl decided that it was time for her to demonstrate her abilities. From Karen's palm, long lines stretched across the floor far ahead, growing in the air in the shape of huge human hands. Long magical arms were tightly entwined around the enemies. Leenik realized that Karen's shadows immobilized the creatures. Elsa admired the adventurer's work. Damien, standing with his back turned, said that now it was his turn to act. Placing one hand on his chest and the other raised at eye level, he cast a spell. A beam of shimmering golden light shone down on Leon, Hamel, Leenik, and Hansen. Hamel drew an arrow string, the tip of which shone like a bright star. Leonicus was armed with the same shining axe, and Hansen, in turn, was armed with a shield and spear. Leon, looking at his shimmering gold sword, heard Demian say that all of their weapons had temporarily received the attribute of sanctity. Leon marveled at Demian's abilities, but Demian only blushed faintly, blaming his talents on the goddess. Leon whispered his joy over the enchanted sword to Elsid. 
Else had explained to the apprentice that this spell would help hide the fact that Leon was holding a holy sword. Leon gained courage and confidence before the fight. One of the black monsters was cut in half by a wave of bright light. Strong and extremely tense hands held a powerful two-handed sword tightly. They belonged to the commander, who was smiling broadly through the fresh wounds on his face. Seeing Gustav full of energy and determination, Leon couldn't hide his delight that the commander's injury wasn't fatal. Hamel, Hansen, and Leonik, on the other hand, made stony faces as they expressed their disappointment that their commander was out of the fight with just one punch. He just winked at them with a kind smile. The three of them still kept their sullen expressions and gave Gustav the same warm smiles. The commander began to issue orders, telling his subordinates to first tie up the creatures, then distract the one controlling them, and immediately launch an attack using the opposite attribute. Hearing no objection, Gustav charged into the fray with a battle cry. A group of brave men moved forward, led by Leon. The Count bared his teeth and called them nobodies. Behind the raging hatred, he didn't notice Karen behind him. Her hand was clutching a dagger. Karen aimed at the Count, but he managed to use the red seal as a shield, which the adventurer's blade couldn't penetrate. Karen sighed with disappointment. The adventurer distanced herself from the mage. Enraged, the Count began to complain about Karen distracting him from the fight. A golden arrow shot through the air. The Count once again managed to put the seal as a shield under the blow. He was angry about another arrow being shot at him. Suddenly, the mage turned his attention downwards and realized that all the undead had been destroyed. Now, instead of a pile of misshapen black creatures, there were only six armed human silhouettes below. Their faces radiated bravery and no doubt whatsoever. In a desperate rage, the Count was forced to admit that his opponents were forcing him to play their special trump card. The wizard snapped his finger. From behind him, blood-red magic streams instantly spread out, resembling rays and shooting out electric discharges. These rays went out of the battlefield and penetrated the windows of the building. Damien watched the mage's new move with horror. The white disc of the moon hung motionless in the night sky outside the window. Leon, full of anxiety, didn't understand why nothing was happening yet. The door opened a crack. The Count bared his fangs in a satisfied grin. He greeted his servants in knight's clothing and with withered faces like corpses. Leon recognized one of the mage's loyal slaves. It turned out to be the senior knight Brand, whom they had met earlier during their arrival in the city. Leon's anger flared, and he raised his voice to ask the mage what he had done to these knights. The Count's red magic rays, resembling the paws of an octopus, swarmed over the city. Two guards in knight's armor were guarding the gate, startled at the sight of the eerie red rays. Sorcerous currents seeped deep into the guards' throats, making them scream. At their shouts, the other knights came running, three in number. The groaning gate guards dropped to their knees, looking at the floor and resting their hands on it. When they got up, their faces were already frighteningly lifeless, and they were making inarticulate noises. Brand was among the knights who arrived, frozen in horror. His companions were swallowed up by the same red currents. Brand, suddenly distracted, whirled around. The Count grinned as the servants came to his aid. Among them was Knight Brand. Leon recognized him as an old acquaintance they had met at the entrance to the city. The boy became enraged, asking what the mad mage had done to the knights. Damien was as angry as Leon. His forehead was covered with swollen veins as he explained that it was a black magic that temporarily turns a living person into a monster with great power by releasing all hidden powers. Damien was outraged that the Count had turned the knights protecting him into weak-willed monsters. Fully enraged, Damien called the Count a heretic and accused him of using forbidden sorcery. In response, the magician asked Damien if this was because witchcraft was forbidden, because the people from the church personally decided so. The Count expressed his lack of understanding about how the church, at its discretion, sometimes binds wizards and sometimes frees them from their bonds. Damien clenched his fist and shouted angrily that forbidden witchcraft had become so by the unanimous decision of the entire continent. The distraught mage replied that they had never given their consent to this. The Count stated that the church was simply afraid that wizards with the power and potential in black magic would rule them. When the Count called Demian a church dog and ordered him to die here and now, the monster knights abruptly joined the battle. Gustav, who had blocked a kick from one of them, pushed his feet through the floor under pressure from the opponent. Defending himself, the commander noted the incredible strength of these enchanted knights. The monster that attacked Gustav retreated to a small distance, preparing for another attack. Behind him, the commander heard Demian's deafening cry, warning that the knights in their frenzy felt no pain and were exerting strength beyond their natural limits, because they were in a state of life force release, and these creatures could not be killed with a non-fatal wound. As Gustav faced the monster again, he concluded that the only thing left for them to do was fight to the death. Hansen was also keen on a difficult battle. Then, in the middle of the fight, he felt his ankle twist, suggesting that the reason for this was because of the strength spent in the last battle. The lunatic monster made a leap, holding a spear in his hand. It pierced right through Hansen's body, spraying blood everywhere. Leonicus, seeing his wounded comrade, was distracted from his battle. 
The monster knight took advantage of this moment, knocking Leonik to the ground with a single punch to the face. Maroon blood trickled from Leonik's nose. Leon was trembling with tension. Demian fought the monsters with golden magic seals. Karen, on the other hand, took on the count, so she fought to the limit of her strength and capabilities. Leon realized that even if he tried to help the adventurer, he couldn't, because he couldn't move while he was fighting the enchanted knight brand. Else it ordered Leon to calm down. The spirit advised the disciple to take a close look at the enemy's movements. Elsid noticed that even if the monsters had lost their ability to think straight, their swordsmanship etched into their bodies from decades of experience was still there, so it was best to deal with both of them at the same time. Leon didn't understand what the last sentence meant. Then Elsid reminded him of a long-ago battle in the forest. Elsid said that when an opponent loses himself and uses his honed skills out of habit, it is very easy to find a gap in his defense with the help of the technique of providence and the sense of aura. The spirit added that using such a technique in a one-on-one -on -one battle can be very dangerous, but if you deal with two at once, then using their stunning, you can get the opportunity to conduct a successful attack. Leon finally understood what his mentor was trying to convey. The guy suddenly stepped away from his opponent. Leon grabbed the two monsters that Damien was fighting off. Demian and Hansen stared at Leon in silence. Neither Demian, who was standing on the defensive, nor Hansen, who was bleeding helplessly behind him, understood what their ally was up to. Clenching his hand into a fist, Leon urged the creatures to fight him. The monsters that had been knocked down began to slowly rise up from the ground, letting out eerie moans. A second later, they leaped at Leon, armed with weapons. They were full of animal aggression and a desire to kill. Suddenly, their faces were filled with incomprehension, as if something had discouraged them. Leon decided with a grin that it was time to start implementing his plan. Leon prepared to launch an attack. His attacks were so lightning fast that it was hard to see a man with a gun from the outside. Wielding his sword, Leon began to fight two monster knights at once. Leon knocked the two knights down with a single blow, leaving them lying helplessly on the floor. Suddenly, Demian, his forehead throbbing and his cheeks sweating, shouted a warning to Leon about the danger from behind. Leon, filled with tension, turned around at the same time. The monster that is Brand's senior knight loomed over Leon eerily, baring its snow-white teeth in a snarl. Leon gripped his sword, which glittered with small bolts of lightning. Suddenly, the wrist of his armed hand was gripped tightly by a white-gloved hand. Another palm, belonging to the same opponent, gripped the collar of Leon's robes. Brand was only able to lift Leon into the air by the collar of his cloak with one hand, while blocking the holy sword guy's arm. Behind red-eyed Brand, whose teeth were more like the false teeth of a wizened old man, shone the now familiar red seal belonging to a mage. Leon noticed her immediately, and a look of pure confusion crossed his face. A shout was heard directed at Leon as the battlefield was engulfed in huge red flames. It spread to Knight Grand and Leon and consumed them. The Count watched the situation carefully from above. The sword in Leon's palm suddenly shone brilliantly. Shrapnel rained down, as if the top layer of the weapon had been shattered. Leon realized that the holy power that church representative Demian had put into the team's weapons had neutralized the black magic, and without it, Leon would probably have been burned to ashes by now. Leon's eyes widened in shock when he noticed something. It was the same powerful count who was now only a frozen, burned body and a face frozen in a silent scream. Leon realized that the mage wanted to kill him along with his knight, and the thought infuriated him. As another ring on the maid's hand crumbled to ash, he talked about how annoyed he was with Karen and Leon. Leon froze in utter horror, not taking his eyes off something chilling. Next to the dark, floating male silhouette that belonged to the mage, Leon saw another silhouette, but it was female and bound. Karen, covered from head to toe in a spray of blood, was immobilized by the restraints that bound her. Veins stood out on Leon's forehead in anger at the cruel count for what he had done to Karen, and Leon took a fighting stance, yelling insults at the opponent. The count, while his palm radiated a bright crimson glow, ordered Leon to stop. Karen's face twisted in agony. The Count, breaking into a cruel smile, informed Leon that he had a proposal for the boy, and if he agreed, the magician would not lay a finger on Karen in the future. Leon, looking grim, hissed that it seemed the Count had already lost the opportunity to make any suggestions. Leon's answer amused the Count, and he liked the young man's stubbornness. The mage was talking about how experienced Leon was for his young age, and that the young man's virtues were far greater than those of his mercenary allies. The Count offered Leon one last chance to stand on the side of the magician and kill all the mercenaries along with the representative of the church. While Leon was talking to the Count, Demian and Leonique were engrossed in a fierce battle. The Count promised that by fulfilling his offer, Karen would be safe in the future and Leon would build a brilliant career. With a frown on his thick brows, the Count said that if he refused, he would kill Karen right away. Chuckling, the Count asked what Leon had decided because it was a very difficult offer to refuse. Leon, looking at the enemy with fierce hatred, said nothing. 
Elsid, flying over the ear of his pupil, shared with him the idea that he expected to immediately hear a negative answer from his lips. The spirit advised Leon not to pretend that he couldn't decide what to say, because everything Leon was thinking was written all over his face. Elsid politely warned the young man that his strategy of feigning acceptance of the Count's offer and then exploiting the gap in his defenses to deal with him with Merak was doomed to failure. Ignoring Leon's dumbfounded perception of the spirit, Elsid added that the boy's Merak skills were not yet sufficiently honed, and that his intentions would obviously be revealed when he was ready to activate the technique. Elsid asked the student rhetorically if he thought the Count would really believe such a lie so easily and agree to it. The spirit explained that since we are talking about such a high-ranking wizard, Leon's word will definitely be supported by some kind of oath or prohibition. Elsid concluded that it was very dangerous for the young man to do so. Leon panicked and screamed that Karen was in danger, that they didn't have time, and that all he could think of was this dubious strategy. The Count watched from the sidelines as Leon actively argued with the Void. This confused the mage, and he even suggested that Leon had a split personality. Elsid told the student to calm down, but he did not even try to do this, explaining that the situation was truly hopeless. Elsid, however, was really calm, telling Leon that he had forgotten something. The young man, however, did not understand what was being said. The red-eyed count turned his evil and callous gaze upward. Leon also noticed the ceiling, which was suddenly shaking. In the next second, a deafening explosion thundered in the Count's castle, splitting the majestic building into two huge halves. There was a large hole in the ceiling, through which the dark figure of a man in a raincoat was clearly visible against the background of the full white moon. Elsid chuckled contentedly as he noticed that the mysterious figure, who turned out to be none other than Angelica, had arrived just in time. Leon, too, was relieved by the arrival of an experienced warrior to help and turned to greet the girl. Angelique's pink hair and dark blue cloak fluttered in the night wind. The girl's thin brows drew together, giving her a very thoughtful and serious look. Damien, looking completely exhausted from the ongoing battles, noticed that his partner was a little late. In response, Angelica, not having the physical ability to object, gave Damien only a curt nod. Taking advantage of the warrior's lack of vigilance due to this conversation, the monster knight charged towards Angelica with a shout. She stood motionless and firm on the ground while those incredibly strong opponents were about to spring at her. Clenching her fist with the magic spiked brass knuckles shining brightly against the background of the dark room, Angelica prepared for a fierce battle with the creatures. She raised her fist to strike, her purple eyes with white pupils looking resolutely at the monsters in the form of knights. The girl's two consecutive blows only looked like two small golden flashes that appeared in the air for a couple of seconds. The Count's first sense of excitement came from this encounter with the Leon squad, and it was evident from the sweat on his face. The mage rudely inquired about the newcomer's identity, clearly impressed by her abilities. Angelica stuck out her thumb with the shining brass knuckles. Then she drew a line across her neck with her finger, looking haughtily at the Count. The mage, in response to the pink-haired girl's peculiar performance, only addressed another insult to his opponents, twisting his face in anger. The formidable Angelica swung for a punch while the holy fist sparkled with golden lightning. The powerful one swept through both of the Count's guards, deflecting them with bolts of sacred power, and the girl with sparkling eyes stood in front, her fist outstretched belligerently. Reuben was sweating profusely, clearly frightened. After the work was done, the girl exhaled, straining her clenched hand so that the veins stood out on it. The men who had been hit by the blow were lying on the floor, showing no signs of life. Leon let out a ragged laugh full of hope as the girl finished her attack. Watching the fight with Elsid with complete confidence, he guessed the most likely reason why Miss Angelica had volunteered alone. The pink-haired girl was so strong that it would be very difficult to adjust to her rhythm. Looking at Angelica in awe, Elsid concluded that it was a good idea to emit an aura-like shockwave through his own body. Rather closing his eyes, the spirit said that if the girl was mistaken even by a millimeter, the energy passing through her body would tear her internal organs. Concluding that it was not so much a strong body as a stable mentality, the danger of this technique, in turn, shocked the main character terribly. After giving Leon a serious look, the spirit explained that a large amount of aura was like gunpowder in itself, but when such a mixture begins to circulate inside the body, it becomes much more dangerous. Deciding to test the knowledge of his student, the spirit asked the guy what would happen if at the moment of performing the technique a person relaxes, to which the concerned hero hesitantly replied that there would be death from an explosion. Continuing to watch Angelica, Elsid confirmed Leon's guess. The girl looked very confident, sweating profusely after a fierce battle. Leon was very surprised that the girl was able to use such a technique in practice without a drop of doubt, admiring how many unimaginably strong people there are in the world. Clenching his fist, Leon counted himself among the last. With his fearsome face illuminated in red, he decided to join the fight, not wanting to cowardly sit on the sidelines. The bloodthirsty Count, taken aback by the girl's sudden appearance, continued to stare at the fierce warrior. 
he had absolutely no idea who Angelica was, standing right in front of him and challenging the man. She was holding her fist in such a way that you could see the brass knuckles made of metal spikes. Angelica coolly raised her hand, pointing her thumb at herself. The girl's arrogance caused a storm of pure anger in the count, and he began to yell, cursing rudely and wanting to kill the impudent girl on the spot. Angelica kept her heavy gaze on the enraged old man as she closed her two fists together, creating a strong energy discharge between them. With her fists flashing from the lightning, the girl rushed at the opponent. A moment later, there was only a cloud of dust where she had been, the lightning trailing behind her. A fearsome Angelica with shining gold eyes raised a lightning flashing fist to strike. A gloved hand with brass knuckles was already flying at the count. Chuckling, the old man created a protective magic symbol in front of him. The count tried to withstand the powerful blow of the holy fist, covering himself with a red circle, but the girl did not back down. Straining very hard, the count laughed maliciously, showing his sharp triangular teeth, and said that Angelica would never be able to break through his protective barrier. Even as he spoke, golden cracks appeared on the magic shield. The girl continued to advance, breaking Ruben's defenses with each effort. The Count stared ahead, dumbfounded, his eyes wide with fear and incomprehension, calling what was happening nonsense. The girl finally broke through the old man's defense, shattering the magic barrier into pieces, causing the Count to shrink back in fear. As the magic barrier fell in pieces, the crippled guild members reacted happily to its destruction as one. The Count jumped as far back as possible from the strong girl in a panic. Pressing his back against the windows, the old man heard the crowd's cry of surrender, which made him even more perplexed and angry. Enraged, Demian turned to Andrew Rubin. The Count, shocked by what was happening, didn't say a word as he continued to flash his scarlet eyes. The knight said with an angry grin that the old man was playing a very dirty game. But the dark knights who were summoned earlier by black magic were destroyed, and the barrier of the mansion that was the source of Rubin's power was destroyed. Grinning maliciously, the Count asked if the knight really thought the old man would raise the white flag. Pointing behind him at Karen, who was hanging limply, he reminded the crowd that he still had a valuable hostage in his hands. Reveling in his own cunning, the Count didn't understand at first when he heard the voice of an adventurer standing freely right behind him. A second later, he was looking back in complete shock, looking like he had been electrocuted. The girl, blood dripping on her clothes and skin, took out her sharp kunai, coquettishly saying that it was time to finish off the Count. With all her fury, Karen drove the blade straight into the old man's back, causing him to scream in pain as blood spurted from the wound. As he continued to scream furiously, the Count tried to understand how this had happened. He could clearly see the girl's bloodied body hanging tied up in the distance of the room. After a moment, the illusion disappeared, and a shadow in the plague doctor's mask with sparkling purple eyes hung in the bindings. Karen herself shrank back, away from the Count, after a precise blow. Running up to the girl, Leon asked if the older man was okay, to which she only grinned, keeping her hand on her hip. When the guy decided to clarify what happened, Karen was happy to tell him that everything was exactly as the hero saw, but the Count apparently did not intend to kill the captive on the spot, so she slowly switched places with the shadow aura, and if not for Angelica's intervention, the adventurer would have finished off the opponent first. Leon yelled angrily at the girl, asking if she was alright and if she was injured, because the guy was terribly worried about his partner. She stared at Leon with her big emerald eyes, puzzled. Raising her eyebrows guiltily, Karen asked if the boy was angry with her, but he didn't answer the question, saying nothing. He turned around, menacingly asking the girl to stay out of the way from now on, and walked away, and she agreed in confusion. Sprawled on the floor with Cupie on his back, the Count continued to writhe in pain, calling his opponents nobodies. Looking up, the old man noticed that a sharp blade was pointed at him. Leon pointed his sword at the pathetic old man and ordered the Count to surrender. Reuben grinned at him, glaring at him fiercely. The old man held up his ring fingerless hand and laughed madly, noting that he still had a trump card up his sleeve. Leon's expression showed that he wasn't happy at all. However, the Count quickly realized that the ring with the artifact must have been on the now missing finger. Karen twirled the selected piece of jewelry in her hand. The girl innocently asked if the ring she now had was the one in question, explaining that she could not leave such a valuable artifact in the hands of the villain and promising to use it somehow. The Count was furious, hurling threats at his opponents. Suddenly, dark energy surged through the room and a voice was heard ordering Reuben to surrender and pay for all her sins. This took the Count by surprise. Before him stood two enraged vampires, Prince Tepesh and his servant Romana. Outside the palace window, the moon was shining brightly. Malevolent laughter came from Andri's mouth. Turning to the prince, he repeated his words about him surrendering. Agreeing with him, the vampire called them bugs. His body was shrouded in a powerful red aura. The boy's faces were filled with shock. In the hand of the bleeding Andrew was a crystal. At that moment, horrified, the main character realized that in the vampire's hand is a black crystal, which Arnold gave him. Opening the moat, Andrew tried to swallow it up. 
after which, the crystal ended up in his mouth. Dumbfounded, Leon was startled that the vampire had swallowed him. At that moment, the entire room was enveloped in powerful streams of satanic aura. Andri's eyes glowed bright red. The crystal that was swallowed gave off a mysterious aura. After which, Andri startled the mercenaries standing nearby with a shout. Due to the deafening wave, they covered their ears with their hands. The vampire transformation process was in full swing. Shocked, Tepesh spoke about the technique used by Andri. Dumbfounded, the prince noted that only one of the three great Nosferatu aristocratic bloodlines has the ability to control sound. Huge wings formed in Andri's back. Tepesh assumed that this power belongs to the Elizabeth family. After finishing the transformation, the vampire appeared in front of the guys. Andri asked them how much they thought he had already prepared on this land. Watching their reactions, the vampire revealed that from the moment they started searching for the Nosferatu bloodlines, he had been turning the powers he gained into his own. After that, Andri noted that now only Tepesh remained. The protagonist's hands were trembling. While in his thoughts, he couldn't understand what was happening to him. The startled mercenary couldn't understand why he was trembling. Taken aback, Hamel asked him if he was a coward. In his rage, Leon realized that the presence, through the sense of aura, was gradually expanding and depressing. Andri said that he hesitated because the preparations were not completely completed, after which, he noted that they made him hurry up. Directing his gaze to the caravan guards, Andri declared that from now on, he would be the king of the night sky. Towering over the window, the vampire announced that this fief was his territory. Andri was sure that he would remain so until the very end. The vampire stated that he would suck the blood out of all living things and start using it as food, becoming the new vampire lord. Hamel's face was shocked. Damien was filled with anger. Looking out of the window, the main character was surprised that the moon turned red. Tilting his head, Tepish reported on the blood moon. The prince told me that it creates obstacles wherever its blood light extends and captures everything under its influence. The powerful aura of the blood moon gradually enveloped the surroundings of the residents. Wary, Tepish claimed that this power symbolized the vampire lord who rules all vampires. At that moment, Angelica rushed to attack Andri. With a crushing attack, it hit the vampire's face. Overjoyed, the mercenaries began to cheer. Hansen asked if he had heard the fist that smashed the barrier to smithereens. Watching Angelica, Andri called her another little thing. After which, he grabbed her head. Angelica's body was covered in a powerful red aura. Finishing his attack, the vampire removed his hand from her face. Angelica's body collapsed to the floor in defeat. Startled, Damien tried to address her. Directing his gaze to the guys, Andri said that now it was their turn. Taken aback, Leon couldn't understand why drops of blood were flying from the air. A terrified Tepish asked everyone to avoid them. The entire ceiling of the palace was shrouded in mysterious blood. A powerful attack was launched from the formed seal. Due to the shock wave, dust rose up in the palace. The bodies of the mercenaries lay in a pile of rocks. Putting her hand to her nose, Karen wondered about the events that had taken place. There were many pools of blood on the floor. The excited protagonist asked if the adventurer was okay. Karen looked up and saw Leon. His face was covered in blood. The main character was glad that everything was fine with her. Karen put her hand on Leon's neck and called him not smart. The adventurer asked if he was going to get hurt, what she needed to do. Leon put a hand on Karen's shoulder and informed her of an important request. He asked Karen to take Tepesh and Roman and move them as far away from here as possible. The frightened adventurer didn't understand what he was talking about. She thought it was wrong. After which, Karen asked him what he was going to do alone. The main character's face froze in one position. The adventurer was filled with excitement. Karen still agreed to his request. Looking at Leon, the adventurer said that if he died, she would kill him. Karen's face was shrouded in worry. A small smile appeared on Leon's face. Encouraged, the main character said that he understood her. Rising in the air, Andri watched the result of the explosion after his attack. Turning his attention to his hand, the vampire wondered how beautiful it was. Andri was glad that the transformation into a vampire with the help of a black crystal was crowned with complete success. He noted that the power of the life force that has been gathering for decades is inside him. Grinning, Andri talked about the vampire king who disappeared 300 years ago. He believed that this body was his second coming. At that moment, the main character was heading in his direction. The vampire's face was filled with surprise. He was amazed that there was still someone who was still able to move. Leon was holding a holy sword. Turning to the vampire, the main character asked him to fight with him. Looking at Leon, Andri ordered him to stop bragging. Seeing the pool of blood beneath him, the vampire noted something that recognized his tenacity. Andri couldn't understand what the main character had in mind. Grinning, the vampire thought there was nothing Leon could do now. At that moment, Karen, who was behind the main character, used the Undertaker technique. As the vampire watched the adventurer disappear, he assumed that Leon intended to buy time so that at least Karen could escape. 
Being wary, Andri declared that Reuben's fief is already a land that is no different from its internal organs. The vampire was sure that no matter how hard they tried, they wouldn't be able to escape his eyes and leave this city. Blood spurted from Leon's mouth. The gloating vampire had ordered him to suffer the pain. He wanted the main character to feel desperate and cry. Andri said that this regret will remain with Leon even after his death. Lowering his head, the protagonist noted the vampire's talkativeness. Leon slung his sword over his shoulder and asked if there was a rule that you had to have a good tongue to practice black magic. The main character noted that he patiently listened to Andri's chatter to stall for time, but he continued to chatter incessantly. Enraged, the vampire ordered him to repeat his words. Andri asked if he was trying to stall for time, after which, he called him a pathetic worm. The vampire thought that the main character was stupid. Raising a powerful charge of aura over his head, Andri assumed that Leon was testing his patience to the last. As he tried to stand up, Damien noticed the vampire's incredible strength. He was sure that the sphere must not be allowed to fall. Having wrapped his body in an aura, the protagonist believed that if he couldn't sense Karen's energy, then they had already moved quite a long distance. In his mind, he was glad of that. Leon's sword shrouded in sacred light. Elsid grinned and called Andri a sucker. Sacred Weapon was startled that he used a trump card to transform into a vampire. Raising the weapon above him, the main character asked him to get ready. After which, Leon activated the holy light. The vampire's face flickered with a holy aura. Andri's loud screams could be heard in the palace. His body gradually began to disappear. Suddenly, the wounds on the mercenaries' bodies began to heal. Taken aback, Hamel couldn't understand what was going on. He couldn't believe the wounds were healing. Leaning his hand on the wound, Damien fell into a stupor. While in his thoughts, he assumed that that light was coming from the holy sword. The protagonist's face was brimming with confidence. Exhausted, Andrew continued to yell in pain. All that remained of his body was a skeleton that had fallen to the ground. An evil aura gradually began to emerge from the vampire's remains. Watching all this, Elsid spoke about the rejection of human nature in order to gain evil spirits. The sacred weapon thought it was a good name for a vampire. Seeing the souls released in front of him, Elsid declared that the Holy Sword's radiance was three times more deadly to these monsters. He noted that the Vampire Lord's abilities weren't just an outlier of his power. With a smirk, the Sacred Weapon reported that the experience gained over a long life and the honed ability to freely use mysterious powers were much more troublesome. The main character believed that Count Reuben didn't have any more trump cards left. Sacred Weapon assumed that this was the case. As Elsid continued to observe the souls, he noticed that the Count was not up to the task of properly controlling the power that was manifesting in him. Frozen in place, the Sacred Weapon was horrified by what it saw. After which, Leon wondered if everything was alright. Behind the main character was the skeleton of a barely alive vampire. At that moment, Andri bit into his neck. Startled, Elsid began to call out to Leon. A blood moon was shining brightly above the residence. An agitated Tepish asked Karen to untie them as soon as possible. The prince, who was in prison, said that he had to finish off Andrew with his own hands. Tilting her head, the adventurer refused his request. Pointing her finger at Teeps, Karen asked if they wanted to die with Andrew for company. The adventurer thought that the vampires would only hinder Leon. Karen said that if they would sit here quietly, she would remove their restraints. After which, she removed them from the prince's hands. In desperation, Tepish talked about how their enemy was right in front of them, and they couldn't do anything. He thought it was a truly pitiful sight. Roman, who was nearby, fell into a stupor. Suddenly, a red aura began to radiate from the prince's eyes. Surprised, the subordinate reported the power that enveloped Tepish. The prince pointed to the door and said that someone was calling for him. A dumbfounded Roman suggested that if Tepish's power had reacted, then there might be. The prince went to the door and announced that a tribesman was there. Startled, Karen asked the prince to stop. The adventurer wondered if a crowd of bloodsuckers would attack them. Tepish thought they should go in to find out. The door to the room opened slightly. The boys were standing in the doorway to the room. Looking around, Karen guessed that there was no one there. The prince asked if he had called him. Karen's face was full of excitement. Seeing something, the adventurer fell into a stupor. Tepish's eyes narrowed. From the iron cage, the hands of a creature could be seen watching him. Karen couldn't figure out who it was. After calming down a bit, the adventurer assumed that this creature was on the verge of death. At that moment, the mysterious creature started shaking the cage. Reaching out of the cage, it began to let out screams. After which, Tepish rushed towards him. Walking over to the cage, the prince took the creature's hand. Next, Tepish used a special technique. As he watched the creature, he became absorbed in its memories. While in the garden, Count Reuben held the girl's hand. Outside the window, a heavy downpour began. In his hand, the Count held a syringe with unknown contents. After which, he injected it into the girl's arm. A wicked grin spread across his face. Her hand was covered in a red aura. Powerful blood spurts flew out of Leon's neck. 
a sacred aura began to radiate from the bite site. It completely covered the barely alive vampire's mouth. Clutching his shoulder, the protagonist assumed that it was a reaction to the sun attribute. As he charged, Leon thought this was his chance. Opening his mouth, Andre prepared to attack. The powerful wave of the vampire's roar pushed the main character back. After which, Leon started to cry out in pain. By jumping back, Andre expected further actions. The bloodied protagonist tried to lean on the holy sword. When he recovered, he assumed that it was a sound attack that made him unable to hear anything. As Leon tried to stand up, he realized that if he hadn't already wrapped the aura around his head and neck, he might have already died from the bite, or his head would have been torn apart by that sonic attack. Turning to the main character, Elsid praised him for his excellent work. Sacred Weapon asked if he was okay. Leon, covered in blood, reported that this was so. Noticing Andrew standing next to him, Elsid thought that he looked terrible. As the Sacred Weapon continued to watch the vampire, it reported that the vampire had experienced a power surge that left him with nothing but instincts. He suggested that now Andrew is even more dangerous than before. Elsid knew that even though he couldn't cast magic, the vampire was still able to use his awakened abilities. After which, the sacred weapon asked the protagonist to be careful. Leon smiled and agreed with him. Elsid pointed out that you should not underestimate Andri. Recalling the image of a powerful red aura and a barely alive vampire, Elsid told Leon that the power of the three Nosferatu clans is the blood of the Wallachian clan. Sacred Weapon noted that the sound technique belongs to the Elizabeth clan. An image of a mysterious man appeared in his mind, his shadow reflected on the wall of the room. Elsid reported that the shadow technique belongs to the Strigota clan. Sacred Weapon noted that during the battle with Tepesh, it was confirmed that the power of the Wallachian clan does not affect the main character. A memory of the prince's duel with Leon popped up in his mind. Elsid reported that the main character blocked the power of the Elizabeth clan with an aura. He assumed that the remaining attack was the shadow of the Strigoth clan. Holding the holy sword with both hands, Leon stated that the Count had become a doormat, as well as that he had used up 80% of his aura. The main character believed that they should not delay the fight. He knew that the vampire had to be dealt with in one blow. Paying attention to Andri, Elsid noted that during the previous attack, the latter also instinctively understood that if Leon hit, then he was finished. Sacred Weapon believed that now the vampire would not allow the main character to get close. Leon froze in thought and said he knew it. Grinning, the protagonist noted that he had no other choice but to go straight ahead. Elsid smiled and said it was true. After which, Leon rushed to attack Andri. The main character stated that the blood attack does not work on him. The barely living vampire let out a roar. Then, using the shadow technique, he tried to attack Leon. On the legs of the main character there were multiple cuts. Bleeding profusely, he kept going straight ahead. Holding the holy sword on his back, Leon thought about the vampire materializing a shadow. He was surprised that Andri didn't react to the sun's aura in any way. While in his thoughts, the main character remarked that it was clever. As he continued to think, Leon realized that if it was about shadow techniques, he must have eaten a dog while training with Karen. Continuing to rush towards the vampire, the main character believed that without the technique of providence and rapid movement, his head would have already flown off his shoulders. While in his thoughts, Leon was sure that he needed to put all his remaining strength into strengthening his body and move on. At the same time, the main character's face was enveloped in a sacred aura. While waiting for the attack, the vampire continued to let out a roar. With a lightning attack, Leon cut Andrew's body in two. A mark was left on the vampire's body after the main character's powerful attack. Furious, Andrew let out another roar. Dumbfounded, Leon couldn't believe that even after being wounded by the holy sword, the vampire was still alive. Multiple streams of red aura emanated from Andri's body, which attacked the main character. Leon's body developed multiple piercings, causing him to start screaming. The vampire's technique completely destroyed the palace, leaving only a single piece of rubble. Strange red spots began to appear on Andri's body. Turning into a mysterious creature, the vampire let out a strong roar that could be heard all over the area. The main character's face was shocked. A blood moon rose above the residence. The terrified man couldn't understand why everyone was out on the street. The young man reported that a bloody glow emanated from the moon. Pointing his finger at the sky, he asked if the man had previously heard the sound of an explosion coming from the castle. He was sure that something must have happened. The silhouette of a huge monster appeared behind the terrified elder, after which, there were many shouts on the residence's street. The monster clung to his neck and bit down on Damien. Screaming in pain, he reported that the monster was sucking blood. Damien was talking about stealing shadows and restricting movement. At that moment, the mercenaries were also grabbed by the mysterious creatures, clawing at their necks. Above the wreckage of the palace, a vampire rose from the body of which multiple streams emanated, which directed the monsters. Strange sounds were coming from Andri's body. Damien froze in place, dumbfounded. As he watched the vampire, 
He was struck by the fact that it was sucking the blood out of everyone in the city. Demian assumed that Andri was trying to return to his original state as a vampire lord. He believed that the vampire was desperately trying to make up for the damage done to him. Damien revealed that it was an ability sealed by the vampire progenitor, who realized its danger. Many creatures continued to emanate from the vampire's body. Not someone who isn't a full-fledged vampire will undoubtedly show the strongest backlash, Damien continued. An enraged Elsid declared that this was a forbidden technique, triggered by the survival instinct. Sacred Weapon noted that if its range was extended on an incredible scale, the inhabitants of the city would disappear without a trace. Trying to catch his breath, the main character suggested that it was like the coming of the city devourer. A crowd of furious monsters headed towards Leon, after which, the main character tried to dodge them. A red aura radiated from the mouths of the mysterious creatures. The enraged monsters pounced on Leon, attacking him in every possible way. Startled, Elsid turned to the protagonist. At that moment, the vampire was watching the gradual recovery of his arm. Grinning, Andri noticed that the body was returning to its original state. He declared that they would soon lay their heads on the sacrificial table of his resurrection. Mysterious creatures, using the creation of a cocoon, sealed the main character inside. In his thoughts, Leon realized that he couldn't move. As he bled, he thought about the remaining aura that protected his body, but he knew that this was only a temporary measure. The main character thought that he was bleeding too much. Leon didn't have the strength to move, let alone control his aura. Suddenly, the main character heard some screams. In the vast expanses of the residence, people begged for help and shouted that they did not want to die. After grabbing the holy sword, the protagonist realized that he had to cope, because the reason he decided to become a hero was to save people suffering from unreasonable evil. At that moment, in the cocoon, he began to form a technique with which he would get out of there. Gradually, the cocoon was filled with a sacred aura. With an incredibly powerful attack, Leon cut through the shackles that had been holding him back all this time. Being beside himself with rage, Andrew called him a persistent worm. Being in the center of the form technique, the vampire knew that he had to concentrate all his strength on it. After using more monsters, Andri ordered him to stop digging and die. In the main character's mind, a memory of Karen's words surfaced, telling him that if he died, she would kill him. A smile spread across Leon's face. The main character was inspired by the fact that the adventurer said that she would tell him off if he died. Concentrating, Leon used the Big Dipper sword. Using the Great Chariot, with lightning speed, the main character rushed to the attack. Leon had almost reached the limits of the vampire's technique. At that moment, Andri was watching the main character's expression. Looking at the terrified vampire, Leon declared that this time he would be finished, calling him a nasty evil. Using Marak, the main character cut Andri's technique with the help of a sacred aura. The vampire's technique was cut in two. The remains of his body swiftly flew down. Andri's face was filled with horror. A memory of his daughter holding a teddy bear popped up in his mind. The girl turned to her father. As he put his arm around her, he was glad that she was waiting for him. His daughter asked if he would play with No today, after which, he agreed with her. Lifting his daughter in his arms, the Count began to play with her. She stated that her father is the best and that she loves him very much. The Count said that he also loved Lee. Seeing something, his face was shrouded in fear. Lee was lying in front of him, bloodied. Horrified, the Count rushed to her aid. When he picked her up, he told her that he would save her. He said that he would definitely fix everything. Outside, it was raining incessantly. In desperation, the Count clutched his head. He talked about an incurable disease that took his wife and may take his daughter. He pointed out that despite being a high-ranked mage, he couldn't cure this ailment. The Count had tried every method in the world. Terrified, Reuben was sure that he could not lose Lee, being ready to sell his soul. After which, an image of black magic appeared in his mind. Raising his hand, the knight ordered all the slum dwellers to be taken away. A liquid was injected into the chained man. Due to the intense pain, his screaming cry could be heard. There was a plea for mercy outside the door. Grinning, the Count announced that he had found it. The butler behind him assumed that he had found the right way. Reuben claimed that the key was a black crystal. He explained that if he could increase the power of the vampire clan he had gathered with the help of black crystals, he would be able to gain the power of the vampire lord he coveted. Choking back tears, the butler considered this a real blessing. He noted that with the help of this, the Count will be able to cure the illness of his daughter Lee. Looking out the window, Reuben asked about Lee. With distraught eyes, the Count recalled the original reason. The vampire's body was gradually melting. When he was about to die, he froze in one position. The prince appeared before him. The Count, barely alive, turned his gaze on him. Teeps was holding a small teddy bear. The prince said that she was waiting for her father and asked him to give him this toy. Memories of how he'd used the serum to save his daughter's life popped up in Reuben's head. Then he tied her up with chains. While in his thoughts, the Count couldn't understand how he could have forgotten that. 
Intoxicated with the power, Reuben forgot his original purpose. The image of his little daughter calling for her father came back to him. Reuben's eyes filled with tears. At that moment, he was thinking about his daughter. The blood moon gradually began to disappear from the expanse of the residence. Above the terrified people, particles of red aura could be seen flying in the air. Damien's face was in shock. Raising his disappearing hand to the toy, the Count tried to say something. Reuben's hand continued to disappear rapidly. Watching him, Tepish reported that vampires were originally a race that had no distinction between spirit and body. The prince noted that when a vampire dies, his soul does not separate, but disappears forever along with the body. Watching the Count's remains, Teeps announced the punishment for those who violate the taboo. Putting a hand to his chin, Gustav asked if it had ended like this. Outraged, Hamel turned to his commanding officer. He asked him to stop talking nonsense. The mercenary asked if he had forgotten that the ogre he had beheaded had gotten to his feet right after he finished his tirade. Taken aback, Gustav wondered why they were so worried about someone bringing the dead back to life. Hamel pointed out that if he continued to say something like that, he was a vampire and would definitely rise from the dead again. The mercenary asked the commander to keep his mouth shut. Alert, Gustav asked about Leon's condition. Hamel pointed a finger into the distance and reported its location. The bloodied body of the main character tried to heal the Knights of the Order of the Iron Castle. Streams of sacred aura were directed at Leon. Smiling, the main character thanked the guys for their help. He reported that he was already better. Leon thought that Demian and Angelica should take care of their bodies. But suddenly, there was a deathly silence. The main character's face was filled with confusion. Taken aback, Damien informed them that even if they died, it wouldn't matter. Confused, Leon turned to Elsid. He noted that despite all his attempts to stop them, they did not listen. The sacred weapon said he was right about that. Elsid believed that the guys who would be willing to give up their lives to save Leon if necessary. A joyful Demian noted that the main character was great in battle. He had endlessly wondered why Jezar had asked for the protagonist's full cooperation, but now he realized the reason. Taken aback, Leon tried to find out exactly what he hadn't told them earlier. Demian stated that if the main character decided to hide his identity, then they respectfully accept his will. With confidence on his face, he stated that they would keep this information about him a secret for the rest of their lives. Demian asked the main character to be calm about this, after which he begged to let them deal with the consequences. Leon's face was filled with confusion. Demian stated that they would minimize any friction with the kingdom so that nothing would interfere with Leon's plans. Grinning, Karen asked if the main character was half-dead. The outraged adventurer leaned toward Leon, noting that she believed that her threat would somehow affect him, but he simply ignored it. After which, the main character tried to justify himself to her. Furious, Karen claimed that she had been stupid to believe him because he had almost killed himself. The adventurer reported that this is why she. Suddenly, he fell into her arms, unconscious. Karen froze in place as she grabbed it. A blush spread across her face. After which, she hugged him to her, calling him stupid. The adventurer's hand was on the head of the sleeping protagonist. The afternoon sun rose above the expanse of the residence. The next day, a report of the incident in Reuben Fief was delivered to the royal palace. Her flag was flying over the kingdom's palace. The Count's family was among those who could be said to have real power in the kingdom. And suddenly, one of these pillars of power had passed away, so not only the royal palace, but all the high-ranking nobles were in great turmoil. The plot showed us Tepesh holding the document, the injured soldiers, as well as Count Reuben. However, when testimony was obtained from members of the Wallachian clan who had served their time of labor service in the church, and survivors who had been innocently imprisoned and whose blood had been used, it became clear that all the evidence pointed to Lord Reuben being a follower of satanic teachings. Demian, who was standing behind the counter, said that Count Reuben was found guilty of heresy and executed without trial. After which, a member of the Order of the Iron Castle noted that they were assisted by several mercenaries and adventurers in the process of capturing him, he believed that in reality their contribution was insignificant. The pondering nobility fell into a stupor. Damien informed them that even if the nobles called them in as a witness, they wouldn't get much out of it. The evening sky of the residence was gradually shrouded in clouds. Two knights of the Holy Iron Castle Order, whose words were guaranteed by the church, came forward to clarify the situation, and soon the commotion in the kingdom was over. Carvin of the Stom Guild was on his way again. Karen reported that they had a long way to go, but the nobles would be very concerned about this incident. The adventurer thought that they obviously wouldn't have left them alone, but thanks to the intervention of the church, they were able to safely escape from this drag. Turning her gaze to Leon, Karen noticed that he was finally awake and aware of what had happened. The main character's entire body was covered in multiple layers of bandages. In his thoughts, Leon assumed that he had fallen asleep in Karen's arms that day and passed out for four whole days. Overjoyed, the mercenary group declared that they were able to survive. 
the main character was glad that the personnel of the Steel Claws mercenary squad had survived. After which, Leon noticed Karen's heavy wound. The main character focused on her wound. Taken aback, the adventurer declared that it was almost delayed. Karen noted that her vital organs were not affected, and she reported a small bleed, after which she quickly recovered. Leon smiled and said that he understood her. The boys on their way to the mountains were in a cart. Tilting her head, Karen apologized to the protagonist. The main character's face was filled with confusion, after which, he wondered what she was talking about. The adventurer thought he was angry, a memory of how she'd used the technique to trick a vampire into swapping her body for an undertaker popped up in her head. Karen reported that she was talking about the moment when she pretended to be captured by the Count. The adventurer's mind flashed to the memory of being behind the desperate Leon. Karen looked annoyed. The adventurer felt that because she was acting at her own discretion, the protagonist was too surprised. She said that from now on, she would share her intentions with him first and then act. Leon grinned at that. Dumbfounded, Karen couldn't understand what that smile meant. The main character said that they did not disperse at all on her, but on themselves, due to the fact that he could not even understand the strategy of a friend. Directing his gaze at Karen, Leon asked her to continue acting as she had done so far. The main character said that from now on he would understand everything even without her words. The adventurer's face became confused. Karen disappeared in a flash and said she was going to get some fresh air. Leon's face was filled with surprise. Elsid smiled and noted that Leon fully qualified as a hero. Sacred weapons believed that Karen's strength lay in her unique tactics and extraordinary improvisation. After which, he pointed out that asking an adventurer to reveal her cards in advance was the same as destroying her strengths and turning them into weaknesses. Encouraged, Leon said it was true. He believed that if his ignorance limited the strength of his comrades, then he had no right to call himself a hero. Karen sat on the roof of the wagon, looking confused. The sacred weapon stated that the main character had gone up another notch. With a grin, Elsid informed them that their next step was the Titan Mountains. Wary, Leon agreed with him. The main character believed that the legacy left by the Holy Emperor Rodrigo was in the land ruled by the Giant King. Leon turned to Elsid and asked if he had a plan for getting inside. After which, he asked how he needed to find Rodrigo's legacy. Sacred Weapon stated that there was no plan. Hearing this, the main character fell into a stupor. Leaning on the base of the wagon, Leon thought that this time everything would be alright again. He stated that he would simply believe in his sacred power and in his companion who was the Holy Sword. Putting a hand to his chin, Elsid noticed that after hearing Leon's words, something came to mind. Looking at his hand, the main character realized that they still had a long way to go, and the stairs that need to be climbed, there is no end in sight. Inspired, Leon clenched his fist. While in his thoughts, he noted that if he didn't give up, tomorrow's he could become even stronger. His face was shrouded in confidence. They looked out of the wagon and headed for the Titanium Mountains. In the depths of the snow-capped mountains, there was a small settlement. The plot takes us to the mountain town of Chinook. The city's torn flag fluttered in powerful gusts of wind. Here there is no lord, no law, no order, also commonly known as the city of criminals. A man flew out of one of the buildings. After hitting the ground multiple times, his body landed on the ground. The man's mouth was slowly bleeding. Grinning, the stranger called him a pathetic worm. He didn't understand how the man dared to attack him on a rank Odin. Raising his fist, Odin announced that the drinks would be paid for today by the man he had defeated. The mercenaries raised their glasses and admired him. A guy standing next to the bar declared the fear that was enveloping him. Pointing to the unconscious man, the guy asked if she had seen it. He noted that this is not the place where such an innocent girl should visit. Leaning his hand against the wall, the mercenary declared the danger of this place. The young man thought that it gave off a wonderful fragrance. The guy asked if the girl wanted to use their escort services. Watching the hooded girl, the man didn't understand what kind of escort he was talking about. As he examined her face, he asked if he should show her what the ways of debauchery and corruption were. The man wanted to stop talking and finally sell the girl. The mercenary's gazes were filled with horror. He asked her if she was okay. Turning his head in their direction, the man couldn't understand what he was talking about. The guy was talking about his hand. Grinning, the man looked down at his hand. After which, powerful shouts appeared on the streets of the city. Leaning her hands on her hood, Elahan addressed the group of mercenaries. When they saw her, they fell into a stupor. Smiling, she asked if they would like to atone for their sins. At that moment, Karen and Leon were heading towards the foot of the mountain. A huge, powerful dragon could be seen in the sky. Stopping, the guys began to explore the territory of the Titanium Mountains. Surprised, the adventurer noted that there were many wyverns here that were dangerous even for B-rank. She believed that this was exactly what you would expect from the Titan Mountains. Karen said that from their first step, the tension was on edge. The main character completely agreed with her. 
Their faces were filled with horror. The adventurer reported that the demonic energy coming from the forest was too huge. She felt like she would be crushed if she let her guard down. Karen believed that this was the reason why most guilds didn't accept requests for the Titan Mountains. The adventurer noted that there were many rare spiritual plants and resources here, so many adventurers challenged themselves, but only a few returned alive. Grinning, Karen announced her degree. The main character realized how dangerous this place is. With a grin, Elsa announced that a giant king was reigning in demonic punishment. Sacred Weapons noted that this was a land that even dragons couldn't fly over as they pleased. Karen put her hands to her shoulders in alarm. After imagining the Titan Mountains in his mind, Elsid reported that these mountains were not a world for humans, but for giants and monsters. Sacred Weapons believed that there was no better place to train. After which, he pointed out that this is the case if the main character can survive. Hearing this, Leon fell into a stupor. With a smirk, Elsid asked if the main character would go deep into the mountains because of this. In courage, Leon stated that this was not the case. The main character noted that once he got here, he can't turn back. Motivated, Leon turned to Karen. Putting her hand to her side, she noted that this was his style. After that, the guys set off again. An explosion occurred in the vast expanses of a small town. Elahan shouted for punishment. The mercenary's head was pierced by a powerful mace strike. Putting a hand to her head, Elahan suggested that that should be the end of it. Around the saint were many defeated enemies. Peeking out from the corner, Khan noted in his mind that she was very dangerous. As he watched Elahan, he thought of the former ranger who was wanted for shooting his superior in the head and falling out of favor with a high-ranking knight, as well as the former a rank adventurer. He was amazed that she had taken them all out on her own. Feng couldn't believe that she had taken down such a crowd so easily. As he continued to think, he couldn't figure out who she was. After which, Elahan smashed through the wall that Khan was hiding behind. Grinning, the saint declared that he was the last one. Feng's face was filled with horror. He asked her to stop. Startled, Elahan braced herself for the blow. Startled, Khan asked her to listen to him. He stated that he was terribly annoyed. Feng reported that he had been here less than 24 hours. Elahan, frozen in place, couldn't understand what kind of annoyance Khan was talking about. She considered him an impudent and unscrupulous person. After which, Feng once again tried to explain the situation to the saint. Continuing to attack continuously, Elahan talked about how she didn't need any questions and answers. Taken aback, Feng assumed that she was from the church. In desperation, Khan noted that despite being the boss of the slums, he received their recognition for helping them. Feng said that if she didn't believe him, she could ask Bishop Jezar about it. After which, the saint stopped her weapon a centimeter away from Khan's face. Elahan continued to stand there, lost in thought. Feng froze in one position, startled. Blood spurted from Khan's nose. Leaning towards him, the saint asked if he was the boss of the slums. A dumbfounded Khan was surprised that she knew him. Suddenly, the young man came to his senses and let out a cry. Feng pointed at him and asked why he was alive. He noted that the mace broke his neck and shattered his spine. Smiling, Elahan explained that she had used the sacred technique of maximum recovery at the moment of impact. The saint pointed out that even if all the bones of his body were crushed, they would grow back together and he wouldn't die. Elahan revealed that this is a body that has been resurrected from the dead, so Khan will be able to move for a while. Watching the crowds of crazed mercenaries, Feng was amazed that it wasn't enough for Elahan to flatten a grown man with a single blow, but she also used a sacred technique that could instantly heal wounds that could lead to instant death. Looking at it, Khan couldn't understand what its essence was. Feng thought that he was familiar with the power of the Knights of the Iron Castle Saint Order, but the saint's power was on a completely different level. Khan knew that there was only one being who belonged to the Holy Church and had such power. He couldn't believe it was a woman. Putting her hands to her heart, the saint asked if he knew the adventurer who fought with him in the battle, whose name is Leon. Hearing her words, Khan fell into a stupor. He asked her if she was talking about that brat. At that moment, Elahan's face was filled with intense anger. Shouts of the saint's punishment were once again heard from the city. Elahan said that she now grants him forgiveness for the earlier slip of the tongue. The terrified Feng didn't understand what she was talking about. Raising a finger, the saint noted that in return, she wanted him to track down the main character's tracks to find out where he went and what path he took. She asked Feng to share this information with her. Putting her hand to her face in embarrassment, the saint said that he didn't need to be told details such as what Leon liked or what his habits were. She thought it was very rude and tactless, even though she was very curious. Hearing this, Khan fell into a stupor. Elahan smiled and asked him to take her to Blaine first. Feng was baffled by her words. She put her hand on his shoulder and asked if they were coming. A dumbfounded Khan was startled to see the saint dragging him. Thrusting her hand forward, Elahan announced that they were moving to Blaine. In his mind, Feng was shocked that his body was like a rice cake. The plot takes us to the Titan Mountains. The evening sky was shrouded in gray clouds. From the dragon he killed, the man tried to get his weapon out. 
Turning to the stranger, the man asked if he could fight. The stranger reported that his ribs were broken. He noted that the left collarbone was also damaged. Standing by the many corpses, the man thought that their task was not easy. A powerful roar came from the huge dragon's mouth. In this state, resist Drake, he continued. A terrifying monster towered over the boys. Grabbing his axe, the man noted that this is a life and death battle. After which, they rushed to attack. Due to the dragon's constant attacks, dust rose up from the area. While in the shelter, Karen reported that those giants are residents of the Titanium Mountains. Wary, the protagonist noted that they were fighting Drake on equal terms. Watching the huge monster, Leon believed that it was full of strength, so the advantage was on his side. Drake continued to parry the Titan's powerful blows in every possible way. The main character noted that he was just having fun with them. He had doubts about whether he was definitely a demonic monster. Looking at the roaring Drake, Elsid stated that in reality, such an attitude is completely consistent with the demonic monster's character. He believed that because of his sense of superiority, the demonic monster was playing with other people's lives. Furious, the protagonist clenched his fist. After imagining the terrain surrounding their area, the sacred weapon reported that Drake had excellent perception. Elsid explained about the range of detection of opponents by the demonic monster, he stated that it was equal to about 3 kilometers, so he initially knew about their presence. Sacred Weapon believed that Drake's next target would be them. After which, he asked Leon what they would do in this situation and if they would fight. Putting her hand to her head, Karen reported on the rumors that said the inner part of the Titan Mountains was a demonic land. The adventurer had never expected to see Drake on the first day. Karen noted that a monster with a danger level of S plus can use all sorts of tricks like a human. She thought it was a complete nightmare. Raising her head, she wanted to ask Leon what they would do. Glancing at the protagonist's wary face, the adventurer noted that she had done the wrong thing when she asked. One of the titan's hands was gripping an axe held tightly behind his back. After which, with lightning speed, he threw it towards the demonic monster. When the axe reached its target, it left a severe wound on Drake. Grinning, the man asked him what he thought of it. He thought he'd hit the bull's eye. But suddenly, the demonic monster's tail was right in front of his face. With unimaginable power, Drake continued his powerful attacks. The dumbfounded man's body was on the tail of the demonic monster. The giant's ally was also defeated by Drake's might. After which, the demonic monster threw the titans into the air. Then, with an incredibly strong kick, he smashed them into the ground. Blood spurted from the titans' mouths. Drake, towering over them, let out a mighty roar. In desperation, the man assumed that they were about to die. Imagining the image of the constellation in his head, the protagonist activated the Great Chariot. Next, he used the Merak technique. With unimaginable speed, Leon attacked the demonic monster's neck. Drake's eyes were shrouded in anger. The main character's body was shrouded in a sacred aura. After the attack, he turned to Karen. At that moment, the female adventurer on top prepared to launch her attack. Her daggers pierced through the demonic monster's neck, causing it to scream in pain. Karen was relieved to see that her poison blades had hit home. Blood spurted from Drake's neck, after which, the demonic monster dropped all the daggers in it. Furious, Drake waited for the next move. The boy's faces were shocked. Karen thought they were dead now. Standing up a little, the man noticed that the demonic monster really wasn't an easy opponent. After activating the magic bracelet, Leon asked the titans to take it. He threw regeneration potions into their hands. The main character said that despite the size, these potions have a very high concentration, which ensures the effect. The titans' faces were filled with confusion. The guy tried to address them. With confidence on his face, the protagonist asked them to deal with the demonic monster first, and then talk. Leon asked if they could continue fighting. Grinning, the man said it was true. After which, the titans let out a terrifying roar. The guy asked if they needed any more words. Karen's face was full of confidence. Raising his weapon above him, the man declared that they were ready to fight to the last. Rushing towards Drake, the main character asked them to follow him. Karen and Leon were now walking in front of the angry giants, all four of them ready to fight Drake. A ferocious red dragon of impressive size roared at the opponents from its perch on the stone hill. The four of them charged into the fray, weapons ready to strike. With full focus, Leon started to activate the Providence technique, and a golden lightning flashed in his eye. After maximum concentration, the pupil in the eye sparkled so that the brown color of the iris completely disappeared, a circle formed around the eye. The magic scope was aimed directly at the belly of the demonic red dragon, which was roaring in rage as it towered over the attacking heroes on its hind legs. For a moment, Ian was taken aback, because the colors seemed to have left the world. Elsid calmly said that there was no need to get lost during the battle. 
Duck clarified that the loss of colors occurs when the consciousness does not keep up with the speed of the body's reaction. As the giants charged furiously at the dragon, Elsid explained that the loss of color and the slowing of time were only temporary, and that if Leon had given up practicing the Providence technique altogether, he wouldn't be able to see anything at the moment. The giants and Karen flew fully armed at the enemy, and the spirit advised the main character not to be distracted during the battle, asking him to look up. The hero raised his head, remembering the huge dragon. While Leon was watching the ferocious monster, Elsid advised him to take advantage of the opportunity that came up due to the time dilation to decide where and how to attack. Leon carefully examined the hero, his eyes clinging to his neck and hind leg. Leon, enraged, concluded that the dragon's defense was too high, and the attacks of the guy and Karen would not be able to deal fatal wounds, continuing to search for the creature's weak spot. The places with the highest probability of damage were chosen for the attack, the wing membranes and eyeballs. The dragon raised its powerful tail to strike. Leon yelled at everyone to dodge Drake's own attacks. The four of them leaped high to avoid the lizard's powerful tail. As they descended to the ground, the giants noted that it was dangerous, and if it wasn't for the young master's warning, the situation might have become dire. Karen, sitting on her lap after the jump, thanked Leon, saying that she could not have noticed the attack herself, executed with such incredible speed. The four of them paused, waiting to see what the enraged Drake, one eye glinting in the shadows, would do next. The dragon closed its mouth and snarled angrily, letting out steam from its nostrils. Alarmed, Leon, watching the monster intently, began to suspect that the atmosphere was changing from fun to murderous. A purple glow of aura appeared near the guy. Looking at the enraged Karen, surrounded by flashes of purple lightning, the protagonist also noticed that her energy had changed. The adventurer single-handedly charged at the dragon, trying to hit the red lizard with a powerful electric aura discharge. In mid-flight, Karen created many shadow blades around her, aiming them at Drake. The girl dropped to the ground, and the swords followed straight to the target, emitting a purple glow. The dragon watched the weapons fly in panic, unable to dodge the blades. All the swords hit the creature squarely in the eye, and Drake let out a roar, maddened by the pain. The giants watching Karen's attack were pleasantly surprised, marveling at the girl's strength, while Leon was proud of his partner. The dragon, still roaring in pain with its mouth wide open, covered its affected eye, which was now emitting smoke. The monster snapped open the eye where Karen's attack had landed, and it turned out that it wasn't damaged at all. Noticing this, the shocked adventurer started yelling that the dragon was overreacting, even for an S-rank creature, and poking her finger at it. Standing a little further away, the giants blushed, calling Karen Leon's sweetheart and hot stuff, adding that the guy would have to sweat, which greatly puzzled him. The men with satisfied faces concluded that they now knew where to aim, and also said that they would cover the mercenaries. Leon, smiling gratefully at the giants, agreed to their help. Drake stared at them, puzzled, wondering what they were up to. Around the huge dragon, all of Karen's shadow blades were embedded in the stone mound, and none of them hit the monster, which was waving its heavy red tail and snarling. The beefy giants flew straight for the huge lizard's head, raising their spear and axe to attack. A black-haired giant with a long tail and beard loaded an axe on one leg, and his brown-haired, snub-nosed partner stuck a sharp spear in the other. Drake screamed in pain, choking the air. The startled dragon noticed something with its yellow eye while its mouth was open. The monster noticed a bright golden stream coming from the top of one of the mountains, which was concentrated in the plateau nearby. Inside the golden glow was a focused Leon holding a glittering sword. He glared at the dragon, his brown eyes blazing. The monster, waiting for the next attack, broke out in beads of sweat and let out a growl. The dragon opened its sharp-toothed mouth wide, concentrating a purple-black ball of magical energy into it. The energy ball flew straight at the protagonist, creating a giant black and purple dome on the plateau. The area around Leon was completely dark, making it impossible for the guy with the fading sword to see anything. He called out to Elsid, Karen, and the two giants, trying to figure out what had happened, but no one answered. The voice of the spirit was abruptly heard explaining that Leon had encountered an attribute of darkness, but the boy panicked, unable to see his mentor, and asked where he was. Leon froze when Elsid told him not to be afraid. The spirit reminded the protagonist that he was able to create a path opening light with the help of the sword, which now shone strongly again in the young man's hand. The light reflected in his dark eyes. Leon's face grew confident of her own abilities. When the guy used the Great Chariot, third mystery technique, a golden constellation appeared in the air, the star in the middle glowed as brightly as the hero's sword. The dragon watched the giant dark dome without moving. Suddenly, a star-shaped glow emerged from the darkness. The monster kept its eyes fixed on the bright beam of light as the glowing particles hovered around. The dome was finally destroyed by the powerful light stream coming from the bright star through the magic circles in the distance. At the end, the blow reaches the dragon's eye, sparking golden lightning as the monster screams in pain. 
several stars appeared in the dark sky, including the brightest and largest alcade, and the dark silhouette of a dragon could be seen in the distance. Leon was holding a shining sword. The darkness was replaced by sunlight streaming in through the windows. Leon lay exhausted in bed, squinting against the bright lights, wondering where he was. He was lying under the dome, and light came in through the circle of windows under the roof. The hero stared at the ceiling, not understanding anything. He looked away from her at the blonde head. Right in front of Leon, the buxom adventurer Karen lay snoring peacefully. Leon started to shout in surprise, eyes widening. He didn't understand how he ended up in the same bed as his partner. The girl opened her emerald eyes a crack, waking from a dream. Confused, Leon shouted that it shouldn't be like this, to which Karen replied that it should be like this now. As she sat up, smiling seductively, the strap of her tank top fell off her shoulder. The girl said that she was a little upset that Leon didn't remember anything, noting that he was hot, and looked away in embarrassment. Stunned, Leon tried to find out more about what he had done yesterday. Then the girl burst out laughing, watching the hero's reaction. Karen explained to Leon, who was confused, that he had developed a high fever yesterday, and the girl had spent the whole night on her feet, caring for a sick comrade. The girl thought of Drake, not hiding her anger. Leon understood what she was talking about. After the guy's powerful attack, the dragon lost an eye. The monster's self-preservation instinct kicked in as it began to thrash from side to side, spewing out streams of fire from its mouth. During the story, Karen hugged Leon tightly, pulling the guy right to his chest, which greatly embarrassed him. The girl rubbed the guy on the head with her fist, scolding him for using the technique, after which he fell unconscious from a huge height, and he asked for forgiveness, trying to get out of the tight embrace. Leon stopped and looked up at Karen's face in admiration. He remembered that while he was falling, the girl recklessly rushed towards him right through the flames released by the dragon. She lunged at Leon and grabbed him tightly, saving him from falling. Leon looked at the savior with tenderness and warmth and sincerely thanked Karen. The girl blushed with embarrassment and began to explain that it was her duty to save Leon. Two giants of their acquaintance pushed open the doors to ask if the young master had regained consciousness. Leon and Karen looked like lovers, sitting on the big bed with their arms wrapped around each other. The giants realized that they had entered at the wrong time, abruptly turned away and hurried to leave the couple alone, to which the mercenaries began to stop the men. Karen began to tell me what she had done yesterday, and they had made friends with the giants. The blonde, snub-nosed man with the big smile was called Erga. The giant with the long dark hair and beard was called Jolu. He held out his hand to greet Leon. The giant took the boy's tiny hand in his huge one, shaking it slightly. The girl said that their new friends are very strong, and they are afraid of wild animals and monsters, so Karen did not see any threat all the way. Jolu was gripped so tightly by Leon's hand that the boy was shaking like a leaf in the wind. Sitting on the red carpet, the giants began to ask the main character about his plans. After a moment's thought, Erga revealed that to meet the giant King Leon, he should see the head of the village. Erga resolutely asked the hero if he was ready to go on the road right now, while Jolu recommended that he rest a little longer. Leon, not understanding why the giants looked so crafty, replied a little hesitantly that he was ready to go right now. The two giants were smiling insidiously as they questioned the alarmed Leon with their reactions. The girl looked curiously at the main character, while he froze in place, looking ahead with fascination. The four heroes emerged from the giant's lair, and a stunning view of the settlement opened up before them. Walking through the huge streets, past the tall figures, Lainey Karen admired the village of giants. The main character noticed something in front of him that greatly shocked him. On the ground were the corpses of a dire wolf and a wyvern. There were also trolls and a dragon among the monsters. Leon noted that the corpses of these monsters are counted in two-digit and sometimes three-digit numbers, remembering how hard he managed to defeat the troll. Karen noticed with annoyance that someone had crushed a mushroom that could buy two magic swords. Elsid declared that the giants are strong. Gorok-like giants have aura plus rank, as well as martial arts and intelligence. They are able to destroy any monster below rank 5 alone, being skilled hunters and warriors. The giants brought a pair of mercenaries to the giants training ground Hell's Parade ground, in the middle of which was a huge skull with fire. A high-pitched scream came from the skull. The giants called the adventurers inside, declaring that a chapter was waiting for them. But after the terrifying sounds, Leon had no desire to go. Giants flew out of the skull's fiery mouth. Three bodies fell to the ground. Looking around, Leon couldn't tell if it was an enemy or not. Right out of the fire, a huge, muscular figure was walking towards the heroes, asking if there were guests in front of her. Leon and Karen stared at the approaching giant in panic. A beefy red-haired woman who introduced herself with a good-natured smile as the head of the village named Balkania came out to them. 